The Ceremonies by T. E. D. Klein. Copyright 1984 by T. E. D. Klein. Narrated by Dennis Bateman. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Annotation A fantasy horror story that transforms a New Jersey farm into a place of satanic intrigue. A cynical graduate student spends his summer studying on the secluded farm of a young fundamentalist couple and falls in love with an exquisite virginal dancer. The two couples are brought together by a sinister spirit that manipulates them toward horror and doom. Some strong language and some descriptions of sex. 1984 From the Book Jacket Let it therefore rest at this. The events recorded here began as one day they would end, in mystery. From the terrifying vision of its opening scene, to the breathtaking horror of its climax, the ceremonies turns our familiar world into a place of satanic intrigue and ominous design. In the grip of an extraordinary writer, it plums our darkest forebodings, the deadly underpinnings of ancient myth and folklore, to reveal an undying evil in our midst. For graduate student Jeremy Frears, citified, cynical, yet prone to daydreams, Summer is the time to shed a few pounds and finally get some reading done. He's picked just the right place, the small, secluded village of Gilead, New Jersey, only ninety minutes from Manhattan, but with its antique customs and clannish traditions seemingly a century away. For farmers Sar and Deborah Poroth, young members of Gilead's fundamentalist community, the summer threatens a conflict between their passionate natures and the stern dictates of their faith. For Sar's widowed mother, gifted with second sight, it promises the frightful awakening she's dreaded all her life. And for aspiring dancer Carol Conklin, a red-haired virginal country girl struggling to survive in the city, the hot weather brings not only the first blush of romance, but a lucky job with a kindly-looking old man known as Mr. Rosebottom. But Rosie, as he calls himself, bears a more sinister name, the Old One and a far more terrifying face. Only he knows the dark design that rules these people's lives, for in the heat of the summer an infinite corruption is stirring, an evil rooted not far from the Poroth farm, yet reaching sinuously to the city and beyond. The signs are all about them, but the old one alone knows that the rest dance unwittingly toward horror and doom. The time is right for the ceremonies, the monstrous rites that will unleash on a despised creation an age-old promise of apocalypse. And to see the scheme unfold like some deadly flower is to watch a nightmare come to life. About the Author T. E. D. Klein, a native New Yorker, has written some of the eighties' most accomplished tales of fantasy and horror, including the much-acclaimed novella Children of the Kingdom which appeared in the Viking anthology Dark Forces. For the past four years, he has been the editor of Twilight Zone magazine. This is his first novel. Prologue Christmas The forest was ablaze. From horizon to horizon stretched a wall of smoke and flame staining the night sky red and blotting out the stars. Vegetation shriveled and was instantly consumed. Great trees toppled, shrieking toward the earth, dying gods before an angry gale, and the sound of their destruction was like the roaring of a thousand winds. For seven days the fire raged, unimpeded and unquenchable. No one was there to stop it. No one had seen it start, save the scattered tribes of Mangos and Unamis, who had fled in terror from their homes. Among them were some who said that, on the evening of the blaze, they'd seen a star fall from the sky and crash amid the woods. Others claimed that lightning was the cause, or a queer red liquid bubbling from the ground. 
perhaps none of them were right. Let it therefore rest at this. The events recorded here began as one day they would end, in mystery. At last the flames were dampened by a night of steady rain. The morning sun rose upon a kingdom of ashes, a desolate gray land without a tree left standing or a trace of life, save, at its very center, the charred and blistered body of an ancient cottonwood, the tallest object for miles around. The tree was dead, but crouched amid its branches, hidden by a web of smoke still rising from the earth, something lived something older far than humankind, and darker than some vast and sunless cavern on a world beyond the farthest depths of space, something that breathed, schemed, felt itself dying, and dying lived on. It was outside nature, and alone. It had no name. High above the smoking ground it waited, black against the blackness of the tree. Fire had ravaged its body. A limb had been devoured by the flames. Where once a head had been, and something rather like a face, was now a crumbling mass, the form and color of charcoal. Still it clung implacably to life, as to the branch round which its claws were fixed. Survival was a thing of calculation. There was something it must do before it died. Now was not the time, but it was patient. It closed its one remaining eye and settled down to wait. Its time would come. The planet spun. Moons waxed and waned. Vegetation returned, groping hungrily up through the ashes. The scarred place on the planet's surface was lost beneath a canopy of green, and once again the trees rose straight and tall to catch the sunlight. Only in a small grove near the center was a difference to be seen. There the foliage was not so thick, and the trees themselves had grown back shorter, coarser, curiously stunted, like the life forms at the summit of a mountain. Others had taken on odd shapes, with trunks split into a hundred branching arms, or twisted, or swollen obscenely like the bodies of drowned animals. When a wind swept westward from off the sea, turning the roof of the forest into an ocean of waving leaves, no such movement stirred the shadowy confines of the grove. The very earth there was changed. By night it seemed to glow as if a fire still raged beneath. At intervals thin wisps of steam would drift up from the ground, curling past the roots and leafless boughs, obscuring both the treetops and the sky. The Indian seldom ventured near that part of the forest, and even avoided speaking of it after a woman gathering firewood described the thing she'd seen there, squatting in a dead tree in the middle of the grove. For the thing no word existed, but they found one for the grove in which it chose to wait. Makineanok, they called it, the place of burning. A year passed and another, and then five thousand more. The stars had shifted slowly in their courses. The sky looked different now. So did the planet's face. The Indians were dead, and the forest land had dwindled to a third its size. Settlers had dotted it with homesteads. Engineers had crisscrossed it with roads. Farmers had cleared off a patchwork of fields for pasturing and corn. Villages had sprouted. Townships spread. Somewhere a city was being laid out that would spell destruction for another million trees. Here and there, some remnants of the former age survived. Hidden knots of wilderness where man had never walked, and where the great trees still struggled as before, unchallenged and unseen. Such places, though, were few, and disappearing fast. Soon, within the compass of a century, the forest and its secrets would belong to man alone. Where the ancient woods were deepest, in the region that the Indians had called Makineanok, five thousand years of quietude had already been breached. Months ago the grove had rung to the distant echoes of a hammer. Now, at any moment, 
human footsteps might penetrate the silence and the gloom. Still it waited. The boy was not yet lost, but he was puzzled. He had wandered into this part of the forest by mistake, trying out the new snowshoes he'd received that morning, and suddenly he'd found himself unable to proceed, his left shoe mired in two inches of mud. Elsewhere the forest floor was blanketed in white, but here the earth showed through in great bare patches, and the gray December sky was reflected in puddles of melted snow. Stepping back in search of firmer ground, he brushed a pale strand of hair from his eyes and tucked it beneath the hand-knit woolen cap. All afternoon he'd had a steady wind behind him, but now it had stopped. Until this moment he had hardly been aware of it. Running a tongue over his chapped lips, he looked around him, ears straining for a sound. His own breathing seemed unnaturally loud in the winter silence. There was something different about these woods. He saw it now. It was more than just the lack of snow. The trees were smaller here, and queerly formed. A ring of leafless branches, sharp as claws, reached yearningly toward his face, while many of the trunks and limbs were twisted into grotesque shapes, images from half-remembered dreams. Pulling off a fur-lined mitten with his teeth, he stooped to unfasten the rawhide bindings of the snowshoes. It was growing late, and he was beginning to get hungry. At home there'd be warm eggnog waiting, and johnny cake made of cornmeal, and in the huge cast-iron stove a bowl of Christmas pudding. The older girls would be helping his mother in the kitchen. The others would be singing hymns, the younger children joining in as best they could. His two little sisters would be playing on the rug beside the chimney corner. Around him the dark woods seemed to press closer, as if to cut off his escape. He paused to wipe the dirt from his leggings and to re-tighten the laces. Standing, he slipped his boots from the muddy snowshoes and took a step backward, nearly tripping over the exposed roots of an old cottonwood. He reached out blindly to steady himself. With a cry he yanked away his hand. The tree had felt warm to the touch, like a living creature. Yet a glance assured him that it was merely dead wood, blasted by lightning from the look of it, or scorched as from a recent fire. Hurriedly he picked up the snowshoes and stowed them on his shoulder. With the cottonwood behind him, he began to walk due eastward, the direction pointed by the lengthening shadows. He was just emerging from the grove, still uncertain of his way, when, prompted by some obscure impulse, he stopped, looked back, and saw it. The monstrous black thing staring at him from the tree. He threw down the snowshoes and ran. He ran all the way home. Almost. Just before he reached it, the boy slowed to a halt. Turning, he began to retrace his steps. He believed he was going back for the snowshoes. He believed he would stay only long enough to retrieve them from where they had fallen, before dashing home to the safety of his family. He was wrong. Across the miles of snow and ice, through the bleak December woods, a call had come. He had been summoned. The boy told no one of what he had seen. The next day he returned again drawn back to the secret place to gaze aghast and wonderstruck at what lived there. Once again the thing rolled up its cold, unblinking eye to stare at him, and nothing moved, and not a word was spoken, and nothing broke the silence of those woods. The next day was the same. So was the next, and the next, and the one that followed. On the seventh day it killed him, Afterward, it gave him back his life, but twisted now, corrupted, irrevocably altered. The boy fell prostrate to the mud and worshipped it. He came to it each night throughout the spring and summer to gaze and chant and sacrifice. The last time that he came to it, it spoke to him. 
It opened its fleshless black jaws, and just before it died, it told him in great detail exactly what it wanted him to do. Book One Portents It has long been my conviction that, were an absolute and unremitting evil to find embodiment in human form, it would manifest itself not as some hideous ogre or black-caped apparition with glowing eyes, but rather as an ordinary-looking mortal of harmless, even kindly, mien, a middle-aged matron, perhaps, or a schoolboy, or a little old man. Nicholas Keyes, Beneath the Moss Boston, East Side Tract Society, 1892 May 1st The city lies throbbing in the sunlight. From its heart a thin black thread of smoke coils lazily toward the sky. April is almost thirteen hours dead. Already the world has changed. In a park above the Hudson the old one waits, blinking his mild eyes at the sun. Insects plunge and dart around the refuse by the water's edge and buzz amid the grass beside the bench. But for their hum, the lap of oily waters, and the swish of passing cars, the park is still, the air hushed and expectant. A cry from overhead breaks the silence, three long, tremulous notes, and then the bird is gone. Leaves rustle softly, one branch at a time. The old one sits forward and holds his breath. Soon it will happen. A sudden breeze sweeps up from the river. Blood-red blossoms scatter at his feet. The pages of an old newspaper shift and curl, revealing smudged boot prints, a naked leg, a jagged slash. Above him trees hiss urgently in the wind. With a flash of green the leaves lift together and point toward the city. All the grass leans one way. In the distance the coil of smoke whips back and forth, then twists in upon itself. Silently its black tip sways against the sky, splitting into a serpent's tongue. The old one licks his lips. It is beginning. All the way from New York, as the bus sped through the gassy haze of the Lincoln Tunnel, humming with Sunday morning traffic, past the condos and diners and car lots that lined the highway, Jeremy Frears had been thinking about the farm. The ad had been enticingly vague, nothing but a three-by-five recipe card with a row of bright green vegetables printed along one side. It had been tacked to the bulletin board just above the table, where he usually sat at the Voorhees Foundation Library, on West 23rd Street, as if left there for him alone. The handwriting had been neat and somehow girlish-looking. Summer Rental, Private Guest House on New Jersey Farm, Fully Electrified, Quiet Surroundings, Ninety Dollars a Week, Including Meals, RFD-1, Box 63, Gilead. At that price, if he could manage to sublet his apartment, a fourth-floor walk-up on Bank Street, he would actually make himself some money on the summer, and it seemed to him that quiet surroundings were exactly what he needed right now. It would probably mean a couple of months of celibacy, of course, but that wasn't much different from what he'd been going through this spring. It also meant he'd be able to forget the fact that he'd be turning thirty. There'd be no need to suffer through the celebration his friends were so keen on having, the lavish dinner at some place expensive, followed by booze and slaps on the back. Well, he would just have to celebrate out there on the farm, away from civilization, like Thoreau. Probably be good for him, concentrate his mind on more important things. There was also his thesis to think about, the something-something-something of the Gothic imagination. He would figure it out eventually. Focus on the participant observer, maybe, or the interplay of setting and character, or, even more promising, setting as character. 
He was sure it would come to him. These things usually did. Meanwhile, he'd be reading up on the subject. The primary sources, Lefanu, Lewis, and the rest, making notes for a course he'd be teaching next fall, and who could tell, perhaps for years to come. To spend a summer among books, it was an appealing prospect. So was the notion of escaping from the city this year, from the three flights of echoing stairs that, even after twice that many summers, left him panting and sweaty by the time he'd reached the top, from his claustrophobic little bedroom, the second-hand air conditioner churning endlessly in the window, blocking the view of the street, and maybe most important of all, escape from the inevitable memories of a certain Laura Rubenstein, who had shared that bedroom with him for so much of last summer, and whose moving out at the end of it had been responsible for, among other things, the abandonment of a planned trip to England, the loss of a lucrative teaching assignment at Queensborough Community College because of Freer's erratic attendance and, as the department head had noted, insufficient classroom preparation, and the habit of stuffing himself with food as he sat up reading late into the night, alone in his apartment, resulting in a gain of twenty pounds by winter's end and the drastic alteration of Freer's wardrobe. He still missed Laura. For a while he'd actually believed she'd be his second wife, the one who'd proved that, whatever mistakes he had made in the past, this time around he'd get it right. There'd been a couple of other women since her, but no one he'd really cared about. Three weeks ago, on the day of Laura's marriage to an old boyfriend with a family house in Sag Harbor, and tenure at NYU. Frears had written to the box number in Gilead, asking for more information, and suggesting today, the first of May, for a possible visit. He had already discovered that the town was too small for most maps of the state. Except for one highly detailed geological survey map he'd found at Voorhees. But Hunterdon County Transport operated a twice-a-day bus service from the Port Authority, which, upon request, made a detour to the town. The reply had come less than a week later. It was written in the same girlish hand on lined yellow paper, obviously drawn from a legal pad. Three photographs had also been enclosed. Dear Mr. Frears, My husband and I were pleased to get your letter, and will be happy to have you come out on May Day and see our place. The Sunday bus arrives in Gilead shortly after two, and will let you off across the street from the cooperative. That will be closed when you arrive, but there's a bench on the porch where you can wait, and my husband will be by in the truck to pick you up as soon as services are over. You shouldn't have to wait long, and we'll see that you get back to town in time for the return bus. The guest house is one of our outbuildings. It is newly renovated and electrified, and though you can't see it in the photograph, we will be putting new screens on all the windows. The left half of the building is used as a storeroom, but you should find the right half more than ample for your needs. There is a brand new bed, a wardrobe, a set of shelves, and a spare table you can use as a writing desk. Your work sounds very interesting. At one time my husband and I considered teaching as a career. We are not fancy people, but I can promise you three square meals a day, well prepared, just as we ourselves eat. Our farm is not yet a fully working one, we purchased it only in November. But by this summer we expect to be eating our own produce. We are lifelong members of the Brethren of the Redeemer, a religious order with adherents all over the world, though most of its membership is concentrated here in Gilead, with other settlements in Pennsylvania and New York. Both my husband and I have attended college outside the community. We welcome the interest of those outside the faith and do not impose our beliefs on anyone. We have no telephone, so if you cannot come to see us on May Day, please let us know in writing as soon as possible. If we don't hear from you, we'll assume you're coming, and Sar will be there to pick you up. But I see I'm repeating myself. So in closing, I look forward to meeting you and hearing about life in New York. Sincerely, Mrs. Deborah Poroth P.S. Jeremiah is our prophet and so your name strikes me as a very good omen. Frears had read the letter with the rest of his mail on the subway up to Columbia. 
he'd found something charming about the woman's tone. It was like getting a message from a pen pal in another country, complete with three exotic snapshots. Yet as he'd scrutinized the photos, tilting them forward and back in the subway's glare, he'd felt a faint twinge of nervousness. The pictures were in color, but for that they would not have been out of place in some long-forgotten album of the past. The first showed a dirt road bordered by woods, with pale winter sunlight slanting through pine boughs and the leafless branches of an oak. In a clearing on the left stood a small white clabbered house with an open porch in front, nearly level with the road, and a line of thorn bushes making twisted shapes against one side. The porch was bare save for two narrow wooden chairs, one of them empty, the other occupied by a woman in a long black dress, her dark hair tied back in a knot, her face masked by shadows. On her lap rested something small and yellow, with a second at her feet. Squinting at the photo, Frears saw that they were kittens. The woman was sitting straight in the chair, staring directly ahead. The whole scene seemed touched with the stillness and silence of a hopper painting. Behind the house lay a tiny fenced-in garden, though neither flowers nor vegetables were in evidence. The picture looked as if it had been taken on a winter afternoon. Frears hoped to find the place a good deal greener now. He could see beyond the trees an open field broken only by clumps of weed and sporadic knots of bramble. At its edge stood further pine and oak, rising in a dense forest. The second picture showed another portion of the field, an arid patch of reddish earth and stubble. A small brook glistened blurrily along the distant edge. In the center of the picture stood a slim, bearded man, somewhat Lincoln-esque in appearance, posed stiffly with a rake in his hand, like a rustic in an ancient woodcut. By his feet crouched a fat gray cat, glowering at the camera. The man was clean-shaven above a fringe of dark beard. He wore a vest, homespun-looking black trousers, and a somewhat wrinkled, collarless white shirt. He looked around forty. His face was pale and his expression somber, but Frears thought he detected a hint of a smile at the corners of his mouth, perhaps for whoever held the camera. The third photo was slightly darker than the others, as if taken when evening approached. At the edge of the picture stood the rear wall of the farmhouse, while squatting in the center was a low gray cinder block structure reminiscent of an army barrack. It appeared to have two entrances, a glass-paneled door near each end. Freer suspected that it was a converted henhouse. Beyond its roof rose a dark line of treetops where the woods began. The building faced away from them, looking out upon the lawn. The grass grew right up to the doorways without a trace of path, as if, till now, no one had had occasion to approach it. Most of the brickwork in front was concealed beneath a dense growth of ivy, which had already spread over the rims of the windows. These were bare and very wide, allowing a view completely through to the back, where the trunks of massive trees cut out the light. Even on the crowded subway, there'd been something about the scene that had disturbed him. He still wasn't sure what it was. The photos, with their air of isolation, were like souvenirs of another world, removed in time or space, early settlers maybe, or backwoods Maine. It was hard to believe that they'd been taken only recently in New Jersey, in a spot less than fifty miles from New York. A month ago, his picture of Jersey had been compounded of a long-ago rock concert in the Meadowlands he'd let his wife drag him to, a disastrous interview in Newark during his leaner postgraduate years, to teach, of all things, black English to inner-city youths, and several metro-liner trips to visit friends of Laura's in Washington. He'd always imagined the state as one vast slum, gray with swamp gas and pollution, populated by ghetto dwellers and gangsters. Somewhere beyond it, outposts of light, lay the monastic seclusion of Princeton and the boardwalks of Atlantic City all taffy stands, convention halls, and casinos. Along its eastern edge, just across the river from New York, stretched a wasteland of oil tanks and marsh water, 
lit up redly here and there, deep into the night by tiny sputtering flames. But he'd been wrong. For the past weeks he'd been reading about the state, his interest piqued by the photos. It appeared that there was real wilderness out here after all, with deer, foxes, rattlesnakes, even a few bears. There were the pine barrens to the south, over a thousand square miles of them, where a man could walk all day without seeing a sign of civilization. The books told of places down there that outsiders never heard of, tiny little villages completely cut off from the rest of the state, with nothing but a church and a general store, with one or two gas pumps out front. There were ghost towns, too, and towns with names like Hog Wallow and Long A-Coming, and towns with dialects all their own. Some of them weren't even on the map. To the west lay the Delaware Valley. There'd been a piece on it in natural history, where in a certain hollow just upriver from Philadelphia, one could still find relics of idols the Indians worshipped. In the hill country north of it rose Takasaw Ridge, riddled with a network of hidden caverns. Hikers had found queer words and symbols carved into the rocks, but no one had managed to puzzle out their meaning, or even what language they were in. Some of the towns were still just names to him, names like West Portal and Winterman and Vineland, which billed itself as the witchcraft center of America. Others came complete with odd histories, Munson with its string of unsolved murders, and Red Cliff with its devil museum, and Bud Lake with its reports, back in the forties, of a chanting heard on certain nights, echoing over the water. There had been similar reports ten years later of a chanting near the Jersey City docks, and rumors of stone objects, ancient ceremonial artifacts, the local papers called them, unearthed during excavations for the stadium in the Meadowlands. And then there were the religious communities, pockets of ignorance, to judge by the descriptions, bearded men, black-robed women, and a polite fuck you to strangers. It was astonishing that such places had survived, and on the doorstep of one of the biggest cities in the world. But then, isolation, he'd come to realize, was also a state of mind, and an insignificant little village might easily be overlooked, except when, now and then, some journalist heard about it and decided it was quaint enough to warrant a photo and a few inches of copy. Frears had read how, in May of 1962, the Times had discovered one such religious community near New Providence. Its existence had never been a secret. It had simply been ignored. Until one morning New Yorkers had picked up their papers, and there it was, a town that looked much as it had in the late 1800s, when it was first settled. The old religion, the customs, the special schools for the children, they'd all survived unchanged. Farm work was done entirely by hand. Town worship was held every evening. Women still wore long dresses with high collars. And all this less than thirty miles from Times Square. These places were real. A few, it was said, had even had stone walls around them once. Places such as Harmony and Mount Jordan, and Zion and Zarephath, with round-the-clock Bible talk on the radio places such as Gilead, his destination. Kenilworth, Mountainside, Scotch Plains, Dunellen. They themselves seemed far from Jersey, names out of Waverley novels, promising vistas of castles, highland waterfalls, and meadows dotted with flocks of grazing sheep. But the signboards lied, the books had lied, the times had lied. The land here was one vast and charmless suburb, and as the bus passed through it, speeding west across the state, Frears saw before him only the flat gray monotony of highway, broken from time to time by gas stations, roadhouses, and shopping malls that stretched away like deserts. The bus was warm, and the ride was beginning to give him a headache. He could feel the backs of his thighs sweating through his chinos. Easing himself farther into the seat, he pushed up his glasses and rubbed his eyes. The scenery disappointed him, yet it was still an improvement over what they'd just come through. Back there on the fringes of the city, 
Every work of man seemed to have been given over to the automobile, in an endless line of showrooms and repair shops for mufflers, fenders, carburetors, ignitions, tires, brakes. Now at last he could make out hills in the distance, and extended zones of green, though here and there the nearness of some larger town or development meant a length of highway lined by construction, billboards touting banks or amusement parks, and drive-in theaters, themselves immense blank billboards, their signs proclaiming horror movies, family pictures, softcore porn. A speedway announced that next Wednesday was ladies' night. Food stands offered pizza burgers, chicken in the basket, fish and chips. Too bad the bus wasn't stopping. He'd wolfed down an omelet two hours ago, standing in the kitchen of his apartment, but he was already hungry again. With a sigh, he turned back to his reading. He had brought a manila envelope, bulging with photocopied articles from Sight and Sound and Cahiers du Cinéma, enough for him to fake his way through still another week's installment of the film course he was teaching at the new school. Luckily, that bunch wasn't hard to stay ahead of. Art students, mostly, on transfer from Parsons, satisfying their English requirement by sitting through a dozen or so old movies. The bus was nearly empty, and he had a pair of seats to himself. No need to make halting conversation with some ignoramus who hadn't brought along a magazine to read. Around him all the other riders looked like Jersey types, blank-faced men and women in dowdy clothes, off on mysterious Sunday afternoon errands. Farther forward sat two teenage boys cradling knapsacks and caps, a fat woman and her equally fat daughter clutching shopping bags, an old man chattering non-stop to the driver, and one lone young woman whose face betrayed nothing, probably on her way to meet a lover, he decided, or returning from some wild night in New York. Toward the rear a large black woman gazed impassively ahead, already looking out of place. White folks country here. In the row in front of him a pale red-haired youth with an armed forces duffel bag was fiddling with his radio, not a suitcase-sized monstrosity like the black kids carried, or the tinny little transistor Frears himself owned, but a solid gray plastic thing Souvenir of some PX. A song by Devo had just ended in a burst of static, and a voice announced the time. 12.57 in WABC land. They were passing another industrial park now, its wide black lots deserted for the weekend. An electronics firm, a cannery. A forbidding-looking plant labeled Chemtex. To the west the sky was nearly cloudless, flooding the bus with sunlight. Hot for May. Perhaps a promise of worse to come. The Poroth's ad had mentioned electricity, but would that include air conditioning? Unlikely. But he supposed it would be good to be a little warm, sweat the pounds away. He felt the bus slow slightly and saw a sign for Somerville approaching in the distance. He remembered the map he'd studied. They were halfway across the state. Now, gradually, there was a change in the land. At first it was only evident in the stores along the road. A farm supply house with burlap sacks of feed and grain piled against the porch. A tractor showroom. A sporting goods outlet with advertising placards for guns and ammunition in the window. Then, here and there, an occasional well-tended farm set far back from the highway the distant farmhouse seeming to turn slowly as the bus went past, the trees or fence posts along the roadside flashing by in a blur. The land was greener now, the acres of asphalt and angry-looking rust-red earth receding into the east. He felt something in him quicken. On the radio one row ahead, the electrified pastoral of Jethro Tull was fading beneath a shrill insect-like buzz, and the youth twisted the dial to something else. Then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem, the radio said, to go into the land of Benjamin, to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. They were moving deeper into the country. He had never spent time in the country before. Where he'd grown up, in Astoria, northern Queens, there'd been playgrounds, 
empty lots, little green patches of lawn, but nothing that hinted of real nature, nothing for a boy to explore. It was a neighborhood where Cub Scouts had learned to read subway maps, where the closest things to wildlife were pigeons and gray squirrels. The only open land, besides LaGuardia Airport to the north, had been Flushing Meadows Park and a cluster of enormous treeless cemeteries where various Freers, Freiriker, and Bodenheim relatives lay buried. The park had been the site of two world's fairs. It was mostly grass now, but a few of the pavilions remained, and Shea Stadium occupied its northern half. As a boy, Frears had spent hours sitting in a favorite tree beside one of the artificial ponds, watching planes come in and out of LaGuardia. They'd come in all night as well, one every few minutes until early morning. On summer nights, standing on the roof of his apartment building, he could look to the right and see the Bronx Whitestone Bridge glowing in the distance, and the Triborough to the left, with the lights of Manhattan behind it. A central Con Ed power plant had stood just a mile and a half away, a monstrous thing with five huge smokestacks, like some great beached ocean liner, and he'd always believed that it made the electricity for all those lights. The planes had been beautiful, winking in the darkness, and the noise hadn't bothered him much. He'd grown up with it. Manhattan, when he'd moved there after college, had seemed almost quiet by contrast. Paradoxically, like so many other children in New York, he'd grown up with the idea that what he loved best was the country. Phrases like the dark woods, the forest primeval, and the wide open spaces had made him shiver with longing. He'd felt an inexplicable nostalgia at the pictures of farms and mountains in his school books. Even a poster of bland, brown, Smokey the Bear was capable of moving him. At age six, he had wandered through the parking lot behind his house, stamping out cigarette butts, convinced he was helping prevent forest fires. Later, in junior high school, he'd been certain he wanted to be a forest ranger when he grew up. So had nearly half the class. He had imagined himself sitting all day in some solitary tower, reading stacks of books, gazing through binoculars from time to time, then slipping down the ladder, beardless young Jewish St. Francis, to check up on the bears and feed the deer. Now, for all he knew, he was heading toward that very world, or at least that world's domesticated neighbor, and he was beginning to feel a little less certain of its rewards. The bus had left the highway back in Somerville and had already made half a dozen stops in small towns and roadside depots. Clover Hill, Montgomery, Raritan Falls, Bastions of silence and boredom, where, on a Sunday afternoon in May, not a soul was to be seen except the occasional tall, scowling man, or hard-eyed woman in a pickup truck or station wagon, waiting for a passenger to disembark. These were towns without drug stores or banks, towns where the nights were for sleeping, and homes went dark early. Kids here, he supposed, would build backyard tree houses and fortresses in the woods. They would join 4-H clubs save up for their first rifles, and spend their teenage evenings driving up and down back roads, following their headlights while the roadbed bumped and dipped beneath their wheels. He tried to imagine a place like Gilead, tucked away up one of those roads, hidden in the less settled part of the county, in a region of woodland and marsh. Unlike the towns he'd just passed through, it would be truly self-contained, turned inward its inhabitants wary of the shopping centers and uninterested in their rural neighbors. For the first time, he could see how such a place might survive, even in a county as fast-growing as Hunterdon. It would need little from the rest of the world, nor would it offer much. Outsiders would have no reason to visit, unless, like him, they deliberately sought it out. Those born into the community would never leave it. All their friends and relations would be nestled right there beside them. The land would thus be locked up tight, the area closed to newcomers, and, considering the religion practiced there, closed to new ideas as well. TV might be regarded as the devil's tool. Telephones, for all he knew, might also be proscribed. 
Certainly the poorest did without one. Yet even if they'd had a phone, how useful could it be if there was no one outside town to call? Lines of communication meant nothing if they weren't used, and these would not be. So Gilead would live on in its isolation, following its own peculiar paths until, in the course of time, it would simply be ignored, overlooked, and he wondered if in fact this were already true, all but forgotten. I brought you into a plentiful country, the radio was saying, the words sing-song as if from years of repetition, to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. For the dozenth time he considered changing his seat. The youth one seat ahead of him, hunched glassy-eyed over the dials, had turned the volume down at Freer's request but the preacher still sounded as if he were speaking at the top of his voice. It was a Bible station out of Zarephath, and hot for Jeremiah. The town lay miles to the east, but the voice, though strident, had an unsettling intimacy about it, as if the man himself were crouched just inches from Freer's face. He could almost smell the gamey breath and feel the spray against his skin. He'd had his fill of Jeremiah's, all this fire and spit and brimstone was beginning to give him a headache. But he felt curiously reluctant to ask the youth to turn the volume down again. Superstition, maybe. In a country of believers, you didn't interfere. And there was a kind of fascination to the rhythm of the words, even if their meaning was a mystery. It was like listening to a recording of one of Hitler's speeches. Besides, he liked the idea that people out here made so much of Jeremiah. He'd never cared much for his name before. The Poroth woman had commented on it, the coincidence of names. He wondered what she and her husband would be like, and what they'd think of him. The woman, at least, sounded eager for company. Reaching into the pocket of his jacket on the seat beside him, he withdrew the envelope containing her letter and the snapshots. He studied her face in the photo, holding it up to the sunlight streaming down beside him. It was hard to tell for sure. Maybe it was just his lonely imagination. But she looked rather pretty, and younger than she'd first appeared. Maybe he should start thinking of her as Deborah. The husband? Rather gloomy looking. Not much humor there. But of course he was still little more than a cipher. He looked at the third photo. This screened-in former chicken coop was where, quite possibly, he'd be spending the summer. It looked serviceable enough, yet there was something about it. He'd felt it from the start, something that disturbed him. Perhaps it was the all-enveloping ivy, or the squat shape of the roof, or the way the shingled eaves hung low over the doorways, or, yes, that was it, the windows. The windows in the back. They were too big, and too near the trees, and the trees seemed to press toward them in a way he didn't like. While the front windows looked out upon a comfortable expanse of lawn bathed by the pale rays of a late afternoon sun, those in back seemed to open on another world, a twilight of tangled branches and shadowy black forms. They offer no protection, he decided. Later he would wonder what had prompted such a thought, and what there was to be protected from. But at this moment, with the photo before him and the bus bearing him toward that very scene, all such questions fell before a single overriding conviction. It isn't right to build a house so close against the woods. Its outskirts had become the haunt of bargain hunters, a busy region of shopping centers and showrooms. But the town of Flemington was quiet on this Sunday afternoon, though cars still lined the parking lots of the churches at the edge of the business district. Farther up the street, the bus stopped before a red brick card and candy shop. New Jersey lottery stickers on the window and commercial notices fluttering from a bulletin board by the door. Several passengers filed off, the youth with the radio among them. The lone, attractive girl had long since disappeared into one of the small towns back down the road. 
With a hiss of air brakes, the bus continued on past the venerable white pillars of the Union Hotel, then a bakery, odd star-shaped loaves in the window, a real estate office with its shades drawn, and the old county courthouse, beyond whose worn stone steps the killer of the Lindbergh baby had been tried. At the end of the street stood the offices of a local daily, the Hunterdon County Home News. Next to them, a funeral parlor's awning reached toward the sidewalk. The bus followed the main road as it curved westward, the stores and municipal buildings giving way to handsome suburban houses with gables, ornate shutters, and broad, well-tended lawns, which in turn gave way to freshly plowed fields, pastures where cattle grazed, and occasional patches of woods. Abruptly the bus veered north, leaving the main road for a narrower one, that twisted between tall hedges like the footpath it may once have been. It wound past small, shaded bungalows, half hidden by trees and secretive little lanes where foliage blocked the view ahead. Down one of these the bus turned, branches scraping at its sides. The lane cut through a stand of cottonwoods and over a gentle, sparsely forested rise choked with ground ivy and brambles. Beyond it, winding away from each side of the road until they were lost amid the trees, ran what appeared to be the ruins of an ancient stone wall. As the bus passed through them, Frears felt as if he were trespassing onto private ground. The way continued through a lane of cottonwoods and maples that looked as if they'd been there for centuries. Behind them stood a succession of dark shingled houses, three on one side, four on the other. Dwellings without ornament, obviously old, with lawns trimmed neatly and glimpses of gardens in back. Just past them the road suddenly widened and came to an end at another running perpendicular to it, forming a T. Facing the intersection stood a rambling white clabbered building with a wide front porch and a post office sign by the doorway. Behind it, and apparently attached, rose the tall rust-red pillar of a grain silo and the black gambrel roof of a barn, its weathered shingles curling in the sunlight. The bus slowed as it came into the intersection and pulled noisily up to the building, in front of it Frears could see three old-fashioned gas pumps, and along one side what appeared to be a loading area, with broad ramps leading up to a garage adjoining the barn. By one of the doorways stood a dusty little tractor and a wagon piled high with bags of grain. An empty pickup truck was parked ahead, near the pumps, with another parked farther back, in the shadow of the barn. Both trucks looked decades old, like the car he'd noticed in a driveway down the street. Their paintwork was dark, lacking all decoration and chrome. No one was about. The porch was empty save for a straight-backed wooden bench. The front door was closed, the windows shuttered, the place as quiet and deserted as an empty film set. There were no street signs to be seen, not even a sign above the building, and there'd been no words of welcome down the road but Frears knew, even before the bus driver turned and announced the name, that at last he'd reached Gilead. The bus left him standing alone before the store, holding his jacket and his envelope of clippings. As Deborah Porth's letter had warned, there was no one to meet him, and as he turned to look around, he felt marooned. Across the street, set well back from the road behind a line of massive oaks, stood a building that he guessed to be a school, a square red brick structure with a patchy brown playing field beside it and two lonely seesaws in front. At the opposite corner on a piece of ground slightly higher than the rest stood a little cemetery, old but obviously well tended, though here and there a tombstone was askew, like trees after a storm. The sound of the bus's engine faded beyond the curve of the road, leaving a silence broken only by the buzzing of insects and the occasional cry of a bird. Frears hadn't really expected the town to be this small. He'd expected at least a town center, some place for the populace to meet. Yet except for the schoolhouse, back behind the trees, 
there appeared to be no civic buildings of any kind, not even a Grange Hall or an American Legion post. What surprised him most of all was the absence of a church. From where he stood he could see nothing but well-scrubbed houses bordering both sides of the road, and maples and oaks whose new foliage looked cool against the burning blue sky. The treetops receding into the distance toward a line of low green hills. The skyline was unbroken by either a golden cross or a slim white steeple. Perhaps services were held in some simple one room tabernacle concealed behind a bend in the road. Turning with a sigh toward the clabbered building, obviously the cooperative mentioned in the letter, though for a store it was curiously bare of window placards and advertising. He climbed the steps to the front porch, wishing there were somewhere around to take a pee. The bench did not look comfortable and wasn't. Above him, as he sat, he noticed a row of ominous-looking iron hooks protruding from a beam in the porch ceiling, probably where they hung the sinners. He wondered briefly what sins lay on his own head. He sat for a few minutes, savoring the silence. He was going to like this place, if the farm was as quiet as the town. Who knows, even boredom might be welcome. Tedium as therapy, the uses of ennui. Time as a function of... He was already beginning to feel drowsy. All those hours on the bus, and now this heat and solitude. It took a lot out of a body. His bladder was full, though, and there seemed little likelihood there'd be a bathroom handy. Typical that he hadn't thought to go back there on the goddamned bus. Opposite him by the schoolyard, a line of oaks made patterns of shade along the roadside, inviting, but he'd be too conspicuous there. Past the farther corner the stone slabs of the cemetery stood bathed in sunlight. Behind them rose secluded clumps of trees. That was the likeliest place, Besides, there might be some interesting old tombstones. Do some rubbings there some day. At least it would help pass the time. He strolled down the porch steps and across the street. Climbing the slope to the cemetery, he felt self-conscious. What if they didn't like strangers walking over Great Granddaddy's head? That probably wasn't the case, though. People around here would be proud of these things, of how far back their families went. Here was one, for example. He stood looking down at a small white headstone that the years had worn almost smooth. Ephraim Lint, who died 1887 in the sixty-third year of his life. That wasn't as far back as he'd expected. Obviously, you couldn't go by the condition of the stone. The white ones tended to weather more. Nearby he saw an older one that had held up better. Johann Sturtevant, called to his maker 1833, aged 51. His dutiful wife, Cora, joined with him in heaven 1870, aged 78. Jesus, a widow for almost forty years, and in a place like this. Farther back stood a small stand of willows, and behind them a scraggly hedgerow, he approached them, unzipping his fly, and let loose a splattering yellow arc on the base of one tree. Insects circled round in protest. Off to the right he could see the assemblage of headstones regarding him like an audience. Buckhalter, Stoudemir, Van Meer. But there was no one to see him but the ghosts of the dead. And surely they were tolerant, envious even. How long had it been since his citified cock had been touched by actual sunlight? Damn, but this place felt healthy. Zipping up, and with nothing to flush, he wandered back to the graves. Slowly he made his way through the aisles, stopping at intervals to read the inscriptions on the older stones. Their quietude, the sense of souls and bodies in repose, had begun to make him drowsy again. Many of the stones had faces on them or angels' heads, or skulls. Some of the more modern ones had willows, like the one he'd just watered. There were also smaller headstones for children. 
Picturing the tiny wooden coffins, Frias tried to imagine how parents must have felt in an era when half the population died in childhood. Maybe in those days they didn't mind so much. Often married couples shared a single stone, but a number of others were in pairs, one for the husband, one for the wife, as if in life they'd slept apart and now saw no reason to change. Here lay the Van Meers, Rachel and Jan, their gravestones side by side like bedboards. On hers, 1845 to 1912. Such as I am, thus shalt thou be. Just a cheery little reminder. And Hubby, 1826 to 1906. Let this to thee a warning be. Quickly thou must follow me. Not something he felt like thinking about right now. Later, maybe. He moved farther down the row, wiping sweat from the back of his neck. Maybe it was the sun that made him tired. Butterflies flitted between the tombstones. Bees poked among the tall grasses along the bottom of the hill. He looked once more toward the store across the street. The door was still shut. No one had returned. Near the end of the row, he stooped to puzzle out another inscription. The stone was of slate, and chipped almost beyond reading. Getting up again required too much effort. Dropping his jacket and envelope, he sat himself on the grass and stretched his legs, his feet merging with the shadow of the adjoining monument. It was the largest object in the row, a dark four-sided column whose top was jagged and oblique yet obviously sculpted that way, as if to suggest that the shaft had been broken off. He craned his head back to read the words. The thing appeared to commemorate an entire family, a way of saving money, perhaps. You left a little space after the names, and one by one, as the people dropped off, you added the years they died. Isaiah Trout, 1839 to 1877 Hannah Trout, 1845 to 1877. They had died the same year. Well, sometimes grief did that to people. Was it happier that way, or even sadder? His eyes felt heavy. He lay back in the sunlight, cradling his head in the grass, and squinted up at the rest of the names. Their children. Ruth, 1863 to 1877. Tabitha, 1865 to 1877. Amos, 1866 to 1877. Absalom, 1868. Tamar, 1871 to 1877. Leah. 1873 to 1877. Tobias, 1876 to 1877. Odd. They all had died that year. Some sort of disaster, maybe. Plague, flood, famine in the land. His eyes closed. Sunlight beat against the lids, while blades of grass brushed his cheek. For a moment he had a vision of long-lost souls with funnily spelled names. Just as sleep claimed him, he recalled something else that had been odd. They had left out the death year for the one called Absalom. Idly, in a final thought, he wondered what it meant. Maybe Absalom had simply died the same year he was born. Poor kid, he thought, and slept. Wind sweeps in gusts across the Hudson, carrying the scent of oil from the Jersey shore. Oil and a burning, and the strange, sweet, far-off scent of roses. No one has noticed. No one but the plump little figure perched unobtrusively at the end of the bench. A battered old umbrella by his side. No one else is watching. No one would understand. No one sees the patterns in the water, 
or smells the corruption beneath the flower scent, or hears the secret sound the grass makes when the wind dies. Once more the air grows still. Small green moths flit among the weeds. Hornets buzz thirstily around a barrel of refuse. No one could guess what is happening. The river rolls past the park unobserved. The planet rolls through space, unsuspecting. The old one's squat black shadow lengthens on the bench. In the shadow, shielded from the afternoon sun, a baby sleeps peacefully, its tiny olive face protruding from a tight cocoon of blanket. A woman, presumably its mother, sits slumped beside it, head fallen forward, eyes sunken and shut tight, skeletal arms hanging like dead things at her sides. On the ground beneath her lies a crumpled paper bag from which the neck of a bottle emerges. The cap has long since rolled into the grass. Except for the three figures on the bench, this area of the park is almost deserted. The only movement comes from near the trash barrel, where a pair of glossy yellow jackets rise and dip in ceaseless search for food. His face impassive, the old one watches as one of the insects slips from sight behind the rim and falls greedily upon some rotting thing within. The other circles round the spot in ever-widening arcs, until, having flown as far as the bench, it pauses above the paper bag, tiger stripes thrashing furiously beneath a blur of wings. Settling atop the bottle, it disappears inside. Suddenly the air changes. He can feel it. Whispering the second of the seven names, the old one turns his gaze toward the river, the farther shore and the shadowy hills beyond. Strange clouds have appeared on the horizon. Part two of the sequence is almost complete. He sits poised, ready, rigid with anticipation. In a moment. In a moment. A small green moth flutters past his face and comes to rest on the back of his hand. Feebly its wings open and close. Open. Close. Then at last fall open and lie still. All movement ceases. At the far end of the bench the woman's head falls back as if in a dream she has offered her throat to the knife. A small bubble of saliva grows and bursts at her lips. Her mouth opens like a rose. High overhead a white bird wheels erratically in its flight and falls screaming toward the Hudson. The signs are all about him now. It is time. The old one sings the death song to himself and shivers with exultation. He has been waiting more than a lifetime for this, waiting and planning and readying himself for what he has to do. Now the moment is at hand, and he knows that the years of preparation have not been in vain. Above the park the sky remains a blinding blue, the sun glares mercilessly down. With a metallic gleam the second yellow jacket lifts from its feast and comes spiraling toward the woman on the bench to hover inches from her gaping mouth. From the empty bottle the other insect rises buzzing toward the baby's face. Mother and child sleep on. The old one regards them silently, watching the slow rise and fall of the woman's chest, the hollow cheeks and ravaged flesh, the infant in its mindless sleep. Here it lies, in all its glory, humanity. He has plans for it. And now, after a century's contemplation, he is free to act. The future is clear at last. He has heard the strange, piercing cries of the white birds circling overhead. He has read the ancient words chipped into the city's blackened brick. He has seen the foulness at the edge of a young leaf, and the dark shapes that lie in wait behind the clouds. Last night, as he marked the birth of May, standing in solemn observance upon the rooftop of his home, he has seen the horned moon with a star between the tips. There is nothing left to learn. 
flicking the moth from his hand. He reaches for his umbrella, stands up from the bench, and grinds the tiny body into the earth. No longer shielded from the afternoon sunlight, the baby stirs, squints, and opens its eyes. A yellow jacket settles lightly onto its cheek. The other buzzes with interest round a frantically twitching eyelid. Bound within the blanket, the infant struggles helplessly to free its arms. The little mouth opens in a scream. Oblivious, the woman sleeps on. The old one stands watching for a time. Then, with a wintry smile, he turns his footsteps toward the city. The world had darkened. A deep voice was intoning his name. Frears jerked awake, grumpy and scared, to find his head in shadow. For a moment he didn't know where he was. A figure was standing over him, blocking out the sun. Jeremy Frears? He managed a grunt of assent. I'm Sar Poroth. My truck's down there by the road. The man looked as tall as the monument beside him. The sunlight at his back made him hard to see. Still dazed, Frears got to his feet and brushed himself off, then picked up his jacket and papers. Yawning, he rubbed his eyes behind his glasses. I think that bus ride knocked me out. Wishing he were still asleep, he followed Poroth through the rows of tombstones and down the slope toward an old dark green pickup truck parked at the edge of the road. The cooperative across the street was open now, he saw, with several more trucks and autos in the adjoining lot. All were as somber in color, and most of them as antiquated-looking, as the ones he'd seen earlier, like cars in old photographs. The co-op's windows were unshuttered now, with merchandise spilling out the open door, and a balding man with glasses and a fringe of beard was busily dragging straw baskets of sponges, axe handles, rubber boots, and overalls from the doorway onto the porch. It looked like moving day. The porch ceiling was already filled, garlands of clothesline, shiny metal farm implements, and kerosene lanterns dangling like mobiles from the hooks that had looked so ominous before. A stocky mechanic was bent beneath the raised hood of a car parked off to the side of the gas pumps. Frears could hear the regular iron scrape of some tool he was using and, in the distance, the hum of a tractor. Sounds of Civilization He blinked in the sunlight as he followed Poroth toward the truck. His legs still felt stiff from his nap. The screen door across the street swung wide, and two young men, brothers from the look of them, and hardly more than teenagers, emerged from the store carrying mesh bags stuffed with groceries. They couldn't have been more than high school age, yet both, like Poroth, wore beards without mustaches, and dressed in black overalls over collarless white shirts, making them appear almost elderly. They had been talking together with some animation, but fell silent as they saw Frears and Poroth descending from the graveyard across the street. Poroth, ahead of him, raised his hand in greeting. They waved back. The smaller of the two glanced at Frears in surprise, but quickly looked away, following the other down the steps toward one of the parked trucks. The strangeness, a feeling almost of foreignness, lay not so much in how they dressed as in how they moved, they walked closer together than boys in Freer's world, and without the defiant swagger most of them affected. As they climbed into their truck, giving Freer's a last subdued glance over their shoulders, he had the impression that they'd have liked to stare longer, but that it would have been rude, betraying an unseemly curiosity. Such restraint was somehow unnerving. He felt like one of the first Westerners to enter Japan must have felt, being received courteously and correctly, but, it was clear, by people who considered themselves superior. He wished he weren't wearing the chinos and blue work shirt, imitation L.L. Bean that here just looked phony and college boy. 
plus his goddamned gut hanging out. What poorer than the others were wearing, that uncomfortable-looking black-and-white get-up, a virtual uniform, was apparently what real country people wore. Beneath his shirt, Porth's broad back was probably as well-muscled as any of the people Freers knew who hung around six hundred dollar-a-year health clubs, or spent their leisure hours pumping iron at the Y. Though now that he looked at it closely, the shirt itself was sweat-stained and none too clean. Was this the way the man attended church? Poroth patted the metal flank of his beat-up green truck as if it were a farm animal. She probably isn't what you're used to, he said regretfully. Frears expected him to qualify this, to add some assurance of the truck's homely virtues, but the other merely swung himself up into the driver's seat and waited for Frears to climb in beside him. The pair of youths had just pulled out from the parking lot and disappeared up the road in their own truck, and once more the loudest sound to break the quiet was the regular metallic scrape from across the street, where the mechanic labored over his engine. The man paused above some unseen part. Then, as Poroth gunned the pickup's motor, he looked up, his face betraying neither friendliness nor interest. His beard looked somehow incongruous above the grease-stained overalls, a man out of the Bible attempting to pass for modern. Poroth drove fast, either from a desire to impress or a simple impatience to be home. Thanks to the truck's height, Frears enjoyed a commanding perspective of the road ahead. With every unevenness in the surface, the two of them bounced on the springy black seat like cowboys on horseback. Several times Frears found himself reaching out almost surreptitiously to steady himself against the dented metal of the dashboard. He stole a glance at Poroth, whose skin, while rough, seemed surprisingly pale for one who spent most of his day working in the sun. Against the dark beard, his face seemed all the paler. The beard, and the man's sheer size, made it difficult to tell his age. In the photo, he'd looked as old as forty, but Frears now suspected he was as much as a decade younger, perhaps as young as Frears himself. He tried in his imagination to erase the beard from Poroth's chin, and to do the same for the long, obviously home-cut hair. What sort of person would Poroth be in the city? stick him in a three-piece suit, or on the subway with a briefcase beneath his arm, or sipping at a beer in some restaurant near Abingdon Square. No, it didn't work. He just wouldn't fit. He was too tall, too broad of shoulder, too obviously meant for outdoor labor. His very features were too stern, his brow thrust too far forward. There seemed no urban counterpart for him. Horath still hadn't asked him anything about himself, his interests, his impressions. None of the chat that Frears would have offered a Sunday visitor. Had he done something wrong? Maybe Porath had resented his snoozing in the graveyard. "'When you saw me resting back there,' he said, speaking loudly over the sound of the truck, "'I hope it wasn't also the resting place of some relative of yours.' Surprisingly, Poroth didn't answer right away, and he gave Frears a quick, unsettling look. Well, he said at last, the fact is pretty much everyone around here is related in one way or another. It's like a tribe. You know, a limited area with a few extended families. A sociologist would have a field day. Frears heard the complicity in Poroth's voice. He'd been speaking as one educated man to another, and remembered what Deborah had written. Both of us have attended college outside the community. Clearly, Sar didn't want him to forget it. Sounds incestuous. Poroth shrugged. No more than any other tribe. Our order is pretty strict. And there are also brethren living outside of Gilead, so it's not as if we only marry each other. My wife's from Sidon over in Pennsylvania, an even smaller settlement. You met at college? No. We'd met years before that, at a coronal, a kind of planting festival. But we didn't get to see each other again till college. I was at Trenton, 
Deborah spent two years at Page. It's a Bible school. He paused. We've only been back here for six or seven months. Deborah's still learning to fit in. Is fitting in important? Very. Fears felt a stir of interest. I guess she and I will have a lot in common, then. Porth darted him a glance. In what way? We're both newcomers around here. The other mulled this over, frowning. I guess you're right. There are some strong personalities in Gilead, and a few people haven't really accepted her yet. It's all a bit new to Deborah. At this point she's still trying to get all the family straight. There are faces to remember, names and relations. Yes, I saw a lot of those names on the tombstones back there. Sturdivant? Van Meer? That's right. And Reed? Trout? Buckhalter? A few stray Verdocks? That was the stone I fell asleep by, Freer said. Trout. Ah, yes. Porth kept his eyes on the road. Actually, they were a distant branch of my mother's family. She's a Trout, too. But that branch is gone now. They all seem to have died at the same time. Porth nodded. Some kind of fire, I think. The Lord works in strange ways. He fell silent, then as if realizing that this was insufficient. Fire's always been a hazard in the country. These days, though, people around here live pretty much the way everyone else does, and they die of the same things other people do. Heart attacks, cancer, an occasional accident. All the usual things. Of course, they may live a few years longer, what with working hard, breathing clean air, eating food they've grown themselves. Well, I plan to do plenty of hard work this summer, said Frears, settling back. But it'll be more the mental sort. Still, this looks like a healthy place to do it. He patted his belly. Maybe I can even lose a little weight. Poroth smiled. I should warn you. Deborah's a good cook. I hope you're one who struggles against the temptations of the flesh. Frears laughed. No better than the next man, I guess. You know what they say about the best way to get rid of a temptation. He laughed again, and looked over at Poroth. But the other was no longer smiling. They had already passed through a lane of brick houses, square and unadorned, notable only for the absence of children's outdoor toys, junked auto bodies, and whimsical lawn decorations that Frears had seen in front of other rural homes he'd passed today. Many of the houses were bordered by plots of land in earthen rows, dotted here and there with little shoots of green. Children tended garden beside their elders. They waved to Poroth as he went by, eyeing Frears uneasily. A house was under construction, bearded men clinging to the framework like sailors in the rigging of a ship. They too waved, their faces impassive. I see there's no restriction against working on Sunday, said Frears. Far from it. We believe that labor is holy, and all days are sanctified by it. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Amen, Frears said automatically. Though Bible talk merely bored him, like words from a foreign text that had lost in translation some essential meaning. But at least he'd found a reason for the state of Porth's clothes. Every sweat ring was presumably a badge of honor. They had been following the road over a slight rise of land, Poroth gunning the motor to maintain their speed. Now, on the farther side, they passed a sprawling red farmhouse and a barn that looked pegged to the earth by the broad silo beside it. Cattle grazed up and down the slope. "'Prosperous-looking place,' said Frears. "'Verdoc's Dairy,' said Poroth. "'More relations. Lisa Verdoc is my father's sister.' The cattle all faced the same direction, as if in prayer. 
A few were moving idly among the others in what seemed slow motion. The rest were as immobile as creatures on a billboard. Freer's smelling grass and manure breathed deeply. This stuff was supposed to save him. They stand tail to the wind, Poroth was saying. So when they all look east like that, it means good weather. He nodded toward a more imposing house beyond the dairy farm, at the top of a long tree-lined drive. Sturtevant, he said. Brother Yoram has considerable influence in these parts. And does your father have a farm out here too? No. He died ten years ago this fall, and he was never a farmer. He ran the cooperative. So did his father and his father. Now the Stieglers run it, Brother Bert and Sister Amelia. Bert's mother was a Stoudemir, which makes him, let's see, a third cousin once or twice removed. He grinned. See, it gets complicated. Maybe I should just regard everybody as one big happy family. Poroth seemed to consider this a moment. Yes, he said at last. Yes, happy. He nodded, though it seemed as much to himself as to Frears. Frears watched the scenery roll by, the dark fields corduroyed by rows of early corn. So Poroth was taking to the land again after generations in town. That made him, in a way, as unfamiliar with farming as Frears was himself. It was somehow good to hear. They turned right and continued downhill, a shade more steeply now, at the bottom, Porth swung the truck abruptly to the left, the road following a shady, swiftly flowing stream, half hidden from view by trees along its banks. Through the open window, Frears could hear the contented percolation of the water as it passed among the rocks, with a sound like something singing to itself. Side 2. The Ceremonies. Continuing on page 31. Wasakeeg Brook, said Porth raising his voice to be heard. A branch of it runs past our land. They kept to the brook as it wound by straggly orchards, cornfields, and an occasional ancient-looking farmhouse, the sort where strangers knocked on wintry nights and fires blazed within. It felt like a scene in some book from his childhood. Boy, said Frears, I feel as if New York's a thousand miles away. Poroth eyed him quizzically. And is that a good feeling or a bad one? Good, I think. Frears smiled. I'll let you know at the end of the day. The road cut through a stand of beech and cottonwood. Branches snapped against the truck's hood. Leaves flattened themselves against the windshield. Frears moved back from the window as the foliage rushed past. As for me, Poroth said suddenly, a thousand miles away is exactly where I like it. He sounded like a man with something to get off his chest. Even two thousand would suit me just fine. Oh? Frears was still concentrating on the flashing branches. Wouldn't that make getting in and out a little inconvenient? Yes, I imagine it would. But you see, I don't go in and out. I saw the place for the first time around ten years ago, and I've never set foot there since. Uh-oh. For a moment he'd forgotten where he was, among the apple knockers, Garden State variety. These people voted against cities at election time, and probably preached against them, too. Sounds like you had a bad experience. Memorable, anyway. I'll tell you about it sometime. And how old were you then? Let's see. I would have been just seventeen. So Porath was actually younger than he. Hard to believe. And hard to believe a young man of normal curiosity could grow up so close to New York without ever hopping on the bus to see what it was like. It's a big world out there, Sar. Don't you think you ought to give it another chance? Porath shook his head. I've already seen the world, as much as I want to see anyway. I spent seven years out there. 
How many have you spent around here? Why, none, of course, said Frears with a shrug. It's hardly the same thing. I disagree, said Poroth. You've only seen one side of the world. I've seen both. But I'm home now, and it feels right. Home for good? Yes, sir. I intend to die right here in Hunterdon County. And Deborah? Frears said carefully. Does she feel the same? He already suspected that she didn't. No, Deborah's a bit more adventurous than I am. And not so quick to judge, I'll grant her that. She's visited the city a few times, and I can't pretend she shares my feelings about it. I guess it was Deborah, then, who put the ad in the library. Poroth looked blank. What library? The Voris, where I'm doing my research. That's where I saw your ad, on the bulletin board. Poroth took his eyes from the road and turned a suspicious glance on Frears. You mean the notice that Deborah wrote out? That's right. On some kind of recipe card, I think. He shook his head. Impossible. I put it up myself at the bus depot over in Flemington. I wasn't sure at first that we'd want anyone from too far away. You mean from New York? At the time, yes. You see, we'd never done this before. It seemed safer to start with someone who already knew the area. The ad was kind of an experiment. I figured someone passing through Flemington might see it at the bus stop. He paused. That's where I thought you'd seen it. Nope. I'd never been to Flemington in my life before today. He was as much in the dark as Poroth, but found something curiously enjoyable in the other's bewilderment. All I know is I saw it in New York. I guess somebody just decided to move it. Sure, but who? Frears shrugged. Some do-gooder, maybe. Or maybe it was fate. Unless you've got a better idea. Poroth, staring distractedly down the road, fingers drumming on the steering wheel, said nothing. He was still silent when, minutes later, the trees thinned out. Ahead of them the road forked to the right and led onto a crossing. Halfway up a hill, above the opposite bank, guarded at the back by a line of aging cedars, stood a small stone cottage, squat, slate-roofed, and overgrown with vines. Battalions of flowers separated the house from the surrounding expanse of lawn. Additional rows had been planted in front, forming a series of terraced steps that led down to the stream. Spanning the stream, and constructed of the same stone as the cottage, rose the arch of an old stone bridge only wide enough for one car to pass over at a time. Its railings were low and no doubt insubstantial, mere slats of wood. You'd hear them bend and crack before your car went off the edge. But they wouldn't keep you from falling. Frears inadvertently held his breath as the truck rumbled across, but Poroth drove without pause or hesitation, perhaps even with a touch of bravado. On the other side, unexpectedly, he slowed, following the road as it encircled the hill, the cottage from this vantage point looking like a kind of outpost meant to warn those farther inland of encroaching civilization. The flowers that surrounded it were sleeping sentries, ready at any moment to snap to attention. "'Nice-looking little place,' remarked Frears as they were passing. Poroth nodded. "'My mother's.' I expected to see her out in the garden. She's usually there this time of day. He scanned the yard, looking for a sign that she was home, and seemed vaguely troubled when he found none. Or perhaps that business of the ad was still on his mind. What are those things? asked Frears, nodding toward a trio of upright boxes on legs, like midget armoires, that stood in the yard on the side farthest from the stream. Beehives, said Poroth. She even had them when we lived in town. My father and I used to get stung all the time. He shook his head, remembering. 
As the road wound inland now, Frears looked back. Just before the house was lost from view behind a wall of boxwood, he glimpsed something in one of the upstairs front windows. Something that, for all the intervening distance, looked singularly like a face, frowning at them from the darkness. Mrs. Poroth, more than nine years a widow, stood at the top of the stairs, watching the truck till it disappeared up the lane. Sunlight slanted through the small square window panes, setting in relief the rock-hard features, the strong, almost hawk-like nose and masculine jaw, the tiny, sharp lines where the corners of her mouth turned down as if with grief. And she had cause for grief. The vision had been confirmed. Her prophecy had proven correct. Many a woman would have wept. On a normal Sunday afternoon in spring she'd have been outside, silently absorbed over her lilacs and rose bushes. But today, after the hours of worship that had filled the morning, the songs and invocations to the Lord, offered up this week at the home of Brother Amos Reed, she had returned to her cottage and stationed herself by the window, waiting, pale and troubled, for her son's truck to pass, determined to see the visitor it would be bringing before he saw her. And she had seen him. Like one in a dream, she made her way with slow, unthinking footsteps down the ancient staircase and through the lengthening shadows of the front room, moving absently toward the door. Stepping outside, she gazed unsmiling at the garden. A haze had passed before the sun. The countryside lay bathed in amber light. Honeybees poked drowsily among the rows of blossoms spread across the south face of the hill. Framed as she was within the doorway, her hair still black, though touched of late with streaks of charcoal gray, and her shapeless black dress reaching almost to the floor, she seemed the only truly dark thing in the landscape. There was too much to think about now, events too grave to contemplate. Her mind refused for the moment to grapple with them and turned instead, from force of habit, to the mundane concerns of earth and leaf and weather. She surveyed the ranks of blossoms with a practiced eye, the flower beds extending down the slope past scattered clumps of rose bushes and lilacs to the banks of the stream. The season had so far been a warm one, just as she'd foreseen, and all the signs now pointed to a summer of unusual severity. The tulips and hyacinths had already begun to wither on their stalks, and the lavender, she knew, would be opening too early perhaps within the week. She would have to harvest it soon. The lilac bushes, too, had blossomed early, a month ago, in fact, though by tradition they should not have reached their fullness till today, May 1st, the Beltane, sacred, some believe, to Baal's Tyna, the ancient god's sacrificial fire. Legend said that on this day one who bathed in lilac's dew would be granted beauty for a year. The legend held no charm for her. The time of her beauty was past, and she was past mourning it. There was no one on earth that she cared about, not even her only son, Sar. The lilac's time was past as well. Soon they too would wither and turn brown. Stepping from the doorway, the air around her humming with cicadas and bees, she strolled morosely among the ordered rows of flowers. Their lives, though brief, had always been vastly more interesting to her than people's. The crocuses and snowdrops were long dead, and the daffodils dying, but the peonies and baby's breath had just begun to bloom, and a few other species were now at the height of their season. The blue and purple columbines, whose leaves, when grasped, brought courage to the fearful. The delicate pink gilly flowers sprung from Mary's tears, whose petals could be used for divination. The lilies of the valley, born, it was said, from the blood a saint had spilled fighting dragons in the forest, whose cup-shaped blossoms properly prepared were an aid to failing memory. Not that she herself had need of memory aids or courage or divinatory powers. She forgot nothing, feared little, and foresaw far more than she cared to. The Lord, in his harsh wisdom, had singled her out from the rest. 
He had shown her shadows of the future, tormented her with visions of the world to come. He had seen to it that despite what good befell her, she would never be happy for long. It had not always been this way. She had been born with certain gifts, as the brethren called them, a certain wayward talent for prediction or the lucky guess, for reading secret thoughts from people's faces. But such gifts were common to the women in her family. Others before her had known them. They were a small people, the truths, given more to scholarship than farming, which set them apart from the rest of the community. Yet in some ways their strength lay far deeper than the farmers. It had always been, curiously, a female's strength, expressed not in the usual human terms of opposition to nature or in futile attempts to master or control it, but in a kind of day-to-day -day alliance with its laws. Nature had in turn rewarded them, the true women, one or two at least, each generation, had been blessed with certain powers of intuition, as if they were in touch more directly even than the farmers, with aspects of some fundamental process, rainfall and impending winds, vegetation cycle, the changing of the seasons and the moon. Mrs. Poroth remembered her own maternal grandmother, a buckhalter by name, but a trout by descent, who could read approaching weather in a cock-crow or a certain slant of light, and who'd speak familiarly of little signs that others had ignored. It had been a gift beyond her ability to explain. When asked about it, as when still a child, her granddaughter had asked, the old woman would say simply, with an indifferent shrug, that there were other ways of knowing. Mrs. Poroth herself, it was believed, had inherited some of these powers. As a little girl, she'd begun to understand in a primitive way, how to let the world speak to her through the smells and colors of flowers, the shapes of leaves and clouds. But there'd been nothing truly exceptional about her talents, until that summer morning of her thirteenth year, when, on the day after her grandmother's funeral, drawn by some unaccountable impulse to climb the stairs to the old woman's attic, she had discovered the pictures. They had been inside a folder tied with ribbon, crushed beneath a pile of dusty books in the darkest corner of the room. The renderings were crude, the sort of things a bright nine-year-old boy might have produced. They were drawn in luridly colored chalk on cheap rag paper, yellow and cracking around the edges and stiff with age. They looked at least half a century old. Her eyes had widened as she sifted through them. She'd felt the sudden pounding of her heart. Crude though they were, the images had stood out from the cracked and yellowed paper with terrifying clarity. There were twenty-one drawings in all, each on a separate sheet and each in its own way, filling her with inexpressible horror. There was a white bird-like thing with blood upon its breast, dying, a pool of dark water, with the hint of something crouched beneath it. A pale yellow book, fat and somehow repellent, a low earthen mound of odd proportions, and a red satanic-looking sun, and a cold oppressive moon, and a round white shape against a black background that she first took for another heavenly body, a planet or a moon, until suddenly with a shudder she saw it for what it was, a great round lidless eye. Some of the pictures were so queer she couldn't tell what they were meant to be, like the slim black stick-like object, and the things that looked like dogs, only so badly drawn it was hard to be sure, and a pulpy thing that might be a coiled worm, and might be smiling lips, and another figure, small, dark and shapeless, with the half-formed look of dead things and decaying leaves, like a child's attempt to draw some creature he had heard about, but never seen. And with each new image, Impossible memories were stirring. Even the strangest of the pictures, the three concentric circles with the red slash down the middle seemed somehow familiar, in ways almost painful to think about. And there were others even worse. A horrifying scene drawn entirely in white, and another entirely in black, and a hideous thing that may have been a rose, except it had what looked like teeth, and a tree with something in it, a thing that glared and beckoned. She knew that it was beckoning to her. 
The room was tipping forward. She was slipping, falling, the world spinning around her, drawing her toward that terrible face in the tree. Dizzy, she had somehow had the presence of mind to hide the evil things, to shove them back beneath a stack of old papers before stumbling wild-eyed and delirious down the stairs. When they found her minutes later, crumpled and unconscious on the second-floor landing, it was believed she'd had a fall. She was carried into what had been her grandmother's bedroom and laid on the dead woman's bed. There were some who felt uneasy about using the chamber of one so recently departed, and a younger brother wondered aloud if her fall hadn't perhaps been occasioned by a glimpse of the grandmother's ghost stalking the attic overhead. But the brethren were, above all, a practical people, and not inclined to place much importance on such concerns. They knew they had nothing to fear from ghosts. She had lain all that day as if under a spell, barely breathing enough to stir a goose-down feather held beneath her nose. Her face had become as rigid as a mask. When they peeled a lid back, they found the eye turned up in her head so that little more than the white showed, as if she were gazing at the inside of her skull. Her family feared for her life, and, having just buried one of their number, spent the hours in prayer, begging the Lord to content himself with the pious old woman he had so recently taken to his bosom, and to spare this unworthy child. But if he heard them, he made no sign. The trance had continued through the night and into the following morning, a hot windless day that turned the old house into a furnace. Brethren gathered on the first floor to mop their brows and pray for the girl's soul, many quietly preparing themselves for a second funeral. A few even wondered if this wasn't perhaps a judgment on the whole Trout clan and its strange contrary ways. And so things had remained until evening of the second day, when suddenly the girl's eyes opened and she sat bolt upright, startling those assembled at the bedside with a scream that sounded like the burning. She was quickly declared to be out of danger. Her dramatic awakening seemed merely to have been the culmination of a nightmare, and her family was relieved to discover that, despite her cry, she appeared to have no fever. But the nightmare had been real. She'd been sure of it. She'd been flooded with visions, lying there, images of murder, Somewhere just outside Gilead, a girl very like herself was about to die. There was light and a tree, and an odd design with three concentric rings. Her confused ravings were not entirely dismissed. The brethren took such warnings seriously, aware that the Lord occasionally allowed men glimpses of events to come. But it was difficult to make sense of what she said. A tree? There were thousands of trees not half a mile from the house. A girl. It could be anyone's sister or daughter. And as for the design she'd babbled of, what were they to make of it? They could hardly be expected to act upon a prophecy so vague. And in the end she had relented. Perhaps they were right, her family and the others. Perhaps it had been a nightmare after all, brought on by her discovery of the pictures, whose existence she'd been desperately anxious to keep secret. Two days later a group of hunters had come upon the partially burned body of a girl from a nearby village, suspended from a tree in the part of the woods they called McKinney's Neck. She had felt, in part, responsible for the death. A vision had been vouchsafed her, and she had failed to heed it. Never again would she allow this to happen. That had been in 1939. Since then, over the years, she had sifted the pictures many times, though always without joy, studying them at night by her bedside. She no longer had to see them all, merely staring at a few of the now familiar images, drawn at random from the pile, was enough. Invariably the dreams would come. She had never told a soul about the source of her knowledge. The community had no suspicion. The brethren regarded her as a model of piety, and, after her first prophecy had been proved true, they accorded her a superstitious respect not untinged with fear, coming to her often for advice. 
she doubted they'd look kindly upon her use of the pictures. She detested them herself. She knew what dreadful visions had inspired them. She knew the identity of the dark, formless creature and the terrible things it could do. She'd learned what the circular design meant and where it was to be used. And she knew, had always known, who had drawn them all. Even in those first dreams in her grandmother's house, she had seen in the pictures the hand of her vanished ancestor, the boy Absalom Trout. Over the years, she had come to suspect, if dimly, what the boy's instructions might have been, and she trembled at them. For beneath the dreams that the pictures inspired loomed a great black certainty that haunted every waking hour, a vision of the future which, as a young girl, then a housewife, now a solitary widow, she felt powerless to alter or prevent. Though she knew she'd have to try, surely the Lord expected nothing less. In recent years, like one who leaves unread a message of bad tidings, she had resorted to the pictures less frequently, had avoided them, in fact, preferring to leave them tucked safely inside the great leather-bound Bible on the nightstand by her bed, as if to thereby make them holy. She had no need to open the Bible. Its every word was as familiar to her as the images Absalom had drawn. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. She frowned as she moved farther down the hill, troubled by what she saw, the scattered clumps of rose bushes, the late blooming teas and early blooming damasks and mosses that grew here and there above the stream. They reminded her of something. For just last night, aware that a visitor, an outsider, was due among them this May Day, and knowing with dread that, exactly as prophesied, a month with two full moons lay ahead. She had succumbed to curiosity and the demands of conscience. At bedtime she had opened the Bible, slipped out the pictures, drawn forth at random the images of moon, rose, and serpent. The dream, she recalled now, had been set right here in this garden, by that moss rose halfway down the slope. Darkly it came back to her. She'd been walking here just as she was now, only it had been night, and hot, and moonlit. One leaf on the moss-rose bush had looked different from the others in the ghostly light. A single leaf, half hidden by the night shadows of the damasks, but her sharp eyes had picked it out from several yards away. There seemed to be, there at the tip, an odd unnatural whiteness. No, not just at the tip. She saw as she drew nearer that the entire leaf was edged in whiteness, the dark familiar greenness in retreat, as from a creeping frost or a cold invisible fire. She ran her fingers over its surface. She was sensitive to plants. They spoke to her in a hundred furtive ways, and surely this one had secrets to reveal. Her fingers this time told her nothing. Around her the air throbbed with the buzzing of unseen bees, Grasping the rose branch, she tugged lightly at the leaf. There was a sudden stinging pain, and with a cry she yanked back her hand. Protruding from the fleshy area just below her thumb was a pale green thorn snapped off jaggedly at the base. She pulled it out. It was curved, wicked-looking, nearly an inch long. How had she failed to see it in the moonlight? The buzzing had grown louder, more insistent. As she brought her wounded hand to her lips, the blood flowing salty and warm, something occurred at the end of the branch just inches from her face. A rosebud moved. Her eyes widened. Why hadn't she noticed it before? The bud was fatter than the others, the skin moist and somehow pulpy-looking. It was clinging to the thin branch like a lump of rotting meat. Warily she reached for it. It shifted at her touch. The air shrilled with an angry insect sound that clamored like a warning in her ears, and there beneath the radiance of the moon, in the heat of that rose-perfumed night, she felt a chill. Torn from the branch, the bud seemed heavy in her hand. 
Her fingers probed the dark-veined leafy covering. One by one the leaves peeled back, like a piece of hollow fruit, the skin split and fell away. Inside lay a pale, ropey thing curled like a length of intestine. As the moonlight fell on it, it stirred. She saw now what it was. A plump white worm, thick as a baby's finger. A plump white worm that, as she watched, uncurled, raised its unwrinkled head and glared at her. A plump white worm with a human face. Grimacing, she dropped it to the ground. She was sure she heard the creature scream as she crushed it beneath her shoe, scream words at her as from a human mouth, human lungs, a human throat, words in some dark ancient tongue she'd never heard spoken aloud, but whose meaning upon waking she'd felt sure she understood. And now, just this afternoon, she had seen the visitor, all plump and pink and innocent, arriving with her son. She had recognized something in his innocent face. The dream had not lied. The pictures were real. For the first time in her life, she felt too tired to pray. Absalom, the old one, still lived. She'd known it all along, all her blighted life. She'd always known that one day he would make his move, assemble the performers, the man, the woman, the dole, and allow the process to begin. She had known that it would start the first of May and end the first of August, in a month with two full moons. But she'd always believed she had at least a decade left to her. She'd believed she would have more time to prepare. She hadn't realized it would come so soon. This year. This May. This summer. His journey takes him south, where rows of skyscrapers reflect the westering sun and cast giant shadows up and down the avenue. An idle weekend crowd fills the sidewalks, strolling past the ranks of street vendors and spilling from the shops to join the mass that merges and splits and merges again into a living stream. Unnoticed, the old one walks among them. A half-naked boy limps toward him, pale head swollen like overripe fruit, clutching a thumb-stained envelope. A blind trumpeter blares against the traffic from the doorway of an abandoned building. Someone stands hunched over a payphone, mouth working furiously. On the corner a haggard woman waves a blackboard scribbled with names and exhorts the planet to save itself. Humanity, she cries, has been judged and found wanting. He knows that she is right. That judgment is his as well. Turning his back on the woman, he's confronted by his reflection in a store window. The short, plump figure swinging an umbrella. The blue serge suit gone baggy at the knees. The wide, cherubic face beneath its halo of fine white hair. It is the reflection of a little old man. Once he had something in common with the figures crowding past him on the sidewalk. Once, more than a century ago, he was one of them, part of a loathsome race that swarms over this planet. Now only the semblance remains, the organs, bones, and flesh. He has been washed clean of humanity. He feels no trace of kinship for these odious, doomed beings, only a cold and unremitting hatred. As he passes down the avenue, they part before him like stalks of corn. Stoplights change from red to green, and the crowd surges forward. A bus groans, lumbering away from the curb. Brakes screech as a taxi sounds its horn. Dark feline shapes crouch beneath a parked car, then dart into an alley. From the next block echo the cries of children, and from another part of the city, the wail of sirens. As the old one turns westward once more, the sun is sinking toward the distant Jersey hills, toward the factories and the dumps and the oil refineries. Suddenly the land is touched with red, and the refineries glow as if ignited, hills turning to flame. The river shines with fire. The old one blinks his mild eyes and smiles. Great events are imminent. 
and nothing that he looks upon will ever be the same. The crowds, the traffic, the hateful little faces of the children. Soon, after the vulas, they will trouble him no more. But first, there are a few more preparations to be made. There is not much time left, and he will never get another chance. Five thousand years must pass before the signs again are right. He will have to act quickly. He has already selected the man, some insignificant little academic, with no family and no prospects. There are hundreds just like him in the city, all young, all hopeful, all doomed. But this one has been born on the necessary day, and, though the young fool doesn't know it yet, his interests lie in just the right direction. At this very moment he'll be out there on the farm, no doubt busily convincing himself that he likes it. He appears to be highly suggestible. He will do. Now the old one is faced with an even more important task, a task which has to be completed by Midsummer's Day. He has to find a woman, not just any woman. The age has to be right, and the background, and the color of her hair. And, of course, she will have to possess that very special qualification. Wonderful place you've got here. He was being just a little ingenuous, tramping through the undergrowth with Poroth. The farm looked better than it had in the photographs. Greener, certainly, but it plainly needed a lot of work. Even Frears could tell that. And the last farm he'd seen had been in Days of Heaven, with Richard Gears shoving a screwdriver into Sam Shepard. The Poroths had already cleared an irregularly shaped plot of land nearly twice the size of a football field, extending westward from the farmhouse's back lawn, past the barn and down to the meandering little brook that curved across the southern edge of the property. But there appeared to be many times this area still to be attended to, including a huge uncultivated section on the far side of the brook that Poroth had spoken of saving for next year. The place was much bigger than it had looked from the road, close to fifty acres, all told, though most of this was forest, or fields of weed too thick and high to walk through. Frears reminded himself that the Poroths had moved in just last fall, and that till then the land had lain untended for seven or eight years. Perhaps this was why a young couple like the Poroths had been able to afford it. He would have liked to ask Poroth how much the place had cost, now that the two of them were alone out here, lunch under their belts, and the land stretching green and sun-soaked before them. But for most of this day, at least ever since they'd passed his mother's house back there on the road, Poroth had fallen into some kind of mood, replying to Freer's occasional polite questions with an air of gloomy distraction. Here was Brother Lucas Flinders' place, he'd said, barely nodding towards some tidy farmhouse they were passing. That one was the Reeds. Down this way lived Brother Matt Geisel. More than that, he'd seemed disinclined to say. And then, toward the end, barreling down the three miles of pitted, unpaved road that wound through woods and brambles to the Poroth's farm, he'd barely talked at all too preoccupied with keeping the old truck from going off into a ditch. Before them the road had seemed to buck and twist beneath their wheels like a wild thing, at times almost doubling back upon itself, like it's trying to throw us off, Frears had said, holding tightly to the door handle and wishing the other would slow down. What in hell was he trying to prove? Poroth had said only, This sort of road's not meant for driving on and hadn't so much as glanced in Freer's direction. He'd recognized the farmhouse from the photograph as soon as it came into view, a small gray-shingled box-like affair, as tall as it was wide and obviously quite old, set close to the edge of the road as if eager to greet the few strangers who ventured out this far. The thorn bushes along the side were green now, dotted here and there with dark red rosebuds. Deborah, Poroth's wife, had been standing there on the porch as they drove up, a pair of cats gathered like children at her feet. Even at this distance, Freers could see that she too looked much as she had in the photo, dressed in homespun black from neck to ankle. 
She had waved gaily to them as Porath spun the wheel and brought the truck around to the side of the house, where it came to an abrupt halt on a bare section of the lawn. The first thing that had hit him was the silence. He'd noticed it as soon as Porath shut the motor off. As he climbed out onto the grass, grateful to be on solid ground again, it was as if the whole world had suddenly come to a stop. Back in Gilead, standing alone, he had felt a similar quiet, but there it had seemed somehow less dramatic, a more fragile thing, soon to be shattered by the inevitable noise to come, traffic noise and tractors, and the intrusion of human voices. Here, though, he sensed that except for the small sounds of insect, bird, and wind in the trees, the silence was permanent, a central fact of life. Deborah immediately came down from the porch to meet them. She was a handsome woman, even better looking than he'd hoped, with strong cheekbones and wide, dark eyes beneath heavy, unwomanish brows. Her mouth was large, the lips sensual and thick, not a Puritan's lips at all. With makeup in the right clothes, she would really be something to see. Her mass of black hair was obviously long and full, but she wore it swept back behind her head and knotted in a complicated bun with a severity that looked almost painful. He wondered what she'd look like with it down. "'I sure hope you didn't have to wait long,' she said, after Sar had introduced her. "'Services always run so late at the reeds. The way Brother Amos can talk. I was afraid you'd get fed up and start walking back to New York.' Frears smiled in part to make up for Poroth, who he saw was scowling at his wife. Probably didn't like her putting down the neighbors. Oh, I wasn't about to walk home. In fact, I had myself a little nap. I found him sleeping in the graveyard, said Poroth. Right by that big stone of the truths. Deborah laughed. A good choice. They're Sar's old relations. Yes, said Frears. I gather almost everyone is. And guess where he found our notice, said Poroth. The one I put up in Flemington. Where? She turned to Frears. I found it on a bulletin board in New York, he said. This news he saw had caught her by surprise. She looked from him to her husband, as if the two men shared a secret. How did it get there? That's what we don't know, said Poroth grimly. Some kind of prankster, maybe. Or else a good Samaritan, said Deborah. She considered this a moment, then nodded. Yes, it must have been, don't you see? Look how nicely everything's turned out. It just might be a sign from God. Eyes wide, she turned back to Frears. It's like your name, from Jeremiah. I'm sure that's an omen, too. She grinned. Maybe you'll turn out to be a prophet. Frears laughed uneasily. I'm afraid I'm no relation, but then you never can tell. I can tell, she said. You were meant to come here, I'm sure of it. And I'm sure you're going to fit right in. Scooping up a cat, she began moving toward the house. Now come on, both of you. I have lunch ready, and then Sar can show you around. You two just better be hungry. There's sliced ham and cheese and fresh dandelion greens. Looking back at Freer, she added, Nothing from our own garden, not yet anyway, but there's a rhubarb pie from the Geisels right up the road. To Sar, she added, Brother Matt's coming by later. I think he wants to meet our guest. Sounds like just what the doctor ordered, said Frears, hurrying after her. For a moment, he caught a glimpse, in back of the house, of the outbuilding where he'd be staying. It looked somehow less welcoming than the farmhouse. Maybe they didn't want to show it to him till they'd softened him up. Well, that was okay. He could use a good lunch. He followed Deborah up the porch steps, surreptitiously eyeing her swaying hips encased in a black dress, the hemline sweeping barely an inch above the floor. A wonder it didn't get dusty. Behind them in the yard, Poroth sighed. 
the matter of the rental notice seemed to be closed. I'll leave the truck out, he called, coming after them. We'll have to start back to town by five to make the bus. While Deborah held the screen door open for Frears, a pair of cats dashed past her feet and into the house, closely followed by another that Frears hadn't seen. This could be a problem. He hadn't counted on there being so many. Inside, the house seemed cramped and dark, with an unmistakable odor of cat. His nose tickled alarmingly. He heard Porath's footsteps on the porch behind him. The old floorboards creaked. It's lighter in the back, Deborah said, leading the way. They passed from a small front hallway to what was obviously the living room, where a rocker and a low, rather worn-looking couch stood facing a small fireplace. Beyond it lay the kitchen, afternoon sunlight streaming through the windows, and a screen door in the rear. It took Frears a moment to realize what was missing. He looked in vain for lamps, a light switch, television. There was nothing but a small kerosene lantern on the mantelpiece. As he entered the kitchen, he saw another on the shelf by the doorway. He cleared his throat. I thought your ad said fully electrified. The outbuilding is, said Poroth, ducking as he came into the kitchen. I ran the wires in myself not two months ago. But in our own home, he shrugged. We prefer to keep the modern world at a distance. Here, you see, we're independent of the city and its ways. Frears sensed, not for the first time, a hint of disapproval. Across the room he noticed a huge cast-iron wood-burning stove rubbing shoulders with a shiny little hot point. He turned to Deborah, who was busying herself at the sink, cats milling at her feet. I suppose that stove is gas-powered. Correct, said Sar. We bought it second-hand from a man in Trenton. Honey, Deborah said over her shoulder. Show Jeremy the tanks out back. Frears watched her lay a platter of ham on the kitchen table and remembered how hungry he was. Here, look at this. Poroth pushed open the screen door and led Frears out onto the back porch, where two more cats were lying on the dusty wooden steps. Each one lasts about a month, said Poroth, but he was pointing to a pair of silver canisters standing like miniature spaceships against the rear wall of the house, surrounded by rose bushes and weeds. Ordinary propane. It heats our water and cooks our meals. Draping a long leg over the railing, he leaned back against the weathered wooden post and folded his arms. I don't get it, said Frears. You say you want to be independent of the modern world. But gas is just as modern as electricity, and probably just as expensive. He thought perhaps he had offended Poroth, but the other seemed amused. I know it doesn't sound very rational, Poroth said. I don't pretend it is. The choices we've made have been largely symbolic, expressions of our faith. He smiled wryly. Does that make any sense? Freer shrugged. I suppose so. Look, said Poroth, we're not fanatics, Deborah and I. We have indoor plumbing, we own a truck. When one of us gets sick, we see a doctor. Some of the brethren are stricter than that. Others may think we're too strict. There's plenty of room for differences. You'd be surprised how open-minded the brethren can be. He would, all right. He hadn't forgotten the looks they'd given him in town. But he said politely, You people must be a lot more liberal than I figured. I'd had you pegged as a New Jersey version of the Amish. Porth made a face. Black hats, we call them. They're a little better than tourist attractions, if you ask me. I guess I was going by appearances. I mean, you seem to dress the same as they do, except for the hats. It's true. We have our similarities. Certain customs, outward forms, this sort of thing. He pointed to his trousers. See? No pockets. Pockets breed avarice. Give a man pockets and pretty soon he'll want something to put in them. 
He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. Poroth smiled. That's what I meant by symbolism. No kidding. I thought those pants looked strange. Wait till he told them about this back in New York. It's the same with the beard, see? Brethren don't wear mustaches because the military wore them, in Europe anyway, and we refuse to leave the farm. Abruptly he swung his leg down and stood. He was nearly a head taller than Freer's. Electricity's a symbol, too. You'll find a battery in our truck, another in our radio. We like to listen to the Bible broadcasts. But Deborah and I, we're not ones for labor-saving and luxury. We have no interest in wiring up our home. As I see it, an electric wire is a golden chain that binds a body to the city. And that, my friend, is the citadel of corruption. When the city flickered, we'd flicker. When the city went dark, we'd go dark. That's a tie we'd rather do without. He started back inside. Frears lingered a moment on the porch, gazing at the land that lay behind the house, at the outbuildings, orchard, and fields, but thinking of the monstrous Con Ed plant back in Astoria and how it had lit up the night sky like an ocean liner. At last the view drew his attention. Where the fields ended, sloping gently downhill from the farmhouse, his eye was caught by the distant glimmer of a stream. The property was more extensive than he'd imagined, though its exact limits were hard to discern, for it merged gradually with the woods, which, in every direction, formed a backdrop to the scene. They were dark with shadows, and, even at the height of afternoon, far from inviting. He realized suddenly how far he was from the city, and felt a tiny shiver of excitement. This was the real thing. The three of them ate in the kitchen, seated on heavy, high-backed chairs before an ancient wooden table that some long-dead Poroth ancestor had made. The farmhouse, he'd discovered, had no dining room. It was simply too small. Three rooms upstairs, two rooms down, and rough plank floors with spaces often wide enough to see through. Deborah, smiling, had remarked that when she swept out the kitchen, the crumbs slipped through the cracks and ended up in the root cellar below, where the mice ate them. And they in turn get eaten by the cats, Sar added, as if compelled to remind her of this. All part of God's plan. Frears studied the two of them while Poroth said grace, and the cats prowled restlessly beneath the table, except for the difference in height, for even when he was seated Sar towered over them both, and the fact that Deborah was, from what he could see, full-breasted and wide of hip, while Sar was tall and rather willowy, the two looked much alike, as if they'd stepped from the same faded tintype, representatives of some earlier generation. Despite their dark hair, both had skin of a surprising smoothness and pallor, considering the time they probably spent outdoors. It was already clear to him that Deborah was the friendlier of the two, yet in moments of quiet like this one, as she sat listening, eyes downcast, while her husband thanked the Lord for his bounteousness, and the guest he'd sent them today, Deborah wore an air similar to Sars, a kind of guarded dignity. They seemed brother and sister, in fact, two solemn-faced children raised in the wilderness, both of them on speaking terms with God. By the time Grace was over, though, Frears had become distracted by a growing need to sneeze. It's nothing to worry about, he explained, with irritation when the two finally looked up. I just happen to be allergic to a variety of things, cats most of all. He gritted his teeth and tried to smile, as a pair of them, a yellow tiger stripe and a charcoal gray, both obviously young, crowded closer to rub against his legs. He was as angry with himself as with the animals. He'd have been happy to reach down and pat them, scratch the downy hair behind their ears, but with each successive breath he could feel his nose becoming clogged, as if somewhere a mechanism had been triggered that he was helpless to control. The corners of his eyes had already begun to itch. Sar sat watching him in silence, 
Maybe he saw such afflictions as evidence of weakness or of God's displeasure. Deborah appeared more sympathetic. I think it's a good sign, she declared, watching beneath the table as the cats, no doubt in an effort to leave their mark on a stranger, continued to rub themselves diligently against the bottoms of Freer's pants legs. I mean the way they've taken to you. It shows you're welcome here. I guess we're all starved for visitors. Sar frowned. Clearly this sort of thing made him impatient. Shall I put them outside? That was in fact precisely what Frears wanted, but he was in no mood to make a scene. These animals were the closest things the Poroths had to children. Surely they could all work it out over the summer. They're okay here, he said lightly, and launched into an elaborate cock and bull story, though who could say, maybe it made sense, about how the only way he'd ever get over the allergy was by exposing himself to the offending animals as often as possible. It's just a matter of building up the right antibodies, he said, privately resolving to see a decent allergist as soon as he got back. Deborah looked relieved. Well, just remember now, she said, if you ever have problems like this over the summer, there's always antihistamine in the medicine chest. She sounded as if it were a foregone conclusion he'd be staying with them, and maybe it was. He already felt as if he knew them. Obligingly, he marched off to the bathroom in search of the pills, grateful that she hadn't offered him some brethren-approved medication like herbs or mud or some other crazy folk remedy. The bathroom was a crowded little chamber just off the kitchen, with a small curtained window looking out upon the rose bushes at the side of the house. In the corner stood a bulky metal water heater, apparently connected to the tanks out back, and next to it a primitive sink with separate faucets for hot and cold. Frears wondered why nobody'd had the sense to connect them. It only took a simple Y-shaped pipe. The room was dominated by a gigantic old claw-footed bathtub, big enough for two, that would probably take hours to fill. No showers for him, then, if he spent his summer here. He told himself that baths were more relaxing, reading classics in the tub, soft music on the radio. It might not be so bad. The medicine cabinet was a revelation, dusty little plastic bags with roots in them, and colored powders, and things afloat in brown unlabeled bottles, side by side with a handful of prescription drugs for headaches, nausea, nerves, plus mouthwash and aspirin, and scented bath talc and on the top shelf near the end, a half-empty package of strawberry douche. The Poroths must have an interesting marriage, he decided. Back in the kitchen, Deborah had set out a platter of cheese beside the ham and was busy slicing a loaf of thick brown bread, the kind he saw at German delis, but that always seemed too expensive. She was wielding a bread knife that looked half as long as a sword, while Sar sat watching her impassively a king on his throne. Now this looks good, said Frears, seating himself across from Porath. He poured himself some milk from a ceramic pitcher and washed down the pill, some local version of contact. Yesterday, I want you to know, that milk was in the cow, said Deborah. It's from Sar's uncle's dairy. Sure, I remember. We passed it on the way. He swallowed a large bite of bread and cheese. And I'll bet this bread's homemade. She nodded, pleased. I haven't bought bread since we lived in Trenton. It's all baked right here. In that thing? Frears nodded toward the huge black wood-burning stove that stood beside the hot point, already seeing pictures out of Norman Rockwell, Courier and Ives. It looks at least a century old. It is said Deborah. It's as old as the house, but it's hard to regulate. We only use it for heating in the winter, and for certain ceremonial occasions. Does this place get very cold in the winter? The attic needs work, said Sar, obviously looking forward to it. I'll have to put new insulation in this fall. It gets cold here all right, said Deborah. 
You've heard people talk about three dog nights when you need all three dogs in the bed? Well, this January, Sara and I had a couple of six cat nights. Frears winced, but not at the idea of such cold. His eyes were still red, and he hadn't stopped sniffling. God, he said, I probably wouldn't survive the night. Though I guess on a farm like this, six cats must have their uses. Seven, said Deborah. You probably haven't seen Boada yet. That's his cat. She nodded at Sar. And where's he? asked Frears. She, said Poroth. She stays outside all day, sometimes nights, too. She's more adventurous than the others. I've had her since she was a kitten. Deborah added, She's fat and just plain mean. That's why she sleeps by herself. Now these are the nice ones, Jeremy. And until dessert she proceeded to furnish him with detailed biographies of the other six, complete with ancestries. They all had names like Habakkuk, Tobias, and Azariah, names which sounded as if they'd been taken from obscure portions of the Bible and which Frears immediately forgot. He was too busy thinking of Deborah. It would be heavenly, he imagined, to pile into that big, soft feather bed they must have up there and lie beside her on a long winter night, slipping the flannel nightgown above her waist and breasts, feeling her warmth against the cold and darkness outside. Dessert was a tart red rhubarb pie and a plate of lacy brown molasses cookies, the kind he bought at block fairs in the city. He wondered over his second cup of coffee if all the meals were going to be this elaborate. If so, he wasn't going to lose much weight out here, but he'd probably be content just the same. Once coffee was over, Poroth wiped his mouth, pushed back from the table and offered to show Frears around. You may as well see what you came for, he said, stretching as he rose so that his fingers bent back against the ceiling. You can see my garden from here, said Deborah, pointing out the window at a small brown fenced-in plot beside the house. It doesn't look like much right now, but by summer there'll be squash, tomatoes, peas, cucumbers, carrots. We'll be eating well, I promise you that. Clearly they were trying to sell him on the place. They must be counting on his ninety dollars a week. We're starting awfully late this year, said Sar. As the two of them descended the steps from the back porch, Deborah having elected to remain in the kitchen, a pair of cats scampered out behind them, just before the screen door slammed. We'll probably just have enough for the three of us, but by next year we expect to produce enough to sell. Even that prediction seemed somewhat optimistic. The garden looked far from flourishing, though there were small shoots where the carrots were coming up, and green wooden stakes standing in hopeful rows above the young tomato plants. The adjoining lawn, by contrast, looked surprisingly hardy, as if the land's true destiny was to be one of the suburban estates that were already taking up so much of the county. Across the lawn, and well off to one side, lay the weed-strewn wreckage of an old wooden outhouse, grass growing over the doorway. Frears wrinkled his nose as they approached, but the air smelled of nothing but damp earth and pine. You're free to use it if you like said Poroth, making one of his infrequent jokes. I believe it's still in working order. Wonderful. Frears peered through the gaps in the planks. The bench inside was the double-seater sort for the ultimate in rural togetherness. Welcome to Appalachia. He thanked God that the farm had modern plumbing. Farther down the slope... Its back to the surrounding wall of forest was the low, barrack-like outbuilding he'd be renting. It was the one he'd glimpsed from the front of the house. He recognized it immediately from the photograph. "'Am I right?' asked Frears. "'In assuming that the place was originally a chicken coop?' "'True enough,' said Poroth. "'We've never used it as one, though. We keep our chickens in the barn.' The building looked somewhat more cheerful in the spring sunlight than it had when the photo was taken, though ivy now covered the walls more thickly and was curling over the edges of the windows, 
an ever-shrinking green frame. It's not completely fixed up yet, said Poroth, looking it over with a critical eye. I still have to put up the screens. Still, I suppose we ought to go in. Inside, the place was surprisingly dark, ivy blocking much of the sunlight. I'll have all that trimmed away before you get here, Poroth said, snapping on a shiny new wall switch that turned on the overhead light. If I did it now, it would just grow back by summer. There was nothing inviting about the room. The best Frears could do, by an exercise of imagination, was to see it as a kind of monk cell, unromantic but suited to the intellectual labors he hoped to perform this summer. It had a pale blue linoleum floor with a slightly uneven seam down the middle, and was empty save for a sturdy-looking bed, room for just one, Frears saw, a chest of drawers, and an oppressive-looking old wooden wardrobe standing like a watchman in the corner. There seemed to be only one closet. Later this spring I'm going to build some bookshelves in here, said Poroth, eyeing one of the bare plasterboard walls. And we can move in a table for you to use as a desk. He seemed happy to leave. The other half of the building, with an entrance of its own at the opposite side, was being used as a storeroom. Its cement floor was packed haphazardly with lumber, battered-looking furniture and dusty steamer trunks. The air smelled of mildew. Along the front window sill, a row of dirty mason jars collected cobwebs and dead flies. Deborah wants to fix this up, too, said Poroth, since we've already brought in the electricity. She'd like to turn it into another guest house. Frears was peering at a pile of old books, their covers warped and faded. The Law of the Offerings. Footsteps of the Master, God's Providence and Gospel, Religious Tracts. And how do you feel about that? The other paused. I'd rather see how things work out this summer. He turned to go, but Frears had pushed past the furniture to a door in the far wall. What does this lead to? A closet? Open it and see. Frears pulled it open, then smiled. He was looking into the other room, his room. With surprise, he realized that, in his imagination, he'd already taken possession of it. The familiar linoleum floor and narrow bed looked almost welcoming. As they strolled outside, Poroth eyed him hesitantly. So, he said at last, do you think you want to rent the place? Yes, I do, said Frears though he hadn't really made his mind up till that moment. It seems to be just what I'm looking for. Poroth nodded. Good. He sounded, Frears thought, as if he meant it, but he wasn't smiling, and there was uncertainty in his face. Frears felt faintly disappointed. And when do you think you'd want to come? Probably right after my last class ends. There's a Friday evening course I'm teaching that doesn't get out till the 24th of June. I figured I'd come out here that weekend. All right. We'll try to be ready for you. Instead of turning back toward the house, he was moving in the direction of the fields and obviously expected Frears to follow. By the time you come out, I should have this land cleared off all the way back to the brook. He gestured toward the line of distant trees. And it'll be under cultivation. To the west a row of stumps showed where Poroth was engaged in cutting back a column of encroaching pine. Immediately ahead the land was bare, but marked by scattered mounds of ashes where great piles of underbrush and weeds had been burned. It looked like the aftermath of a battle. Of course this place needs plenty of work, said Poroth, gazing around with apparent satisfaction. That's what happens when land lies idle for so long. Deborah and I are already behind in our labors. Most of the brethren finished planting weeks ago, beneath the last full moon. That sounds quite picturesque. What do you people grow? Corn. That's what this land is made for. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Of course, the Indian corn I'll be planting isn't what old Isaac had in mind. 
Ah, hmm. What the hell was the guy talking about? Are you people allowed to drink wine? In moderation. He turned. And you? Frears patted his stomach. Like I said before, my vice is food. Poroth smiled, but only for a moment. Then his face resumed its old preoccupied look, and he continued walking. Before them rose the huge, sagging shape of the barn, and beside it a gnarled old black willow with scales like a dinosaur, practically touching the overhanging roof, as if tree and barn had grown up together. Beyond it the still uncleared land lay covered with the same ropey-looking weeds and homely little saplings that Frears had seen in New York vacant lots. The barn was where Poroth kept his truck at night. Flies buzzed over the ancient hay still scattered on the floor, though it had obviously been many years since livestock had sheltered here. Leaning against the wall lay a rusty collection of farm implements, and in the shadows at the back, an antiquated mowing machine that Poroth said he planned to repair. They all looked to Freer's like museum pieces. It was hard to picture anyone actually using them. Along the left side of the barn, on a loft platform as high as Freer's head, and reachable by means of a trapdoor and a simple wooden ladder, Poroth had constructed a chicken coop. At the moment it housed only four fat hens, all recent purchases, and a pugnacious-looking black rooster who glared at Freer's accusingly, as if aware that under normal circumstances it would have been inhabiting Freer's quarters. They're from Werner Clapp's farm right here in Gilead, Poroth explained. He shooed away a cat that was pawing the ladder. They're not laying regularly yet, but by summer we should be getting all the eggs we need. By summer, by summer... This was the Poroth's refrain. It was rather inspiring how optimistic they were, as if the two of them, those earnest children, could make this place a paradise all by themselves. Frears almost believed it might be possible. He knew he couldn't do it, couldn't repair houses, move masses of earth, apply the magic that would make the land yield its secret stored-up fruit. But these were rural people, country-born despite their lack of experience. Who could say what they'd be capable of? Near the barn stood a small gray shingled smokehouse covered with brambles and vines, its door hanging partially open. I wouldn't go poking around there, said Poroth, giving it a wide berth. Why? Wasps. He nodded toward a few black insects hovering like guards above the doorway. They've got a nest in there, just below the roof. I mean to clean them out as soon as I get the chance. Frears peered inside as they passed. The ceiling, like that of the porch at the cooperative, was arrayed with wicked-looking iron hooks, where, probably, years before, hams and bacon had hung. Down the slope from it lay the shallow brook he'd seen from the back porch. Flowing past rocks and fallen trees, it curved out from the woods and ran a meandering course past the acres of stubble that might some day be a cornfield, until it lost itself again in the swampier woods to the west. Legally, the Poroth's property extended far beyond its banks. But all the area on the other side was forest now, a dense wilderness of pine, oak, and maple that, in this century at least, had never known a woodsman's axe, so that the brook effectively marked the southwest border of the land. It also marked the limits of the afternoon's tour. Poroth, taking a position at the water's edge, stood with arms folded, surveying the brook's winding path, as if he contemplated rerouting it. We've got minnows here, frogs, a few turtles, he said. Still, it's no trout stream. In that case, I won't bring my fishing pole. Frears stared idly into the brook's clear depths. He was eager to get back to the farmhouse and maybe spend some more time with Deborah before returning to the city. He glanced at his watch. Nearly a quarter to five. They would have to be starting back soon. Already the sun was sinking toward the western pines. He thought of the work he'd meant to do by Monday that would be waiting for him in the heat of his apartment. Poroth had seen him check the time. Well, there's really nothing more to show you, 
he said morosely. We may as well be... Oh, here you are. He was looking down at a large gray cat by his feet. This is Boada. He bent down and began scratching her head, an attention the animal seemed merely to tolerate, for though her eyes closed momentarily as if in pleasure, she soon moved out of reach. Frears watched her uncertainly. She was fat and sleek, with fine gray fur halfway between charcoal and silver. Placid looking enough, but you never knew about these animals. Hesitantly, he reached out to stroke her, but she backed away, mostly, it seemed, out of fear, though as his hand drew closer she made a menacing sound deep in her throat. He decided it was best to keep his distance. She's the oldest of the cats, said Poroth, and it takes her a while to get used to people. She's not even sure of Deborah yet. With a sigh he squinted at the sun. Well, we should probably be heading back. I want to get you into town in plenty of time. Frears followed him up the grassy slope through the lengthening shadows. Looking back, he saw Boada crouched on the bank, eyes wide as she followed the bobbing flight of a dragonfly above the stream. Inching forward, she thrust out her paw and dabbed tentatively at the moving water, as if testing whether the surface were strong enough to walk on, then settled back again to watch and wait. She's found a way to cross the brook by some fallen logs over in the woods, said Poroth, who had turned to see why Frears had stopped. She's afraid to try and cross anywhere else. She really hates the water. His stride had an athlete's spring to it as he continued toward the farmhouse, rising up onto the toes of his boots with every step, arms swinging easily at his sides, as if drawing upon some private source of power. Strong ankles, too, no doubt. Frears himself was beginning to feel bushed. It couldn't be just the walk, he told himself. He walked farther every day in the city. The antihistamine, maybe. Or something to do with the country air. The air seemed healthy here, but maybe it was only an illusion. Though you had to admit those pines smelled sweet and good, down by the brook. Nothing like the disinfectant pine smell he was used to, in aerosol and aftershave. You only smelled the real stuff in the winter, walking past a sidewalk stand of Christmas trees. As they rounded the barn, they saw that a second pickup truck was parked in front of the house. Frears felt a sudden rush of disappointment. That's Brother Matt Geisel, he heard Porath saying. He and Sister Cora are our closest neighbors. They live up the road just past the turn. The man was in the kitchen with Deborah when they came inside, leaning stiffly against the counter as if his limbs were too long to fold into a chair. Hello there, he said in a gravelly voice, beaming from Porth to Frears. We still had a few winter parsnips left over, and I thought you folks might find a use for them. He looked about sixty or seventy, his face lined and deeply tanned, like patches of leather stitched together. Matthew's brought us enough for a full-size family, said Deborah, nodding toward a pile of greens and pale carrot-like vegetables on the counter by the sink. She made a mock frown. I wanted to give him some of these cookies, but he says he's getting too fat. Geisel grinned broadly, displaying a mouthful of small stained teeth. It ain't just me that says it. Cora, she says it too. He blinked. Anyways, we got ourselves a cellar full of parsnips from the winter, and with the weather like it is, pretty soon they won't be good for much. No sense wasting them. Brother Matthew, said Porth, I want you to meet Jeremy Frears. Solemnly the old man took Frears' proffered hand. His grip was as steely as Frears had expected. You the fellow from New York City? he asked cocking his head and glaring at him with, Frears had caught on now, the humorous gruffness that old codgers like this sometimes assumed. Frears nodded, playing the game. 452 Bank Street, right in the heart of Greenwich Village. Jeremy's going to be renting our guest house this summer, added Poroth. 
Deborah's face brightened, casting a quick, inquiring glance at her husband, who nodded to confirm the news. She turned to Frears and grinned. Good, Jeremy. I'm so glad. Frears felt his skin grow warm. In less formal company, he'd almost have expected her to hug him. But already her expression had changed. Uh-oh. Don't we have to get you back to town? I'm just about to take him in, said Porth. Geisel ambled forward. Well, I'm heading up to the cooperative myself, he announced. I'll be glad to give your young friend a ride. Thanks, said Frears, and seeing that Poroth appeared pleased, he added, Yes, I'd appreciate that. He glanced at his watch. Nearly five o'clock. But I think we're going to have to leave right now. As they filed out to the porch and down to where the trucks were parked, he surreptitiously touched his wallet, wondering suddenly if the Poroths were going to hit him for a deposit. So it's all straight now, right? he said, standing beside the trucks. I'm aiming for the weekend I told you, the 24th of June. Of course I'll get in touch before that. And you'll be able to pick me up again at the bus stop? I'll be there, said Poroth. Just let me know the time. Geisel's old black Ford pickup looked even more beat up than the Poroth's. Geisel slapped its rusted fender. A beauty, ain't she? he said, grinning. He opened the door on the driver's side and climbed gingerly into the front seat. I'll just slide my bones behind the wheel here. Frears climbed in beside him and waited as Geisel fiddled with the ignition and the choke, the other solemnity genuine now, an old man operating something he still didn't quite believe in. The motor rattled, turned over, and caught. Frears waved goodbye to the Poroths. Returning Deborah's smile, they made a traditional-looking tableau as they stood waving back, the old gray house rising cozily behind them. As the truck began to pull out, easing onto the bumpy surface of the road, Frears looked back. Sar was turning toward the fields, already preoccupied with some new task, while Deborah, still waving, had retreated to the porch steps, the late afternoon sun shining almost directly behind her outlining her full figure as she stood there, hips cocked, one leg on the higher step. As Frears gave a last farewell wave, he couldn't help but notice that she didn't seem to be wearing anything beneath the long black dress. Crack! The axe blade bit deep into the wood, scattering chips of bark. The pine stood trembling, branches shook. The tree was part of God. He felt it testing him but other matters occupied him now. He swung the axe back for another blow. Crack! He was thinking about the summer ahead, and about the visitor they'd had today, who'd be coming among them this summer with his books and clothes and city ways. He wondered if he and Deborah had done right. Crack! Leaving the axe buried in the tree, he paused to smooth his hair back and wipe away the sweat. Pensively, he ran a thumb along his fringe of beard. He felt perplexed. Lord knew they needed the money the visitor would provide. There was no gain saying it. Though it was hateful to ask payment for the things a proper Christian should have offered guests for free, he and Deborah were deeply in debt to the cooperative, an institution his own father had once run. This is what stung the worst. And he wouldn't be able to hold up his head among the brethren till all of it was paid. Oh, the money would certainly be useful. And yet... He yanked the axe from the tree, hefted it in his hand, and swung it back. Crack! And yet somehow he had bad feelings about the arrangement. He'd had them from the start. He had been ready, eager even, to return to the fold from which his family had strayed, and to identify himself henceforth as a farmer, a tiller of the earth a toiler in the vineyards of the Lord. It was the one truly worthy occupation he knew of, in God's eyes and his own, offering a life of piety and independence, a life close to nature. The souvenir plaque above his mantelpiece expressed it all. A plow on a field arable is the most honorable of ancient arms. 
And now, crack, he was being asked to alter that dream. Though he only half acknowledged it to himself, at the back of his mind was the thought, unworthy, selfish, even snobbish, that he didn't want to play hotel keeper. It wasn't right. It was degrading. It made him and Deborah little better than servants, peasants in the hire of a godless master. Crack. He was beginning to think he should never have let Deborah talk him into it. Taking in a lodger had been her idea. She was already pressing him to make room for another. It was she who had persuaded him to convert the old chicken coop into a guest house. It was she who had convinced him to bring in electricity. You show visitors a kerosene lamp out there, she'd said, and they'll turn right around and go home. It was she who'd written the advertisement and gotten him to leave it on the bulletin board over in Flemington, despite the disapproval of the brethren, who saw all forms of advertising as devil's work. And now, crack, was come the fruit of her endeavors. A stranger was due to enter their midst, an outsider, someone ignorant of their beliefs, who could have but little sympathy for their chosen way of life. True, the man had seemed polite enough, but his godlessness was obvious in his every word, and he'd brought with him a reek of corruption from the city he was so determined to flee. He had already asked too many questions. He had already made too many jests. Of course, he'd sounded educated in what passed for education among the worldly, was even a teacher, he had claimed. And doubtless it would be good for Deborah to have someone else to talk to. But, crack! Who could say where that might lead? Deborah was a fine, God-fearing woman, but sometimes the woman in her nature seemed stronger than the fear of God. She was modest one moment, hot-blooded the next. There was no telling what she might do. What was it the prophet had warned? The heart is deceitful above all things. Crack! Deborah was inclined to wander from the path that much he knew, and this smooth-talking teacher might prove a most dangerous influence claimed he'd spend the summer among his books. The thought made Porth downright uneasy. Oh, he'd studied books himself once, far more than the brethren would have wished, and he still owned a few. He had felt the magic in them, the lure of worldly knowledge, new notions, sweet-sounding words, but with the Lord's help he had put such things behind him. The good book was enough for any man. The rest were just invitations to idleness, an idleness was a sin that led to others. Yes, the stranger would have to be watched. There was no telling what mischief he might get into. He had all but admitted, back in the truck, that he made it a practice to yield to whatever temptations lay before him, as if his stomach hadn't already revealed as much. And the way he'd looked at Deborah. Crack! With a groan, the tree splintered and came crashing to the earth. The old truck bounced noisily toward town, Geisel navigating her like a ship in a storm. He drove slowly, with his head thrust well forward, stretching his long, lined neck as he squinted at the road. "'Well, Mr. Frears,' he said at last, turning to face him, "'what do you think of our little town?' Frears' mind had been on Deborah. Had it been his imagination— or had she really been naked beneath that dress? And what if she'd known he could see? With a sigh, he turned to Geisel. Frears had been deliberately avoiding conversation with him lest the old man turn the truck over in a ditch while doing exactly what he was doing now, looking away from the road. Just his luck to die here in the wilderness with some old farmer he didn't even know. It is a little town, he said finally, keeping his own eyes straight ahead. Maybe Geisel would take the hint. I was surprised, in fact, how tiny it really is. There's nothing in it but one big general store. Geisel seemed to see that as a compliment. Yes, sir. All a man needs is right to hand. Mind you, there's also the Bible school across the street, where they keep the town records. And don't be forgetting the cemetery. I saw it, said Frears. 
Some nice old tombstones there. The old man smiled. Been looking at our ancestors, have you? A few, anyway. It's interesting to see the local names. The other gave a genial nod. Yep, that's where they all end up around here. You stay long enough, you'll end up there, too. Frears laughed uneasily. Not that long, I hope. I'll only be here for the summer. I know, said Geisel. Young brother Sar has gone and fixed the place up real nice. You should have yourself a mighty comfortable time. I saw how he and Sister Deborah even went and put in electricity. I guess that's pretty unusual around here, isn't it? The old man scratched his head. Well, none of us have it. Fact is, some of the others here in town, some of the old-timers, he said this with a hint of smile. They've had their differences with the Poroths and their ways. They say the pair of them are too lax on some points. Deborah without her panties. Strawberry douche in the medicine chest. Maybe the brethren, too, had their generation gap. And do you agree? No, sir, not me. Brother Sar and Sister Deborah are neighbors of ours, and we stick by them. They're good, God-fearing folks. You'll find out quick enough. See, that's the strength of our order. It don't look that way to outsiders, maybe. But we like to think we've got room for differences of opinion. The Lord wants for us to live His way, right enough. But He knows we're all just children, and, well, He's always been good to us. He lapsed into silence. They were nearing the stream now, the dirt road well behind them. Frears was pleased to see that he already had a sense of the distances involved, if not of the actual twisting route they'd been following. The hedgerow-bordered lanes and snug farmhouses seemed almost familiar, viewed in reverse from his trip out, and the countryside somehow smaller, like a room remembered from childhood that one visits after the passage of years. The road was winding gradually downhill. They rounded a wall of boxwood, and abruptly Frears saw, on the slope to the left, the small stone cottage where Poroth's mother lived. Now there, he said, is one beautiful little place. He peered at the windows as the truck moved past, but saw no face this time. They don't build them like that nowadays. That house is... Geisel did some figuring. More than a hundred and sixty years old. It's always belonged to the Trutes. I thought Mrs. Poroth lived there now. Yes, but she's one of them. Oh, that's right. Sar mentioned it. Those Trutes. Geisel shook his head. They never were much for breeding. And most of the lines kind of died out over the years. Gnarled hands gripping the wheel. He brought the truck around the base of the hill and onto the narrow stone bridge, which he took far more slowly than Poroth had. Frears waited till they were across before he spoke again. I saw their monument back in the cemetery. A big granite thing. Sar said they died in some kind of fire. Yes, sir. Back in the 1870s it was. Even before my time. He didn't smile. Wiped out one whole branch of the family. Frears tried in vain to imagine how all those people could have perished in a single fire. It must have been at night. But could anyone sleep that soundly? Mother, father, kids? Blackened bodies in the ashes. It's strange, he said. In that list of names I remember one of them didn't have a date of death. The old man rubbed his chin. Well, you see, young Absalom Trout, he didn't die in the fire. Fact is, some folks say it was him that said it. What? You mean he killed his own family? Geisel shrugged. Well, that Absalom, he was a queer one, so folks used to say. "'Twas quite a ways before my time, of course, and I ain't so sure of the details. But my old grandma, God rest her, she remembered him. 
grew up with him, in fact. She said he was as sweet as can be to look at him, with a face just like a baby. A likely little feller, too, God-fearing as the next. And then one day, just about Christmas time it was, seems he goes off somewhere, and when he comes back home he ain't quite right in the head. He was always up to some sort of mischief after that. Regular little devil. The wind is blowing steadily now, with the first hint of a chill. The sun is just a dirt-brown smear above the Jersey shore. Top halves of the taller buildings remain illuminated, glowing like pillars of fire. The lower parts are plunged in shadow. The old man is tired, but at last his walk is ended. He has come to an area of tenements, ancient warehouses, and shops with foreign names. In the distance the oily river churns. He has reached his goal. The cathedral looms above him, gray with soot. Around the great bronze doors at the top of the steps, saints and demons stand awaiting his arrival. On each of the twin towers a cross catches the waning sunlight. White birds, the gilo, shriek high overhead. Their shadows vanish as the light fades, and the crosses retreat into gloom. The sky is dark as ashes. Below his feet the pavement vibrates to the thunder of a subway. The stones of the cathedral tremble. Tucking the umbrella beneath his arm and whispering the third name, he starts up the steps. Ahead of him, by the great doors, the blind eyes of the saints seem to widen in sudden understanding. The demons grin more boldly from their concrete resting place. A gargoyle laughs aloud. Beyond the doors lies the hall of worship, beyond that the convent. Here he will begin his search. It will not be easy, he knows. He will have to be subtle about it, and persuasive. The sisters will be suspicious of a stranger's interest, and reluctant to confide in him. He will have to win them over first. It is going to take time. After all, he can't just walk into a convent and say, I need a virgin. June 24th Carol was staring out the window of the children's section when the little old man walked in. She looked up with surprise. Most adults remain downstairs, in the library's general reading room, and seldom ventured onto the second floor without a boy or girl in tow. Those who did were usually young mothers with a child homesick, or else had wandered up here by mistake. But this man was far from young. He looked sixty at least, perhaps a decade more and he appeared anything but confused. He made directly for where she was standing, a battered leather briefcase tucked beneath his arm, and, peeping from it, the tip of a stubby little umbrella, even though there hadn't been a hint of rain all day. In his baggy blue suit, wisps of fine white hair catching the sunlight, he cut a rather comical figure. Carol readjusted the shade and turned to meet him, she decided that he must be somebody's doting grandfather, from the way he gazed at the little girl who ran mischievously across his path. It was obvious he adored children. Approaching the window, he brought his face close to hers as if about to offer a secret. Suddenly he smiled, an impish little smile that made his eyes twinkle. I think, he said. You're just the person I've been looking for. It was Friday, the ending of an uneventful week, and the prelude to another empty weekend. She had spent the morning in bed, too tired to get up, lying naked on the sheets and staring lazily out her window. Beyond the padlocked grape that stretched across it, beyond the iron railing of the fire escape, she could see the dark bricks of the building next door, the topmost branches of a tree, a narrow ribbon of sky. Lying there in silence in the gathering heat, she'd been daydreaming of a ballet she had seen the night before, 
the whole cast dressed in bright red leotards against a field of snow. How beautiful it had been, and how unearthly! They had looked like whirling roses. She had started a letter about it to one of her older sisters, married and living in Seattle, but had put it aside before finishing the page. Somehow, as if disturbing the waters at the bottom of a pond, the very act of writing had stirred memories of a different sort, not of the ballet, but of a dream it had inspired that same night. Not a good dream, either. Something about roses. Something better left forgotten. And forgotten it had been. But all morning long a certain apprehension had remained, a flicker of unease, dancing in the shadows just beyond her reach. With an effort she had roused herself at last, shaken off the dream, turned her thoughts to job and clothes and food. Her roommate had gone out after having eaten the one remaining orange and the last of the cottage cheese. The refrigerator was practically bare, save for half a dozen eggs, and she'd recently begun to wonder if it wasn't wrong to eat even these. She had renounced meat while back at St. Mary's. Better not yield to the temptation. God, she knew, would reward her for her strength. She settled for a cup of instant coffee and a thick slice of Italian bread toasted on a fork over the top burner of the stove. Rochelle, she gathered from the emptiness of the refrigerator, was on one of her periodic diets. Lately she had taken to calling Carol anorexic with undisguised envy. The girl could be impulsively generous and good-hearted, but Carol had begun to see signs of a selfishness beneath, perhaps even a growing resentment. They had been rooming together for less than a month. Carol suspected occasionally that it might have been a mistake to move in with her, and wondered what changes in their relationship the future would bring. She herself had always been thin. Her goal was to keep her weight just below one hundred, and the last time she'd checked it, old Mrs. Slavinsky, whose apartment she had shared until last month, had owned a scale. She'd been pleased to see that she'd succeeded. Ninety-seven pounds. Food was, like so many other things in life, a test of will, something to steel herself against. As she showered, she ran her fingers through her hair, trimmed almost as short as a boy's now, and felt a wave of relief. Until last week, reluctant to waste a quarter of her paycheck at one of the city's overpriced styling shops, where rock music blared and dead-eyed young men and women chattered to one another over the inert heads of their customers, Carol had left her hair long, wearing it pinned up in a style she liked to think of as old-fashioned, but which she'd realized, in the end, was just plain ugly. Her roommate had offered to cut it, more in the spirit of adventure, Carol suspected, than of friendship, but the thought of the slovenly Rochelle wielding a scissors over her was enough to discourage such experiments. Finally, one day last week, after returning stiff and sweaty from her dance class, she had gone and cut it herself. This, too, had been an act of will. Her hair was, after all, her best feature. She knew that in other respects she was no beauty. She looked as if she might, and did, in fact, have an extremely pretty sister. Yet heads would turn to watch her even in a crowd, for her hair was thick, silky, and strikingly red. As red, so her father had once told her, as sunset through a stained-glass window. She missed her father. Poor old man, she sometimes thought, at odd moments in the day. Old he had been, as long as she'd known him, gaunt and white-haired, the pale skin hanging wearily from his bones. Old to have fathered five children, nearly two decades his wife's senior, and she herself had married in her thirties. That infant after infant had sprung from their loins seemed at once miraculous and obscene. Somehow together they had found the energy to create four daughters, Carol the third of them, until on the fifth try they'd produced a son. Here they'd stopped, presumably contented, but by then Carol's mother was herself a worn-out, shapeless woman, with shadows beneath her eyes and hair that Carol had watched go gray. And her father with the first demoralizing taste of surgery behind him, and a series of operations on the way, was suddenly preoccupied with his own mortality. 
until ill health had forced his retirement, he had made an unsuccessful living selling advertising space on billboards. His only legacy, Carol sometimes thought in anger and humiliation, was an endless parade of ugly highway signs. He had died last December, shortly before Christmas, his energy exhausted. She remembered him in his final days, sitting transfixed before the television, and later still, lying spent in the hospital ward, waiting for death, with what first had seemed stoicism, but had proved in the end to be mere resignation, something close even to boredom, no strength left to be frightened, no strength to contemplate eternal life ahead. Carol understood something of how he felt. She had seen it before. She had lived all but two of her twenty-two years in a drab little mill town up the Ohio River from Pittsburgh. And she knew what it was to be bored. She remembered her brother shooting endless solitary baskets at the hoop in their yard, and a neighbor's boy who spent each evening driving aimlessly up and down the highway, and her grandmother on her mother's side, solemn and alone in her room at the end of the hall, who told her why she always slept past ten because if I get up any earlier, it makes the day too long. There had been times in her girlhood when Carol had felt the same, but not often. Life had been too full of possibilities. She had been a princess from the fairy tales, blessed by an auspicious moon and accustomed to getting what she wanted. Inevitably, a prince would come to marry her, and together they would accomplish great things, it was only a matter of time. To this day she couldn't have said just how poor her family had been, but her years of girlhood in a tottering old two-family house near the railroad tracks had been comfortable ones. And she could recall nothing she'd really longed for, which, while her father was alive, she hadn't received, save, perhaps, a milk-white stallion, a dragon's egg, and, at one brief stage, the habit of a nun. Like her two older sisters, she had attended St. Mary's, a large, well-to-do parochial school for girls in nearby Ambridge, though by Carol's turn the family had found it necessary to accept, not without shame, some aid with the tuition. The two youngest children ended up in public school. Once again Carol counted herself lucky, or even perhaps blessed. She'd survived the years at St. Mary's with her confidence intact, though by then she'd come to think of it as faith. God, or someone, would look after her. God, or someone, always had. Not once had she stopped to question what the future really held in store. She'd been far too busy flirting with more agreeable ideas. Ballet lessons, a film career, a modern-day St. Joan, and even on occasion with the school's youthful priest, who'd been surprised to find himself mistaken for a prince. She'd met few boys her own age, except at functions with other schools, or at home in her neighborhood, and the ones she'd met had seemed, without exception, ignorant and immature, their conversation limited to the local basketball standings and the cars they'd some day own. Besides, she hadn't had the sort of figure that attracted many of them. She'd reminded herself that the sophisticated beauties of the future, the girls who turned out to be the professional models and actresses, were frequently dismissed in their school days as awkward and skinny. Most of her crushes had been confined to older girls in the school, though she'd looked with interest at the boys her two older sisters brought home. The younger and more sexually active sister had brought home a lot, one of them a slim, quiet boy with long eyelashes and poetic-looking long brown hair, had become at a Halloween party more than a year later the first person other than a doctor that Carol had allowed to touch her breasts. She had liked it so much she'd grown flushed and almost dizzy. But she'd been slow to repeat the experience, and hadn't allowed any touching below the waist. It wasn't hard to get a reputation in a small Catholic town in Pennsylvania, even in the 1970s. She had heard the way people talked about her sister, who, parochial school notwithstanding, had lost her virginity by sixteen, and had been known to go driving with men in their thirties. Carol was ashamed of this sister. It pleased her to be seen as the virtuous one. She had never quite relinquished the desire to dance, 
to act, to be a star. But in later years, as she dreamed her way through another St. Mary's, college this time, on a more than modest scholarship conveniently provided by the church, her world had grown more private and less physical. Her hours now were occupied by Thomas Akempis and Tolkien, her mind by pastel visions, the star of Bethlehem, Gandalf's resurrection, Jesus preaching to the hobbits. She'd known little of the doctor's bills and mounting debts at home, though that was where she still lived. Even when her father had been forced to quit his job, she'd been all but unaware of a change in their circumstances. Surely his condition would improve. Perhaps it was a kind of test, such as so many of the faithful had endured. Having just completed a sophomore course in the mystics, she wondered if she might not be one of them herself. She saw evidence of the divine hand wherever she looked. All around her lay the city of God, with shining towers brighter than the sun. At times she half fancied she could see the angels who populated it, insubstantial creatures shimmering like snow. She sensed that she'd been chosen, though could not have said for what. But she knew if she was patient, God would tell her. He had been curiously slow to speak. College had ended. The future was upon her, and nothing had changed. Her prince had not yet arrived. Things, in fact, were growing worse. Her father was dying. Her mother was being supported by relatives. The two older sisters had married. Having a reputation hadn't mattered after all. And there was talk of selling the house. Carol realized that she'd been a fool. She had contributed nothing. She had cost her family much. How selfish she had been, and how blind. One thing was certain. There was no place for her here. But perhaps there still was something she could do. Shaken but with expectations undimmed, the fairy tale princess had set off for New York. The change, though, had not been a drastic one. For Carol it had simply meant replacing one saint for another, another set of walls, another world of earnest ceremonies and cheerful, well-scrubbed females. St. Mary's, St. Mary's, St. Agnes's, a school, a college, a convent. The move, it's true, had not been undertaken lightly. She'd known no one in the city but a few contacts her school had provided, sisters and clerks and administrators, a list of Catholic names without faces to go with them. And New York had seemed, in her imagination, a terrifying place. But then, as it had turned out, St. Agnes's wasn't really part of New York, and there'd been little need to venture beyond its gates. She'd slipped quickly into the security of its daily routine, as if she'd known it all her life. And now even that was behind her. She was on her own at last. Twenty-two years old, and still lucky, happily ensconced in a new job without even having had to search for it. Clearly she was still among the blessed. Yet in one respect she was worse off than ever, for she was almost totally without money. Her pay after taxes was just one hundred nine dollars fourteen cents a week, and while a lifetime of poverty no doubt qualified one to walk the streets of heaven, it was depressing to think how many places in this earthly city were all but barred to her, the theaters, the clubs, the restaurants with their twenty-dollar meals, the dress shops where even a scarf or a belt was beyond her means. She was sick of avoiding such places, sick of abstaining from taxicabs, first-run movies, and hardcover books. Just once she'd have liked to be able to afford a good seat at the ballet. Sitting in the back row no longer made her feel virtuous. Life was short, and she was getting too old for games like that. Her job was less than a fifteen-minute walk, but the thought of those blazing sidewalks sapped her energy. Still she was grateful for the work, and knew how lucky she was to have gotten it. Lucky that Sister Cecilia, God bless her, had phoned her when she did, especially considering that she'd been out of St. Agnes's so long. Work was, for her, the position of junior assistant, part-time, circulation division, at the Voorhees Foundation Library on West 23rd Street. She had been employed here since the middle of May, and arrived every day at noon. 
Maury's was one of the shabbier of the city's many private libraries, and, like most of them, predated the free public system that Carnegie had built. Though it had fallen on hard times, it still maintained an extensive collection of nineteenth-century British and European literature, as well as ample general holdings, and a children's section upstairs. Dues were sixty dollars a year, but there were special rates for students, golden agers, and others, so that few members paid the full amount. The library itself occupied a staid old building on the south side of the street, less than a block from the old Chelsea Hotel, with slate-gray walls and a line of high vaulted windows along the lower story. White paint peeled in jagged strips from the ceiling. Two square pillars, tall and thick as trees, cast oppressive shadows across the floor. She spent the first part of the afternoon maneuvering an overladen book cart through the maze of cabinets, tables, and display racks that filled the ground floor. The work was slow, undemanding, and dull, and she could be alone with her thoughts. No one so much as glanced her way. By mid-afternoon, as usual, many of the available seats were taken by scholars of various sorts who frequented the special collections— Serious, bespectacled young men with dirty hair and ill-fitting suits, young, defeated-looking women as faded as the building's plaster walls, aging grad students, most of them down from Columbia or Fordham or City College, or up from NYU. Their briefcases had to be searched carefully when they left. In the past, there had been a lot of thefts. The remaining seats were occupied by elderly residents of the neighborhood, widowers, retired union men, Social Security pensioners, people with little money and lots of time. There were always a few of them, she'd heard, waiting outside the doors each morning for the library to open, pacing impatiently up and down the sidewalk, or slouched coughing in the entrance way. Once inside, they'd take a newspaper from the rack, or a thumb-smeared magazine in its clear plastic binder, and for the rest of the day they'd sit hunched over it with what seemed intense concentration— moving only to turn each page. Others would select some book at random from the nearest shelves, laying it open before them on the table. They would fall asleep, head on their arms, until closing time. The same ancient faces reappeared day after day, except in the poorest weather. They came and left without speaking a word to anyone, not even a good morning or good night. Carol didn't mind these solitary souls. In fact, she rather liked them. People that age were comfortable to be around, here within the walls of Vuri's. Amid the dusty sunlight and drowsing old men, the city seemed far away. The place, in its very routine, seemed a kind of fortress. She took particular comfort in certain familiar sights and sounds that marked her day. The buzz of the fluorescent lights, the pale figures sprawled silent and motionless over their reading, the reassuring feel of her book cart as she wheeled it down the aisle, and the books themselves, symbols of order on their backs, young adulthood reduced to Y.A., mystery reduced to a tiny red skull. When she forgot the miserable pay and put all dreams of the future from her mind, Maurice filled her with something close to nostalgia, as if, despite the years, she had never really left school. The high ceiling and the faded green walls, the solidity of the dark brown wooden shelves, the potted plants gathering dust on the window ledge, the shades above them glowing yellow in the sun and billowing like ship's sails at the smallest breeze, all were touched with a kind of holiness. Nothing, they promised, had changed. All her life, she had been hypnotized by the same great metal clock that ticked off the minutes at the front of the room. When she crowded into the little glassed-in office and pulled up a chair before her battered wooden desk, running her fingers along the pencil grooves, the places where the varnish was worn away, the ragged green blotter marked with ring stains from the coffee mug, she felt a sense of permanence that revived the years of her childhood. Only the nuns were missing, and the crucifix on the wall. Occasionally it occurred to her that, far from being out on her own, she had merely traded the school and the convent for another set of walls, so much for the expectation she'd had on leaving St. Agnes's. 
She had spent more than six months there, but in January she had moved out, convinced that her vocation, her destiny, lay elsewhere. She still believed, though some might have mocked such pretensions, that she had a destiny. Some day she would look back on her life and see the reason for it all, shining through it like a golden thread that would draw her in the end, headlong toward some brave and wonderful purpose. Her first steps in this direction, though, had been hesitant ones, and had ended in a rent-controlled two-bedroom apartment on West End Avenue and 93rd Street, where, fresh from St. Agnes's, she'd found work of a sort, as live-in housekeeper and attendant to a tiny eighty-two-year-old Polish woman named Mrs. Slavinsky. Carol's expenses, along with one hundred twenty dollars a week, had been provided by the woman's divorced daughter, who lived on the east side, and appeared delighted to have found, in this day and age, a well-bred young white girl to look after her mother. The arrangement had been, at the time, equally convenient for Carol, since it had spared her the necessity of finding a place of her own. Less agreeable was the fact that, though the job had been advertised as that of companion, the old woman was in no shape to appreciate companionship, having but slight command of English. Worse, her hearing was failing, and seemingly with it, her mind. Thus had begun four months of preparing kosher food and washing two sets of dishes, an observance Carol still found exotic, of vacuuming the worn Persian carpets and dusting the soot from the Venetian blinds, of walking the old woman to the supermarket, or the park, or the toilet, and remaining nearby while, through the winter and spring afternoons, she mumbled to herself, or snored, or squinted vaguely at the TV. The days had been monotonous. At least, Carol reflected, she'd had a bedroom and a TV of her own, luxuries she hadn't had at the convent and two nights a week she had thrown herself into her modern dance class at a school twelve blocks south on Broadway, returning stiff and elated to the brightly lit apartment, usually to find Mrs. Slavinsky and her daughter, who came to sit with her those nights, engaged in some fierce and incomprehensible argument in Yiddish. The daughter also visited on weekends, allowing Carol to take the days off, but with few acquaintances outside her dance class— and no other place to call home. Carol often found herself remaining near the apartment. She searched the want ads for interesting prospects, wondering where her talents lay, and resolved, come summer, to look into a course or two in dance therapy. The second week of May, however, she had received an unexpected phone call. It was Sister Cecilia, one of the administrators from St. Agnes's. She had just heard about a job opening, assistant librarian at some place downtown called the Voorhees Foundation, and, remembering how Carol had shown such a fondness for literature, always burying her head in a book, she had wondered if Carol might be tempted to apply. Carol had been grateful, though somewhat puzzled. The sister had never shown this sort of interest in her back at St. Agnes's. The next day, leaving the house shortly after noon as if to go shopping, it was understood that from time to time the old woman might be left alone for an hour or two. Carol had taken the subway down to Voorhees. The balding little desk clerk had raised his eyebrows with surprise. Why, yes, there was a job open in the circulation department, though it was rather strange to find someone already here inquiring about it, seeing as the officers of the library hadn't even agreed yet upon the wording of the ad they'd be sending to the Times. I heard about it from a friend, said Carol. Hmm. The clerk had pursed his lips and eyed her skeptically. At last he'd given a little shrug and admitted that, since Carol had taken the trouble to come all the way down here, perhaps there were some people she might talk to. It was, he added, absolutely perfect timing on Carol's part. The boy who'd held the job till recently had simply not shown up one day last week, and even seemed to have disappeared from his apartment. All very mysterious. "'And a shame,' the clerk said wistfully. "'He was a very sweet boy.' He sighed. Probably now he had no one to look nice for. "'But Mrs. Tate seems to prefer a girl this time.' With a pout he had sent Carol upstairs. Mrs. Tate was the circulation manager, and only one of the people who interviewed Carol that day. 
junior assistants were expected to fill in for any number of departments. Carol also talked to Mrs. Schumann, the children's librarian, Mr. Brown in acquisitions, and the sleepy-looking man in charge of maintenance. None of them seemed particularly curious about her background, or in making more than a few polite inquiries into her skills. And as the afternoon wore on, it occurred to Carol that the job was hers if she wanted it. It was so lonely. Only thirty hours a week for the present, and paying even less than she made now, that the staff was obviously not inclined to waste time evaluating applicants. Besides, if they hired Carol, they wouldn't have to pay for an ad in the Times. With all its drawbacks, Carol had felt inclined to take the job. Surely it would lead to something better. And after the round of interviews, it had, as expected, been offered. She'd realized, from the casualness with which the offer was made, that anyone who'd applied that day would probably have been hired. She'd simply had the luck to get there first. Once again she congratulated herself on her charmed life. But no sooner had Mrs. Tate invited her to start work the following Monday than Carol had had second thoughts. Doubts about the salary. The sudden necessity of finding an apartment of her own, but also misgivings, now that the decision was hers, about her eagerness to abandon old Mrs. Slavinsky. She had requested, and been allowed, a day or two to think things over. The hour had been later than she'd realized. It was nearly five by the time she'd reached home. She had noticed an ambulance parked outside the building, and an empty police car, but her thoughts had been on other things. Upstairs, when the elevator opened, she'd heard men's voices. They were coming from the old woman's apartment. Suddenly fearful, she had unlocked the door. A policeman was standing in the front room, talking to Mrs. Slavinsky's daughter, while another spoke softly on the phone. Two black ambulance attendants were unrolling something near the entrance to the old woman's bedroom. All turned to look at Carol when she came in, but the only one who spoke to her was the daughter, who explained to her quite calmly, with little apparent grief and without a trace of accusation in her voice, how, some time after Carol had gone out, she had phoned her mother, gotten no answer, tried again an hour later, still without success, and how at last she'd hurried over to find that the old woman, no doubt having returned to bed for an afternoon's nap, had somehow contrived to wind the blanket around her face. She didn't seem to blame Carol. Later, after the men had left, bearing with them the shapeless thing in the bag, she had even offered to let Carol stay on in the apartment, at least until she was able to find a suitable place of her own. But Carol was in no mood to remain there. She was too horrified by the voices in her head, the guilty one that insisted it wasn't her fault. She'd done nothing wrong, and the one that reminded her how remarkably convenient the old woman's death had been. For now she was free to take the job at Voorhees, would have to take it, in fact. Absolutely perfect timing. She reported for work at the library the following Monday, and spent part of the first week in the Chelsea Hotel just up the block. But despite the place's legendary glamour and the furtive fascination with which Carol regarded the tenants and visitors who strolled its echoing yellow halls, the hotel was too expensive. A roommate service in a shabby second-floor office on 14th Street had connected her with Rochelle, whose previous roommate had moved out. Carol was more than willing to take the tiny bedroom. It was private, at least. Rochelle, who slept on a sofa bed in the living room, had the run of the apartment. She was not the sort of person Carol would have chosen to live with, and in the month they'd been together, they had not become real friends. But, Carol reminded herself, the girl could be quite good-hearted at times, and besides, with the situation as it was, Carol knew she couldn't be choosy. She was grateful for the roof over her head, grateful she could remain in the city. For a while she'd been haunted by visions of returning home to Pennsylvania a failure, to throw herself like a child back on the support of her family. Now at least she had a job. She could survive here after all. At 2.15 today she'd been summoned to the first-floor office by the assistant supervisor, Miss Elms, a graying, harried-looking woman whose desk, opposite Carol's, was piled high with correspondence. "'You look as though you could use a change of scene,' she said. 
regarding Carol dourly over the top of her glasses. When you come back off your break, I'm sending you upstairs. Mrs. Schumann's got a four o'clock story hour, and since it's the last day of school, those kids may get a bit rambunctious. Carol would have much preferred working downstairs, but told herself that, with the weather grown so warm these days, most of the children would probably be staying outside. Remember, the supervisor added, you're not up there to read, and you're not up there to daydream. You're there to give Mrs. Schumann a helping hand. Climbing the stairs, Carol wondered if Mrs. Schumann had been complaining about her to the supervisor. If so, it seemed unfair. She worked just as hard as anyone else. There simply wasn't very much to do on the second floor, short of helping fledgling readers with the harder words and keeping an eye out for the occasional fight. Yet she knew there'd been truth in what the supervisor had said. She had recently discovered that she preferred children's books to the children themselves. All but the central desk upstairs was half-sized, a world in miniature. Work tables like low wooden platforms rose just inches from the floor, and several of the chairs came only to her knee. Though she herself was slight of build and had small, delicate features, it was hard not to feel oversized here. Like Alice down the rabbit hole or some invading giant from one of the fairy tale books in the corner. Mrs. Schumann, the children's librarian, sat placidly behind the desk. She was a heavy, slow moving woman who perspired easily and who left her chair only with the greatest reluctance. Except for her, a pair of laughing little girls and a dispirited looking preschooler trudging glumly round the bookshelves with his mother, the floor was deserted, the air oppressive and still. Above the humming of four small electric fans that turned their heads from side to side, she could hear the chugging of the Xerox machine on the first floor, the swish-swish, swish-swish of the outer doors swinging open and shut, and the tread of footsteps on the stairs. School was out. Soon the room would be filling up. The footsteps echoed hollowly in the silence of the hall, a tiny face emerged above the banister. The child peered uncertainly around the empty floor like the first guest at a party, then slunk toward the central desk to confer in urgent whispers with a librarian. Carol drifted toward the front window and stared idly down at the street. The buildings across the way were drab and dull, a large old residential hotel gone seedy, a furniture showroom, a warehouse with trucks lined up in front of it all day. The rear windows held a better view. Here sunlight slanted down upon a tiny courtyard hidden between the buildings, overgrown by creepers, vines, and weeds. It had lain black and apparently lifeless all winter, she'd been told, but in recent months had flourished, until it presently resembled a transplanted patch of forest. During free moments of the day, and when, as now, she'd been assigned upstairs before the school children arrived, Carol liked to stand by the window, glad to find some glimpse of nature amid the bricks. Below her a clump of thorn bushes were irregular green blobs upon a darker field of undergrowth and earth. An oak and two young maples struggled upward toward the light, their trunks thin as walking sticks, while delicate green fern-like vines grew up the side of the opposite building, higher than the floor on which she stood. Through the glass she watched the fronds blow and tremble in the breeze, some of which passed over the top of the open window, just below the ceiling. The shade stirred softly above her. Lifting its bottom edge, she felt the touch of cooler air upon her face. It carried the smell of soil and leaves, and, from somewhere, the faintest, most elusive trace of roses. Downstairs the outer doors went swish, swish. Swish, swish. Seen from this height, the view from the rear windows reminded Carol of a garden gone back to the wild, and she could never think of it without a queer, indefinable longing given over entirely to plants. It hinted at some mystery far deeper than the mysteries in the books that lined the wall. She felt a strangeness in it, yet without the sense of dread that wilderness on a vaster scale inspired. 
No being had ever set foot back there, at least no one she had seen. She wasn't even sure that one could reach it, for the courtyard appeared to be surrounded by high metal fences. It remained forever beyond the window pane, like a fragile green world preserved within a bottle. Suddenly, in the midst of the green, something small and black caught her eye. It lay almost directly below the library window, and half in the shadow of a thorn bush, down among the ground vines and weeds. She leaned forward to peer more closely, pressing her forehead against the glass, but from this distance it was impossible to say just what it was, only what it appeared to be, an arrangement of small black sticks protruding from a shallow hole in the earth, forming a vague pattern, a circle bisected by a line extending slightly on both sides. Carol sighed, so someone had been back there after all. Whether the objects had been dropped or buried, they were certainly a sign of human intrusion. Whatever their origin, some broken fragments of a plant, perhaps, a bit of machinery or merely litter, it came to only one thing. Her garden had been violated. She was still bent dejectedly over the window, a little surprised at the strength of her reaction, when from the hallway behind her she heard the measured tread of footsteps coming up the stairs. I'm not a young man any more, he was saying. The doctors tell me not to make any long-range plans. He smiled wistfully and blinked his mild eyes. But before I die, I'd like to finish a little book I've been working on. A book about children. They stood talking softly by the window, barely disturbing the stillness of the room. The little man's words didn't carry far and they had a gentle, lisping quality, which she found strangely soothing. His voice was high and quavery as a flute. Though at first she'd half resented him for interrupting her reverie. Why didn't he bother Mrs. Schumann if he had a problem? Why had he come straight to her? Carol had to admit that there was something rather touching about the man. For all his paunch and double chin, he looked surprisingly frail up close, and a good deal older than she'd at first supposed, perhaps well along in his seventies. He was no taller than she was, with plump little hands, plump little lips, and soft pink skin with little trace of hair. He reminded her of a freshly powdered baby. "'This will be a book about your own children?' she asked, preparing herself for an onslaught of reminiscence. He shook his head. No, nothing like that. I've never been blessed with children. Again the wistful smile, all the more affecting in so droll a figure. I do enjoy watching them, though, like those two over there. He gestured toward the bookshelves in the rear. Can you see what they're doing? My eyes aren't what they used to be. Carol glanced over her shoulder. Behind the central desk, two small girls darted silently through the aisles of books. Oh, them, she said. She wondered if she should tell Mrs. Schumann, but the librarian was leafing through a pile of catalogues. I'm afraid they're being rather naughty. They seem to be playing tag. The little man nodded. A game that predates history. Once upon a time, the loser would have paid with her life. From behind the shelves came a screech of laughter. That's the subject of my book, he went on. The origin of games, and nursery rhymes, fairy tales, and the like. Some of them go back, oh, even farther than I do. He cocked his head and smiled. What I mean is, there's a bit of the savage behind even the most innocent-looking creations. Do you follow me? I'm not sure I do. She felt a flicker of impatience. He still hadn't said exactly what he wanted. He pursed his lips. Well, take today, for instance. The 24th of June. Traditionally a very special day. 
Magic spells are twice as strong right now. People fall in love. Dreams come true. Did you have any dreams last night? I can't remember. Most likely you did. Young girls always dream on Midsummer Eve. The night just seems to call for it. But surely we're a long way from Midsummer, said Carol. The season's just begun. He shook his head. The ancients saw things a bit differently. To them the year was like a turning wheel. One half winter, one half summer, each with a festival in the middle. Winter had the Yule feast. Summer, what we're celebrating now. Midsummer day. For us, of course, the year's been flattened to death on a calendar, and Yule is just another word for Christmas. But originally it had nothing to do with Christ. The only birth it marked was the birth of the sun. Wait, you mean another sun? He laughed, a little louder than necessary. No, no, oh my, no. I was referring to that big fellow out there. He nodded toward the window. You see, Yuletide celebrates the winter solstice. Afterward, the days start getting longer. As of last night, though, we've come to the other end of the wheel. The days are growing shorter now. The sun's begun to die. Carol found herself watching the sunlight as it streamed obliviously through the window, its radiance undiminished. How odd, with all the hot days still ahead. How odd to think of it cooling, dying, growing dark. Long ago, he was saying, midsummer was a time of portents. Rivers overflowed their banks, or suddenly dried up. Certain plants were said to turn to poison. Madmen had to be confined. Witches held their sabbats. In China, dragons left their caves and flew about the sky like flaming meteors. In Britain they were known as drakes, serpents, worms, and midsummer was the time for them to breed. They say the whole countryside shook with the sound and that farmers lit bonfires. In those days that meant fires of bones, in an effort to drive them away. There were other fires, too. Fires, dancing, midnight chants to commemorate the passing of the sun. Even today there are places in Europe where children celebrate Midsummer Eve by dancing round a bonfire. At the end of the dance, one by one, they leap across the flames. It seems harmless enough, of course. At worst, a burnt bottom or two. But trace it back to the beginning and... Well, I think you can guess what you'll find. More than just a burnt bottom, I suppose. He laughed. A lot more. A ritual sacrifice. Or take a more familiar example... An innocent little counting rhyme like Eeny, meeny, miny, mo." Catch a beggar by the toe? That's it. Except that twenty years ago, before they cleaned up the language, you would have said, Catch a nigger by the toe. And two centuries ago, you'd have repeated a string of nonsense words. Bascalora, hora do. Something like that. There are hundreds of variations. The one you grew up with, incidentally, puts you... Hmm, let me see. He scratched his head. Oh, I'd say somewhere around Ohio. Am I right? Hey, that's really incredible. I'm from Pennsylvania, right across the border. He nodded, not at all surprised. A very pretty area. I know it well. Turning, he gazed dreamily out the window, sunshine playing on the little pink baby skull, the wisps of hair that glowed white with a touch of yellow. 
Carol watched him in silence as he stood before her, blinking in the light. There'd been something in his tremulous old man's voice which hinted at considerable experience, but till now she hadn't been inclined to take him seriously. Maybe it was his size, or his funny little lisp. He was far too small to be threatening. No doubt his reference to Ohio had been a lucky guess. Still, she found herself oddly impressed. Presently he turned. I'll tell you what's even more remarkable, he said. You can trace that little rhyme of yours all the way back to the Druids. He smiled at her look of disbelief. Oh, I assure you it's quite true. Once upon a time, when Britain was occupied by the Romans, it was a sacrificial chant. The Druids had a rather nasty habit, you know. They liked to burn people in wicker cages, and they used the Bascalora method to choose a victim. Basca means basket, and Laura... Isn't that Latin for straps? His smile widened. Well, bless me, you are smart. Binding straps, yes, to tie the hands. She was pleased to see the admiration in his eyes. My one good subject, she said, and allowed herself a modest smile. Briefly another thought intruded. The night sky, a mound aglow with flames, and a girl very much like herself, bound naked to a kind of altar. Something long and white was emerging from the shadows. She pushed it from her mind. I've had a lot of practice, she said. In Latin, I mean. And your subject is this type of thing? Childhood and primitive rituals? He nodded. More or less. Behind him three more children had arrived, and soon they'd be asking for her help. She would have to cut this short. It sounds absolutely fascinating, she said. But you know, you're really in the wrong place. The books we have up here, well, they're very basic, strictly for pre-teens. You want downstairs under anthropology. Or you might try looking through child development. He nodded genially. Yes, I know. I've already been down there. Voris has a very good collection. He patted the briefcase beneath his arm. Until this afternoon, in fact, I'd been looking for a certain little book, a study of Agon de Gatuan, the so-called old language. I'd searched the whole city top to bottom, and this was the only place that had it. Carol was amused at how pleased he sounded with himself. Oh, really? she said. Top to bottom. You must be pretty thorough. The city's an awfully big place. Not at all. Not when you know what you're looking for. He smiled and took a step closer. And, of course, the nice thing is, you get to meet such interesting people. If I hadn't come up here, I'd never have made the acquaintance of a charming young lady like yourself. Oh, now you're just teasing, said Carol, flattered and uneasy. She had heard this sort of thing before. There were always one or two old men who tried to flirt with her in a joking, grandfatherly way. Maybe I'd better say goodbye now. My mother always said that when a man pays a compliment, watch out. What? Watch out for a poor old thing like me? He laughed and shook his head. I assure you, young lady, I'm perfectly harmless. His smile was so dazzling that she didn't stop to wonder if he wore false teeth. I'm nothing more than a... Suddenly he looked past her. Carol saw his smile fade into a frown, and at the same moment felt an insistent tug on her sleeve. She pulled back, startled. A belligerent little white face was peering up at her. I have to have something on entomology, the boy demanded, still gripping her sleeve. With pictures. He seemed greatly put out by Carol's hesitation. Insects, he hissed, and was duly directed one row past outdoors and adventure. 
When she turned back to the little man, he was staring out the window. She realized that he still hadn't explained precisely why he'd come upstairs. No doubt he was just another lonely old pensioner who'd lived too long and read too much and now wanted a chance to tell somebody what he'd learned. As if sensing her eyes on him, he turned. Lovely garden, he said softly. Behind him the topmost vines arched toward the sunlight. I wish I had more time for nature, but that's the one thing I don't have. I'm busy every minute of the day. In that case, Carol wondered, why is he wasting time up here? The truth is, he said, there's job enough for two. I've been trying to find someone at Columbia to work with me, some bright young student, but I didn't care much for the people they sent. He shook his head. No, I didn't care much for them at all. He gazed absently toward the garden once more, then turned back to her. You know, when I was downstairs today, I couldn't help noticing all the scholars down there, looking oh so self-important as they pored over their books, but not really knowing half as much as they like to think. And I suddenly asked myself, why bother with people like that? Why not turn to a professional? I'll bet there's a children's librarian right here at Voorhees who'd be a lot more useful to me, and who'd probably be grateful for the extra work. That's why I came up here. It was just a whim. Carol's interest was stirred, but so were her suspicions. Was this funny little man about to offer her a job, or was he merely looking for an unpaid volunteer? His project sounded interesting enough but she was in no position to work for free. She hoped he wouldn't ask her. I've collected a huge amount of data over the past few months, he was saying, and I expect to be acquiring more over the summer. You know the sort of thing. Journal articles, newspaper clippings, dissertations, and so forth. More than I'll have time to read myself. He patted the briefcase again. I'm an old man. At least that's what they tell me. And frankly, I'm going to need some help. Laying the briefcase on the windowsill, he leaned toward her as if he had something urgent to confide. She noticed with approval that he smelled of talcum powder and soap. What I'm looking for, you see, is someone to read over the material, pull out the important ideas, and, wherever possible, summarize them for me. Part-time, of course. Ten or fifteen hours a week. He stood back, hands on hips. So, young lady, there it is in a nutshell. I see. She recalled the work she'd done four winters ago at college, the dark evenings at the library, and the endless pages of notes. You want a sort of research assistant? That's right, he said. Someone I can depend on. Someone who's smart, who writes well, and who has an interest in the field. He paused a moment and regarded her quizzically. The wide, gentle eyes, level with her own, seemed to float in their sockets, taking in her surroundings, her features, her hair. I feel certain that you meet my qualifications. Well, I... I do have an interest in the field, said Carol, not entirely sure what field he meant. She wondered if he'd mistaken her for a regular children's librarian instead of just one of the downstairs assistants. Dare she tell him? And dare she ask him about pay? These articles, she said at last. How would I obtain them? Well, he said softly, leaning toward her again. I rather like to do my own collecting. Idly he reached up to scratch at the corner of his eye, and Carol felt a wisp of breeze against her cheek. Above her the shades billowed and collapsed. Sometimes I might ask you to locate a particular item for me, but that won't happen often. 
We'll meet each week, and whatever's the matter? No, no, it's nothing. Please go on. For a moment, she had felt a tiny stinging just above her left temple, but already it was gone. She smoothed back her hair and tried to look interested. Well, I was saying, here, let me brush you off. His hand swept gently over her shoulder, then came away trailing several strands of her newly clipped red hair. I was just saying that we'll meet wherever's convenient, here at the library or at one of our homes. He stepped back, slipping his hand into his pocket. I live uptown, by the way, near the Hudson. It's an easy walk from the subway. He paused, as if awaiting a reply. Carol resolved not to give him her address, at least not for the moment. She remained silent. He licked his lips. None of this is important, he said at last. It can all be arranged later. Each time we get together, you'll give me your notes and I'll give you the new material, along with your pay. So there was to be money after all. And this pay would be... He laughed. I thought I'd mentioned that. I was thinking of... Twelve dollars an hour plus expenses. Does that sound all right? Twelve dollars an hour? Hastily she tried to calculate. He'd said ten to fifteen hours a week. That would be anywhere from one hundred twenty dollars to... She gave up. Her heart was beating too fast. She only knew she wasn't worth that much. He looked momentarily uncertain. If you don't... That sounds absolutely fine, she got out. She hoped she appeared composed, but in her imagination she was already buying the outfit she'd seen in a shop on Greenwich Avenue and a subscription to next season's ballet. Maybe even an air conditioner, too. God loved her. I'm glad it's satisfactory, said the little man, with the faintest of smiles. It'll be off the books, of course. Off the books? She wasn't sure exactly what that meant, except that it was something illegal. The ranks of dancers faded and the air conditioner stopped. The room grew warm again. He nodded. Was there impatience in his face? I assumed you'd prefer it that way. You won't have to give anything to your Uncle Sam. Yes, yes, of course. This was too good to be true. You mean, then, I could keep everything? That's right. You would, I take it, be interested? Yes, absolutely. This is just the sort of thing I've always been fascinated by. Fairy tales and myths and primitive religion? She finished lamely, unable to recall if this was his intended subject. He hadn't actually said anything about religion, had he? Excellent, he was saying. You sound like just the person I've been looking for. I need someone with an inquiring mind, who's not afraid of a little hard work. He unfastened the strap to the briefcase and began digging inside. It may sound old-fashioned, but, oh dear. He drew forth a plump, pale yellow book and turned it over to examine it. There were catalog numbers on the spine. Oh, for heaven's sake, look at this. I'm getting so absent-minded these days. I seem to have walked off with someone else's book. He grinned sheepishly. I'm afraid this must belong to that nice young fellow downstairs, the one with the glasses. Do you know him? At the table by the bulletin board? Carol shook her head. Well, I'll just have to make sure to return it. With a sigh, he laid the book idly on the windowsill, then turned back to Carol with a dazzling smile. Now, young lady, where was I? Downstairs, where rows of scholars frowned over texts, scribbled silently or dozed, Jeremy Frears reached for the yellow book and cursed when he realized it was gone. 
It was a dog-eared old copy of The House of Souls by Arthur Mackin, bound in saffron-colored cloth, and it had been lying on top of the pile on his desk. He searched the pile again, but didn't find it. Damn! That pesty old queer must have taken it. They had met, in fact, over that very book less than an hour before, searching for it through the labyrinth of Voorhees's open stacks. Frears had rounded an aisle in a deserted section of the library where bookshelves high as hedgerows blocked the sound from the street, and had come upon the old man hunched over the volume as if tracing its words with his finger. At Freer's approach, he had glanced up like a child caught reading pornography. He was hardly more than child size himself, in fact, and then he'd snapped the book shut. Freer's had seen him slip something hurriedly into his pocket. A pencil? No wonder the old guy had looked guilty. He'd probably been writing in the margins. There was something not quite right about the man. He didn't look as seedy and dispirited as the other old-timers who frequented the library, yet he seemed far too elderly to be an academic. He looked like the sort of man who'd play the kindly uncle in some saccharine 1940s movie, not Freer's style at all. Freer's had ignored him at first, but he'd been unable to find the book he sought on the shelves. Behind him the old man said softly, "'Could this be the one you're looking for?' He held the book out for inspection. Frears glanced at the spine. "'That's it, all right. Are you using it?' "'No, no. I'm all done.' Smiling, he handed over the book. "'Here. Take it.' Frears hefted the book in his hand. It was fat and heavy, damn it, and he didn't have much time left to look through it all. He turned to go, but a hand caught his arm. The old man was looking up at him. His voice was practically a whisper. You're familiar with Mackin? With his beliefs? No, said Frears, a little louder than necessary. I've never read him. I just want to see if I should. Once more he made as if to leave. If he stayed away from his seat too long, someone might steal his book bag. Oh, you should. You really should. The little man seemed not to care that he was detaining Frears. He knew a thing or two, our Arthur. You'll be well repaid for reading him, I promise. Frears nodded. Good. I'm glad. Turning his back, he made his way up the aisles to his table. He had a small square table to himself in the rear, just beneath a bulletin board laden with clippings and notices, like a brick wall overgrown with ivy. Throughout the spring it had been his usual place of work. The better tables, farther down the row, looked out upon the little patch of garden in back of the library, but he seldom arrived at Voorhees early enough to secure one and just as well, too. If he'd had a window seat, he'd probably have spent all day staring out at godforsaken weeds instead of finishing his work. Even without the distraction of a window view, he hadn't gotten quite as far as he'd expected over the past two months. He was still compiling a reading list for his projected dissertation, whose working title was currently Hell's Abhorred Dominions, The Dynamics of Place in the Gothic Universe though this now struck him as a little pretentious, even for Columbia. He added the Mackin to the pile already on his desk, first transcribing the publication data. London, 1906, and a list of the book's contents, some half-dozen stories. He was searching the literature at the moment, still uncertain of his dissertation's scope. Even the most unlikely books might be worth a footnote or two, if only as a way of dropping the name. The longer he could pad out his bibliography, the more unlikely it would be that the board of examiners would be able to check all his references. He was leafing through the second-to-last chapter in a Gothic bibliography, alternately amused and aghast at the titles. The Benevolent Monk, or The Castle of Olala, 1807. Deeds of Darkness, or The Unnatural Uncle, 1805. The Midnight Groan or the specter of the chapel, involving an exposure of the horrible secrets of the nocturnal assembly. 1808. 
when someone cleared his throat. He looked up to see the old man standing beside his table, smiling down familiarly at him. I wonder if I can borrow Mr. Mackenback from you for just one moment, the old man asked. Would you mind terribly? There's a passage I really ought to check. With a shrug, Frears tapped the yellow book at the top of the pile. Be my guest. Just bring it back when you're done, okay? But after opening the book, the old man showed no signs of moving. He stood riffling through page after page, and peering at each with an almost comical fervor, head darting back and forth with the movement of his eyes. Ah, here we are, he said at last. He nodded to himself. Ah, yes, yes. Frears sighed and returned to his own reading. Gonda's the monk, phantoms of the cloister, horrors of the secluded castle. But moments later the old man began to speak. We underrate evil, he said, his voice a portentous whisper. Frears looked up. What's that? We underrate evil, the man repeated, reading a passage from the book. We have quite forgotten the awfulness of real sin. What would your feelings be, seriously, if your cat or your dog began to talk to you and to dispute with you in human accents? You'd be overwhelmed with horror. I am sure of it. And if the roses in your garden sang a weird song, you would go mad. And suppose the stones in the road began to swell and grow before your eyes, and if the pebble that you noticed at night had shot out stony blossoms in the morning. Well, these examples may give you some notion of what sin really is. Finally he looked up from the book, face oddly transfigured, almost ecstatic. Marvelous, he said all but smacking his lips. What do you suppose the man is driving at? Freer shook his head, reluctant to involve himself in a discussion, yet drawn to the game. Around them several readers looked up with curiosity or annoyance. Obviously it's a kind of moral metaphor, he said, evil as a violation of normal physical law, an aberration, something like a disease, but the symbols he's dreamed up are unusual, to say the least. The old man nodded. Yes, yes, I'm sure you're right. I can see that you're a very bright young man. He smiled slyly. But then again, of course, they may not be symbols after all. For all we know, Mackin may have meant them quite literally. Frears had been glad when, at last, he'd wandered away, no doubt to bother some other unsuspecting soul. But now the damned book was gone, too. The man must have walked off with it. Frears looked around the room, but didn't see him, nor, despite the lost book, was he especially sure that he wanted to. Anyway, the day was almost over. He had his final class to teach at eight, and wanted to get home first to prepare for it, to go over his students' papers and brush up on his cahier and film comments. Celluloid, swish pens, mise en scène. Another world, that one, far from gloomy monastics and their gothic battlements, farther still from flowering stones and singing flowers. Beyond the window, several seats behind him, shadows were lengthening in the garden, doggedly climbing the bricks. He checked his watch. Almost five o'clock. He'd press on to the end of the chapter, then get the hell out of this place. Sunlight still streamed freely through the second-story windows, but suddenly the old man's eyes narrowed as if he'd seen a shadow cross the sky. Frowning, he glanced quickly at his watch. Across the room, summoned by an impatient gesture from Mrs. Schumann, now re-immersed contentedly in the catalogues that covered her desk, Carol was leafing through a stack of books on dinosaurs for the benefit of a small boy and his mother, 
while a daughter awaited her turn. He just can't get enough of them, the woman explained proudly, as her son studied pictures of steaming primeval swamps where monstrous reptiles preyed upon the weak, jaws tore flesh, and giant serpents struggled against bat-like things with sharp-clawed wings and impossibly long beaks. None of it was real, Carol told herself. None of it had ever been real. Later, searching through Perrault and Anderson to find a fairy tale for the daughter, she stole a glance at the little man across the room. He was leaning against the window sill, gazing idly at the book he'd carried upstairs. The sunlight from behind him made a nimbus of his hair. Suddenly, as if aware that she was watching him, he looked up and winked at her. His smile was radiant. Even from the other side of the room it made her feel good. So this, then, was to be her future employer. She still couldn't believe it was true. Nor could she believe that, for the duration of the summer, she would more than double her income. How could he afford to pay so much? He certainly didn't look rich. Carol recognized a cheap suit when she saw it. Was he a liar or a lunatic? And the job a hoax? Somehow she felt inclined to trust him. Perhaps he'd saved his money all his life, and now, reaching the end, found himself with no one else to give it to. She wondered how he'd made his living. For her part, she reminded herself that she hadn't been entirely truthful with him. Thank God he didn't know that she was only an assistant here. As she read a page aloud, more to mother than daughter, she prayed she looked professional. Whenever a good child dies, an angel of God comes down from heaven, takes the dead child in his arms, spreads out his great white wings, and flies with him over all the places which the child has loved during his life. Then he gathers a large handful of flowers. Lord, no, so depressing. She handed the woman a Disney Cinderella and made sure the little girl approved. Over by the window, the old man was staring at her. He nodded reassuringly. I see you have your hands full, he said, when she'd returned to his side. She laughed. Oh, today's one of our slow ones. You should come up here on a rainy afternoon. It's like a playground. She smoothed back her hair. I'm used to that, though. I grew up with three sisters and a brother. Ah, oh, really? His smile was a trifle vacant. I'm sure they're all very proud of you, coming to the big city like this. Well, I... I do hope to make something of myself, she said. Perhaps she should try to impress him, lest he change his mind about the job. As a matter of fact, I'm planning to take some psychology courses next fall, in dance therapy. If, she added mentally, I find the money. I may take night courses once or twice a week up at Hunter. He gave a courtly nod. A fine institution. I know it well. This job should help you meet some of the expenses. He began to turn away. Speaking of expenses, she began, then regretted it. Yes? His look was guarded. Well, you mentioned something about twelve dollars an hour plus expenses, and I was just wondering... She hoped she didn't sound greedy. Not that it makes the least bit of difference, of course, but I was wondering what expenses you meant. He shrugged. The usual. Paper, photocopying, typewriter ribbon. You do own a typewriter, don't you? Oh, yes, of course. That is, I have access to one. It's my roommate's. She's almost never home. Some residual bitterness from the morning made her add, And when she is, she's in no position to use it. A roommate, you say? The little man pursed his lips. Hmm. A bit of a free spirit, is she? Carol nodded. She thinks so anyway, but... She stopped herself. She really didn't mean to be unfair. It's not that she does anything wrong. We just come from totally different backgrounds. She went to a big state university. 
I went to a little Catholic school, girls only. And where might that be? He didn't sound very interested. The shadows in the room shifted as a cloud passed in front of the sun. St. Mary's, in Ambridge. The little man blinked reflectively. I'm sure you've never heard of it, she added. There are at least twenty others with the same name. She looked past him out the window. The fronds were tossing in the breeze. He moved slightly, blocking her view. Indeed I have. It's just above the highway, am I right? At the top of a hill? You're thinking of the high school, she said. I went there, too. It was spooky how much he seemed to know. You have nothing against parochial schools, I hope. Oh, no, quite the contrary. They're the only places left that still teach proper English. He moved away from the window. So you stayed within the fold, then, from St. Mary's to St. Mary's. She nodded. And then to St. Agnes's here in New York. Another college? It's a convent, actually. Over on West 48th Street. She waited to see his reaction. I spent around six months there. I've only been out since January. You? A nun? Why, I never would have guessed it. His eyes twinkled merrily. Well, not really a nun. I only got as far as my novitiate, in fact. I never even put on a habit. She noticed that, for all his professed astonishment, he didn't look particularly surprised. It was just something I felt I had to try, she added. I realize now that I joined for the wrong reasons. I mean, selfish reasons. But at the time, there just seemed no place else to go. Things were really bad at home. My father was sick, and somehow I got it into my head that if I went and took the vows, well, that things might get better. Maybe my father would recover. He nodded. He seemed to understand. A kind of sacrifice, he said. You made a very difficult choice. Yes, I suppose so. But for a while I had the feeling that it wasn't really my choice at all. I felt as if somehow I'd been chosen. She shrugged. I guess everybody feels that way at times, that they've been singled out for something special. I thought so at any rate. It was a chance to give some direction to my life, which I thought I needed. Direction. Yes. He appeared to consider this. But you didn't stay very long. Well, you see, my father died. Oh, how sad. And anyway, the whole thing just wasn't for me. I began to think about all I'd be giving up, meeting someone, falling in love, getting married. And when you start having doubts like that, you know you're in the wrong place. The memories returned. Still, I was so sure that I'd been... Chosen? She nodded. Well, he said, who knows? Maybe you have been, but for something else. Something you never even dreamed of. He did understand. She was going to enjoy working with this man. Anyway, he added, as if he'd read her thoughts. I've chosen you, and I think it's going to be a very productive arrangement for us both. He paused. I'm a little concerned about one thing, though. This roommate of yours. You're sure she won't be too much of a distraction? Oh, no, not at all. Rochelle and I get along fine. She goes her way, I go mine. If she's bringing somebody home and I have reading to do, I just go in my room and shut the door. We're different sorts of people, that's all. She thinks I ought to get more fun out of life. He snorted contemptuously. That's all very easy for her to say. She's obviously lost the most precious thing a young girl has. 
For the first time that afternoon, Carol thought she saw him glower. But perhaps it was a trick of the light. The room had dimmed perceptibly. Take my advice and stick to your guns, he said, his voice no longer so gentle or so high. I wouldn't have anything to do with the men that girl brings home. They're not for you. Carol nodded dutifully, only half convinced. You sound just like my father, she said. He was very protective of me. Well, of course, of course. That's what fathers are for, to make sure their little girls don't overstep the bounds. He shook his head. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be lecturing you. I'm sure you miss your father very much. Oh, yes. I just wish I'd known him better. But he was so old, even when I was a little girl, that I never really got very close to him. All I can do now whenever I go home is buy an occasional new wreath for his grave. Ah, yes, wreaths, the old man nodded sympathetically. I'm half tempted to make them a chapter in my book. She felt a tiny chill. You mean they're more than just a decoration? He nodded once more, but now his face was somber. In the waning light the room had fallen silent, except for the queer sing-song echo of a child reading aloud from a book of nursery rhymes. Frown thee, fret thee, jelly-corn hill. The sky outside was almost gray. You can trace all burial customs back to ancient times, he said softly, just like funeral rites. We put flowers on graves because, well, for the same reason a woman wears perfume. A corpse by any other name would smell no sweeter. She bit her lip. No, he said. It isn't very pretty, but this is the sort of material we'll be working on together. At bottom, most ceremonies are direct, distasteful, and utterly ruthless. Even the very notion of tombstones. I thought— she stopped abruptly. Something had fluttered past the window, snowy white against the dark sky and the bricks. She glimpsed a flash of wings as from a falling angel, or an impossibly white bird. I thought tombstones were simply to mark the grave. And also to weigh down the corpse, he said, his voice louder now, to prevent it from rising again. Taking the briefcase, he moved even farther from the window, and she had to turn to face him. Behind her she heard high, mournful cries. A flock of birds must be passing over the courtyard. She wanted to go to the window and look, but it would have been impolite. Mark thee, mind thee, jelly-corn hill, sang the thin, small voice of the child, echoing through the room. If crow don't find thee, mousy will. He was digging once more in his briefcase. He seemed to be in a hurry. Here, he said, withdrawing a sheaf of papers. You should find some interesting material in this batch, and you can consider it your first assignment. He handed them to her. They were photocopies of articles from various academic journals. She glanced at the top piece and frowned. Celtic Heathendom an inquiry into the epigraphy and myth cycles of fourth-century Meath. It looked rather formidable. So did the next. The ethnology of the Akamba, East African, apparently. And I'm to summarize all this? That's right. Just a page or two per article. You'll probably enjoy it. Looking at still another piece, she doubted this. Report of the Cambridge Anthropological Expedition to the Torres Straits, with special attention to... Torres Straits? Where in the world are they? The South Pacific, he grinned. As you can see, I cast a pretty wide net. Scramble thee, scratch thee, jelly-corn hill. The last one seemed innocuous enough. Notes on the folklore of the northern counties of England and the borders. 
London, 1879. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad. She reminded herself of how much he'd be paying. If Mouse don't catch thee, Molly will. He cleared his throat. She looked up to find him holding an open checkbook, pen poised. Along with the work, I think it's only fair that I give you some expense money, he said. An advance, so to speak. Oh, that would be wonderful. It won't be much, just something to tide you over for the weekend, he winked. Now, what name shall I put here? The question caught her by surprise. For a moment she had the crazy impulse to give a false name, even though it meant the check would be useless. But immediately she felt ashamed of herself. Rochelle was always making fun of her for being timid. Now was the time to grow up. What was she afraid of, anyway? God would watch over her. Carol Conklin Ah! Beaming, he wrote it in. A fine old Nederlandse name. She nodded uncertainly. But I think my mother's people came from Galway. Ah, yes, he said. I know it well. Hide thee, haste thee, jellycorn hill, if mole don't taste thee, wormy will. He extended a plump little hand. And my name's Rosebottom. Spelled just the way it sounds. No jokes, please. His old eyes twinkled merrily. You can call me Rosie. Everybody does. Not Mr. Rosebottom? Not Mr. Anything. Not even aunt or uncle, just Rosie. He slipped the check into her hand. I'll come by sometime next week and see how you're getting along. With a courtly bow, he moved off toward the stairs, swinging his briefcase. Momentarily, she saw his little pink head flash between the banisters. Bobbing lower and lower, it disappeared from sight, still smiling. The first thing Carol did, once the little man was gone, was to examine the check he had handed her. She could barely make out the Aloysius Rosebottom of the signature, for the letters curled like vines across the bottom of the paper, in contrast to the sedate A.L. Rosebottom printed at the top. Across the middle was written, Thirty dollars even. She wondered if she'd have trouble cashing it. The banks would already be closed. It was only after she had slipped the folded check into a pocket and was turning to see if anyone in the room might need her help that she discovered the little man had forgotten his book. It was lying on the window sill where he'd left it, a block of pale yellow in the waning light. Picking it up, she was surprised by its weight. It looked considerably older than she'd at first supposed, older than most of the books in the room. The cloth was worn in spots, but the front cover still bore traces of a design, imitation beardsley from the look of it, depicting what appeared to be the head of some fanciful animal. Carol could see long, supple horns, or were they antennae, and great bulging, heavy-lidded eyes. The book's spine, too, was ornamented with a Victorian-looking pattern of blossoms and leaves. Most of the title had been rubbed away, but she managed to puzzle out the words, The House of Souls. The white library numerals inked at the bottom seemed almost a desecration. That old man left this lying on the window sill, she told Mrs. Schumann, who had been going through the offerings on the magazine racks for a group of patently uninterested children. Carol held up the book. It's a wonder the binding isn't cracked, with workmanship like this. I'd better run it downstairs. Someone may be looking for it. I suppose so, said the older woman dubiously. For the first time she looked put out. You haven't done a heck of a lot of work here today. Who was he, anyway? A friend of my father's. The lie was curiously comforting, as if speaking it aloud made it true. He brought it up here by accident. Mrs. Schumann blinked in slow comprehension, ignoring two small boys who were pawing through a rack of crickets and ranger rick as Carol hurried from the room. She examined the book as she headed for the staircase. 
It appeared to be a collection of stories by someone named Mackin. She had never heard the name before, and was not even sure how to pronounce it. She wondered how her new acquaintance, Rosie, how perfectly fitting the name seemed, had managed to walk off with it. Had he thought it might pertain to his research? Perhaps they're fairy tales, she thought, and flipped through the book to see. It fell open at a story called The White People. Someone, she hoped it hadn't been Rosie himself, had scribbled a few penciled notes at the top of the page. Skimming the opening paragraphs, an earnest, rather abstract discussion of sin, she gave up and snapped the book shut. This was no fairy tale. The first floor was just as she had left it, crowded with figures pale and immobile as statues, and as silent as the storeroom of a museum. Carol sneaked a glance at the clock above the front desk. She had a watch at home, a long-ago Christmas present, but it was broken, and she'd never had enough money to have it repaired. Till now, she reminded herself. It was nearly five-fifteen, with still an hour and a half to go before Miss Elms flicked the light switch and announced closing time. For a minute or two, there'd be no reaction except irritated sighs. Then, one by one, the statues would return to life. Among the grad students, there'd be a faster riffling of pages. Sleepers would lift their heads and shake off the hours of dream. Gathering up books and jackets, they'd shuffle, grumbling and blinking toward the front desk. A young fellow with glasses, Rosie had said. Sitting by the bulletin board, Carol looked around and immediately recognized the one he'd met. He was a frequent visitor to the library, a plump, distracted-looking young man with sandy hair cut squarishly short. He wore a faded plaid sport shirt open at the neck, its sleeves rolled up over thick, freckled arms. A blue seersucker jacket, clearly in need of pressing, was draped over the back of his chair, and a red cloth book bag, empty now, lay crumpled by his elbow on the table. He was squinting into an oversized volume, a directory of some kind from the reference section. A yellow pad beside it was covered with hasty-looking notes. Approaching him, she cleared her throat. Up and down the aisle, heads turned to watch her. Excuse me, she whispered. He looked up with annoyance, but on seeing Carol his expression softened. Perhaps he recognized her, too. She held out the yellow book. I think this may be yours. Mine? He peered uncertainly at the book, then nodded. Oh, yes, he said, reaching for it. Great. He kept his voice low. Where'd you find it? As he took the book from her, his eyes gave the tiniest flicker, and for an instant she felt his gaze drop to her breasts. It seemed almost a formality. She'd even known priests to do it. Someone brought it upstairs by mistake. He smiled bitterly. Yeah, and I'll bet I know who it was. That weird old guy I ran into today over in the stacks. She laughed. Once more, heads turned. You mean Rosie. He's very nice, really. He's working on a book. And I'm helping him, she wanted to add. Well, he's damn near kept me from working on mine. I was hoping to get through this by the end of the day. He tapped the Mackin volume. And now I'm not going to have time. Am I allowed to check it out? Not this one, she whispered, even before she'd glanced at the call numbers to make sure. Special collection. It can't leave the library. He scowled. I was afraid of that. Maybe I can Xerox some things in it before I leave. He pushed back his chair. Carol saw herself about to be dismissed. Wait, she said impulsively. I'll do it. The only alternative was to go back upstairs with the children and their mothers and the slowly growing wrath of Mrs. Schumann. I have access to the copy room, she explained, and I think the machine's free now. She hadn't heard it working at any rate. Hey, that's really nice of you, he said. Thanks a lot. 
He opened the book to the front and ran his finger down the list of contents. Let's see. I'll probably just need the great god Pan and the inmost light. He peered speculatively at the titles. And maybe the one that old man was going on about. The white people. He handed her the book, then searched through his wallet and pulled out a ten-dollar bill. I don't know what it'll come to. You can bring me change. Everyone's giving me money today, thought Carol as she followed the line of shelves past the administrative offices toward the windowless little copy room in the rear. My luck must be changing. Taped to the dark wooden door, beneath a sign that said no admittance, staff only, hung a sheet of paper reading, See Mrs. Tate at front desk for copy vouchers. Inside, the air smelled of sweat and machine oil. A portable fan on a table in the corner did little to alleviate the heat. Mrs. Tate's aide, a furtive, narrow-shouldered old man who seemed as suited to the room as a hermit to his cave, was bent over one of the two silent machines, its immense glass and metal top lifted open like the hood of a stalled automobile. Oh, no! said Carol. Is it broken again? The second copier she knew had been out of commission for months. Replacement parts seemed to be permanently on order. The man had looked up as she came in, but was now bent back to the machine, tentatively prying at something with a screwdriver. He reminded Carol of the witch in Hensel and Gretel, about to be swallowed up in the oven. She was fine until an hour ago he muttered. But when I came back from my break, he strained, grimaced, something came away inside with a clank of metal. Well, she's on the fritz now, all right. Standing, he wiped his hands and regarded her suspiciously. You catch anybody coming in here while I was gone? No one I saw. Sighing, she filled out a mimeographed voucher, and left the book atop a pile of others to be copied, paper markers dangling from them like prize ribbons. It's not your lucky day, she told the young man at the table, handing him back his money. Both machines are broken down. Those copies of yours won't be ready till Monday at the earliest. He cursed softly. Oh, great. I'm leaving town Sunday morning, and I won't be back till the end of summer. Well, if you like she whispered, as to a disconsolate child. I could copy what you need and mail it to you with an invoice. He looked up with surprise. Really? Sure. We do it for people all the time. After all, it's what you're paying for. You ought to get something for your money. He eyed her appreciatively, as if, despite what she'd just told him, she had offered to do him a personal favor. Yes, he said his voice low. That would be terrific. But, you know, I'm not technically a subscriber. I'm here on an academic discount. Does that matter? That's all right. Just tell me where you want it sent. He folded the pad back to a fresh page. It's an RFD out in Jersey, he said, writing it down. I don't know the zip. It's such a weird little out-of-the-way place I'm not even sure they have one. She felt a touch of envy. She'd be right here next week. He'd be off in the country. Sounds nice to get away to. Yes. It's like going to an earlier century completely cut off from the world. I can't believe I'll be out there this time Sunday. He smiled as he tore off the page and handed it to her. I'll probably get culture shock when I come back. RFD 1 Box 63, she read. Gilead, New Jersey. She handed it back to him. You forgot to write your name. He laughed, then looked sheepish as several nearby readers peered angrily up from their books. Jeremy, he whispered, writing it down. Jeremy Frears. He pointed his finger at her like a pistol. It's the kind of name that ought to have a cult detective after it, don't you think? Once upon a time it was Freiriker, I'm told, but somehow it got trimmed. He paused. 
and what's yours? This time she hesitated only a moment, though she knew that this person, unlike little old Rosie, could potentially do her harm. Carol Conklin, from an equally out-of-the-way place in Pennsylvania. God, why had she volunteered all that? What was the matter with her? It wasn't as if this man was going to call her. By Sunday he'd be far away. And why would she even want him to call? He wasn't her type at all. He was looking up at her with a little half-smile. Are you one of those farm girls I keep hearing about? She was wondering what sort of wise guy answer he expected when, from the corner of her eye, she saw a movement. At the front desk, Mrs. Tate, the supervisor, thin and turkey-necked, with dyed blonde hair, was staring in her direction. As Carol turned toward her, she made a gesture of impatience. Uh-oh, Carol whispered. I've got to go. He looked disappointed. Well, anyway, here, he said, thrusting the sheet with his name and address at her. You'll need this. She was already preparing her story and trying to look busy as she approached the front desk. He needed some research material, she explained, holding up the paper he'd given her. He'll be away and wanted me to copy it for him. Fine, the supervisor said, not at all interested. Let him fill out a request form before he goes. Now put that paper in your desk and come back out here. There's lots you should be doing. You don't get paid to stand around flirting with the patrons. Blushing and annoyed, Carol deliberately avoided looking toward the young man's table as she hurried across the floor, past the magazine racks and reading section, toward the office in the back. It was empty except for Mr. Brown, in charge of acquisitions, who looked up guiltily from his post as she came in. He smiled when he saw who it was and continued to watch her, baggy eyes glittering with more than friendliness, as she slipped the sheet of paper into a clipboard she kept on her desk. She had suddenly begun to feel very resentful of Voorhees, of having to take orders from everybody in the place, and of the job itself, which had spoiled the one chance she'd had in, God, in months, it seemed, to talk with a man who seemed frankly interested in her. She felt the great gray mass of the library building overhead, a crushing weight bearing down on her shoulders. Emerging from the office, she saw with surprise that the young man was gone, his seersucker jacket no longer hung over the back of the chair. And the desk was empty, save for three or four library books that someone on the staff, probably Carol herself, would soon be replacing on the shelves. She felt a surge of anger, almost of betrayal. He had simply packed up and left, without even saying goodbye. She'd been no more than a servant to him, like a waitress or a clerk, just someone to mail him some research material. What an idiot she'd been to believe, even for a minute, that he was interested in her. And to think she'd actually gotten yelled at for it. She was passing the high shelves and narrow aisles of the special collections, just beyond the card files, when she heard someone softly call her name. She turned. There he was, standing just within one of the aisles, like a fugitive loitering in an alley, reluctant to set foot beyond it. His jacket was tucked under one arm, his book bag by his side, as if he were about to make an escape. Grinning, he motioned for her to join him. Carol, he whispered. It was somewhat flattering to hear him speak to her so familiarly. I was just thinking, since you seem to have a country background and all. She was about to correct him. She hadn't meant to give him that impression. But then she saw that he'd obviously rehearsed the next part. I thought you might be interested in the film I'll be showing tonight. It's all about growing up on a farm. You're showing a film? Yes. I teach down at the new school one night a week. The Cinema of Magic. Tonight's the last class. We're going to look at a film called Les Jeux Interdits. Pardon? He had switched languages so effortlessly that she hadn't followed him. He leaned closer as if imparting a password. Forbidden games. I've never even heard of it, whispered Carol. Is it in French? He nodded impatiently, 
and she was afraid she'd sounded stupid. It takes place on a farm during the Second World War, he said. Two little children form a secret club. They collect the bodies of animals, a beetle, a lizard, a mole, and bury them with elaborate magic rituals using tombstones stolen from the local cemetery. The whole world is viewed through their eyes. It sounds interesting, whispered Carol. She was getting nervous about all the time this was taking. She was supposed to be reporting back for more work. Well, look, he said. Why don't you come tonight? You might enjoy it, and I can get you in free. He smiled. Everybody else has already paid seven bucks for the privilege. Well, yes, that might be fun, she said hurriedly, thinking of the empty night ahead. I could just walk in? Sure. It starts at eight. Room 310. At the end of the hall, just follow the crowd. You know, I just might. Only tonight's my late night. I don't get out of here till eight. She wondered if she might be sounding too eager. Unthinkable to let him see she had nothing to do. He shook his head. Oh, that's no problem. We never begin exactly on time. And the new school's what? Only ten blocks south of here? That shouldn't take you long. I'll try to make it, she said. I really will. She wasn't exactly sure where the school was, but she knew she could ask someone on the way. Listen, I've got to go. They're waiting for me at the main desk. Oh, yes, of course, he said quickly. I've got to go, too. He slung the red bag over his shoulder. Well, then, he shrugged. I guess I'll be looking for you tonight. Without waiting for an answer or giving her time to change her mind, he turned and headed toward the door. She took another twenty-minute break. Afterward, allowed to remain downstairs by the grace or mere inattentiveness of Mrs. Tate, Carol found it hard to concentrate on her work, not that logging a stack of new acquisitions into the card file near the center of the floor required much thought. She was thinking about the evening ahead, wishing she had a chance to go home and put on something a bit more flattering than the blouse of her sister she was wearing today. It was always that way. The important people came along when you were wearing hand-me-downs. Not that this would be a real date, of course, but it was the closest thing she'd have to one all weekend. She'd have preferred to look nice for it. Her life had suddenly grown more complicated, richer in possibilities, a train back on the tracks and moving at last, building speed. Between Rosie and Jeremy, this had been a very special day, and she felt sure there'd be more like it ahead. When Mrs. Tate reassigned her to the bookcase beneath the south window to arrange a bound and dusty set of natural history, she took advantage of the solitude and lost herself in daydreams. At last, knees aching, she stood up and smoothed down her skirt. Before her, just beyond the window, lay the garden, always wilder looking at this level, a cool and silent world enclosed in glass and brick, the young trees swaying somewhere overhead in an unheard breeze. And wilder still at this hour of the afternoon, when surrounding buildings blocked the sunlight. It was like looking into the darkness of the woods. You could almost forget where you were. And then, with a momentary chill, she remembered the small black shapes she had seen from the floor above. Rising on tiptoe, she leaned over the tops of the shelves and peered outside. Yes, there they were, near the wall below the window, deep in shadow and half covered by earth. There was something familiar about the things. She squinted into the darkness, then gasped at what she'd recognized the charred remains of some small animal. A hand touched her shoulder. I thought I sent you upstairs, said Miss Elms, the assistant supervisor, standing beside her. I had to return a book down here, and Mrs. Tate said I might as well see that these magazines... She paused. Her eye had been caught by a reflection in the window pane. For an instant... She thought she'd glimpsed a little pink face peering at her from the dim light of the hallway across the room. Could it be Rosie? Had the little man come back for her? 
she turned. The outer doors went swish, swish, and the hallway was empty. Well, don't stand around here all day, said Miss Elms. You seem to have this set put away, and there's a dozen other things you could be doing. I was just trying to get a look at what's out there, said Carol. She pointed toward the garden. See? Below the thorn bush. The woman adjusted her spectacles and glared suspiciously through the window. Damned kids! She shook her head. How the hell did they get back there anyway? That gate's supposed to be locked. She let the glasses fall around her neck. Looks like someone's had themselves a chicken dinner. Chicken? The relief showed in Carol's face. Hell yes, said Miss Elms. There's a barbecue place over on 8th Avenue. You know the one I mean. She checked her watch. Now how about giving a hand up front? They'll be lining up with their books in a minute or two. Carol followed her toward the desk. Behind them, unheard, the wind in the courtyard grew, tossing the vines and scattering leaves from the young trees. Something white danced past the window, blown from beneath the bush where it had lain. A clump of delicate white feathers, stained red at the tip. The sky is red and gold above the water. The water glows a darker red and in each swims the pale shape of a half-moon. Strolling southward along the river, the battered leather briefcase tucked tight beneath his arm and time like a toy in his hands. The old one pauses just long enough to appreciate the symmetry. A half-moon in the early evening sky, its counterpart reflected in the ripples on the water. Two halves of a shattered eggshell, with no chance it will ever be restored. Here indeed is a sign, a token of the Mogu Vul. Soon the egg will be broken, the beast awake. White shapes plunge and scream in the air above him, and down the waterfront soot-blackened rooftops echo with the sound. He turns and continues southward, smiling, heedless of the mournful cries. His legs are short and his progress slow but he is in no hurry. Shadows are advancing on the city to the left, and tiny lamplit windows are beginning to stand out on the dark shapes of the buildings. Higher windows still catch the reflected light. To the right, the river glistens where golden columns of sunbeams pierce a band of cloud. Unseen in the distance, yet so palpably close, he hears every breath, the community of farmers out beyond the low hills is now assembling for the planting, dutifully observing the customs of the clan, reciting their silly prayers, muttering hosannas to their silly god. Closer still, within his sight, silhouettes of oil tanks and factories rise along the farther shore, while above them the moon hovers just out of reach, alien, serene, and growing brighter with each passing minute. A pair of lovers catches the old one's eye, clasped obscenely on a slab of concrete above the water, then the ungainly figure of a jogger and a small white dog that capers on the grass. He would like to lure it out onto the highway, but now he knows is not the time. He has a more important task ahead, and a destination waiting, imperative that he be hidden in the shadows when the man and the woman emerge from what will be their second meeting. The woman, what a find she is, the greedy little bitch. It has been painstaking work, opening that library job to her and easing her into the slot, but it has been worth the effort. She is perfect. Perhaps, he smiles, he should send a contribution to the convent of St. Agnes. Of course, that man-crazy roommate of hers may prove a problem. But that is no great matter, in view of what he has accomplished today. Initial contact has been made, and the interview has gone according to plan. The players have been chosen, the great wheels set in motion. 
swinging his briefcase there on the sidewalk, with the Friday night traffic rushing past him in a blur. He laughs aloud. An old man's high-pitched cackle. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Indeed. How easy it has been. Frears looked for the fifth or sixth time at his watch, and at last yielded to a bitterness he could no longer argue away. A quarter after eight, and the thin redhead from the library hadn't shown up. Probably she'd only been humoring him. But damn it all, she'd really seemed to like him, and her interest had been all the more exciting because she'd clearly been at pains to disguise it. Unlike the young women in his classes, whose seductive manner made him feel so old, even when their ages were the same as his. The girl's very thinness had been alluring, as if by some magic it could compensate for his own excessive bulk. Tonight's final screening had seemed like the perfect way to meet her again, yet apparently he'd misjudged her. She hadn't shown after all, and the brightly lit double-sized classroom was almost filled. Few of the faces out there meant much to him. He was going to be in a bad mood tonight. Midway across the room, one of the more ass-kissing students was standing officiously by the light switches near the door, waiting like a little soldier for his signal. Farther back, beside the pair of sixteen-millimeter projectors, the T-shirted projectionist was eyeing him impatiently. Well, there was nothing he could do about it now. He couldn't hold things up any longer. There'd always be a few latecomers, of course, slipping in noisily and unapologetically half an hour or more into the film. Fully half the class were art students from Parsons with no sense of time. But if he waited any longer, the punctual ones, the ones who wrote the long, carefully typed papers, and raised their hands in class, and got themselves in a sweat over grades, would rightly begin getting irritated. Already the students were beginning to forget where they were, the conversation around him growing in volume. Looking to the boy by the light switches, he gave a short nod. The room vanished in darkness, pierced only by a cone of white light whose base was on the screen. Dust motes and cigarette smoke, formerly invisible, drifted through it like ectoplasm from the spirit world. Frears turned and was feeling his way toward the nearest wall, preparing to stand for the first part of the film, then maybe slip out in the middle and read some journals he'd brought in his bag, when a soft, husky voice whispered urgently, Mr. Frears! Donna, several rows to the right, curly-haired and full-breasted, her wide, heavily-made-up eyes discernible even in the darkness, was gesturing at him and pointing to a seat next to her. One of the silver, gypsy-like earrings she always wore caught the projector light. There were one or two like her in every class, easy, aggressive, ultimately more possessive than one might have thought. He seldom let it get that far. Mr. Frears, she said again. She waved an invitation. Ah, oh, well, the thin girl from the library wasn't coming, and Donna was nice, too. Kind of exotic, in fact, and by no means dumb. Careful not to stumble over the rows of protruding feet, he threaded his way toward her through the darkness. The woods were a patchwork of shadow and light. Beside her flowed the river, sunshine dappling the reeds. Wide-eyed, obviously dazed, the little girl stumbled down an uncertain path, following the river bank as it skirted the edge of the forest. In her arms she clutched something small, white and limp, a teddy bear, perhaps, or some other nursery toy. The angle shifted, and Carol leaned forward to see. This was no toy. In her arms the girl was clutching a dead dog. No one around Carol seemed surprised. They looked amused, in fact, or passive, or bored. Several were whispering to their neighbors, barely watching the film, and down the road to her left an unshaven youth was slouched back in his seat, his eyes already closed. The woman one row in front appeared to be taking notes, but when, after five minutes, she'd failed to look up, Carol realized that she was writing a letter. The room was hot from body heat and foggy with cigarette smoke. 
because the floor was perfectly flat and the screen too low, it was hard to read the subtitles from the bridge chairs in the back. People's heads kept getting in the way. Carol hadn't dared leave the library until work ended, and Jeremy must have misjudged the time it would take her, because even with good directions she'd arrived here nearly twenty minutes late. She was already beginning to regret that she'd come. She couldn't find Jeremy in the darkness and was feeling uncomfortable and alone. On the screen the little girl and a young peasant boy were performing a kind of funeral ceremony for the dead dog, which they'd buried in the earthen floor of an abandoned mill. Placing a primitive wooden cross atop the mound, the boy clambered up to the loft and, reaching into an owl's nest built high in the rafters, removed the tiny body of a mole. This he buried beside the other grave. That way, he said, the dog would not be lonesome. When the little girl contributed her rosary beads, he draped them solemnly over the cross. Watching distractedly, Carol still felt herself touched by the scene. It awakened memories of her own childhood, and of the secret religious rituals she'd enacted without quite knowing why. The rest of the film, unfortunately, was dominated by the adults, a slack-jawed, clownish lot. They were caricatures, all of them, and impossible to care for. Carol's back began to ache from leaning forward in her seat, and she found her attention wandering even more. Down the row the unshaven youth was still asleep, the film's shifting light playing over his features like the shadows of a dream. This same light was reflected in the glasses of a stout young man several seats farther ahead, sitting bolt upright near the wall, his legs swinging impatiently back and forth. Was it Jeremy? Carol strained to see him more clearly, but in the darkness it was hard to be sure. For a moment, as if responding to her thoughts, he seemed to turn toward her, though his eyes were concealed by the glare from off the screen. But then a dark-haired woman sitting beside him leaned toward him to whisper something in his ear, and he turned away. In the end, like lovers, the two children were parted, and Carol felt the customary lump form in her throat. The boy kicked over the crosses, trampled the mounds, and hid the rosary forever in the owl's nest, while, rigid with dread, the girl was led off like a prisoner, and lost amid the crowds and confusion of a refugee center somewhere far away. Until this moment, the story had been set within the rural isolation of a farm, and it had been easy to forget that, beyond the cornfields and the pastures, a modern world was speeding toward destruction. She looked back at the young man near the wall. Yes, she was sure now it was Jeremy, in time to see him whisper something to his dark-haired companion. The woman turned to face him, smiled, and whispered something back. Her hand touched his shoulder familiarly. Carol felt a stab of disappointment so intense it made her catch her breath and look away. She saw that she'd been duped into coming here. She'd been a fool to have expected anything else. So much for her daydreams. Moments later at the front of the room, the screen was filled with fan, like a gate slamming shut upon the characters' lives. By the time the overhead light came on, they had already receded into memory. But Carol herself was already gone. She had gotten to her feet and slipped out the door before the film had ended. She'd arrived at the new school, with light still coloring the western sky. Departing now, she stepped outside and found herself in darkness, broken only by the melancholy glow of street lamps and a scattering of windows lit behind drawn curtains. Above the chimneys and the ventilator ducts, a chip of moon looked small and far away. After the heat and glare of the classroom, the cool night air with its solitude, its silence brought a kind of relief. She walked listlessly, though, weighed down by a sudden feeling of fatigue, and beneath it, a dull, unspoken loneliness. Several couples passed her as she made her way up the block, couples her own age, bound for a party, a disco or a bar, and something in their voices made her feel painfully old. She was halfway to Sixth Avenue when, passing the doorway of an apartment house, she caught the smell of garlic, tomatoes, and cheese, 
and remembered that she had not yet eaten dinner. Her hunger had been forgotten for the duration of the film. Now it returned with a rush. Normally she'd have stopped at the all-night bodega at the end of her street to buy a package of spaghetti or a box of rice. But tonight the idea of cooking in that cramped, steamy little kitchen, with the ever-present roaches crawling just behind the stove, was too dispiriting to consider. When she reached the avenue she paused. Tired as she felt, it was still too early to go home. Home, in fact, seemed a rather dismal prospect, the more she thought about it. Rochelle would be up there with her new boyfriend tonight, the boisterous one who seemed so proud of his body and left coarse, dark curls in the sink and tub. The kitchen would be piled high with pots and dirty plates. The TV would be on, loudly, no doubt, but almost totally ignored. The two of them would be far more interested in each other. No doubt, too, they'd resent any interruption. The Rochelle would be more resentful than the boyfriend. He'd made one pass at Carol already. The television belonged to Rochelle, and so did, in effect, the living room itself, since this was where she slept. Carol would be confined to her bedroom, trying to read or write letters above the sound of the TV's canned laughter and the less easily ignored laughter of the lovers. Holding that image firmly in mind, she turned left on the avenue and headed toward the lights and crowds of 8th Street, resolved that something good would happen to her before the night was through. The night is growing dark now, but his mood is darker still. His wrinkled face is frozen in a scowl. From the shadowy recesses of an alley, across the street, he has seen the woman leave alone. Something has gone wrong. Where is the man? The two of them are supposed to be together. But perhaps it may still be arranged. Stealthily he pads from the alley and into the street, moving toward the entrance of the school. In the classroom on the third floor, Frears and nearly a dozen of his students, some habitual sycophants, some who genuinely liked him, were still gathered near the front desk. After the film, a far larger mass of them had surrounded him like a mob of petitioners. A few waving their late reports at him, their excuses loud and earnest, others eager to get their papers back and quarrel over the grade. It had taken him nearly fifteen minutes to get them sorted out, and, as it was the final class, to write down the addresses of the students whose papers he would have to mail back over the summer. His red book bag was stuffed once more with work. Now only the most loyal were left, clustered around him at the front of the room. Donna was among them, pretending to be interested in the topic at hand, but fooling no one. Frears took advantage of every opportunity to catch her eye. She was the best-looking thing in sight. Listen, he was saying, half seated on the desk, in a manner that allowed him to take the weight off his feet, but still keep his head on a level with theirs. A lot of you seem to think that superstition disappeared from the human scene somewhere between the talkies and TV. His eyes swept the group, daring them to look away. I only wish it were true. But it's just not so. I mean, think hard. How many buildings have you seen lately with a thirteenth floor? One of the younger men smiled. A good-natured long hair, or so he'd always seemed, who all this semester seemed to have enjoyed feeding Frears his best cues. Everyone liked a good straight man. Oh, come on, Mr. Frears. That thirteenth floor stuff is just a joke nowadays. Believe me, said Frears, it's no joke. There are people in this country, even today, who think it'll rain if they pray hard enough. They're out there right now, happy as can be, brewing their love potions, warding off the evil eye setting traps for demons. They tell time by the stars, just like their grandfathers did, and they still plant corn by moonlight. It was the Poroths he was thinking of, Sar's gloomy frown, Deborah naked under that severe black dress. The student was still regarding him with amused skepticism, probably putting on an act for Donna and the rest. Or maybe it just seemed funny to him that a pudgy city boy like Frears should talk knowingly of old-time country ways. 
Frears dug deep into his wallet and pulled forth a dollar bill. You know, he said, I can't resist this little test. He nodded to the younger man. You're obviously one of those rare beings we all hear about. A totally rational man. And so I want to give you this dollar as a gift. He waved it theatrically in the air. Several of the onlookers turned to one another and grinned. What was old Frears up to now? All I want in return, he continued, is a simple little note, signed and dated, selling me for one dollar. He leaned forward. Your immortal soul. The others laughed, and Donna managed to get in a slightly too enthusiastic, Oh, Mr. Frears! The younger man eyed the money, smiling uneasily, but made no move to comply. You want it in writing, huh? Frears nodded. That's all. Just a scrap of paper with your name on it and the words, This is to certify that I sell my soul to Mr. Jeremy Frears. Forever. The student laughed but shook his head. Why take a chance? He said, shrugging. Exactly. It's Pascal's wager in reverse. Frears stood looking flushed, and stuffed the dollar back into his pocket. He turned to the rest of the group. So you see, kiddies, the old fears die hard. We're not out of the woods yet. His thoughts were on the farm again, out there in the night across the river. Behind the smiling faces of his students, darkness waited at the windows like a living presence. And now he said, suddenly tired. Maybe it's time we adjourn for the summer. I've got a lot of packing to do. Hey, anybody up for a drink? The long-haired youth asked brightly, as if it had just occurred to him. He glanced quickly around the circle, lingering an extra second on Donna. Several of the others voiced an interest in going. Donna remained silent, leaving herself free, Frears realized. He wondered how he could go off with her without making it too obvious. Now, if any of you still have problems with your papers, he said, deciphering my handwriting or disagreeing with my comments, we can... Uh-oh, what's going on here? The lights in the classroom blinked once, then again. After the second time, only the light directly above them came back on. Freer saw Donna reach nervously in his direction then draw back her hand. Sorry, you folks. Gotta clear this room. They turned. The voice, wheezy with age, had come from the shadows at the other side of the room. Dimly they could make out a small figure standing outlined in the doorway, silhouetted against the light from the hall. He appeared to be dressed in a shabby gray uniform several sizes too large. There was a push broom in his hand. He was holding it before him like a weapon. "'What's the rush?' said Frears. "'We've always stayed this late before.' The figure in the doorway seemed to shrug. "'End of the year,' he said softly. "'Gotta clear the room.' Donna's lip curled. "'Boy, these goddamned janitors think they own the school.' She glanced at Frears for support, but he was reaching for his jacket. Oh, well, he said. I guess we've been here long enough. Gathering up a few remaining papers and stuffing them into the bag, he began moving toward the door. Awkwardly, the others filed out, brushing past the small gray figure who had turned away and was busily dragging through the doorway a large brown trash barrel almost as big as he was. Its wheels squeaked unpleasantly behind them. Outside in the light, Frears stood slouching in silence by the hall elevator, but several of the younger students headed for the stairs. "'Come on!' called one. "'It's just two flights!' With a sigh, Frears straightened up and moved toward the stairway. The ones remaining followed him. All except Donna, who reached worriedly to her ear. "'Damn!' she muttered. Her left earring was gone. The others had already started down, 
The hall was silent. Frowning, she searched the floor around her, then turned back toward the classroom. From its shadowed interior came a faint, irregular squeaking, then silence again. Hesitating a moment, she strode through the doorway and disappeared inside. Do you mind putting on a light in here? Her voice echoed in the hall. I'm trying to find... There was a thud, a high-pitched little laugh, and then a protracted series of cracking sounds, as of the splintering of wood. Moments later came another sound, the crunch of compressed paper, as from an object being stuffed into a wastebasket. With a snap, the final light went off, and then a small gray figure emerged from the darkness, pushing a laden trash barrel, its wheels squeaking rhythmically as he steered it down the hall. To this noise, as if softly in counterpoint, he was whistling a tuneless little song. Outside, the group had begun to disperse. There's no sense in waiting, said one of the women. She's certainly not up there. The others followed her gaze. She was staring at the darkened windows on the third floor. Right, said a young man. She must have gone on ahead. They turned to Freer's. He looked puzzled and somewhat annoyed. Well, he said at last, shrugging. Tell her when you see her that if she wants to talk about her paper, she'd better call me first thing tomorrow, because she won't be able to reach me after that. Slinging the bag over his shoulder, he nodded goodbye. Maybe I'll be seeing some of you next fall. Have a pleasant summer. Two of the students walked westward with him as far as 7th Avenue, but then, as Frears turned south, they repeated their goodbyes and went their separate ways. Smiling at what he's performed back there in the darkness, he slips from the doorway of the school, averting his face from the glare of the street lamps. Beyond the glare, half hidden by the city's fumes, the night's first constellations glimmer faintly to the east, while before him in the northern sky, Draco sweeps sinuously round an invisible pole star. To the west there are no signs at all save a lonely, broken moon. He has no need for signs now. He knows where the stars tremble cold and unseen overhead, and where they did so fifty centuries ago, and will do so five thousand years hence. No matter that the Milky Way is gray with smog, or that lamplight hides the familiar shapes of Gemini, Capella, and the Lynx. He knows just where to find them, knows as well their real and ancient names. And he knows the land below them, knows it as a general knows terrain that's ripe for conquest. Far across the river where the sun has disappeared lie the dominions of the unsuspecting world. Beyond the dark horizon, men and women fight and scheme and struggle. Others toil in a field like figures in a biblical tableau, chanting as they work. He can almost hear their song. They will be his special playthings, these farmers, they will suffer first. His man frears, his fat, unwitting tool, will see to that. Soon. Soon. Swift as death, he moves along the block in their direction, noting as he hurries across the avenue a paunchy, rumpled figure with a book bag and a seersucker jacket. Frears himself, one block farther south, plodding gamely toward their common destination, unaware that he is headed anywhere but home. One avenue west of him, nearer the water, the old man turns southward too, jauntily swinging his briefcase, already eager to play his next part. He pauses once in his journey to cock his head and listen for the voices. Before him the sky is stained red with neon, but to the west it shimmers with the whiteness of the moon. As he passes between the buildings, he can see dim lights on the river, the distant shore, and above it, the places where the stars will soon come into view. The stage is being set. Soon the fools will get what they deserve. Let them sing while they can.
Scramble thee, scratch thee, gilly corn hill. If mouse don't catch thee, mole he will. In the moonlight, the women were planting corn. They labored side by side, the seven of them, and in the gathering darkness, they looked much alike. All were young, all married. All but one had borne a child. Their long hair hung down their backs, loose and unadorned, but their bodies were concealed, neck to naked ankle, beneath dresses of homespun black. From a distance, only the burlap sacks they carried at their sides were visible, and their pale white faces floating like will-o'-the-wisps over the empty field. Ahead of them walked the seven men, treading stiffly in their starched white shirts, black vests, and high black leather shoes. They moved together in silence, grave of expression, faces clean-shaven but for the fringe of beard below each chin. As in a close-order military drill, they carried long wooden staffs, sharpened at both ends, and with every stride the men stabbed downward, making holes an inch deep and a yard apart in the freshly turned earth. Behind them the line of women reached deep in their bags, and, stooping gracefully to drop three kernels into each hole, chanted another measure of the counting rhyme. Hide thee, haste thee, gilly corn hill. Standing, they pushed loose soil over the holes with a scrape of their bare feet, then moved on. Suddenly one of them laughed aloud, unaffected, childlike laughter that carried through the evening air. I'm sure glad I didn't see what I just stepped on. The others giggled, causing a momentary break in the chant. Oh, Deborah, said the one beside her. There's nothing out here but a few night crawlers, and I've been stepping on them ever since the moon came up. I've just said nothing about it. She took up the chant. If mole don't taste the worm he will. At the end of the row, another woman stood and wiped her brow. "'You'd best be right,' she said. "'I don't fancy the notion of tripping over a corn snake out here. "'Twouldn't do to have that kind of scare, not in my condition.' She patted her distended stomach. "'Just listen to her,' Deborah laughed again. "'Lotta Sturtevant's afraid her baby'll be born with a split tongue.' "'Deborah!' Her husband whirled to face her eyes blazing angrily in the moonlight. Have you forgotten yourself, woman? These good people came out here to help us. He stood a little taller than the other men, wide shoulders tapering to a willow-thin waist, and despite the severity of his expression, he was clearly a shade younger than the rest. His voice was stern and very deep, the voice of an Old Testament lawgiver, but it softened in one last urgent whisper. Please. Just as abruptly he turned and caught up with the others. None of them had looked back. My apologies, Brother Yoram, he said to the older man who walked beside him. She meant no harm. We both give thanks you're with us tonight. No need for thanks, sir. The man jabbed his pole into the earth and withdrew it with an expert twist. We do what the Lord gives us to do. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, Be of good courage. Amen, said the others in unison, without looking up from their work, and the younger man chimed in quickly. Amen. Behind them the women continued their chant, but more softly now, for they were listening. Their voices were no louder than the chirping of the crickets. From a distance came the muffled sound of other voices, where the old men had gathered at the edge of the field, their faces illuminated by a low cottonwood fire. It was their task to tend it, and from time to time a shower of sparks signaled that they'd heaped another log upon the flames. Nearby a cluster of children stood in dutiful guard over a bag of seed bigger than themselves. The fields they knew were filled with thieves, birds and mice, and hungry yellow cornworms. To lose a single kernel meant bad portent for the crops. Farther off, 
The windows of the little farmhouse were ablaze with light, and from the kitchen, where the older women folk were busy with their special preparations, there came the sound of voices raised in hymn. Between the farmhouse and the field jutted the squat shape of the low cinder block outbuilding, its windows dark. Close behind it, like an impenetrably black wall, rose the encircling woods. Suddenly the air contained a new voice, a low and distant rumbling from the east. At first it had been barely distinguishable from the wind in the trees. Now it was growing deeper, in lazy waves of sound, like the drone of some gigantic insect. In the fields the women fell silent. The older men kept to their steady pace, eyes pointedly averted toward the ground, but a few of the younger ones surreptitiously scanned the horizon and found at last some small red winking lights that climbed among the stars. Miles above the woods and fields, a shape like a great silver crucifix was streaking across the planet, heading westward. The women stirred themselves. "'We've got corn to plant,' said the pregnant one. She peered into the darkened furrows at her feet, searching for a place to drop the seed. The others again took up the counting rhyme, but Deborah stared wistfully at the moving lights. Each Friday night the jet passed overhead, a jarring reminder of the world they'd shut out. "'Wonder where it's going,' she said, almost to herself. Her words were lost amid the chanting, the smell of moist black humus, the ancient and laborious routine. There was work to do, and her husband might be watching." She turned back to the corn seeds and the earth. Ahead of her, one of the men continued to gaze awestruck at the eastern sky. So many stars up there, he remarked to his companions, and so little light down here. You're a hard worker, Sar, and a good God-fearing man, but I sure do wish you'd been ready when the rest of us were. Leastways, we had a moon we could see by. Poroth peered dolefully upward, aware that the other was right. Just above the trees, the half-moon reminded him of something damaged or broken, but the elders had assured him that, on the contrary, it was a most favorable omen for the crops. Waxing larger day by day, it presaged an abundant growth and harvest. "'It wasn't possible to get these fields plowed by the appointed time,' he said, hurrying to keep pace with the others. He remembered the weeks of back-breaking labor, struggling with a bulky tractor, rented from the cooperative. A month ago the ground we're walking on was covered by scrub and trees. This land hadn't been worked for seven years. "'We know that, Sar," said the first man. "'We know what this farm means to you, and what it must have cost. We respect you for it. Tisn't every man takes to the land so late.' Coming to the edge of a row, he turned in unison with the rest and reversed his staff, using the alternate tip. You're bound to make a few mistakes at first, but with the Lord's help you'll come out all right in the end. That's why we're here tonight, and why Brother Yoram made his wife come along. She's sure to bring good portent. There it was again, the omnipresent reverence for signs. A pregnant woman ensured good crops. A widow might bring disaster. Porath knew that a cousin of his, Minna Buckhalter, was working in the kitchen side by side with women twice her age, his own long-widowed mother among them. Though Minna was strong enough for the outdoor work, she was considered unfit to bury seeds because last month she'd laid a husband in the earth. Were the brethren superstitious fools, then? Porath didn't care. He'd had more education than the rest, and he'd lived for a while in the place that called itself the modern world. Yet he was a believer, his faith unshaken. Fertile women meant fertile crops. Their long, straight hair meant long, straight stalks of corn. Primitive symbolism, perhaps, but it worked. He was certain of it. Jets flew high above the earth, where angels played. There was room up there for both. Thunder was a collision of molecules, and also the voice of God. Both might be true. 
the Lord was in his heaven, whatever name you called him, as assuredly as there were demons here below, whatever faces they wore. Him you worshipped, them you wrestled. It was as simple as that. The only trick was not to lose your faith. The nature of the belief didn't matter, Porth knew. What mattered was its intensity. He had a high regard for superstition. God's my witness, he said to the other men. I know we've had our differences, but that's all past. Deborah and I are going to make you proud of us. You wait and see. You won't recognize this place. In the distance, light spilled from the kitchen doorway of the farmhouse. Moments later came the slam of the screen door, echoing across the field. By Michaelmas, he went on, I'll have every acre planted, clear back to the stream. He smiled at the thought. You wait and see. This land's going to look like the Garden of Eden. The one called Yoram paused and looked his way. If he was smiling, the darkness concealed it. Mark you, Brother Sar, he said softly. The Gospels speak of another garden. They knew he meant Gethsemane. From beyond the fire came the faint clanging of a bell. Yoram held up his hand. It's ready, he said. Come. They followed him from the field. The village was alive tonight. The shoe stores and overpriced boutiques that lined both sides of 8th Street were already closed, their windows dim, but the crowds were out in force and the food stands and novelty shops were packed. Comic T-shirts, Zodiac posters, pizza slices, frozen yogurt. There was something for everyone, and everyone had a gimmick on display. Carol passed a fat girl in dirt farmer overalls, a goateed black with a gypsy headdress and an earring, a young couple with leather pants and shiny blue streaks in their hair, the girl wearing a wristband ringed with spikes. Perhaps it was her mood, but she found herself disliking almost everyone she saw. It did no good to narrow her eyes and view the world through a veil of lashes. The faces still swam at her out of the shadows, only now they were distorted as in a waking dream. From a doorway, a dark figure made explicit sucking sounds and hissed something at her in Spanish. A group of heavy-set blonde boys staggered past, football types from the suburbs, drunk already and raining blows on the one in front, nearly shouldering her off the sidewalk. Dodging a black selling incense and a party of teenagers arguing where to go next, she slipped into a bookshop just off 6th Avenue and killed some time by leafing through the fashion magazines. They had foreign editions of Vogue here, and photo annuals from Japan. Glossy, sullen-faced women in shiny dark lipstick pouted across the pages. She tried picturing herself as some of them, and for the first time the idea didn't seem so far-fetched. St. Agnes's seemed far in the past, or maybe it was just the prospect of more money to spend and her close brush with the young man at the library. Leaving these fantasies on the rack, in magazines selling for five dollars or more, she journeyed back out onto the sidewalk, up the block, and around the corner to the relative quiet of MacDougall Street. It was less noisy here. Ahead lay the darkness and trees of Washington Square, as if she'd come to the edge of the city. It was time she got some food in her. That was not going to be easy, unless she was willing to stand at a counter eating vegetable tacos or falafel or a greasy wedge of pizza. She had only seven dollars in her wallet, with perhaps two more in change. This might well have to last her till Monday. Rosie's expense check was useless for the moment, and if her supermarket refused to cash it, would remain so all weekend. Her roommate never had any money either. She got men to pay for everything. It was an arrangement that, at this point, Carol would have welcomed. With a hand on her pocketbook and an eye peeled for strangers, she wandered farther south, lingering a minute or two before a shop off the park, 
where she stared pensively at a slinky blue dress in the window and tried to imagine herself in it. Afterward, she considered a more modest transaction, treating herself to cappuccino and a croissant in one of the coffee houses along Bleecker Street. But a dollar eighty-five seemed a foolish price to pay for a cup of coffee. Besides, all the seats were taken in every place she passed. Couples waited morosely by the open doorways, peering inside for vacancies, while others sprawled over tables set up cafe-style on the sidewalk. Movement here was only partially impeded, but farther west the sidewalks were completely blocked by street musicians. Standing behind open guitar cases or hopeful-looking upturned hats, they played wherever the crowds were thickest. From every side their music filled the night. Carol fought her way past the crowd surrounding a Jamaican steel drummer and felt her exhaustion returning. Somewhere soon she would have to rest. She was just crossing the street to avoid an even larger mob near the corner, flute music issuing from its midst, when among the knot of spectators, their backs to her, her eye was caught by a bit of movement and a flash of red. It was a red canvas bag, swinging back and forth at the end of an all-but-unseen hand. Regularly it swung out from the crowd, then was lost again from sight, like the pendulum on an overwound clock, or the leg she'd seen swinging in the darkness of the classroom. It was him, of course. Jeremy, the young man from the library. Even from behind she recognized the book bag, the stocky build, the rumpled seersucker jacket that hung from one plump shoulder. He seemed to be alone, and as she watched the bag appear and disappear, appear and disappear, she was struck by the crazy, not unpleasant notion that, like an engineer flagging down a train, fate was giving her a sign. Her first impulse was to hail him, but she stopped herself in time. She didn't want to seem too aggressive. Crossing the street once more, she slipped to the opposite side of the crowd and wormed her way up to the front. At first she could see nothing but the encircling faces. They were gazing toward something on the sidewalk. She looked down. At her feet squatted a diminutive old man with shiny black skin and grimy turban, piping frenziedly upon a wooden flute. Beside him lay a battered black umbrella. Between his knees he gripped a basket filled with loose change, from the middle of which rose a pale, serpentine thing that swayed before his face. Carol blanched. For an instant she had taken the object for some grotesque, phallic joke, but now she realized what it was, a stick of wood carved to resemble a rearing snake, moved by pressure from the flautist's knee upon a metal rod. From a distance the illusion might have been effective. Here on the sidewalk in front of her it just looked silly. Suddenly the man's eyes widened as he turned toward someone in the crowd. His pudgy black fingers curled more fiercely over the stops. His cheeks puffed in and out, and the music climbed to a shrill tremolo, just as a dollar bill fluttered like a dying moth into the basket at his knees. Who was throwing dollars away? Carol looked up, and recognized Frears at the same moment he recognized her. He was standing on the other side of the circle, his tie slightly askew, jamming a wallet back into his pants pocket. Street light was reflected in his glasses. As he turned and saw her, his face brightened. He signaled to Carol to wait where she was. Pushing his way through the knot of people, he made his way to her side. So it's you again, he said. The elusive librarian. He seemed quite pleased to see her. There's just no missing you. That hair of yours really stands out on a crowd. It's like a flag. Behind him the piping grew faster as if in celebration. I looked for you in class tonight. It's a shame you didn't come. Carol shrugged. I had to stay late at work, she heard herself say. Maybe next time. There won't be a next time, he said, looking pleased at the fact. At least not till next fall. He glanced doubtfully up the block, at the head shops and frozen custard stands. Don't tell me you live around here. 
This is no place for anyone who works at Vori's. Oh, no, she said. I was just taking the long way home. Really? He appeared to consider it a moment. Feel like stopping off for a drink? A cup of coffee, maybe? She felt a queer thrill of triumph out of all proportion to the question. Absurd, of course, but there it was. A tiny voice that whispered, Anything can happen now. It was almost as if he had asked her to marry him. Within the stone circle the flames snapped ravenously, demanding still another log. Insects danced and died amid the smoke, which, rising in a slender column, twisted among the stars and was lost in the surrounding darkness. At the edge of the firelight, the children crouched impatiently by the bag of corn seed, their eyes drawn past the flames to the tables that the older men had brought from the house and were now busy setting up. A folding bridge table, a sewing table, and the small, square wooden table from the Porth's kitchen, arranged in a row, and, as the children watched, draped with a dark cloth to form one long platform. The screen door slammed again, and four women could be seen hurrying across the yard like stretcher-bearers, hauling something heavy in a sagging white bedsheet. Behind them emerged others, arms laden with large brown thermos jugs, which they placed by the fire. None of them spoke, and none were smiling. The only sound now was the distant clatter of pans from within the kitchen, and, regular as a pulse beat, the slow and steady cadence of the crickets. Suddenly, for the second time, the night was split by the clanging of a large brass dinner bell brandished by one of the elders. Setting it down beside him, he reached for a hand-hewn limb of cottonwood and added it to the fire. It fizzed and crackled like a living thing. Nearby the women had lifted the bedsheet onto the tables and were crowded alongside, backs to the firelight, busily molding a flat, straw-colored mass that lay inert upon the cloth. They had been working since sundown, gathered around the huge cast-iron stove, measuring out the cornmeal, the molasses, the shortening, milk, and eggs. With practiced fingers they had scraped the separate portions still hot from the pans, fitting them together into the prescribed shape, using icing as mortar. Now at last it was ready, arranged hot and smoking by the fireside, awaiting the workers' return from the fields. The younger women struggled in behind the men. Theirs had been the harder job, as tradition dictated. Man's work would come later, with the cultivation and the harvest. All were tired and hungry, in no mood for surprise. But all of them stopped short, men and women alike, when they saw what lay upon the bedsheet, burnished by the flickering light. It was the size that astonished them. It was longer than a man, and covered most of the combined tabletops. In shape it resembled an immense five-pointed star, its entire surface studded with an intricate pattern of currants, nuts, and glistening sweetmeats. It smelled of corn and fruit and molasses, and everything about it spoke of holidays and feasting. Only its name, born of long custom, was ordinary. Cotton bread, they called it. Ceremoniously, they filed around the tables. I didn't think I'd be seeing this again so soon, said one of the men, wiping the dirt from his hands. It's a sight bigger than the loaf we had last week, wouldn't you say, Rachel? That's because we don't have so many mouths to feed, said his wife. A heavy-set man grinned and nudged the first one in the ribs. Not yet, anyways. The men around them chuckled, all but Poroth, the youngest here, who stood a little apart from the rest, silent and uneasy. He wasn't one for joking, especially about matters such as that. Children were holy, a gift from the Lord. A woman's body was his sacred instrument. He glanced anxiously at his wife. She was hunched beside a little girl, whispering something in her ear to coax a smile. It wasn't right that she herself was childless. Just as soon as they were out of debt, he would make a mother of her. 
He knew she was impatient for that. How beautiful she looked with her hair down, far more beautiful than the local wives. If only she would learn to hold her tongue. After all, this was his land and these people his guests. Even though other hands had prepared the food that lay before them, he'd refused their offers of charity and had paid for it himself. It had put him even deeper into debt. But then, first planting was a once-in-a-lifetime occasion. He prayed that nothing would mar it. Behind the friends and townspeople assembled by the tables, behind the knots of children and old men, he noticed the spare, severe-looking figure of his mother. She was talking with his Aunt Lisa, and Lisa's widowed daughter, Minna Buckhalter, both of them a full head taller than she was, their jet-black hair drawn tightly in the back. Lisa had been his late father's sister, and she and Minna bore an almost haunting resemblance to him. It was a look perhaps more handsome in a man, the wide and sturdy shoulders, the thin ascetic lips, the stern, deep-set brown eyes, though it lent them an undeniable air of strength. His mother's back was turned to him, as it had been so often these past years, ever since, with Bible school behind him, he'd made his impetuous decision to leave the community. In time he had returned to it, with much learned and no regrets, but there was still a coolness between them. What little love there'd been had proven difficult to restore, like corn that wouldn't grow in played-out soil. But then he remembered he had himself to blame, for when he'd returned he hadn't been alone. He'd had a wife with him, a stranger who, while of their faith, came from outside the area, and more important, seemed to make little effort to adapt herself to local ways. Her morals were, of course, beyond reproach, her training as strict as his own. He wouldn't have considered marrying any other kind. Still there were those who thought her frivolous, high-spirited, dangerous even. And then there'd been the question of the ceremony itself, that hurried little song and dance performed by an assistant college chaplain with none of the parents in attendance. Yes, it was a lot for a mother to forgive, especially one who had no other child. Though he couldn't help but wish she were a little less reluctant to so much as speak Deborah's name. Lately he'd begun to wonder if this hardness of his mother's wasn't somehow connected in some mysterious and fundamental way with the very things that made her so special in the community, her supposed gifts. He himself felt no particular reverence for them. What good had they ever done him? What good, for that matter, had they ever done her? Sometimes, in fact, it seemed as if this special knowledge was all but wasted on her. It apparently brought her not a moment's pleasure. She was like one who, shown a magic window to the future, yawns and looks away. Throughout her life she'd seen things, heard things, felt things coming. Bitter winters, summer droughts, births and deaths and storms. But none of them had ever seemed to matter. Nothing had commanded her attention. Nothing moved her. Nothing, at least, within the bounds of the visible world. "'Tisn't right to get attached to things,' she liked to say. "'The Lord don't mean for us to love one another too much.' She had baffled him even in the early days, before his father's death. There'd been times when she appeared to lead an almost secretive existence, apart from the family, nor had she ever shown the slightest interest in its affairs. She had shared none of her husband's devotion to business, the doings of the town, the rise and fall of others' crops, or the fortunes of his own beloved store, the buying and selling of grain and supplies, the faithful nightly entries in the ledger, the bedside prayers for guidance as he balanced his obligations to God and the community with the same care he brought to balancing his books. Instead, even then, she'd been prone to moods of distance and distraction, as if listening for faraway voices or preoccupied by some half-remembered dream. It had been clear, even then, that the brethren felt uneasy in her presence, though they were loud in the praise of her piety. Many of them still clearly regarded her as something of an oracle, and she was popularly reputed to have second sight. 
as to the actual extent of her powers, Poroth himself couldn't say. He only knew that he had inherited no such powers himself, for which he supposed he was glad. Still, watching her as she stood there in the darkness, her face, as always, turned away from him and the moonlight so cold on her hair, he found himself recalling all the things this night represented, and longing for some small token of encouragement from her, some word of benediction. But that, he knew, would have to come from somewhere else. Nor was it long in coming. The others, he saw now, had fallen silent. They were watching a gray-haired woman, Sister Cora Geisel, who stood at the head of the table. Her hands held something out of sight. "'We're plain folks,' she began, gazing into the familiar faces around her. "'And I'm no good at speech-making. "'You all know that this farm has been standing empty for too many years, "'ever since Andy Baber gave up working the land. "'And so we're all real glad to see it under cultivation again. "'But probably no one's half as glad as we are, Matthew and me. "'You see, living where we do, just over on the next road, we've always felt kind of on the edge of things out here, and, well, it's good to have some company again. The others laughed and nodded. So, being as we're their closest neighbors, and since there's no one likelier to do them this service, we wanted Sar and Deborah here to have our chaplet. She held up a dried and withered garland of corn, two ears, the husks, and a shaggy mass of leaves. It's from a good crop. The Lord was bountiful last summer. And you all know it just wouldn't be right to plant without one. We're hoping it'll get these young people off to a proper start. Solemn, as if she were crowning a queen, she placed the garland upon the uppermost point of the star-shaped loaf, Faces turned toward him expectantly, his mother's among them. Poroth realized he would have to say something. He cleared his throat. Brother Matthew and Sister Cora do us a real honor, and I know the Lord will bless them for their neighborliness. We give thanks for the bread we're about to eat, and thanks for those who prepared it. It's made from store-bought cornmeal, but next year... Thanks to you good folks, we'll be using our own. And next year we'll be planting on time, Deborah had added that. She replaced Sister Cora at the head of the table and stood clutching a long, serrated bread knife, its blade gleaming redly in the firelight. The brightness was reflected in her eyes. And now, he said quickly, let us bow our heads together in silent prayer. He stood biting his lip, eyes closed, but the only sound he heard was one of the children driving some predator from the corn seed. At last he looked up. He had been distracted, annoyed at his wife. There had been no prayer in his heart. He wondered if somehow the others had seen, but they were staring pensively at the cotton bread as if lost in recollection. Only Deborah herself stood watching him now, and, just beyond the firelight, seven pairs of wide, unwinking eyes. He hadn't noticed them till this moment. "'How did they get out?' he whispered, nodding toward the cats as he moved beside his wife. She shrugged. "'I never locked him up.' "'Of all the dumb!' Once more he dropped his voice. You know how Brother Yoram feels. Oh, honey, don't be angry with me. Tisn't anything important. Yoram will just have to watch his step. She reached once more for the knife. Are we ready? He nodded curtly. Ready. Metal flashed. She brought up her hand and, with a smooth stroke, sliced off the topmost point of the star. It remained lying before them, still decorated by the cuttings from last year's crop. Just beyond the firelight, the seven pairs of eyes followed every movement, missing nothing, 
Silent as shadows, two of the animals rose and padded back to the house. The others crouched nearer the flames, purring softly. Corn fragrance hung above the table, reminding those assembled of their empty bellies. With the first clean slice, the spell that held them had been dissipated, replaced by simple hunger. They murmured in anticipation. Brothers, sisters, said Porath gravely, let us break bread. The command was this time a literal one. Crowded round the bread loaf, the celebrants broke chunks off with their hands. They were polite, even deferential. The pieces they took were not large. Still the star's smooth contours soon looked ragged, and before long limbs devoured. It had been reduced to a shapeless yellow mass. The severed portion, a triangle nearly as large as a kite, was brought past the fire to the children, who greeted it with shouts of pleasure. It had been garnished with extra sweetmeats, including three plump candied crab apples and a slice of glazed peach. They fell upon it eagerly. The garland of corn had been removed beforehand and left in a prominent place at the head of the table, where it presided over the destruction of the loaf. Like cornbread it was dry, crumbly, and provoked an immediate thirst. Cups were handed around, the thermos jugs were emptied, disgorging strong hot coffee brewed with chocolate. Older children trooped forward for their share. The younger ones sang planting songs, or dozed, or fought over the sweetmeats. Men were lying full length on the grass. Benches were not part of this occasion. Some of the married couples sat together in the darkness, washing down the last of the bread while they searched the zenith for meteors. Others remained standing, sipping their coffee as they gazed dreamily into the flames. In the warm reddish light their features were drained of detail, taking on the ageless look of masks. Here and there a lightning bug glowed and dimmed above the lawn. And in the sky beyond the cornfield, the sickle, rolled serenely toward the western horizon. Children chased a buzzing June bug from the bag of seed. Overhead, Draco and the Queen wheeled in an endless chase around the pole star, the dragon's tail directly overhead. In its tip shone Thuban, pole star of the ancients, once a herdsman's beacon and the light to which the pyramids aspired, stony angles pointing toward its gleam. Since that hour, Five thousand years had flashed and died like sparks. The heavens had shifted. But not until this present spring had the world really changed. At night, the city seemed immense. The sidewalks looked as wide as streets, the streets like highways. In the absence of traffic, the avenue resembled a dim, empty arena, its spectators all gone home. Cars passed only at intervals now, in groups of two or three, and could be heard from blocks away. Carol's voice sounded loud amid the silence. Jeremy, I can't keep up with you. Sorry, he said. I guess I'm still upset about that bag. The two of them were walking north toward Chelsea, their footsteps slapping heavily against the pavement. Frears no longer had his book bag. Earlier that evening, they had stopped to eat in a crowded little Italian restaurant on Sullivan Street, Frears slipping the bag beneath his chair, and later when he'd reached for it, it had been gone, stolen most likely, though Frears still clung to the hope that it had been taken by accident and might eventually be returned. It had contained nothing but books and student papers. The loss of the bag had spoiled what had been until then, a happy evening, though for Carol the incident was already receding into the haze of the past. The two of them had shared a bottle of Chianti over dinner. She'd had nothing to eat since her afternoon break, and that first glass had immediately gone to her head. Later, after coffee, he'd convinced her to join him in a brandy. It had never taken much to get her drunk, and tonight she'd been especially susceptible. 
Despite the coffee, she was beginning to feel drowsy, and, in her imagination, was already staggering into bed and pressing her body in sleep against the cool sheets. She could think about the day's events tomorrow morning. It was now well past midnight. A mile to the north, the red, white, and blue lights that illuminated the Empire State Building throughout the July 4th season had gone dark, with only the wink of a red warning beacon left to mark the top while up and down the avenue the lights of the deserted shops glowed pallidly behind steel security gates. In the shadows of a butcher's window, hanging carcasses and the goose-pimpled body of a turkey pressed against the metal bars like creatures in a cage. She walked slowly, aware that she'd eaten too much. Still, hadn't it been nice of him to take her out like that? It was something she missed here in New York, where most restaurants were beyond her means places to pass without entering. Today, though, her luck seemed to have changed. All evening she'd been thinking of Rosie's check, carefully folded in her handbag, and of how she was going to spend it. Two benefactors on the same day. It was almost too much to believe. I feel like I've eaten enough to last the whole weekend, she said, hoping she sounded sufficiently grateful. I wish I could say the same. As he walked, he stared gloomily down at his paunch, as if surprised it was still there. I've really got to get in shape this summer. If I don't lose around twenty pounds... He shook his head. They were passing the open doorway of a bar room, its patrons concealed by darkness. The sounds of salsa music and arguments spilled out into the night. Carol hurried after him. I don't think you look so bad, honestly. Well, thanks. He stood a little straighter. But you should have seen me a year ago during my diet. I was positively lean then, like you. She shrugged, though she knew she'd been complimented. My two older sisters have really full figures. I was always the skinny one. Not me, he said mournfully. When I was growing up, I was a regular little tub. My parents had to send me to a Weight Watchers camp in Connecticut. He slowed briefly for her to catch up. You know, come to think of it, that was just about the only time I ever really got out into the country. That and a temple youth group trip, and a few weeks at a tennis camp on Long Island. Pretty provincial, huh? Oh, I wouldn't say that. She wondered if he'd been kidding. I'll bet you think it's the rest of us who are provincial. He grinned. I don't deny it. But then that's what comes of being a New Yorker all my life. With an easy sweep of his hand, he took in the nearly deserted street, the lights of distant traffic, and, it seemed to her, the whole titanic nightscape of the city, the dark alleys, silent buildings, and the millions around them now dreaming in their beds. She envied him his growing up here. It was a world he knew well enough to thrive within, and one he might help her no better. Something, anyway, worth hoping for. For a moment, as she walked up the avenue with him, Freer's already ahead once more, it seemed to her that she was on a different street entirely, one that, if only she didn't stumble, would lead her to a future in which all things were possible. I can't help wondering she said at last. What you'd make of my town? I'm sure I'd like it. She laughed. Don't be. It isn't very interesting. Well, you know, Pennsylvania and all. He waved his hand vaguely to the left. I expect it's pretty scenic out there. She glanced at him skeptically. You sound as if you've never been west of the Hudson. Oh, don't get me wrong, he said. I've done my share of traveling. L.A., Chicago, Miami. He waited till she'd drawn beside him. My parents moved down to Florida a few years ago. Horrible place. And after college I spent some time in Europe. But as for good old country living in the good old U.S.A., you know, going to sleep with the chickens, getting up with the hogs, or whatever it is they do out there, he shrugged. They were approaching another bar now. Carol moved closer to his side. 
She couldn't explain why, but she felt quite safe with him, despite the fact that he himself was plainly somewhat tense. Both of them had been sobered by the loss of the book bag, and the night had sharpened her senses when she'd first stepped from the restaurant, but now her giddiness was returning. Perhaps it was Jeremy, or perhaps only the drink. Love stories always made her weep when she read them late at night, whether or not they were really sad. She trembled at mysteries after too much black coffee, even when their plots held no terrors. It was hard to tell for sure. Normally she might have been a great deal more apprehensive. Although they were nearing her own neighborhood in Chelsea now, she was unaccustomed to being outdoors at this hour, when every stranger was potentially a threat. The sleepy-eyed schoolboy who shuffled past them, hands plunged deep into his pockets, might be secretly caressing a rosary down there, or his own nakedness, or a knife. Faces which would have been ignored by day now took on a peculiar cast, and she was acutely aware of figures in the distance, coming toward her through the empty streets. Even their footfalls were audible. She could hear them, and anticipate the encounter from several blocks away. At this moment the view ahead held only a bored-looking householder walking his dog, from the sidewalk behind came the voices of a couple speaking rapidly in Spanish, and across the avenue the echoes of a small, lumpish figure staggering after them upon a black cane. A tattered parcel clutched beneath its arm. Newspapers swept like ghosts through the foyer of an abandoned movie theater near the corner, its marquee blank, display case bare of posters, Wind stirred the heaped-up trash against the doors, as the two of them hurried past, reminding Carol of the rustle of dead leaves. "'You know something?' she said. "'I think the country will be good for you.' "'Really?' He sounded as if he cared. "'I sure hope so, because I keep suspecting I've been missing something.' "'Well, I think you have. Of course—' She stumbled slightly and felt his hand reach out to steady her. He seemed to hold her longer than was necessary. "'Of course, I don't know you very well,' she said, pulling away slightly. "'You may get bored. What are you going to do if you're unhappy out there?' "'Unhappy? What do you mean?' "'Can you just come back here to the city if it turns out you don't like it? I hope you haven't paid the whole thing in advance.' No, I haven't paid anything yet, he said. But I told the Porths I'd stay the summer, and they're expecting me to, so I guess I have a certain commitment. Still, that's hardly the same as a contract. Maybe, he said, glancing at the figures behind them. But I feel my word to the Porths is just as binding as a contract. It's the way those people operate. And anyway, I did sign something with the other couple, the one subletting my apartment. They wanted the place till September, and I gave it to them. They wanted the whole thing in writing, and... He shrugged. I gave it to them. So I just made my mind up. I'm going to stay the whole summer, and that's all there is to it. You won't find me coming home crying. For a moment she thought she'd heard real self-pity in his voice. But then, screwing up his face, he made a mocking little sound like the sobbing of a baby, and she broke into laughter. Soon he was laughing with her, but only for a moment. Clearly the doubts she'd raised were still on his mind. Jesus, I hope I don't get bored out there, he said. I certainly don't expect to. My dissertation alone should keep me busy round the clock. If you could see the size of my reading list. He shook his head. God, I'm still so pissed about that book bag. There were things in there of my own aside from all those papers. You wouldn't believe the catching up I've got to do. There's a course I'm teaching next fall that I'm completely unprepared for, a night class at Columbia. I thought you taught at the new school. Sure, but nobody's going to pay the rent on that. You've really got to scramble for the jobs these days. You've got to take whatever comes along and hope that some day some place gives you tenure. Me, I admit it, I'm a bit of a hack. I'll go wherever they pay me and teach whatever they like. She felt a trace of envy. The pay must be good at Columbia. 
Well, it isn't exactly the college I'll be with. It's the general studies program. But it's the best I can do right now. The course itself is partly my idea. The rest of his words were drowned out when beneath their feet the pavement trembled like the roll of a hundred drums. In an instant they were engulfed by a cavernously deep rumbling, as if something vast and invisible were bearing down upon their lives. Through the subterranean corridors below them an IND express hurtled noisily uptown, leaving only silence in its wake. Silence. But broken by a certain sound behind them, a queer, irregular thump and scrape from somewhere down the block. What will it be on? Pardon? He was peering over his shoulder, but quickly turned back to her. One didn't stare at cripples. In the distance the little figure with the cane, head bowed, continued its laborious progress up the sidewalk. The emptiness and the night seemed to press heavily upon it. Your course, she said. What'll it be on? I'm calling it the Gothic Imagination. That's the kind of title they go for up there. I told them I'd start with Shakespeare and work right up to Absalom, Absalom, and believe it or not, they bought it. They must think, Wait a second. Since when did Shakespeare write Gothics? He paused. Well, there's always Hamlet. You know, ghost on the battlements, lost inheritance. But that was just part of the sales pitch. The same with the Faulkner. I threw them in for the names. The truth is, I'll mainly be reading a lot of crazy old horror stories, the sort of stuff I should have read ten years ago. I've been faking it all this time, and now's my chance to find out what I've missed. He turned to look at her, smiling. Should be fun, eh? She felt a tiny urge to needle him, for there was something about his enthusiasm that irritated her. The same smug faith in good fortune, perhaps, which she occasionally recognized in herself. Or perhaps it was just that he seemed so blithely prepared to leave her. And what will you do out there, she asked, if you get sick of ghost stories? Oh, that shouldn't be a problem, he said. I'm pretty good at keeping myself busy. One thing's for sure. I'm not going to spend the summer sitting on my ass. I'm going to get myself in shape, maybe even do a little jogging, establish a routine and stick to it. Bran and yogurt at breakfast, dental floss at night. Shoes on the shoe trees before going to bed. She noticed with some amusement that, as he spoke, he was swinging his arms more forcefully and holding his head up straighter. And in the evening, he said, who knows? I might try to teach myself astronomy. That's something you can't do in the city. Stargazing. I'm bringing out a book with all the maps. It'll be nice to learn what's actually up there. The two of them looked upward as they passed along the block. But by now the city was almost starless. The moon had vanished behind the buildings to the west. They saw it shining low over the cross streets and the vacant lots. If things get too boring, he added, I suppose I can always get a lift into Gilead, what there is of it anyway. He shrugged. And of course, if worst comes to worst, I can always try bird watching. I hear that's fun, or go for walks in the woods. In fact, now don't laugh, I'm bringing out a whole slew of those little illustrated field guides. I mean, let's face it, I don't know a hell of a lot about camp craft. I'm like the guy in the joke. The last time I tried rubbing two sticks together was in a Chinese restaurant. But there are quite a few things I'd really like to learn, like mushroom hunting and animal tracks, and the names of some of the flowers. Round-lobed hepatica, Dutchman's breeches. The names rolled off his tongue. Bachelor's button, touch me not. She nudged him with her elbow. You sound just like the nature counselor at BCYC. Oh, yeah? He stopped and faced her. And what, pray tell, is B.C.Y.C.? Beaver County Youth Camp. His mouth opened in an incredulous grin. Beaver County? Is that where you're from? Uh-huh. She burst into giggles. He laughed, too, with something like relief. The girl from Beaver County. What a find. It was as if a wall between them had been broken, 
they leaned against one another, rocking with laughter. And what a great title for a film. We'll get... Suddenly he caught his breath. She felt him stiffen. Jesus, how does that guy keep up with us? He squinted into the darkness. I've never seen a cripple move so fast. She turned and looked, but the sidewalk behind them was empty, the streets hushed but for the wail of a distant police siren, rising and falling, rising and falling, like a hungry baby screaming unheeded in the night. The time of idleness was drawing to an end. Away from the others, near the rose bushes at the side of the house, the poroths lay drowsily in the long grass and the shadows from the kitchen light, resting beside one another. They were alone here but for a trio of their cats, two stretched in sleep between them, another curled purring on Deborah's stomach. With the murmur of voices so distant and the bonfire out of sight behind the house, Sar felt sorely tempted to roll over and hold her in his arms. They were used to making love among the animals, outdoors as well as in, but he forced the desire from his mind. Not for another full day, not until the planting was complete. Sunday, though, was going to be special. Sunday after services. Just a few more hours of this, Lord be praised, he said. But I can't say as I look forward to tomorrow night, with just the two of us. I'll bet we end up working straight through to Sunday morning. Deborah made a sympathetic noise. I sure hope I don't doze off again in the middle of the sermon. They've never let me forget it. Don't worry, he said sharply. I'll make sure you stay awake. But as soon as we come back here, I'm going to sleep for the rest of the day and you're going to be right there beside me naked as old Mother Eve, so that when I get up... Oh, no, I'm not, honey. And neither are you. She reached over and ran her fingers through the dark hair on his chin. Don't you remember? We've got a visitor coming on Sunday. Sar made a face in the darkness. I forgot all about him. With a sigh, he sat up, dislodging a cat about to seat itself on his chest. Well, at least it'll bring in some money. Lord knows we can use it. He turned and looked across the lawn at the outbuilding, a squat black form against the night sky. We'll have to get the place fixed up tomorrow, said Deborah, as if reading his thoughts. Put up the screens and get the ivy off those windows. And I don't intend doing it all myself. He grunted noncommittally. We'd best do it early, she went on. We'll have more planting at night, and Sunday'll be too late. T'would be awful if he came out here with all his goods, took another look at the place, then turned around and went home. She paused, speculating. I sure hope he doesn't mind a few bugs. He got to his knees and began brushing the dirt from his pants. Well he said. You never know about those city people. Yawning, he stood and sniffed the air. The wind was blowing off the marsh, but he could smell the fragrance of the freshly planted field, the moist soil and vegetation. All right, woman, he prodded her gently with his toe. High time we got back to the others. Sure wouldn't want old Yoram to squawk. No, wouldn't want that. He smiled in spite of himself, but then felt a surge of anger. How dare she talk that way? And how dare he let her? Troubled, he turned from her to stare into the distance. As always, the view calmed him. He was simply going to have to make her understand. But not now. Not on such a night. There was a faint glow in the eastern sky, past the outbuilding and the woods. The wind was blowing from behind him and went hissing through the tops of the trees. They nodded together as if sharing a secret. As a boy on nights like this, he used to pretend that, if he stood on tiptoe, he could see truck depots, railroad yards, and glimmering lights, the lights of New York City, not fifty miles away. Rejoining the others gathered around the cottonwood fire, 
they savored the last quiet moments before their return to the field. Here and there a knife blade rose and fell in the ruddy light as the younger men sat sharpening the ends of their staffs. Two acres had already been planted. Before they departed tonight, they'd have completed two more. A fifth would still remain. But after dark tomorrow, Porath and his wife could see to that themselves. "'Twill keep them out of mischief on a Saturday night,' joked one of the men. "'We'll see them stagger into worship next morning with corn seed in their hair.' Porath made no answer. He was crouched in the shadow of the table and, as tradition demanded, was busy binding last year's garland to the top of the staff. The dried husks and withered ears dangled from the wood like talismans atop a spear. Some of the more flirtatious wives stood near the men, but talked among themselves, flaunting their long, unfettered hair. As a rule it was worn pinned up in a severe and deliberately unbecoming style, to be let down only at bedtime before one's own husband. During the yearly planting, however, this rule was relaxed. Like a pack of spoony schoolgirls, came a low, laconic voice from the darkness. Father, turn away mine eyes from beholden vanity. Deborah's youthful figure broke away from the others. Why, Rupert Lint, is that all you can say after staring at us half the night? She took another step forward, and with a toss of her head, struck a mock seductive pose. You better go back and read the second half of the book. If a woman have long hair, tis a glory to her. From the darkness came the man's embarrassed laugh, and an automatic chorus of amens. The one called Yoram frowned and looked away. Among the brethren it was considered unseemly for a woman to speak to a man other than her husband, and they took an equally dim view of those who quoted scripture back and forth in argument, for a people so conversant with the Bible it was far too easy to do. Sar, he said at last, turning to the younger man, you have come back to us like a prodigal son, and we rejoice in it, just as we rejoice in the wife you've brought back. The Holy Spirit's in her, we all know it is, but there's still much she'll have to be taught. Tisn't a night for jests. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. I think you know the rest. I do, said the other, aware of the correct response. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Don't worry, Brother Yoram. I'll teach her to weep. Beside him came a muttered, Amen. From the west a breeze gathered, carrying the scent of marsh water and rotting pine. It ruffled their beards and stirred the rose bushes at the side of the house. The night was cooler now, and the work sweat had dried on their bodies. They turned to face the fire, the men in their vests, the women in long dresses. Bats flitted through the darkness above them like the shadows of small birds. Moths clustered around the dancing flames where the old men stood talking. Across the lawn, bustling shapes moved to and fro in the light of the kitchen. The screen door opened, and a line of older women emerged from the house, bearing small metal lanterns to help with the clean-up. The door slammed shut. Low in the sky the half-moon seemed close enough to touch, God's oppressive thumbnail poised just above their heads. Yoram stood. Up, brothers, sisters he called softly, striding toward the fields. We've sore travail before us. Passing the knot of children, he bent and addressed the smallest of them, all but dwarfed by the bag of seed. Now mark you, don't let varmints eat a single one, he warned. Twould be bad portent. With his face turned away from the firelight, it was impossible to tell if he was smiling. Soundlessly the others followed. The time of rest was over. By now the tables had been cleared, of the last scraps of food and of the cloth that had covered them. A lantern had been placed upon the one in the center, and in its beams a younger woman stood folding up the bridge table, her hair knotted back like that of the elders in the kitchen. Moving past the tables, 
Porath set down his staff and approached her. I want to thank you, Cousin Minna, he said, putting a hand on her shoulder. It was good of you to come tonight. I only wish you could have been out there with the rest of us. The other nodded gravely. Above the glowing lantern, her homely face looked prematurely aged. Pete wouldn't have wanted me to stay home and mope. You know how he loved a night like this, with all the folks getting together underneath the stars. I can feel his spirit with me right this very minute, standing by my side. It's with me all the time, these days. I expect you feel it, too. I do, said Porath, and in a way he did. Or maybe it was just a passing breeze. I swear he's almost close enough to touch. Hearing a faint movement behind him, he turned half eagerly to look and found himself facing his mother. She was carrying one of the empty brown jugs back to the kitchen. Here, he said, let me help you with that. He took it from her and started toward the house, expecting she would walk beside him. But moments later, looking back, he saw that she hadn't moved. She was standing perfectly still, as if the shores of some vast and invisible ocean were stretched before her feet, and she was watching him with an expression which, in the dim light, he found difficult to read. You go on, she said. Your Aunt Lisa is in there washing up. I know she is, he said, puzzled. So are all the rest. Aren't you coming? She shook her head. I've got to be getting along. It's later than I thought. Porath heard a certain weariness in her voice. He was about to return to her side, but she stepped away from him and held up her hand. No. Don't worry about me. Ain't nothing more I can do to help around here. You'd best be getting back to the field. The others will be out there by now. I don't plan to keep them waiting, he said. But first I'd like to hear just how you think you're going to get home. She shrugged. The Lord gave me two good legs, and I'm not too old to use them. Somehow he had known that that was what she'd say. There was really no arguing with her once her mind was made up, though he felt it his duty to try. Mother, with all its turns, that road's a good six miles long, and it's at least another mile to your house. That's quite a ways to walk. You don't have to tell me how long it is, she said. I've been down that road before. That was during the day. This time you'll be walking in the dark. You know what they say. It is only dark for them that will not see. She began moving away. I don't understand, he said. What's all this hurry for? You came with Aunt Lisa, and now she'll be expecting to take you home. Or if you don't mind waiting a spell, you can go with Amos Reed. He and Rachel brought their car tonight. So did lots of others. She shook her head again, looking vaguely troubled. No, not troubled exactly. It was something about her eyes, a kind of resignation. I haven't time to wait she said, almost mournfully. The night's got me thinking somehow, thinking about what's coming and what's past, and how there's something I should be doing that I'm not. I just can't seem to shake it, the thought of what's ahead. She muttered something under her breath. The young man strained to hear what she had whispered. It had sounded like, the Vulas. He had never seen her quite so bad before. Now just hold on a minute, he said. You've gone and got yourself in a state, and there's no cause to, not tonight. Tonight's a time for rejoicing. After all, just look at me. He threw wide his arms. Here I am, all set up now, back where I belong, on our own land. Don't go talking foolishness, son. The land ain't ours. 
You know very well that Andy Baber owned this place, and so did Andy's father, and his father before him. He scowled. Well, it was ours a hundred years ago, which means that we came first. That's the whole reason I bought this farm. I figured you'd be pleased, seeing as how your people were the ones who built it. They weren't my people. It's a big family, you know that. They were just another branch. They were truths. She nodded bitterly. And you remember what happened to them. He felt a chill pass over his shoulders. Why had she brought that up? Was she trying to spoil this night for him? But she had already begun to apologize. Don't pay me no mind, she was saying. I'm just a useless old woman. Fact is, it's done me good, seeing you here in a house of your own, the seeds in the earth, the bread on the table. The night's been blessed so far, and I'm sure the crops'll do just fine. I just wish there was something I could do for you and Deborah, but— She paused, as if remembering. But now it seems it's later than I thought. With a brief, dismissive wave, she turned and moved off across the lawn, passing between the outbuildings and the farmhouse, heading toward the road. For a moment, walking through the squares of light spread on the grass beneath the kitchen windows, her figure seemed to grow larger and somehow almost fierce. Then she'd passed beyond them, becoming once again as dim and insubstantial as a wraith on some forlorn, moonlit errand. Circling around the side of the house, she slipped into its shadow and was gone. He remained standing there, watching for her to reappear among the trees that lined the road, but after a minute or two he turned away. Setting a jug back near the foot of the table, he stooped to retrieve his staff and walked bemusedly toward the fields to join the other men. The night was indeed turning out to be a blessed one. His mother's private sorrows were already forgotten. At long last she had mentioned Deborah by name. Surely that meant something. And the crops, she'd said, would do just fine. He felt like singing. Behind him, past the fire, the younger women had replenished the sacks they'd carried at their sides, leaving the huge burlap seed bag only a quarter full. Huddled nearby, their features drawn and fatigued, the children sat watching intently for every kernel's build, but no more intently than the four remaining cats who crouched unseen in the shadows, beyond the ring of stones, eyes aglow like coals. As the women shouldered their now heavy sacks and trudged slowly back to the fields, the smallest of the children dipped his hand into the bag and brought up a streaming fistful of seeds. Wagging a finger in solemn imitation of his elders, he admonished the corn in a grave whisper. Mark thee, mind thee, gilly corn hill. Stooping amid the ploughed furrows, the women took up the chant and repeated the same traditional warning. If crow don't find thee, mouse he will. As they straightened up, one of them groaned and rubbed her stomach. The woman beside her smiled. What ails you, sister? Too much cotton bread? The other nodded. That star was big as a barn door, and I think I ate half of it. Don't know why they call it cotton bread. It's heavy as a stone. Deborah paused to push back a lock of hair. My husband knows all about that sort of thing, she said, but he seems to want to keep it to himself. The moon was settling into the treetops. They peered ahead into the gloom, where the seven men were a row of moving shadows. That was stone-ground white flint cornmeal, Porth was saying. I had to send all the way to Tipton for it. The man who sold it to me, a black hat from the barons. He said it had been milled by water power. One of the others shook his head. Probably charged you double for it. A few of them laughed, but the younger man pretended not to hear. It was made of the same seeds we're planting tonight, 
he went on. The same white flint corn that the Indians grew. Just the thing for a start as late as this. They say it has the shortest season. Let's hope it's not too short, came a stern voice from down the row. Short the life of man and soon the harvest. Now let's be fair, Yoram, said another. You said yourself it made a real nice cotton bread. His wife, walking several paces behind them, had been waiting for this moment. Amos, she called, will you ask Brother Sar something for me? The chanting died. In the sudden silence, her words rang across the field. Ask him why they call it cotton bread. The young man didn't wait for the question to be repeated. I thought everybody knew that, he said quickly, without looking back over his shoulder. It's because they used to cook it over the cottonwood fire. Tasted real good, I'll bet. As if to put an end to the subject, he slammed his staff with special vehemence into the earth. The crown of corn leaves rustled fiercely. The question had come as a surprise. He hoped he'd sounded convincing. Obviously, Deborah had been talking again. Would she never learn? Back there by the fire, Brother Yoram had practically told him to take a stick to her, and he, for all his college education, had found himself agreeing. She was getting to him, that woman, in more ways than one. He paused a moment and turned to watch her slip three seeds into the hole he'd just made. Her hair swept loosely past her face, the way it did as she climbed into bed beside him each night. Standing, she covered the hole with a careless scrape of her bare foot, and as she looked up, their eyes met. She smiled. It was a loving smile, and a knowing one. He looked down, biting his lip. He was hungry for her, and she knew it. All week he had avoided her embrace, hoarding his pent-up energies for the planting. It would help ensure a bountiful crop but now the sight of her moving another pace closer and bending toward the earth, deliberately thrusting out her hips, so aroused him that he had to turn his face away or he'd have cried out. Savagely he plunged his staff into the furrowed ground and gave it a violent twist. Several leaves were shaken off and lost in the darkness. If only he hadn't made that vow. He thought of her round body the softness of her skin beneath the rough dress, and wondered as he rejoined the ranks of the men if he dared hoist that dress and enter her tonight, with all the corn seed not yet sown. Nudging the woman beside her, Deborah nodded toward her husband. Did you see the way Sar was looking at me? she said in a low, husky voice. As soon as you folks leave, I swear he's going to take me right here in this field. The image was a scandalous one, but credible nonetheless. They burst into delighted laughter. Poroth heard the laughter, but not what had provoked it. Like a pack of spoony schoolgirls, Rupert Lint had said, and he'd been right. How deliciously innocent they were, Deborah no less than the rest, and how shocked they'd be if he told them the truth about what they'd done tonight. Hide thee, haste thee, gilly corn hill. He had stumbled upon it quite by accident, in German class. A book in the college library, confirming his suspicions, had hinted at still darker things, older than the pyramids, older than recorded history. He'd read of pre-Christian nature worship, and how, each spring, tribesmen had once sacrificed their gods in human form. The rest he'd figured out for himself. Beneath his neighbor's sober-sided piety, he had glimpsed the painted face of the savage. Behind this evening's quaint observance, he had seen a blood-stained altar, and a figure stretched naked upon it like a five-pointed star. He had witnessed the ritual slashing of the throat, the rending of the limbs. While his friends enjoyed their moonlit meal, he'd had a vision of frenzied hands tearing at a thing without a head. While just beyond the firelight, Children fought greedily over what looked like a face. Though their food now bore a deceptive modern name, it had formerly been known as Gotenbread, symbol of what they'd once devoured, 
the flesh of the goddess incarnate, her hair the garland that now crowned his staff. If mole don't taste thee, worm he will. All such goings-on, of course, were safely in the past. There was no harm in them today. Perhaps he'd read more history than the rest of the brethren, and perhaps he'd seen more deeply tonight. But his faith remained as strong as it had always been. The origin of everything was dark, no doubt, but blood spilled long ago had long since dried. Time, he knew, made all deeds respectable. Some people even ate their god each Sunday. For him all gods and goddesses were one, aspects of an all-encompassing divine. And after tonight's sacrament, followed by his mother's benediction, he walked with the confidence of one who'd been truly blessed. Behind him, appropriately, the women had reached the final, optimistic verse of their chant. Fly thee, fleet thee, gillycorn hill. Forcing his thoughts from the altar, the naked victim, the memory of his wife, he raised his voice with theirs in an exuberant shout. If worm don't eat thee, I will. There was a sudden splintering of wood. The point of his staff struck something hard and wriggling. From the earth before him rose an angry sound like fat sizzling on a fire, and something thrashed convulsively, almost wresting the staff from his grasp. An ear of brittle corn snapped off and fell silently at his feet. In the distance one of the cats leaped up and went streaking across the lawn. Lifting the staff he squinted closely at its tip, but the moon was almost gone and he could see nothing. The wood felt cracked and pitted near the end. It was sticky to the touch, and oddly cold. His stomach now unsettled, he pressed the staff once more into the ground, turning it against the clean soil. He said nothing to any of the others, and by the time the third acre was planted he had driven the incident from his mind. It was then that it happened. The hour was late. The crickets still sang, but the lightning bugs were dimmed and the moon had long since disappeared behind the scrub pines to the west. Suddenly, by the faraway blaze, a child cried out in dismay. She was standing over the bag of seed, pointing to something at her feet. Soon she had been joined by a group of the older men. "'Tis nothing!' one of them called hoarsely. He waved the laborers back to the field, but Poroth and his wife continued hurrying toward the fire. In its light, amid a milling crowd of children and elders, they saw the seed bag lying on its side, looking slightly more shrunken than they'd remembered it. Gaping from the bottom was a small circular hole through which spilled a steady stream of corn seed. "'Tis nothing,' repeated the old man. "'We'll get it all.' Around him his comrades were already gathering up the individual kernels that lay scattered in the grass, but what none of them spoke of was the other hole they had seen, and quickly covered over, a hole that, before the bag rolled on its side, had lain just below the first, twisting sinuously into the earth. Carol was sorry when at last they reached the front steps of her building, where tattered aspidistra struggled against cellophane bags, and candy wrappers in two soot-covered boxes on either side of the doorway. The place, which till now had seemed a haven, somewhere she could actually afford, suddenly looked very shabby to her. She was glad it was night, and that the nearest street lamp was several houses away. Frears acted as if he didn't notice, but she was afraid he was only being polite. He had to be richer than he pretended. She was certain of it one of those self-confident New York Jewish boys who'd grown up with all the advantages and didn't realize how lucky they were. Or if he wasn't rich, he was at least generously supplied with money and would soon be relaxing in the country while she'd still be here working all summer. For their entire walk together she'd been acutely aware with every block they passed that he'd be leaving the city on Sunday. And though she reminded herself that the day had been an extraordinarily good one, blessed practically. She couldn't help feeling that, at the same time, God was being curiously cruel, 
No sooner had she met someone she might truly fall in love with than he was being taken away from her. Frears himself, she'd noticed, had begun to grow inexplicably jumpy as their walk drew to an end. He'd become skittish as a greyhound, in fact, seeing shapes in every shadow, certain they were being followed, and some of his tension had rubbed off on her. Only a few yards from her house, he had frozen without warning in his tracks and seized her arm, yanking her back as if before a chasm, and gesturing wordlessly at a thing the size of a pea pod that had scuttled across their path. Carol had let out a little cry before she'd realized it was only a water bug. How in the world was a person like this going to get along in the country? She paused at the bottom of the steps, not sure whether to ask him up for coffee or to say goodbye. Well, Jeremy, she said, it sounds like you're in for a great summer. I envy you, I really do. I just hope you'll give me a call when you get back to the city. Hell, we can do better than that. How about coming out to visit me sometime? It would do you good. Get you away from the dusty old books and little old men. You could come out for the weekend. His confidence seemed to slip. Or else, just for the day. Whatever you like. Oh, Jeremy, I'd love to. Gilead's just a couple of hours by bus, he went on. It's a nice scenic ride. Really not bad at all. Or you could take the express to Flemington, around twelve miles east of it, and save yourself almost an hour. Either way, I could come and pick you up. The Poreths have a truck they'd let me use. That sounds wonderful, she said. It would be lovely to get away for a weekend. She wanted to ask where she would sleep if she stayed over, but she didn't have the courage. Surely the farmer and his wife must have a spare room she could use. Great, he said. Then it's settled. He already had a scrap of paper pressed against his knee and, with his foot on the bottom step, was scribbling down her house number from above the doorway. I'll write you when I get out there and let you know everything's okay. Standing with him on the sidewalk, she followed his gaze, then looked up past the tiers of dirty brick and plaster to a row of windows on the fifth floor. They were dark. Maybe Rochelle had gone out with her boyfriend, and for once Carol would have the place to herself. More likely, though, she was in bed, and certainly not alone. If you'd like to come in for coffee, Carol said, making up her mind, we'll have to be very quiet. My roommate's probably asleep already. Oh, that's okay. After the triumph of getting her to agree to see him, he seemed disinclined to press his luck. It's late, and I've got a ton of books to pack tomorrow. Just don't forget to take along those nature guides, she said, starting up the steps. I want you to be an expert tracker by the time I come out. She heard him hesitate, then follow her. When she turned, he was standing beside her, smiling. I was hoping you'd come out a good deal sooner than that, he said. Maybe even next weekend. He held the outer door open while she reached into her handbag for her keys. Well, she said, a little surprised. Maybe I could. She searched her mind for doubts, objections, other plans, and realized, feeling suddenly foolish, that she had none. She had no plans for the entire summer. Yes, she said. That might be very nice. I think I can probably get away. Okay, then. I intend to write you as soon as I get out there, and you'd better write back. He tapped her nose with the tip of his finger. Remember, I'm depending on it. Don't worry. I've got two married sisters plus my mother, and I never miss a letter. She paused, fitting the key into the inner lock. It was time to make her goodbyes. Well, I've had a wonderful evening, and I really want to thank you for... Oh, no, look at this. She withdrew the key and pressed against the door. It swung open at her touch. Something had happened to the bolt. He bent to examine it. 
Looks like somebody unscrewed the little metal plate, he said, poking at the pitted wood with his finger. I wonder if anything's been robbed. He shook his head. This fucking city. She stared uncertainly into the dim light of the hallway. It's sort of scary. Look, would you like me to come up with you? I'll just see you to your door. I don't want to come in or anything. Could you please? I'm sure there's nothing the matter, but just in case someone's inside there. She swallowed. Glad to. I'll go first. Frowning, he stepped into the hall. She followed him. The passage was a narrow one, and silent at this hour. Their feet scraped audibly against the yellowing white tiles that climbed, stained, and broken halfway up the walls. At the farther end a thick black metal door concealed an elevator scarcely larger than a closet. Lit by only one bare bulb that dangled from wires in the ceiling. It trembled as the two of them crowded inside, and again when the inner door slid echoingly shut. With a whir of distant gears, the car gave a lurch and rose slowly up the darkened shaft, their shadows flirting back and forth with the swinging of the bulb. They watched the shadows, the curls of paint around the emergency button, and the numbers sliding past the small glass porthole in the door. Through it, as each new floor came into view, a pale circle of light winked open and shut like an eye, then disappeared below them. They said nothing, both of them hushed, listening. The car slowed, sighed, and came shuddering to rest at the fifth floor. Peering through the glass before Frears pushed ahead of her, Carol could see that there was no danger after all. The hall was empty. She walked beside him to her door and slipped her key into the lock. It was an awkward moment. Maybe she should plead with him to come in. Well, she heard herself say, Thank you once again. I had a really lovely evening. She hoped he could see that she meant it, and wondered if he felt the same. At the turn of the key the door swung inward. Beyond it the front hall was dark. She dropped her voice to a whisper. And it was really sweet of you to come up here like this. I only wish it weren't so late. Quickly, before she lost her nerve, she encircled his neck with her arm and pressed a kiss to the side of his mouth. He seemed to take it as his due. Amen, he said. See you in Jersey. I'll be waiting for your letter. She stepped into the darkness. He raised a hand in farewell and turned away. Shutting the door, she heard the clang of the elevator and, moments later, the churning of gears as it started down. The apartment smelled of garlic and fried meat, and from the doorway of the living room, men's aftershave. Rochelle and her date had not gone out then. There'd be no dawdling in the kitchen tonight, and no light to guide her to her room. Half feeling her way, Carol tiptoed through the hall, the only illumination came from beneath the bathroom door at the other end. As she passed, it swung silently open. In its light stood the boyfriend, staring at her open-mouthed, olive-skinned and hairy. He jumped back when he saw that it was her, his sex jiggling. She tried to look away. The light was snapped off, and she heard a low chuckle. Thought you were Shelley, he said. There was toothpaste on his breath. No, it's only me. She could feel the nearness of his body as she brushed past him. She groped blindly, nearly stumbling toward her bedroom. There was the sound of breathing behind her, then a pause, and she heard him pad slowly down the hall. Once inside the room, she closed the door tightly and switched on a small lamp by her bed. The dancers on the posters seemed to leap out from the wall, arms outstretched in welcome. Merrill Ashley, Barishnikov, Karen Kane as the Swan Queen. But it was hard to turn her mind from that figure in the bathroom, the damp and shining hair. She forced herself to think of Jeremy, hoping he was really going to send for her, reminding herself, lest she be hurt, how little she really knew of him. How strangely nervous he had been at the end of their walk here, 
furtively watching for criminals and cripples, yet never for a moment losing that special New York cockiness of his. Maybe she should have insisted he come in. She wished he were here beside her, to hold her all night in his arms. But by now he would be downstairs, perhaps back on the street. She went to her window to see. Parting two slats of the Venetian blind, she peered outside. Yes, there he was, trotting briskly down the front steps, his body foreshortened from this angle. He seemed to be moving fast, his stride lengthening. She hoped it came from feeling good about tonight, and not from any eagerness to leave. Within seconds he'd reached the dying maple that stood halfway up the block, leaves trembling in a final ray of moonlight. Soon he would be past the corner out of sight. She was just about to turn from the window when, from the shadows somewhere beyond the row of tenements to her left, almost at the edge of her vision, she thought she saw a small white shape drop soundlessly to the sidewalk and go scurrying after him, waving something in its hand as if it were a wand. Midway to the corner it made a queer, mincing little pirouette, and disappeared behind a line of cars parked beneath the tree. This was no cripple. It looked as plump and agile as a child, though surely no child could be out at such an hour. Tugging at the cords along the end, she readjusted the blinds for a better view. The slats tilted open. Parallel bands of street light flooded the room. She peered outside again, but it was too late. The moon had set. The street was still the tree dark and unmoving against the sky. A trail of mist was rising in ghostly tentacles from the sidewalk. Both figures were gone. June 25th A very special day indeed. Dawn has broken over the horizon like the lifting of a vast, immeasurable curtain, and the sky is rosy with promise. At ease upon the rooftop of his building, he settles back in the dusty canvas deck chair and blinks contentedly at the heavens, his face aglow with early morning sunlight. The air up here is temperate, with just a hint of blossoms beneath the street smells and the scent of roofing tar. Birds cry raucously overhead, breezes stir the pale wisps of his hair. Behind him lies the dark river, sweeping past hills still mottled by shadow. Before him, eastward, stretches the city, its towers like an endless line of tombstones, black against the brightening sky. The old one lies back, yawning, and allows himself a smile. He has had a full day of it, and a full night. There has been much to do, roles to play, rituals to perform, the theft of a minor belonging. He has spent the greater part of the night observing the man and the woman, Later he narrowed his attentions to the man and stood watch in the street below his window, a squat, shabby little figure hovering just beyond the lamplight, patient and alone, standing huddled beneath the black umbrella, unmoved by the rain that broke the stillness, or the stillness that followed the rain. At last the window had gone dark, like the woman's a mile away, and noting the time with a satisfied nod, he'd begun his journey homeward. Even then he was busy, preparing lines of future conversation, reciting certain chants, whispering a word in a long-forgotten tongue. Years of calculations have waited to be verified within the compass of a single sunrise. There have been readings to be taken from the shadows it produced, from the winking red and yellow lights of an unknown vessel passing silently up the Hudson, from reflections of a fading star in the puddle at his feet. His figuring has had to be precise, his timing flawless. In this way and no other can the final sights be chosen for the ceremonies. Now he is tired, too weak to do more than turn his head from side to side and contemplate the clear, unclouded sky. Yet still he has not slept, nor will he until the thing he's planned is done. Of human needs, food alone remains— and the occasional dose of sun to warm his bones. As for the absurd routine of sleep, the head mashed to the pillow, the face relaxed or clenched, the mind unmoored, eight hours adrift, 
lost among infantile fantasies. He has put all that behind him long ago, as easily as a serpent sheds its skin. As for dreams, they have not troubled him for more than half a century. Not that he would sleep now in any case. He is far too pleased with the progress he has made. In every act, her every word, no doubt her every thought, the woman has proven herself suitable, positively eager, in fact. She has come through her first day splendidly, after a certain delay, quite inconsequential and in no way her own fault. She has gone on to establish a really promising emotional relationship with the selected man. Final contact is complete. The man himself is perfect, right down to the date and the hour of his birth nearly thirty years ago. Perfect, too, that he's a solitary soul, lonely and suggestible, the sort who'll pose no problems if correctly used. And used he will be, that much is certain. After all, what else are tools for? The roommate is another story. Something is going to have to be done about her. Free spirit, indeed. Why, she's nothing but a common whore. He isn't going to have her tempting his little virgin. Not a chance. Yes, something will definitely have to be done, and soon. He isn't sure what method he will use, but he has never lacked for ideas. The ascendant sun is dazzling now, making rainbows in his eyes. The old one blinks and looks away. Beside him, arrayed upon the low brick wall that runs along the edge of the roof, lies the simple apparatus that will occupy his day. The jelly jar, still empty, and the bag quite full, and, resting on a musician's practice book to keep the pages from turning in the breeze, the shabby leather flute case with the black plastic handle. Common objects, all of them. There will be nothing strenuous for him today, but he will not be idle. Taking the bag by its cloth straps, he hangs it on a nail projecting just inside the wall, where it dangles heavily suspended a few inches above the surface of the roof. The leather case is next. From its velvet lining he withdraws a stubby white flagellette that shines like polished ivory. Before putting it to his lips, however, he lays the music book upon his lap, open to exercise seven, atonal syncopations. He has, in fact, no interest in music and no intention of wasting time on such a composition but the seventh exercise bears a vague resemblance to the complicated patterns he'll be playing, and any other tenant who chances upon the roof today will see only a harmless little man, lips puckered, lunch stowed on the wall beside him, laboring earnestly over an unmelodic series of minors, trills, and dissonances. It is good to be prepared. Already the air has begun to grow warmer. The breeze is soothing at this height with the occasional fragrance of early summer foliage from the park a dozen floors below. He breathes deeply. Holding the flute in both hands, he blows three notes, soft and low, that fade into silence. The air grows still. Eagerly he looks toward the bag. Inside it, something stirs. The touch of a smile crosses his face. He blows the notes once more. The bag stirs violently now, as if something inside it were struggling to be free. It gives a sudden jerk, almost dislodging the brick on which the jar rests. Carefully placing the jar at his feet, he begins to play. There is no rhythm to his playing, and no tune. The patterns are impossible to discern. To any listener it would seem, but for a certain exotic quality in some of the phrases, little more than a succession of random tones, like a man punching typewriter keys in an unknown language. And yet the notes, in fact, form a song, the death song, which, curiously, is a song about birth. The gleaming white tube sways erratically before his face. His fingers scuttle like spiders up and down its length. Above him the air trembles with the sound, and whirlwinds sweep invisibly toward the heavens. It is a moment of awakening. The bag rocks back and forth. All nature is stirring now. The river, the trees, the dancing air, 
and something outside nature, deep beneath the earth, where rock grinds slowly against rock. He can hear it stirring and is glad. Raising his eyes from the now blinding sun, he goes on playing, gazing into a sky so blue it looks as if it were ready to shatter into a million pieces, like the rending of an egg. It is going to be a beautiful day. All morning he plays softly upon the flagellette, his small pink head bobbing in elusive time, the flute sound competing with the cries of the birds. At intervals he pauses to watch the movement in the bag. The thing inside thrashes wildly, nearly tearing through the cloth. Whenever he sees this, he smiles. Once the sun has wandered to the other side of the sky and is settling toward the western hills, he plays his last three notes. They are the first three he played, but in reverse order. Laying aside the instrument, he pronounces a certain word and pushes himself up from the chair. Five hours or less till midnight. His present work is all but done. By sunset he is ready. The chair is folded and in place beside the elevator tower, the music tossed away. The flute case and the jelly jar, now full, he takes downstairs. Behind him, in the center of the roof, lies the aftermath of his day's labor. A glistening pink cruciform of entrails, tied with a stolen red hair. And spread beneath it, torn as if by razor claws, lies the empty canvas bag, glowing scarlet in the sunset a bag that, till this day, has held no more than books. Darkness finds him crouching on the walkway by the river's edge, his dim white form reflected in the water, making certain languid motions with his hand in the space between the concrete and the railing. From the distance of the park he would seem a vulnerable little figure, like a child crouched before a mud puddle, absorbed in some grave and private task. His hand flicks downward, and a cascade of small bright objects, jagged shards as white as bone, falls glimmering in the moonlight to vanish beneath the waves. Here and there a feather, like a speck of cloud, is carried by the wind. All that remains is the libation, the offering of the or tina. Formula calls for a beaker or a flask. The jelly jar, he knows, will do as well. With a flourish, he empties it into the river. In the instant before it is lost from sight, it stains the waters a cloudy black, though by daylight they may well have shown up red. Clutching the rail with both hands, he climbs to his feet and stands facing the river. Across it lies the Jersey shore, and beyond that rolling farmlands, the ploughed earth cooling now and plunged in night. A few tiny lights flicker like campfires in the dark hills. To this the man is bound. Tomorrow, with the morning, he'll be speeding toward the countryside, his head stuffed full of ignorant romantic nonsense, his bags weighed down with piles of books, books of just the right sort. How useful he is going to be, once he comes of age and, in the moonlight, reads the passage from the storybook. The old man speaks the fourth name, whispers three more words, and smiles. A chilling breeze from off the river stirs the pale wisps of his hair. Watching the stars sweep majestically toward the horizon, he thinks of all that is to come. The woman is to play the major part, but the man's role will come first. The blind fool doesn't know it yet, but there are going to be some changes made amid those distant hills. Changes beyond dreaming. And on the night that he turns thirty, they will all begin with him. Book Two Poroth Farm Surely, I said, there is little left to explore. You have been born a few hundred years too late for that. I think you are wrong, he replied. There are still, depend upon it, quaint, undiscovered countries and continents of strange extent. Arthur Mackin, The Novel of the Black Seal
June 26th. Dear Carol, Greetings from the Sticks. I've been here all of four and a half hours, and already my voice has taken on a colorful rustic twang. By this time tomorrow I expect to be walking around with a straw hat over my eyes and a wheat stalk dangling from my lips. Amazing what this country air can do. Actually, the air here is quite nice, and it makes me wonder what in God's name I've been breathing for the last twenty-nine years. I just hope it doesn't give me one of those legendary country appetites. Outside in the yard you can really smell things growing, which for this guy is something of a novelty. Everything out here is ridiculously green, and so silent I'm tempted just to sit still and listen to it. No traffic noise, no subways or construction gangs or psychos, and no more jangling telephones, thank God. Believe me, it's every bit as quiet as the library. You'll feel right at home. I came out today on the afternoon bus, lugging two monstrous suitcases stuffed with books, papers, and a few changes of clothes. Sar met me in Gilead with his truck. He's just like I described him. He comes on a bit solemn at first, gloomy even, but underneath it all I believe he's just shy. You'll like him. You'll probably like Deborah even more. She's already filled me in on all the local gossip. Gilead, it seems, is not composed entirely of saints, though I noticed she didn't bring this up till her husband was gone. She also insisted on telling me the complete, unedited life histories of each of their seven cats. I'll spare you the details. You'll probably get an encore when you come out. She's fascinated by New York City, incidentally, which I gather she hasn't visited since meeting Sar. So here I am, ensconced in my rural retreat, sitting at an old wooden table, which I've set up as a desk. There's a small bookcase right beside it which Deborah found in the storeroom, and another one next to my bed. My books are all unpacked now, and I've spent the last couple of hours getting things tidied up a bit, patching a few holes in the screens, etc. The windows let in lots of sun, and the place is much more cheerful than I have probably made it sound. You'll see when you get here, which, needless to say, I hope you'll do next weekend. I certainly don't anticipate any problems. Well, I suppose I ought to get busy with some work of my own. I hope to devote myself to the three R's while I'm out here. Reading and writing with arithmetic to help me figure out how to crowd a year's worth of the first two into a single summer. To keep track of my progress, I intend to start a journal, but somehow doubt it'll rival Thoreau's. Earlier today I found some old lawn chairs in the storeroom on the other side of this outbuilding, so I guess I'll take one of them outside and read till dinner time. There's only an hour or so of daylight left, and I may as well take advantage of it. See you soon, I trust. Write and let me know. XXX Jeremy P.S. I'm enclosing a Flemington bus schedule. You'll have to tell the driver in advance that you want Gilead. Otherwise, they bypass the place. You could come out Friday after work and be here before dark. Horace Walpole, The Castle of Otranto, 1764, Chapter 1 Manfred, Prince of Otranto, had one son and one daughter. The latter, a most beautiful virgin, aged eighteen, was called Matilda. Conrad, the son, was three years younger, a homely youth. No one can accuse Walpole of beating around the bush. Essay Topics Show how the techniques of stagecraft are used to enhance suspense. Gothic fantasy is literature of setting. Mystery is literature of plot. Science fiction is literature of ideas. Why the Gothic is inherently conservative. Sexual nature of grief. Sexual nature of fear. After dinner, chapters two through five. I would say something more, said Matilda, struggling. But it would not be... Isabella, Theodore, for my sake... Oh! She expired. Isabella and her women tore Hippolyta from the corpse, but Theodore printed a thousand kisses on her clay-cold hands. 
Somehow this stuff doesn't really grab me. Castles, monks, giant helmets. Maybe I shouldn't have started so far back. Or maybe it's just the glare from this goddamn desk lamp. Must get a proper shade for it next time I'm in town. Otherwise I'll go blind. Would walk back inside and ask the poets for one, but don't think they'd be much help since, bless their masochistic hearts, the two of them seemed determined to make do with gas lamps and kerosene lanterns, something I deliberately neglected to mention in letter to Carol. Anyway, thank God for Thomas Edison. Nighttime now. The Poroths already have their lights off, and a million moths are tapping at my screens. One of them's a fat white fellow the size of a small bird. Never saw one like it. What kind of caterpillar must it have been? Jesus, I hope the damn things don't push through the wire. Wonder if the dampness brings them out. There's a line of hills not far away, but here the elevation's low and the night air smells of water. Already I've noticed a greenish band of mildew around the bottom of my walls. Bugs, too. Lots of them. This place is really infested. Something else I neglected to tell Carol. Ditto dampness, musty smell, wasps near smokehouse, etc., etc. Why turn her off the place before she comes? Seems to me the Poroths might have taken a bit more time to clean it, instead of waiting till I got here. I had to go over the entire room twice after Deborah left, and each time I found new ones. God knows what they were. Sure as hell don't care to look them up in the guide. Worst of all are the spiders, especially near the screens. Think I got most of them by now, but had to use up half a roll of paper towels squashing the bastards. Must buy more next time I'm in town, and a can or two of insect spray. Killing spiders is supposed to bring bad luck. If you wish to live and thrive, let the spider walk alive. But I'll be damned if I'm going to sleep with anything crawling around in here. Anyway, too late now, I'm already a mass murderer. They can add up the total in heaven. Still hard to know just what to make of the Poroths. Everything they do seems to have a special meaning that outsiders can't begin to understand. Even the farm itself has a kind of religious significance— it's supposed to bring the two of them closer to God. Here they can be in the world, but not of it, Sar says, and they're supposed to find satisfaction in the day-to-day -day labor rather than in the money it might bring. That's why they have no restrictions against working on Sunday, and why progress is such a dirty word to them. It means escape from toil. Deborah seems to work as hard as Sar does. She was cleaning up in here when we arrived on her knees scrubbing the floor. Something curiously erotic about a woman in that position, exerting herself while you're at your ease. Sar tried to pitch in and help for a while, but finally he excused himself and left. He was probably relieved to get back to the fields. He's sure not much on small talk. At dinner tonight he gave me a blow-by-blow -blow chronicle of this morning's service, Apparently the whole community meets each Sunday in someone's backyard, with the Poroth's turn coming up next month, and then launched into a long, earnest explanation of the various theological differences between the Brethren and the general run of Mennonites, differences he claimed were extremely deep. For a silent type, he really talks a lot when he gets going. He lost me after the first minute or two. As far as I'm concerned, they're all just fundamentalists, and they all wear funny clothes. I've even noticed an occasional tiz or twasn't creeping into their conversation, especially when they're going in for Bible talk. I gather the town folk are even more prone to it. Made my first mistake at dinner tonight. Sat down and started to eat, then heard Sar saying grace. Hastily apologized, of course, and waited till he was done but I find that such things don't embarrass me the way they used to. Maybe that's because I'm nearing thirty. Shit. Only one goddamned week left. Somehow I dread that moment. Better not to think of it. The food, at least, was even better than I'd hoped. Chicken, peas, and baked potato, with spice cake for dessert. Homemade, too. Deborah obviously likes to cook. I'll bet she makes Sarah a damned good wife. 
He kept reaching out to touch her every time she passed where he was sitting. I guess planting makes people horny. Can't say I blame him. I felt almost the same this afternoon when she was scrubbing my floor. Not that she makes the slightest attempt to be seductive. I'd like to see her with her hair down. Still can't get that picture of her out of my head. Standing there waving goodbye to me, naked beneath that long black dress. She seems to be the perfect bountiful housewife. Full breasts, wide hips, always filled with energy. Looks as if she'll bear a lot of children. Right now, though, those damned cats are the closest thing they've got, and they fuss over them as if they were real children. One of them, Sar's cat, may be a bit of a problem. She's the gray one, the oldest of the lot. She also happens to be the meanest. Maybe she's jealous of the rest. Or maybe she was just born with an evil disposition. All I know is she's the only cat that's ever bitten anyone. Various friends and relations, including some local bigwig named Brother Yoram, and after seeing how she snarls at the other cats when they get in her way or come too close while she's feeding, I decided to keep my distance. Fortunately, she seems a bit scared of me and retreats whenever I approach. Probably best to keep away from all of them, in fact. Sneezing, itching eyes whenever they're around. Should have gone to that allergist when I had the chance. The Poroths seem pretty cat-like themselves. Interesting case of people resembling their pets. Sar is inclined to be morose and somewhat taciturn, a solemn, slightly suspicious tomcat, while Deb is bubbly and talkative, as animated as one of the kittens. Clearly a case of opposites attracting, despite the similarity of appearance. At dinner, Sar said that some of the locals still use snake oil for whatever ails them, Asked him how the snakes were killed, slightly misquoting line from Vathek. The oil of serpents I have pinched to death will be a pretty present. We discussed the wisdom of pinching snakes. Learned there may be a copperhead out back, over near the brook. Somehow the Poroths neglected to mention this on my first visit. We'll watch my step. Though according to my field guide... Far more people die each year from bee and wasp stings than from snake bites. Insect venom is more toxic. Supposedly there are frogs and turtles out there, too. Have yet to see any. Maybe they only come out at night. Over coffee, Sar talked of the house he hopes to build some day, when the two of them have children. He'll build it out of stone, he said, three floors high and three feet thick. Then he shut up, and I had to keep the conversation going through dessert. Hate eating in silence. Animal sounds of mastication. Bubbling stomachs. Didn't some Balzac character claim talk aided digestion? Probably true. By this time they both looked ready for bed, though I doubt if sleep was the only thing on their minds. So it seemed wise to get out of their way. Brushed my teeth, not forgetting dental floss, and took the usual vitamins, just in case. As soon as I left their place and came back here, I began to feel sort of lonely. Still some light left in the sky, but the lawn behind the house was already swarming with fireflies. Never saw so many. Knelt and watched them for a while, and listened to the crickets. That's one sound the city doesn't have. Too bad Carol isn't here. She'd appreciate it. Wonder if she'll actually come out. Hope my letter made the place sound inviting. Hope I didn't lay it on too thick. Maybe I should have been more honest with her. Just as well I didn't mention how narrow my bed is, though. Really no more than a cot. That's the sort of thing she can discover on her own. Also, incentive for losing a bit of weight this week. Must remember to get a haircut. If I can get into Flemington. Maybe my last one for quite some time. Later. After making it through Otranto, not the most auspicious start, wasted nearly an hour arranging my books. First tried putting them in chronological order, since that's the way I hope to read them, but copyright dates can be ambiguous with the older works, and too many authors get broken up. Then tried chronologically by date of author's birth, but I didn't know most of these and no way to find out. 
So back to boring old alphabetical order by author, with anthologies bringing up the rear. After much deliberation, decided that the works of Saki had to be placed under M for Monroe. Why am I so neurotic about my books? Anyway, they look damned nice, lined up on the shelves. Anne Radcliffe, The Mysteries of Udolpho, 1794 Set up late pushing through Volume 1. All the elements of classic Gothic romance. Heroine passive but resourceful. Hero villain dark, mysterious, and cruel. Predating Byron and Brontes. Lots of spook effects. Understand they're all explained away scientifically at end of Volume 2. If so, a bad mistake. M. R. James speaks of her exasperating timidity in this regard. Check reference. Plot dated, but love the descriptions of picturesque scenes, especially Udolpho itself, rugged Apennine Castle. Would be nice to put book on curriculum, but only one student in a dozen would read it. Too damned long. Long for me, too. In fact, had to keep remembering to slow down, be patient, let myself unwind. After twenty years of school, I've gotten into habit of skimming everything, as if novels were newspapers. Tried to put myself in frame of mind of eighteenth-century reader with plenty of time on his hands and no distractions. Certainly no distractions here. No TV or movies. No goddamned Sunday times. No friends to call or drop by. Nothing but the insects batting themselves mindlessly against the screens. What was it Emerson said in his journal? Thank God I live in the country. Suppose it's time I got some sleep. Wish to hell there was a bathroom in this building. Porth said they'd leave the kitchen door unlocked for me, but I sure as hell don't feel like stumbling all the way back there without a flashlight and maybe waking the two of them up. Looks so goddamn dark out there. Where did all the fireflies go? Maybe I should get a hollow metal oil drum to pee in and lift it for exercise each day as it fills, like the guy who started out lifting a calf every morning, and by the time it grew up was strong enough to lift a full-grown bull. Guess I'll water the grass in front of this building, pissing beneath the stars, just like my ancestors. Very romantic. Though God knows what'll be crawling up my ankles. At least the crickets are still there to keep me company. Back inside now. Felt vulnerable standing there against the night, but must say the sky looked spectacular. I don't think I've ever seen so many stars and can't remember the last time I actually saw the Milky Way. That's something else the city doesn't have. Though typically my first thought on looking up was, Jesus, it's just like the planetarium. Anyway, stood there gawking till my neck got stiff. But the real shock was the view I got of this building. The lamp on my desk must be the only illumination for miles acting as sort of a beacon, and I could see dozens of flying shapes making right for the screens. When you're inside here, it's like being in a display case. Every eye can watch you, from the woods and fields and lawn, but all you see is darkness. It wouldn't be so bad if this room weren't open on three sides, though I suppose that does let in the breeze. Wish the trees didn't crowd so close to the windows by my bed. The middle sections of their trunks are all lit up where the light falls on them. Between the undergrowth and roots, there's not even enough space back there to walk. 2 a.m. now, and a few moths are still hovering outside the screens. A little green one must have gotten in when I opened the door. It's flying around this lamp now, along with several gnats too small to kill. Lots of noise out there, too. How could I have said this place was silent? Trees moving, branches snapping, sounds of breeze and running water. Frogs now, croaking somewhere in the distance, with the crickets coming in behind them. This is what I wanted, I suppose. Just saw an unpleasantly large spider scurry across the floor near the foot of my bed. Vanished behind the footlocker. Must remember to get that insect spray and a flashlight. Wonder what Carol's doing now. June 29th. Dear Jeremy, 
Greetings from the apple. I'm glad to hear you're enjoying yourself, and that you haven't fallen down any cisterns or caught poison ivy or been eaten by a bear. We'll make an outdoorsman of you yet. You really deserve a nice long reply, but this one's going to be short, as I'm writing it on my break, with half a dozen people in this tiny office breathing down my neck. I just wanted to let you know that, thanks to good old Rosie, I'll be able to see you more easily than I'd expected. It turns out Rosie owns a car, and he told me I could borrow it this weekend, as he has some very important business. He pursed his little lips and looked oh so stern as he said this, which will be keeping him in New York. The only drawback is he needs the car on Monday for some Fourth of July affair, so I won't be able to take advantage of the three-day weekend. Still, it'll be nice to get out of the city, and we'll have some time together. I hope to get an early start Saturday morning, so if all goes well I should be there by noon. I wish I had some sort of map, but Gilead sounds like one of those little towns where everybody knows everybody else, so once I get there I'm sure I'll find someone to give me directions to the Poroths. I don't expect to have any trouble. Remember, you're dealing with the third runner-up in the BCYC Senior Girls Pathfinder competition. Rosie's really done a lot for me, I must admit. He's a very dear person and treats me just like his own daughter, or rather, granddaughter. He says he doesn't think I'm eating right, so tomorrow, before I come to work, he's taking me out for a champagne brunch at some fancy place on 21st Street. Now that's the sort of life I think I could get used to. A glass or two of bubbly in the morning and I'll be floating all day. And yesterday he brought me a bottle of wine from, as he called it, his private cellar which is probably just a cupboard above the kitchen sink. Maybe I'll bring it out with me as a house gift this weekend. I've also been working very hard, believe it or not. I want Rosie to feel he's getting his money's worth. Last Saturday I really buckled down and went through all those articles he gave me, so I could have the summaries ready for him when he dropped by here on Monday. I think that really impressed him, at least I hope so. I charged him for twelve hours' work. Actually, it took me close to sixteen, and he gave me a check for $144 right there on the spot. He took me completely at my word. After the way some people treat me in this stupid library, I really appreciate decency like that. By the way, rather than go to the trouble and expense of Xeroxing those stories you'd requested, I'll simply bring you the entire book this weekend. It'll be a lot easier, and anyway, Rosie's convinced me that things like that are much more fun to read in the original. I'll sign it out before I leave work today. Rosie's just amazing when it comes to books. I mean, the things he's learned. You'd be surprised. He's really quite good company, for a person his age. He's been all over the world, mostly doing some kind of heavy research in linguistics, and he tells me the most incredible stories. I had him up to my apartment last night, just for coffee and cake, and he talked to me in something called Agon di Gatuan which means the old language. He's teaching me a chant in it, and promises I'll be able to speak it fluently by the end of summer. It's like nothing I've ever heard. Well, my break's just about over, and I'd better end now if I want to get this in today's mail. See you on Saturday. XXX. Carol. P.S. Rosie gave me something for you. I'll be sure to bring it with me. He just loves to give presents. He's also very keen on order, decorum, rules, things like that, and is always telling me how old-fashioned he is and proud of it. I don't think he quite approves of Rochelle. Last night, just as he was getting ready to leave, she walked in with a few of her friends, and one of the guys made some kind of joke about older guys stealing all the best girls. It was meant to be funny, and Rochelle said I should take it as a compliment, but poor old Rosie looked very upset. June 30th On some days he gives way to rages. Morning finds him on the beach, walking back and forth along the water's edge, the battered old umbrella tucked uselessly beneath his arm. He pays no attention to the flocks of bathers, to the cries of children braving the assaults of the surf, or playing on the rubbish-strewn sand, 
or to the oily, sun-warmed bodies of their elders, lying inert upon blankets with radios and picnic baskets by their heads. Humanity, for the moment, is forgotten, its noise and filth and ugliness ignored. He is far too busy studying the patterns of the waves and, at other moments, squinting directly upward into the blinding blue dome of the sky. To those on the beach, should anyone chance to be watching, this awkward little figure trudging through the wet sand in a baggy blue suit and soggy overshoes, which more than once become soaked as a wave breaks over his ankles, might seem a tourist from some other era. As he peers up and down the beach, he might well be in search of some seaside vista fit for the amateur painter or photographer, or perhaps he'd be mistaken for some confused but harmless octogenarian who's wandered out from one of the old-age homes that lined the avenue across from the boardwalk. But the concerns of art and freedom are, in fact, far from his mind. More urgent matters have brought him to the shore today, matters of geography, sand formation, tides. He is scouting locations. Suddenly he pauses, grows rigid. Something up the beach has distracted him. A pair of lovers lying together, body to body, in the boardwalk's striped shadow. Rage sweeps over him like a wave. Jerkily he begins moving toward them, lips tightening, color surging to his face. He can feel in his fists the pumping of their loathsome hearts. The air before him rings with ancient voices screaming for a kill. Oh, to perform the Vulat Taina! To drown the pair, to burn them where they lie to climb the boardwalk and drop knives upon their flesh through the cracks between the planks. In a vision he sees thrashing young bodies buried beneath waves of smothering sand. He calms himself in time and turns away. The day is young. He has other sights to visit. That afternoon he spends walking jauntily through the park, swinging his umbrella, making silent calculations with the figures he discerns in the branches of the trees. As the sun slips behind a horn-shaped cloud, he spies a group of people coming toward him up the path, a slim, bespectacled man and his pale, wide-eyed wife, their little girl in her red sunsuit, and a baby recumbent in a stroller. And like the sudden waning of the light, his rage returns. His eyes narrow, his face goes dark, his little hand tightens on the umbrella. Trembling, he whirls and follows them, his face fixed in an amiable smile. The family turns eastward toward the zoo. He follows, drawing closer, as they stop to exclaim at penguins, hippos, bears. He eases himself beside them, nodding fondly to the parents, watching benignly as they're drawn on toward the panther curled within a spot of shade, the lion dozing grandly in the sunlight, the tiger pacing madly in its cage. He sees the air vibrate around the tawny form, feels its baffled hunger, shares the beast's longing to leap and slash and rend. Blinking before the cage, smiling at the children, he loses himself in a reverie of death. How he would love to press that vile infant through the bars, to lacerate its flesh, to crush its throbbing neck with his own hands. And he could do it, too, though he dares not. Not now. But for one brief moment, while the gazes of the other three are turned toward the cage and the infant's gaze toward him, he allows his mask to slip. The grin disappears. Eyes go hard. Teeth show in a tigerish snarl. Smiling once more, he strolls onward, momentarily relieved. Behind him, to the astonishment of its parents, the infant explodes into wails of terror. North of the zoo, just off the path, rises a small stand of dogwood and magnolia bushes, and hidden behind them, a tiny patch of dark ground that shelters wildflowers. He stands poised in the middle of it now, features contorted as before, swinging about him with his umbrella. Swoosh! Foliage lies slashed to pieces. Swoosh! Heads of flowers are sliced off clean. Knuckles whiten on the umbrella. His complexion grows red. 
His breath comes in furious gasps between clenched teeth. The air around him shrieks with mangled leaves and tattered blossoms. The episode lasts but a minute. Afterward, calm once more, the smile back in place, a fragile pink magnolia in his buttonhole. He slips back to the path, umbrella at his side, and heads jauntily for home. July 1st The letter was waiting for him in the kitchen. Frears read it over lunch. He looked up to see Deborah watching him intently from across the table. Remember, he said, I mentioned something about having guests out. Deborah nodded, while Sar continued eating. Well, I hope it's not going to be inconvenient, but believe it or not, this friend of mine is thinking of driving out here tomorrow. I know it's a little early in the summer, but... Deborah silenced him. Now don't go worrying yourself. That'll be just fine. She stood and began clearing away some of the dishes. We like having guests out here, don't we, honey? Sar nodded without much enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. Be glad to meet him. Well, actually, it's a girl. Name's Carol. Someone I know from the city. Sar looked up from his dessert with a tiny flicker of annoyance, and perhaps something else. She'll be staying overnight? I think so. Frears fell silent, reluctant to say more. Sar's mouth made a thin, straight line. We'll put her in the room upstairs. Deborah, moving past him, touched his shoulder. Honey, isn't that for Jeremy to say? It drew an angry look. Upstairs will be fine, Frears said hurriedly, disinclined to make an issue of it. Let them go ahead and prepare a room for her. She wouldn't have to stay there. She should be getting here around noon tomorrow. Somebody's lending her his car. I was just wondering about the food situation. If you like, I could drive into town and pick up a few extra things. Sar pushed his chair back from the table. No, no need of that. Tis a blessing to have guests in a home, and she'll be welcome here. Wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, he stood. Well, guess I'd best see to those cuttings out there before the worms do. He turned and left the kitchen, his heavy footsteps echoing on the porch. Moments later they heard him descend the back steps and set out toward the fields. Frears waited till he'd gone. He didn't look all that pleased, did he? Oh, he's not one to show it, but he's pleased all right. He likes when strangers come and look the place over. Reminds him that he really belongs here. That he's back where his roots are. Roots? Frears laughed. You know, he mentioned something about that the first time he was showing me around. I thought he was kidding. Deborah shook her head. My husband doesn't jest. This farm's real special to him. But I thought you bought the place just last winter. We did. But Sire's family owned it a long time before. They were the first to settle here. You mean the Porths built this place? No, it was on his mother's side. The Truths. They're another of Gilead's old families. Yes, I remember. A group of them died in a fire. And this is where they lived. You mean the fire was right here? On this site? She nodded. It was a long time ago. A hundred years or more. Sar told me about it. He says the house we're in now is the second on this spot, built on the old foundation. The first burned right down to the ground, with naught left but the chimney and this old thing. She gestured toward the squat, cast-iron stove. I forget how many people died. Six or seven, I think. Mother, father, babies. The whole family. Except for one, said Frears. The young boy that people think said it. Matt Geisel told me about him. Well, whatever the cause, it was a tragedy. She turned back to the dishes. Frears nodded, then reached for the pudding bowl. 
Must have happened at night while they were asleep. Otherwise you'd think they could have gotten out. Yes. Yes, it must have been at night. Deborah stood at the window, gazing absently into the sunshine. It was barely noon. Freer sat contented over dessert. Outside lay her garden, the cornfields, the barn, distant hills. Familiar things, all of them, the constants of her life. Yet it seemed at the moment that they hinted at a terrible impermanence. She turned away, busying herself with the washing, but her thoughts were on something else entirely something madly out of place on so bright and fair a day, the image of a cold black sky, and beneath it, reddening the night for miles around, a pyramid of flame. She heard a spoon scrape against the bowl. Come on, Jeremy, she said, rousing herself. I want to see you finish up that pudding. A real smart choice the man is saying. In the sunlight, flooding through the open doorway, the smile lines around his mouth show as lines of fatigue. It's always a pleasure to deal with someone who knows what he wants. He marks several spaces with an X and slides the forms across the battered desk. Now all I need from you is your John Hancock there at the bottom of the page. Uh-huh, and there too. That's right, very good. Thanks a lot. Gathering up the papers, he pushes back his chair and stands. Now, if you'll just wait here a minute, Mr. Uh, Rosebottom, I'll get these things taken care of for you right away. You're very kind. Outside in the lot, sunlight gleams from the silent rows of cars. A line of red plastic pennants flutters overhead. Seated by the doorway of the office, the old man hums a tuneless little song and watches the afternoon traffic speed obliviously past. He feels the building vibrate to the rumbling of the trucks and smells the gasoline fumes and the smoke from the exhausts. Here, on the outskirts of the city, the world lies locked in concrete, but his thoughts are far away, where tiny shafts of green push through the soil and small houses sleep in the shadow of the woods. Out there, among the farming people, the visitor will now be settled in, reading or dozing, or engaged in some half-hearted exploration of his new surroundings. Perhaps he has already had his first discouraging taste of loneliness or boredom, unwilling as he might be to admit it. Another day should bring him around, just in time for his birthday and the delivery of the book. When the moment comes, he will be ready. And as for the woman... She's all yours now, mister. Here's the ownership. Your keys are in the car. The salesman has returned. Together they start across the lot, past grill and chrome and windshields bearing scrawled white prices. On one of them the price has been erased. Well, here she is. You can drive her right out of here. He pats the polished metal of the hood. She'll give you years of service. Years? The old man blinks distractedly. No question about it. GM built these things to last. You can't go wrong buying American. The hood reverberates hollowly beneath his fist. Registration's in the glove compartment along with your warranty. Like I said, any problems, you got all the coverage you need. It's good up to one year or ten thousand miles, whichever comes first. And what if neither comes? The old man wonders. But he is barely listening. He is thinking of the farm, and of the woman who will visit it this weekend. Her position is much clearer than the man's, her motives quite transparent. Her behavior can already be predicted, and provoked. Once a few small tasks are successfully behind her, her education can begin in earnest. She will make a willing pupil but there is still another visitor to come, though nobody will think of it as one, at least not till it stands revealed. And don't forget, the salesman is saying, there's a free tank of gas waiting for you right over there at the pump. He holds open the door. 
Take it from me, mister. You got yourself a lot of car for your money. She'd make it clear around the world. The old one smiles. Oh, she won't be going quite that far. Just to New Jersey and back. Book Three The Call Twelve Calling in the Dole Only the player holding the book may call in the dole, and only at the designated time. Instructions to the Dinot July Second the heat in the little Chevy had grown oppressive, but rolling down the window meant she couldn't listen to the radio. No matter. She'd had her fill of Honda ads and reports of what a great weekend it was going to be. Silly to get your hopes up. But maybe it would be great. Carol turned her head from side to side as she let the gusts of wind from off the highway cool her scalp. Once again she found herself thanking God she'd had her hair cut short. Did men feel this cleansed, this free all the time? The Vuri's library back there in the city seemed like a prison on the other side of the world. She had lost track of the time, and with it her sense of direction. She knew only that she was extremely late. Despite her intentions of starting out at ten, she had put in too many hours last night over the week's work for Rosie, papers on a certain Ozark nursery rhyme, a fertility ritual in North Africa, and something called the Mao game, though it wasn't Chinese, but Welsh. And she'd overslept this morning despite the sunlight streaming through her blinds. Rochelle, who'd been supposed to wake her, had gone out, shopping for shoes, she'd said, returning just as Carol left, and obtaining the car from the uptown lot where Rosie kept it had taken the better part of an hour. It had been almost one by the time she'd left the city, and the last news report she'd heard had said 145. Now the radio was drowned out by the wind. On the seat beside her, the reassuring bulk of Rochelle's red canvas tote bag borrowed for the weekend bobbed up and down with the motion of the car. Inside, pressed against her nightgown and a sweatshirt she probably wouldn't need, lay the wine Rosie had brought her, a home brew, white in an unlabeled bottle and a slim little package wrapped in white paper that he'd given her for Jeremy. It was a pack of cards, he'd said, an amusing variation on the old tarot deck. Leave it to Rosie to think of everyone. Alongside them were the three books she was taking to the farm. Two were for herself, just in case she found the time. A dog-eared paperback of the bell jar, and an early Teilhard de Chardin copiously underlined by the fellow novitiate from whom she'd borrowed it long ago. The third book, The Mackin, was for Jeremy, and bore special instructions from Rosie. Now, for heaven's sake, don't just hand it to him when you get there, he had told her, old eyes twinkling. Save it for Saturday night. It's the sort of tale you've got to read at bedtime. Otherwise, it simply doesn't work. One thing about Rosie— he sure took his literature seriously. Freer sat in a deck chair on the lawn outside his building, squinting in the glimmering sunlight and heat, attempting to concentrate on his book while brushing away two small flies that kept buzzing around his head. He would have been glad to move back inside to the cool shadows of his room, but he was hoping to work up a last-minute suntan before Carol arrived. He wished that despite Deborah's good cooking, he'd made more of an effort to diet during the past week, but at least he'd forced himself to take a few minutes' jog along the road this morning, followed by a long soak in the tub, and afterward had made a real attempt to brighten up his room. There were clean sheets on the bed, a poster of René's Providence, tacked to the wall, and a vase of fresh-cut roses from the bushes beside the house. His books and papers were in order. He had even trimmed the ivy vines that surrounded his windows. The day was at its hottest now, the heat soporific, and despite the persistence of the flies, it took some effort of will simply to remain awake. He was beginning to feel slightly guilty, sitting there reading, daydreaming, drowsing, 
shifting position only to unstick his perspiring skin from the back of the chair, all in plain sight of Sar and Deborah, laboring in the nearby field to the beat of some monotonous little chant. It was clearly hard work, a lot harder than turning the pages of a novel, and a hell of a lot more boring. But he made no move to help them, nor did he retreat inside. Whatever they may think of me, he told himself, I'm paying good money for this reading time, and I'm damn well entitled to enjoy it. He was, in fact, enjoying it. The monk, the gothic he was immersed in, was proving far more lively than the others he'd read, and, as he'd been pleased to discover, unrelievedly dirty-minded, even by modern standards. He could imagine the sensation it must have caused back in the eighteenth century. But he was growing impatient and uneasy. Where was Carol? What could be keeping her? She had told him she'd be there by noon, and it was already a quarter past two. Maybe something had come up, and she'd had to bow out of the weekend. For once he wished the Poroths had a phone. It was frustrating to have to rely on the mail. He had left a forwarding address with the post office back in New York, but so far he'd received nothing except Carol's letter, addressed directly to the farm, and a few birthday cards, hollowly cheerful things congratulating him on entering his fourth decade, a doom which in fact would befall him tomorrow. He had carefully hidden the cards away in the top drawer of the bureau, deep among his notebooks and his stationery, so as not to be reminded of the day. He wondered if tomorrow's mail would bring a card from Laura or his ex-wife. He rather hoped it would not. God, could it really be tomorrow? How had it come so soon? He felt like Dr. Faustus, with his one bare hour to live. Of course, turning twenty had been even worse. It had seemed so tragic, somehow, to kiss his teenage years goodbye, with all their arrogance and special privileges, that sense of glorious future possibilities. He felt the book fall shut. His head was growing heavy. His mind was slowing down. He was dozing off again drifting back into a purple world where dreams and half-dreams mingled, heated by the sunlight that flamed against his eyelids. Carol sat nearby, stretching her arms in the warmth. With a languorous movement she rolled toward him, mashing her hips against the back of his hand, and instantly he knew that she was naked beneath her skirt. He could almost feel a wisp of hair against his fingertips. But the hair he saw now was not Carol's. It was Deborah's thick and dark as fur, and at his touch she rose and stood before him with Deborah's full hips, Deborah's full breasts. He saw her glaring down at him, saw her mouth fall open as if she were about to speak, and suddenly the place his fingers touched was wet. He awoke with a gasp. The Poroth's old charcoal cat, Rebecca, was pacing back and forth in the grass beside his chair, butting her head softly against his outstretched hand and looking up at him. As he watched, her pink tongue darted out to lick his fingertips. Backs aching from the hours spent stooped over the furrowed ground beneath the burning sky. Sar and Deborah were planting pumpkin seed between the bare rows where soon tiny corn sprouts would dot the field. Less than fifty yards away, their visitor sat nodding over his reading, "'brushing sporadically at some invisible flying insect. "'From time to time Deborah would look toward him and smile, "'but her husband only shook his head and kept his gaze upon the ground. "'Whenever the mood struck them, they would sing one of their planting songs, "'a different song this time, simpler, more in keeping with the present task. "'One for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and three to grow.' Suddenly Deborah paused in the singing and poked her husband in the ribs. Look, she said, lowering her voice and grinning. Look at him. Over by the outbuilding, Frears had dozed off again. The book lay open on his lap, the pages turning slowly backward. Sar frowned and looked away. He could usually convince himself he loved this labor. Hell fire he really did but it was harder with Frears so near and so disconcertingly idle. In truth, he would much rather have been asleep right now himself, or at least lying up in the little bedroom on the cool sheets, while Deborah in the kitchen made him something cold to drink. 
Then she would come upstairs to him with two tall glasses on a tray, the ice cubes clinking as she walked, the long dress swishing softly around her legs. He shook his head to clear it of this vision and stomped some dirt over a clump of seeds with the heel of his boot. Wouldn't be surprised if he got twenty hours of sleep a day. Deborah smiled. Now, honey, that's not fair. You know how late he stays up every night, and I've seen him up real early in the morning, doing his exercises. He didn't see me looking. Sar snorted derisively. Exercises. That's a laugh. And then he spends all morning soaking in the tub, as if he's even worked up a sweat. Let me tell you, if he really wanted to build some strength, he'd be out here helping us. Lord knows there's plenty of work to be done. Laying a line of seeds along the furrow and pressing each into the earth, he straightened up and rubbed his back. I'll give him all the muscles he wants. I'll bet he's never done a day's work in his life. Not real work like this. He noticed that his wife was making a face at him. What's so funny? he demanded. You are, she said, nudging him with her hip. You act like you've been doing this ever since you were a little boy. You forget who you're talking to. I've seen where you grew up, and the nearest you ever got to a field was that playground out behind the school. I remember you at college only a few years ago. You didn't have a callus on your hand. In fact, I remember now. That's just what I liked about you. You had the softest hands I'd ever seen. He had to laugh. She really took him out of himself, this woman. She was good for him. Lord's my witness, he said. Any hands would seem soft to you after some of the clodhoppers you took up with. I was probably the first man you ever saw who didn't have dirt all over his face and manure on his shoes. Playfully she tossed a lump of dirt at him. Will you sure do now, mister? He reached for her and would have thrown her down beneath him, as he knew she expected him to. But at that moment a small cloud drifted across the sun, and shadows darkened the field. His smile faded abruptly. He drew away his hand. There'll be a time for this later, he said. Right now we've work to do. He bent back to the rose. Responding to his mood, she pulled away. She was used to these changes in him. And not even much time for that, she said. She wiped a sleeve across her sweating forehead. If that girl of his is coming today, I've got to get back inside soon and start dinner. Sar nodded silently, busy grappling with the earth. Deborah's mention of the girl had reminded him of something that had been troubling him. He felt like a fool now for having carried on so with her. There was something more important on his mind. It really was a shame, Carol decided, that she wasn't going to sleep with Jeremy. She would have liked to, and under different circumstances she might actually have done it. Surely God would have understood, though the farmer and his wife might be shocked. She'd never pretended to be a saint, she told herself. If Rochelle could sleep with all those men, it wouldn't hurt for her to sleep with one. High time she got it over with, in fact, this maidenhood of hers. This blessed virginity was fast becoming a burden and a bore. While once it had seemed worth preserving, setting her a cut above the rest of the world, now it seemed little more than a souvenir of the convent, separating her from her friends, her own sisters, most of all from Rochelle. She was sick of being different. But now was not the time to change. After twenty-two years of holding on to something, you didn't just give it away to the first halfway acceptable man who came along especially not tonight, on what amounted to their second date, in a glorified hen-house with stern, religious, disapproving strangers all around. She hoped Jeremy didn't expect anything more, and assumed he'd had enough sense to make provisions for her to spend the night inside the farmhouse. Not that there was anything wrong with Jeremy, as soon him as anyone else. It was all very well to remind herself that, considered critically, he was not the first man she would have chosen— and that her interest in him derived in part from that most humbling of predicaments, his being, at least for now, the only game in town. Still, the choice was more than just pragmatic. 
He genuinely appealed to her. He made her smile. All this past week, he'd been much on her mind. She had found herself pausing in her homeward walk down 8th Avenue to stare expectantly at the western horizon, as if to catch a glimpse of distant marvels, in Jersey of all places. She'd also found herself inventing entire conversations with him, conversations which, however playful or earnest, invariably ended with a mutual declaration of love. I must be crazy, she told herself for the dozenth time. Was her life really so empty that she'd fall for the first halfway intelligent man who showed an interest in her? And did it really take so little? A drink, a cheap Italian meal, a walk home in the dark. Surely there was more to her life than that. Flemington, the sign said. Keep right. Moving back into the slower lane, she took a moment to count her blessings. There was her family, of course, though scattered now, and Rochelle, and the sisters she still talked to at St. Agnes's, and evenings at the ballet every week or two, and maybe an occasional fancy meal this summer with Rosie, and the endless rows of library books that stretched before her thirty hours a week. Surely that was enough for any girl, more than enough. But a contemptuous little voice inside her head whispered, Who do you think you're kidding? So be it. She spun the wheel and pressed her foot against the gas pedal. The Chevy swung onto the exit ramp and sped across the waiting world toward Gilead. Frears put down the book and checked his watch. It was almost a quarter to three. He looked to the right, squinting at the sun. Sar and Deborah were still at it, both of them bent almost double, moving through the ploughed field with the seed bags at their sides, chanting as they went. They reminded Frears of a pair of huge black insects depositing endless rows of eggs. Behind them sunlight glimmered from one of the homemade scarecrows that Sar had erected, really just aluminum foil pie plates with strings through one end, dangling like limp kites from the tops of a row of stakes, so that, at the smallest breeze, the plates would swing and flutter back and forth, banging softly against the stakes with the sound of far-off temple gongs. How strange and picturesque it all seemed. He felt as if he were in a distant country. It was easy to forget that the two of them out there were human beings, people he sat down to eat with, people like himself. He hoped Carol would arrive soon. The day seemed to be passing so quickly that, even with the sun still high, he could feel the chill of evening, the day already lost. A fly settled boldly on his cheek, and he struck at it, knocking his glasses askew. Quickly he adjusted them, hoping the Poros hadn't seen. Where in God's name was Carol? In a little while he was going to get angry, or worried, or both. He plunged despondently back into the novel, trying to lose himself again and speed her coming. Sar was thinking about the girl while he counted out the seeds, and he was troubled. He wondered if he'd done the right thing, allowing Frears to have her out this weekend. Maybe his mother was right. He had seen her at her house the previous night, where, offering some fresh eggs and a bag of early peas from Deborah's garden, he'd gone to seek his mother's advice on how best to deal with the members of the co-op, to whom his debt was about to fall due. Thirty-seven hundred dollars for the mortgage, and another thousand for repairs. He would owe them, by August, nearly five thousand dollars. But there were a few grounds for hope, including a modest family trust left by his father that might, in emergencies, be drawn upon. When he'd mentioned in passing that Jeremy Frears had a girl coming on Saturday, his mother had seemed shocked. No, more than shocked. Dismayed, almost. Like one who's learned an enemy has breached the gates. Son! she'd said at last. I wouldn't open my door to her. Now, now, he'd said. The two of them aren't going to spend a night together. I wouldn't allow such a thing on my land. He was already beginning to feel sorry he'd brought it up, and guilty about having acquiesced so easily to Deborah's argument that what Jeremy and Carol did was none of his business. Of course it was his business. 
Everything that went on under his roof or on his property was his business. The evening, so agreeable at the start, perhaps because he hadn't brought Deborah, always a source of tension, had ended in the sort of unforgiving argument, neither yielding an inch, that he hadn't had with his mother since he was a boy. Even as he'd left, she had still seemed uneasy. No, she kept saying. The woman shouldn't come. She shouldn't be here at all. Well, Sar had said at last. It's too late now. I can't stop her from coming. I can't go back on my word. At the very least I have to offer common hospitality. Don't worry yourself, mother. There'll be no sinning on my land. But she hadn't appeared comforted. And now, as he labored in his fields, Sar couldn't get the matter off his mind. Maybe, in some dark way he didn't yet understand, he had made a mistake. He wondered if he would have to pay for it. Mrs. Poroth grimaced beneath the beekeeper's veil. Gray wisps drifted past her face from the nozzle of her smoker, a teapot-shaped metal contrivance packed with smoldering rags and fanned by miniature bellows. Every few minutes she would shake her head uneasily, as if trying to clear it of some indigestible thought. Earlier, as she'd gone about her Saturday chores, pruning the hydrangea on the south side of the house, and with veil on, examining the upright wooden frames of the beehives for the day's accumulation of honey, she'd considered, half seriously, the possibility of setting up a roadblock on her lane, anything to keep away the visitor. Of course, Maybe this was just some idle girlfriend of Freer's, and not the woman whose coming she dreaded. There was no way to be sure. Still, she hated to take chances. Stationing herself by the third hive, lowest on the hill and closest to the roadside, she waited for the visitor's car to pass. If the woman turned out to be the one she feared, what should she do? Killing her, of course, would be a sin, and the Lord punished such acts even when committed for good ends, though she was half prepared to accept the sin and the eventual punishment. Besides, she reflected, killing was probably the kindest thing she could do for the poor girl. No, she couldn't do it. She would have to play by the rules. The old one would be playing by them, too. There was nothing to do for now but find out all she could. Adjusting her veil and once more directing the smoker into the hive so that the insects, reacting as if to a fire and gorging themselves on honey, would grow sluggish. She lifted the flat, unpainted lid and withdrew one of a dozen wooden frames a crawl with bees. Transferring the honey-laden frame to a storage chamber above the hive, she stood once more and prepared herself to wait for the passing of the car. If the chosen woman was in it, she would recognize her by her hair, if nothing else. It would be red. It would have to be. That, too, was a rule. Gilead at last. There was no mistaking the tidy little crossroads and the general store, obviously the co-op that Jeremy had spoken of. He had also said something Carol recalled about high walls surrounding the town. But no doubt he'd exaggerated. The only walls she'd seen were low stone ruins back at the approach road, stretching from each gatepost and winding off among the trees. She might not even have noticed them if she hadn't been told to look. But perhaps, she mused, there were walls here of a different sort. The place seemed different from other towns, neater, certainly, to judge by the well-tended lawns she'd passed coming in, and more decorous in other ways as well. Across the street from the co-op, where a red-brick schoolhouse glared through a line of trees at the grassy playing field in front, a group of little children played quietly on seesaws, neither shouting nor laughing, as subdued as children in a century-old woodcut, and all without a sign of adult supervision. Nor were there the usual small-town idlers gathered in front of the general store. Parking in front, just beyond the untended gas pumps, she climbed the steps and entered. The store appeared uncommonly well-stocked, and smelled, in the dim light inside, of spice and old apples. It was almost like entering a cave. The beams in the ceiling were heavy with merchandise, everything from sausages to snowshoes, 
from bulbous white garlics to lamp wicks, frying pans and coils of rubber hose. A tall white metal cooler hummed serenely near the back, stocked with cheeses, ordinary-looking cans of soda, and things wrapped in wax paper. Low shelves near the front displayed cellophane-packed cupcakes, barbecue chips, and beef jerky. A huge jar of pickled eggs stood beside the cash register on the counter. The woman behind the counter was talking with another woman. Both were elderly and dressed in black. While pushing through the screen door, Carol overheard references to a brother Yoram and a Lotta Sturtevant, who was apparently growing quite enormous lately. But the two women fell silent and turned to her as soon as she came in. She asked directions of the one behind the counter. I'm trying to reach the Poreth's farm, she said. Well, now, Sar and that wife of his, I believe they bought the old Baber place. The other woman nodded gravely. My Rachel was out there last Friday evening. They're the ones that planted late. Farther back in the shadows, Carol saw an alcove with another wooden counter, almost the mirror image of this one, and a wall lined with shelves and cubby holes, in some of which leaned dusty-looking white envelopes. This, then, would be the local post office. It looked little used. You want to head out along the granary road, the first woman, no doubt the postmistress, was saying. She stepped from behind the counter, and, holding open the screen door, gestured in the direction of the retreating maples and the line of distant hills. Keep going straight past Verdock's Dairy. It's just around that bend, and there you turn right and go along for half a mile or so. She launched into a lengthy, detailed account, replete with references to gullies, washed-out crossings, and lanes that dipped up and down like greased pigs, with particular attention to a mill road. Of course, there ain't no mill there nowadays. It's all fell down since I was a girl. And a fork. Don't go turning off on the little road that splits off it on the left, cause that's going to lead you to the Geisels, and Matt and Cora like visitors so much they ain't going to let you leave before supper time. Carol found herself nodding politely, eagerly, but forgetting everything as soon as it was spoken. Right past Verdock's dairy. She remembered that much. She would find the place, no fear. She thanked the two of them and left the store. And be sure to say hello to Sister Deborah. The woman called after her. Tell her we'll be looking for her at worship tomorrow. The other woman tittered. Parked in front of the store like a reminder of the world she'd left, the small cream-colored Chevy was one of the brighter objects inside. The only other vehicle she'd seen since entering the town had been dark, unornamented cars and pickup trucks, at least a decade old. Driving down the road in what seemed the suggested direction, it was at least the way she'd been heading anyway, she proceeded slowly at first studying every passing farm and homestead for signs by which she might distinguish it later, if she had to return this way. Then, as she realized that there were relatively few turnings to choose from, with more confidence. On impulse, more from the memory of something Frears had told her than from anything the woman in the store had said, she turned right when the road branched after the large dairy farm and found herself heading downhill toward a small, swiftly running stream, whose sound echoed in the fields and thickets through which she was passing. She drove for what seemed several miles along its winding banks, avoiding a narrow stone bridge. Had the woman said anything about a bridge? And coming at last to a clearing where a cluster of shanties stood huddled at the edge of the woods. The road she'd been following curved back uphill among the trees, branching just before the houses into an unsavory-looking pitted dirt road that she prayed was not the Poroth's. Three large, nondescript dogs raced up to the car and yapped fiercely at its wheels. A man in shirt-sleeves, not bearded but unshaven, and with a hillbilly's long, straggly hair, looked up from a rusting automobile he'd been scraping, his dark little eyes peering suspiciously toward her car. In the weed-choked yard, several pale, moon-faced children in T-shirts and shorts paused in their playing to watch her pass. They looked surprisingly ragged for this area almost Appalachian. 
She drove past quickly, determined not to ask for directions here, and with sinking heart followed the road back uphill, taking the first opportunity she found to double back in the direction of the stream. This time the way felt familiar. When she came again to the stone bridge, she turned left with more confidence and drove over it. The road wound steeply uphill once again, curving past a small stone cottage, a cozy-looking place set well back on a rounded hill, the yard around it overgrown with flowers. She was so busy admiring them as she drove by that she almost didn't see the tall, faceless figure looming darkly at the edge of the road. With a little cry, she swerved to avoid it, the car speeding around the bank of earth and shrubbery as if under its own volition, carrying her past. The road climbed farther, curving now in the other direction. She wasn't inclined to look back. It was only later when the house would have been concealed from sight behind the bend that she realized what she'd seen was a woman in a long black dress and the odd shroud-like mask of a beekeeper. She's going to be here soon, Deborah was saying, and I mean it, honey. The least you can do is drive to the Geisels and get us some of that rhubarb wine. I heard you the first time, said Sar. Don't worry, I'm going. He wiped the sweat from his forehead. But I don't intend taking out the truck for a task like that. Some of us still know how to walk. He cast a pointed glance to where Frears lay dozing. You've got the room all ready for her? Deborah nodded. If she's really going to use it. This had been designed to get a rise from him, and it did. She damned well better, he said, exasperated. Tisn't a whorehouse I'm running. Oh, easy, honey. It's not for us to decide. Don't forget they're not our people. She paused, musing. Wonder if she'll be pretty. It's hard to picture what Jeremy likes. I can tell you what he likes, said Sar. Have you ever seen the way he looks at you? What he does with his eyes is his business. Still smiling, she raised her fist. But let me tell you something, mister. What you do with your eyes is my business. Now get along down to the Geisels and buy that wine. She ought to be here any minute. Should have been here hours ago. Get moving. He pretended to cower before her, the sight all the more comic because of his huge size. I'm moving, he said. He loped off toward the house to get his wallet. The screen door slammed. I wonder what's keeping her, thought Deborah. Probably overslept herself. A good match for Jeremy. She looked at him. He was no longer asleep. She smiled. He smiled back. The screen door slammed again, and Sar emerged. With a wave, he disappeared down the road. The road was proving difficult to follow. It gave another twist, a living thing, hostile to the tires, digging into its dusty back, and she had to wrench the wobbly steering wheel to keep the car from going off onto the shoulder, or even crashing into the thick underbrush. The front wheel suddenly dropped into an unseen gully with a jarring clang of metal. Applying the brakes, she proceeded more slowly, fearful lest the dust and the bumps and the potholes damage Rosie's car. She pictured herself explaining how it had happened, Rosie's baby smile turning somber, and the empty way she'd feel if he dismissed her. How had she ever gotten herself into this? It was like a carny ride one couldn't get off. Grimly she continued down the road, jaw set, imagining with something close to hunger the comfort of the bed that awaited her at the farmhouse. Her eagerness to see Jeremy had long since yielded to a certain resentment. What a fool she must look, to have gone to so much trouble just for him. Better to assert herself from the start. If he thought she'd driven all this way simply for the privilege of cuddling up to him, the boy was in for a surprise. Did he take her for one of his horny little students? She would show him just how wrong he was. On the radio a man was prophesying fair weather. It seemed like magic that his voice remained so steady, so unaffected by the pounding and the bumping of the car. The time, he said, Bible time, was 4.13. God, she was late. 
and perhaps there was no one on this back road after all. Perhaps it would simply grow narrower and narrower until it finally disappeared amid the undergrowth and swamp. What if she was simply getting deeper into wilderness and would never be able to get out without abandoning the car? Everything's going to come out okay, she repeated to herself. Meanwhile, the radio was whispering the far less sanguine words of Jeremiah. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. She was almost ready to turn the car around when, up ahead, half obscured by dust and the waves of rising heat, she saw a dark figure stalking grimly toward her like a moving shadow. It circled the car warily as she slowed to a stop. She saw a gaunt, rather handsome face staring down at her, eyes wide and shy above the fringe of beard. She knew immediately who it was. Sar, she said, almost breathless with relief. At last! Mrs. Poroth put the beekeeper's mask back in the closet and sat herself morosely on the narrow bed. She was worried. She had seen the woman. It was her, the one whose coming she dreaded. She had recognized the red hair and the intense, almost ascetic face, like that of an unwitting Joan of Arc, a holy victim. Removing from the drawer in her night table a tattered yellow pile pressed flat between two sheets of cardboard, she untied the ribbon that held the sheets together and gazed down once again at the pictures. Hesitantly she reached for the one on top, a landscape drawn entirely in white upon a gray background, and turned it over. She sifted through the rest of the pile, not shuffling them, proceeding with no established order, merely allowing her mind to roam free as she scanned picture after picture. Her gaze fell immediately on the image of the book, an obscene, fat yellow volume, covers bulging, bloated almost, as if barely able to contain the mass within. The moon drawing, too, caught her eye, but the moon that would appear in the sky tonight, she knew, would be nothing like the cruel, slim crescent shape in the picture, with the star trapped between its tips. The one that shone tonight would be full. Laying aside the pictures, she closed her eyes, fell stiffly back on her bed, and tried desperately to think of a connection. The hum of insects was beginning to drive him to distraction. His ears tingled to the buzz of a mosquito. It seemed about to pierce into his brain, and yet behind it he could hear the reassuring drone of the hornets and bees, and those flies with heads like jewels. What was there in that sound? He cocked his head to listen and for a moment believed he understood. It was the hum the world made as it went about its work, serenely preoccupied, all gears meshing smoothly, the mechanism utterly dependable. Now there was another sound behind it, another motor, and in the distance a small white Chevrolet came lurching slowly up the dirt road toward the farm. Out of the corner of his eye he saw two kittens padding across the lawn to investigate, tails eagerly aloft. He got up from his chair and walked hurriedly around the side of the house to the driveway, just as Deborah was emerging from the back door. She joined him at the bottom of the steps, and by the time the little car had pulled up next to the house, he and Deborah were waiting side by side, cats gambling at their feet, as if the two of them were the farm couple and he Deborah's lawful husband. Carol had arrived at last, but more than four hours late, and he could see even through the dusty windshield that she was in a bad mood. Well, he would just have to hold her a while and make her feel better. Turning the engine off, she wiped a hand across her shining forehead and climbed silently from the car. For Deborah, now rushing forward to welcome her, she managed a smile, but it looked forced, strained, and for him, hanging back, there was no smile at all, not even a hello though he got a greeting he would not quickly forget. "'I swear I could strangle you,' she said, slamming the door shut as the kittens fled back across the lawn. "'How could you tell me this place was only an hour or so away?' 
His first reaction was simple embarrassment that she should speak to him that way in front of Deborah. Her mood also unnerved him. It was going to be that much harder now for the two of them to get romantic, which was presumably what they both wanted. Hesitantly, he reached in through the window for the tote bag on the seat. Here, I'll get this. It was heavier than he expected. He felt the awkward weight of a bottle and some bulky parcels. He was about to start for the outbuilding, but she took the bag from him. That's okay, I've got it, she said, already calming down. She turned to Deborah, who, behind her back, had been giving her a cool, appraising glance. I'd really like to go wash up. I feel like I've just run a marathon. Come on inside, then. The bathroom's just off the kitchen. Deborah led her up the back porch steps, the two of them chattering about the unseasonable heat. Seen together like that, buxom brunette and slim redhead, they looked like some Victorian allegory of darkness and light. After all those nights alone on the farm, he was glad that one of them was his. He drifted back to his room, casting his eye over it one more time before she saw it. The roses on the night table were a nice touch, he decided. Too bad the windows in the back didn't let in more light. Finally bored, he walked back up to the house. Voices came from the second floor, but not as usual from the poorest's bedroom. Dismayed, he hurried upstairs to find the two of them, just as he'd feared, in the small spare room and back, intended eventually for a child's bedroom. They were talking about the pictures that covered the walls, a series of nursery rhyme cutouts and lithographed Bible scenes chosen with the room's future occupant in mind. Deborah was holding a wrapped-up bottle. Carol's tote bag already lay upon the bed, a fresh towel beside it. Jeremy? said Carol, beaming. Do you know, this is just like the room my sister and I had when we were growing up. I swear I had some of these same pictures. Oh, really? He stood in the doorway, hoping that his face didn't betray his disappointment. I guess all that's really needed is a crib. Deborah was watching him closely. He couldn't tell if she was gloating or feeling sorry for him. Well she said. Call me if you need anything. I've got to get back downstairs now. There's something in the oven. She held up the bottle. And thanks again for the wine. Carol, he said when she was gone, you don't really intend to stay here, do you? Her eyes widened. Where else would I stay? He sighed. Already things were going wrong. Out there, beneath the sun, the world was turning serenely, yet inside here a piece of it had turned away from him. The fact of the matter is, I thought that you'd be staying out there with me. That's certainly not what I had in mind, she said, and I don't think the poorest would approve of an unmarried girl spending the night back there with you. Their opinion doesn't matter. Of course it does, Jeremy. We're guests in their home. I'm not a guest. I'm paying rent. Yes, but I'm a guest, she said firmly, and I wouldn't want to offend them. And anyway, though it probably sounds silly to you, I just don't do that sort of thing. He deserved that, he realized. There was nothing dumber than trying to argue a girl into bed, and that's exactly what he'd been trying. Now she had blown him out of the water. It's okay, he said. I understand. Maybe he could still change her mind. And look, she said. I'm sorry about that little outburst of mine back in the yard. I didn't mean to take it out on you. I guess I just got nervous driving Rosie's car. He shrugged. Didn't bother me. Honest. I'm just sorry you had such a rough trip. Glumly, he eyed the room's low ceiling the wide plank floorboards covered by a throw rug, the shallow, smoke-stained fireplace taking up most of one side. How could she actually think of staying here? It was so damned claustrophobic. Around him, shapes were thumbtacked to the pale blue papered wall. Faces grinned from the ramparts of a cardboard castle. A white-robed priest made solemn gestures before an altar fire, 
A cow danced dreamily round a startled moon. He waved his hand toward the room at large. Well, anyway, welcome to the land of Nod. It seems very comfortable. He sniffed. A little stuffy, though. Frowning, he went to the other side of the room, where a tiny dormer window looked out upon the yard. Just inside the panes, hanging by a length of string from a hook above the lintel, a hollow ruby-red witch-ball of hand-blown glass revolved slowly in the sunlight. Large as an overripe apple, it was designed to keep evil spirits at bay. Inside it lay a sprig of angelica, the herb beloved of the Holy Ghost. Across the room, from a trick of the light, a glowing disc the size and color of a rose appeared to float upon the wall above the bed. From behind him came the muffled sound of a zipper. He caught his breath and looked around, half expecting to see Carol stepping lightly out of her jeans. But she was busy rummaging through the open tote bag. A hairbrush and a pair of slacks already lay upon the bed. Inside the bag he glimpsed a fat yellow book with ornamental covers, but failed to recognize it. She reached inside for the volume, then seemed to think better of it and shoved it back among the clothes. God, he thought, she's even brought some kind of prayer book. With a sigh, he turned back to the window. Unfastening the latch, he pushed open the two sets of panes, letting in a breeze from the yard. The leaves of the apple tree whispered with it just outside the window. And the witch ball stirred lazily on its string. Past the garden, the dusty white Chevy sat dozing in the driveway. In the distance, he could see his own building, the afternoon sunlight shining fiercely on the shingles of the roof, and beyond it, the smokehouse and the old black willow that grew against the barn. She would have a pleasing view if she stayed up here tonight, a better view than he would have from down there on the lawn. And he would be alone down there. But she still might reconsider, the optimist in him decided. In fact, he felt confident that she would. Far from discouraging him, her behavior back in the yard had made him feel curiously protective. Here she was, supposedly a resourceful, corn-fed country girl, yet she'd apparently managed to get herself lost two or three times on the ride out, and had obviously had trouble navigating the final stretch of road. Whatever she liked to fancy herself, she was certainly no pathfinder. He realized that in the short week he'd been living here, he'd begun to feel at home. Come on, he said. Let me show you where I live. Their footsteps clattered through the hall and down the stairs, the floorboards echoing as they passed. Behind them in a little room, deserted now, the ball of ruby-red glass spun like a planet in the sunshine. The image it cast on the opposite wall was aglow with rosy light, its center filled with swirling bands of red. Gradually, hour after hour, the sun would settle earthward, the rosy light would travel ever higher up the wall. At last, trembling with the final rays of sunset, it would strike the lower corner of a Bible lithograph, then a line of badly painted foliage, a rock, a patch of moss, a bit of long white robe, until, like some intense supernal spotlight, it would shine directly on the center of the picture, on a bright configuration with the contours of a star, the altar fire. Inevitably, for a moment, the star and rose would merge. Afterward, the sun would settle further, the spotlight would move on, yet for that single moment beneath its rays, the fire would have flickered, glowed, and come to life. For an instant, the flames would leap higher, burning with a vastly deeper hunger, now shifting, now spreading, devouring picture, planet, all. Lazy clouds drifted above the tops of the surrounding trees. Wisps of shadow swept the grass. Freer sat slouched next to Carol on a rock by the banks of the stream, beneath the shade of one of the willows that grew along the side. To his uneasiness the two of them had once more fallen silent, and now barely stirred except to brush away an occasional fly or flip a stone or twig into the water, water so clear that it was impossible to tell the depth. Along the opposite bank, where the woods began, the pine trees shifted restlessly in the afternoon heat but the water here beside them was nearly cold enough to freeze one's fingers. Carol leaned over, trying to see her reflection, but the current was too swift. Sunlight glimmered from the water's surface, 
picking out dead leaves and bits of debris being carried downstream. In the shadows one could see other things, smooth and pale and snake-like, twisting among the rocks at the bottom. She seemed preoccupied. Frears watched her out of the corner of his eye with a yearning he couldn't quite remember feeling since the days before his marriage. He wished she were staying more than just one night. He hadn't realized till now how lonely he had been. It was something of a surprise, in fact. She looked so wonderfully right, sitting here beside him in her old plaid shirt and slim-legged jeans. Her skin so pale in the sunlight, her hair so red against the grass. And she herself hadn't been immune to the feeling. By the time the two of them had left the farmhouse, she'd seemed very happy to be here with him today. Deborah had been singing in the kitchen. Outside the air had grown cooler. Butterflies were dancing on the lawn. God, she'd said, it feels like coming home. But something had unaccountably changed her mood. Without warning, she had suddenly become less friendly, just when he'd begun to feel close to her. It had happened in his bedroom. A silence had seemed to fall between them, there among his books and papers. Somehow she had had a change of heart. He had seen it when she'd first walked through his doorway. He'd seen a vague expression of distaste come over her. Had she actually wrinkled her nose? And a certain wariness when she'd looked from bed to rear window, and window to bed, as if measuring the distance. He had tried to keep the conversation going, something he was usually adept at. But maybe in the past week he'd gotten out of practice. They'd talked about a hike they hoped to take and where to search for animal tracks, arrowheads, edible wild plants. But it had been no more than filling in the blanks. She'd seemed restless and distracted the entire time, and was soon suggesting that they go back outside. She hadn't even wanted to sit down, had flatly refused, in fact, to sit beside him on the bed. You'd have thought she was a virgin the way she'd behaved. He wondered if maybe the fault lay with the bed itself, with its presence, its very concreteness. Women, he knew, were practical at heart, quite ruthlessly calculating some of them, certainly the one he'd married. But there were always a few romantic souls who managed to forget that making love was also a matter of bed space and damp sheets and where to put the elbows. Maybe Carol was one of these, her head spinning round and round with flower-scented fantasies until... With a jolt, she stumbled against the hard physical reality of his narrow iron bed. Maybe she'd preferred to think they'd do it in the air, like angels. He'd given it one try, at least. He'd felt fat and dull and sweaty. But he'd kissed her just the same, leaning toward her as she looked at the woodcuts in a paperback grimoire, and planting a firm kiss at the side of her mouth. She'd been surprised, of course, her eyes had gone wide, and she hadn't exactly fallen into his arms, but she hadn't pulled away. But then, like a kid on his first date, he had failed to follow it up. Instead, he'd made some lame remark about the brethren and their attitude toward sex. Very Old Testament, he'd said, and the two had lapsed back into awkward conversation. The moment had been lost. Afterward, more tense now, and with more blank space to fill, They'd strolled aimlessly around the farm, Frears pointing out the various outbuildings and fields, just as Sar had done for him, and, beneath a demeanor almost as reserved, watching her reactions with the same anxious curiosity. She had not been impressed. At first the place had seemed, paradoxically, both novel and familiar, but her initial enthusiasm had apparently worn off, and she was no longer moved by the mere sight of rural landscape— Casting a critical eye at the broad, uncultivated lands beyond the stream, the old wooden outhouse rotting beneath its tangle of vines, the mass of the encroaching woods, the farm machinery rusting in the barn, the north field overgrown with weeds, she had pronounced the farm in very poor repair. She'd been right, of course, yet somehow the comment had irritated him. What did she expect? After all, this was Sar and Deborah's first year here. He realized that he'd come to feel a certain loyalty to them. How to change the mood? How to bring them closer once again? He'd wondered about it all through the remainder of their walk, and now, sitting here beside her on the sun-warmed rock while streams of shadow spread across the lawn, he still wasn't sure what to do, 
drop his pants, recite a poem, whip out some imaginary pocket knife and carve their initials on the nearest tree. A directly physical approach was out of the question. He could hardly just reach out and grab her, here among the insects and the rocks, and he'd long since run out of things to talk about. What, after all, had he been doing with himself for the last week, except sitting on his ass and taking notes? He had already tried to describe for her the Gothic excesses of the monk, but though she'd seemed interested enough, my God, she kept saying, to be so afraid of nuns. The novel's horror had quite suddenly and unexpectedly begun to pall on him. Subterranean dungeons, inquisitors, and chains all seemed rather foolish and insubstantial out here in the sunlight, with dragonflies dipping innocently above the stream and the smell of pine trees wafting from the woods on the opposite bank. And anyway, Carol was beginning to seem distracted. I hope he'll understand, she said abruptly. Sar, I mean. I should have offered him a lift. I didn't know he'd be away this long. Frears shrugged, just as happy that Carol hadn't gone off alone with Sar before reaching the farm. That would have made her even later, and... Well, he didn't like the idea of the two of them sharing anything without him. Anyway, why bring him up now? He mentioned something this morning about buying wine, Frears said. There are some people over on the next road who make it out of rhubarb and dandelions and things. The thought reminded him of dinner. He looked back to the house, just in time to see Sar himself walking up the back steps, a large jug swinging heavily from his arm. He turned back to Carol without mentioning it, but she too had been looking toward the house. She stood, brushing off her jeans. He's back, she said. They'll probably be getting dinner ready soon. I'd better head on over to the house and wash up. Frears stood and followed her slowly back across the lawn, past his own ivy-covered building. Somehow it looked quite unlovely now. Do you still want to see that field guide? he asked hopefully. The one that has the recipe for cattails? After dinner, she said, not even turning. Suddenly she laughed. Speaking of cats. Beside them, attracted by the direction of their walk, loped two of the younger cats, an orange male and a tortoiseshell female, perhaps anticipating dinner. Where are all the others? asked Carol, crouching to extend her hand toward the female. With the usual feline ambivalence, it dodged her attempt to pat it on the head, remaining just beyond arm's reach. But the orange male crept warily up, and, tail lashing, permitted her to stroke its neck. The older ones tend to go off by themselves, said Frears, watching Carol's fingers sliding through the animal's silky hair. Lucky little bastard. They spend all day creeping through the long grass like tigers on the prowl. One of them is a big silver female, you'll see her tonight, who actually roams around in the woods, just like a wild animal. Sar says she eats what she kills there. At that moment, up ahead, Deborah appeared at the back door and stepped out onto the porch, her apron white against the long black of her dress. She was carrying a large ceramic bowl. At her side, a thin, wicked-looking bread knife hung like a ceremonial sword. Crouching, she set the bowl carefully beside a smaller one at her feet. The dangling bread knife touched the floor and caught the sinking sun. Brushing back a lock of hair, she stood and waved a greeting to her guests, then tilted back her head and yelled what sounded like a single mystical demon name. Bekariah Bwada! Bekariah Bwada! From the long grass behind them, three blurred shapes a charcoal, a tiger stripe, and a silver gray, Rebecca, Azariah, and Boada, streaked across the lawn and up the back steps. And sure enough, one of them, Frears noticed, bore something small and struggling in its teeth. The city feels deserted this evening. It is the start of a three-day weekend, and even some of the poor have managed to escape. The rest sit in their doorways and curse the heat. The old one doesn't mind the heat. In fact, he is in an extremely good mood. As he waits outside the building where the women live, 
he hums a little song. The sun sinks toward the river like a dying rose. Lines of jagged shadows creep farther down the sidewalk. One by one, as the darkness descends, he flexes his pudgy little fingers. Honey, are you sure Matthew gave you your money's worth? Sar looked up from the astrological column in that day's home news, full moon tonight, and unexpected sights beneath it. Huh? Matthew Geisel, did that old man try to cheat you? That's no way to talk about, brother, because this thing's not even full, Deborah went on. See? It's five or six inches down. She pointed to the wine jug that stood upon the table. Suddenly her expression changed. She looked at him suspiciously. Hey, have you been into this? Scowling, he went back to his paper. And what if I was? It's hot out there. She sighed and shook her head. Gonna get yourself sick, you are, walking in the sun with a belly full of wine. It's a wonder you left any for the rest of us. He grunted noncommittally, already looking forward to finishing off the jug at dinner, along with the wine that Freer's skinny red-headed girlfriend had brought out. The brethren didn't hold with drunkenness, but as sins went it was a minor one. No sense getting into an argument over a few tart swigs of rhubarb wine. He looked up. Want me to rinse off those greens? he asked. Or feed the cats? She was having none of it. All that's been done, she said. Dinner'll be ready in a minute. Go see where they are. Last time I looked, they were still out there trying to make friends with Zilla and Toby. She seemed to give up on Zilla, without getting scratched, praise the Lord. And then she started in on Toby. Picked him up just like a baby. And he let her? He seemed to like it. Deborah shrugged and began methodically slicing a tomato. Probably thought she was his mother, with that hair of hers. You don't suppose that's the real color, do you? Sar smiled. He was tempted to say something about women and cats, but held his tongue. Oh, I don't know, he said. Here she is. Why don't you ask her? He was amused to find the subject dropped. While Carol, then Frears, filed into the bathroom to wash for dinner, Deborah busied herself at the stove. Suddenly she paused and turned to face him. By the way, she said, aren't you forgetting something? She nodded toward the porch. May as well get it over with before you wash up. Sar winced. It was time for the body count. He had almost forgotten. With a sigh he heaved himself from the chair. Ah, yes. T'wouldn't do to neglect the dead. Pushing through the screen door, he stood with hands on hips and watched the cats gathered round a bowl heaped with dry commercial cat food mixed with last night's table scraps. A water dish stood nearby. Moments later the two remaining kittens, charcoal Dinah and coal-black Habakkuk, came scampering up the back steps to join the other five. Wada raised her silver-gray head to glare at them as they crowded in beside her. She gave a warning hiss, but they ignored her and, purring softly, proceeded to gobble up as much food as they could in dainty but determined bites. While they ate, he went grimly about his task. It was not a pleasant one, even when blunted somewhat by the drink. Each evening around mealtime, now that summer was here, the cats had taken to bringing in dead things, corpses of animals they'd caught during the day, field mice, moles, shrews, birds, even once a slender green garter snake. It was doubtful that they saw those creatures as food, though Bwada on occasion had been known to make a meal of one, as if she weren't fat enough already. Usually they just laid the bodies out upon the kitchen steps for the poorest to see. Sar believed the offerings were meant as tribute a kind of ceremony. Tonight, thank the Lord, they had returned with relatively little plunder. He saw only two mangled field mice and, almost out of sight within the shadows by the wall, the not-quite-lifeless body of a young robin, 
one delicate brown wing still trembling. A good thing Deborah hadn't seen this, how she raged and carried on about the birds. Frowning, he stooped to pick the mice up gingerly by the tails. With his other hand, he grasped the robin by the legs and walked down the back steps to a pair of garbage cans that stood beneath the porch. His head was swimming slightly from the wine, but he knew his intoxication only brought him nearer to the essential mystery. Placing the bird on the hard ground and looking away, he crushed its skull beneath the heel of his boot. As he did so, he thought he felt a tiny soul flutter past his face and up to heaven. Wrinkling his nose, he lifted the lid from the nearer can, and was immediately sickened by the foul odor of rotting flesh that welled up from its depths. Quickly he dropped the three bodies into the can, and clamped the metal lid back on. It was a process he'd had to repeat, with little variation, nearly every night, but he still had not grown used to it. Before returning inside, he paused a moment, leaning against one of the square white posts that supported the roof, and gazing out at the farmland as it stretched away past the outbuilding and the brook to the distant line of woods. He spent a lot of time here on the porch, especially at the end of the day, staring alone and silent at the land. It was a sight that never failed to move him. Familiar as it had become, he still felt like a stranger. It was a paradox, really. During the day, at the height of the sun, while he sweated over some intractable root, or turned the soil of some outlying pasture, though the land resisted him with all its strength, he nonetheless felt himself its master. But at moments like this, at dusk, when the world was at peace and he could survey his domain in lordly comfort from the back steps of his house, it somehow seemed to him that the land wasn't really his at all, and that, with no human figure to mar the landscape, the farm reverted to what it had always been, a living thing, belonging only to itself. The waving grass and newly planted fields seemed to keep their own counsel. There was a consciousness at work in the lengthening shadows by the apple tree, outbuilding and barn. True, he had purchased all these himself only last fall. The deed, signed, dated, and notarized, lay upstairs in a desk drawer. But how foolish he'd been to think that he could actually own this land, land which had been here so long before him, and would be here so long after his body had crumbled beneath it. He was just another visitor, though thankful even for that. Enough that he'd been given tonight's scent of roses and marsh water and pine, the faint evening breeze that even now brushed his face, and the darkness stealing leaf by leaf over the great trees. Suddenly, disturbingly, another scent was mingled with the roses, the scent of decay seeping up from the garbage cans, a reminder of what lay waiting for everything that walked or crept upon the earth. Turning away, he hurried back into the house. When he emerged from the bathroom after washing and rewashing his hands, faintly troubled, as he was every night by the inevitable thoughts of Pilate, the odor of death seemed to linger in his nostrils, gradually mingling with the smell of roasting meat that filled the kitchen. Deborah was still at the stove, stirring one large black pot while keeping watch on a smaller one. The others were already seated, Frears, as usual, toying with his napkin ring. The wine had been opened, the four glasses filled. It looked tawny and sweet. Sar wished there were more. "'It's lovely the way you fix this place up,' Carol was saying. She ran her hand appreciatively along the smooth, age-stained wood of the little dining table, set with four straw placemats. It was the same table that, a week before, had borne the star of cotton bread. This kitchen's around ten times the size of the one in my apartment, and I'll bet it's twenty degrees cooler in here. Bending over the stove, Deborah called back. There's a certain person I know who believes the city's hotter because it's so much closer to you-know-where. Sar forced a smile, but he felt a flicker of annoyance. Oh, I wouldn't put it like that exactly, he said, crossing the kitchen but Lord knows there's precious little comfort there. He pulled back his chair and sat down heavily. It's a matter of science, I suppose. Something to do with the pavement and the brick. Hardly the sort of place I'd care to live. 
There. The gauntlet was thrown. No use blaming it on the wine. He hadn't meant to speak out that way, but it was too late to take it back. He suspected he was going to have an argument on his hands, because Frears had stopped toying with the wooden ring. Sure, said Frears. It is a bit hotter in the city, but that's why God gave us air conditioners. Sar heard the laughter of the two women, and his smile vanished. He had always been uncomfortable with jokes, especially jokes about the Lord. He began to frame a reply, but paused, for Deborah had come from the stove carrying a large steaming bowl of barley soup. Placing it on a hand-painted tile in the center of the table, she seated herself and clasped her hands piously before her. It was time to say grace. He took a breath. Dear Lord, he said with sudden vehemence, clasping his own hands and dropping his gaze. As we, thy servants, prepare to enjoy the richness of thy bounty, we give thanks for the two good people who have come to share it with us. He glanced up to see their reaction. Frears, as usual, was merely inclining his head, staring pensively at the soup bowl, as if to prove that, while polite, he was not about to buy any of the Poroth's beliefs. But Sire was pleased to see that Carol's fingers were locked in fervent prayer, her eyes shut tight, her expression rapt. She looked almost angelic. And thanks to thee, O Lord, as the source of all well-being and content. Amen, they murmured, even Frears. Perhaps he was going along for Carol's sake. Carol. She was an odd one for Frears to bring out here. He wouldn't have thought she was his type. Not that she wasn't attractive, she was. And Sar was honest enough with himself to acknowledge the feeling she'd inspired in him ever since he'd met her out there on the road this afternoon. It was good to have her so close now. He suddenly realized that it had been years since he'd sat down to dinner with an unmarried woman from outside his family, especially one with Carol's strange mixture of independence and submissiveness, her soft, uncallous skin, her clean-looking red hair cut so curiously short, so unlike the women's here in Gilead. He couldn't help picturing her climbing into his bed, so thin and pale and trembling, and he knew that tonight, as he made love to his wife, his thoughts would stray unbidden to this new woman, at least until he forced himself to think of holier things. Deborah was speaking, lightening the mood, drawing the visitors in while she poured the rhubarb wine and served them their soup. She was so much better at that than he was. I wouldn't trade the country with anyone, she was saying. But there are times I miss the city something awful. If I hadn't gotten myself married, I probably would have tried to live there for a few years. I still think about going back some day, just for a visit. Frears made a mock bow. Just remember, he said. Whenever you're in town, you'll always have a place to stay. Not exactly the Waldorf, maybe, but comfy enough. He raised his glass. To travel, and the broadening effects thereof. The others raised theirs. To country virtues, said Carol, smiling, and to those of us who still remember them. Deborah giggled. And to city vices. She took a sip of the wine. Mmm, good. Sar watched uneasily, wondering if Frears and Deborah were flirting with one another. Unable to think of another toast, he brought the wine-glass to his lips and took a large swallow, almost without tasting it. The lines, he realized, were shifting, setting him and the new woman against his wife and guest. He alone remained consistent. The thought made him feel stronger and at last encouraged him to speak. Deborah, he said, choosing his words carefully. I know you've got a longing for the city. I've heard you talk of it before. And it's just as I told you when I made you my wife. You are free to do as you please. I'll not stand in your way. He took another drink and wiped his mouth. As for me, though, I'll never set foot in that citadel of godlessness again. 
It's a place of corruption, and its people are swollen with envy and greed. Even the very best of them are infected. I hear it in their voices. The obsession with luxury, money, and the things of the world. He looked from face to face. He could see that they knew he was serious. Frears, though, was eyeing him skeptically. No doubt he resented not being the center of attention. How like a school teacher! And would take any word spoken against the city as a personal attack. Probably he would try to assert himself in the eyes of the women. Yet to do so would only be natural. It was God's way that men must compete. Sar understood and forgave. That's why I'm so glad the two of you are with us here tonight. He went on, nodding to Carol and Frears. Lord's my witness, I truly believe you'll both be the better for this. At least you're out of danger, at least for now. Danger? said Frears. You mean like street crime? Sar shook his head. It isn't criminals I mean, nor dirt and noise. I mean a danger to the spirit. I see the city as the prophets did, a place to rival Babylon. Everyone is buying and selling, and everything's for sale. Even their own souls have a price. Frears smiled. I'm not so sure about that he said. I've tried to buy a few lately, and no one's selling. In my film class I asked someone, but Sar wasn't waiting for his explanation. Perhaps you should have offered more, he said. Remember, you're competing with the devil, and he's got the city in his pocket. He was still feeling, he realized, rather light-headed. Too many hours in the sun. It would be good to get some food in him. Mind you, he added almost apologetically. I didn't always think so. When I was growing up here, I used to dream about running off to see the Empire State Building, and at night I'd pretend that I could see it brightening the sky. I used to think that, if light was good and darkness evil, then God must love the city's best. I knew he'd made man, and man had made the city, so I thought that was where he must live. He paused, suddenly remembering. I don't think so any more. I gather you had a less than delightful visit, Frears said lightly, with a look toward Carol. What happened? You get mugged? No, not that. I may have been a bit too big for that even then. I've heard they prefer old ladies. They'll take whoever they can get. How old did you say you were? Sar rubbed his chin. It was Christmas of your senior year in school, said Deborah. That's what you told me. Sar nodded. That's right. I'd just turned seventeen. My father died that fall. God rest his soul. My father died then, too, said Carol. I mean in the fall. It'll be a year this November. Really? He regarded her with new interest. Then that's another thing we have in common. Frears looked up, quick to catch a hint of conspiracy. You mean, aside from your both being country people? No. I meant aside from our both being religious. We talked about it when I met her on the road. I had a Bible program on the radio, that's all, said Carol. She sounded irritated, but it was hard to tell at whom. As for our respective fathers, we've both experienced loss, said Sar. He was about to add a biblical observation on the ephemerality of man, but Deborah cut him off. I'll bet her mother took it a whole lot harder than... Sar silenced her with a look. My mother bore her loss with dignity, he said, with another glance at Deborah. She's always kept pretty much to herself and doesn't let on how she's feeling. But I knew what was in her heart. I knew that the feeling was there, and I thought, if only there was something I could give her, something that would interest her, it'd pull her away from, well, all the things that were on her mind. 
So one Saturday morning I put on my father's old sheepskin coat. Deborah nodded grimly. Like a lamb to the slaughter. And I hitched a ride to Flemington and climbed aboard the bus to New York. I thought I'd bring her back some sort of gift. A jewel, maybe. Something precious. He shook his head. It was a long time ago. And your mother, said Carol. She didn't mind your going? He looked pained. I told her I'd be in Flemington till after dark, trying to find a part-time job. It was probably the first time I ever lied to her. Not that she was fooled. Nothing fools her, said Deborah. She knows everything. But she never seemed to care too much where I went, said Sar. So I yielded to temptation and set off. He sat back, pulling himself almost physically from the memory. At the same moment he became aware of a scratching at the door, where four owlish little faces were peering through the screen. It was the younger cats. He still tended to think of them as the kittens. As he rose to let them in, he saw Carol turn and look questioningly at Frears, who shrugged in acknowledgment. It's okay, Frears said. They're in here almost every night. I think I may be getting used to them. As always, no sooner was the door opened for them than the cats seemed to grow undecided about whether to enter, even though Sar stood waiting by the doorway. Boada pushed impatiently from behind them and bounded beneath the table, but the others hung back as if making up their minds, and when at last the four slipped past his feet into the kitchen, it was with a kind of wary indifference. Their parents, Rebecca and Azariah, remained outside, pacing like tigers back and forth along the steps, and soon disappeared into the long grass at the edge of the yard. Sar returned to the table to see Deborah ladling out more soup, and the cats grouped like disciples at her feet. Frears looked up from his bowl as Sar resumed his seat. So there you were, he said, speeding toward Gotham and God knows what iniquity. Then what? Sar smiled uncertainly. Well, he said, it's a long story. No doubt, said Frears. Carol added, You can't just leave us on the bus, you know. I'm afraid that Deborah's heard it all before. And more than once, said Deborah. Still you'd best tell them, honey, now that you've a proper audience. He had meant, as the host, to hold his tongue, the way he usually did, but somehow this whole meal had started wrong. Perhaps it was the wine. Well, he took another swallow. All right, then. Perhaps you'll even learn from my mistakes. I remember I reached the city a little after noon. The first thing I did was just stand there in the bus station and look at all the people. I'd never seen so many in one place, nor yet so many shades of skin. T'was like looking into an ant hill, only this one was going on all around me and I was in the middle. I was bigger than most everybody else and I know there's always someone up there watching. He pointed toward the ceiling. So I'm not the kind to feel scared. But if I was, that's the time I would have felt it. It's hard to believe you'd never been to New York before, said Frears, as if already regretting he'd given up the floor. Let's face it, you're only a little over an hour away. He glanced guiltily at Carol. Okay, maybe two hours if the traffic's bad. The brethren don't see it like that, said Sar. Just because a place is an hour or two away doesn't mean they'll want to pay it a visit. I'd say half the folks in this town have never been to New York. Beside him, Deborah nodded. They read about it in the home news. The ones who aren't afraid to read a newspaper, she added. Some of them around here think it's a sin to read anything but the Bible. And some don't, said Sar firmly. A few of them see it on the TV, if they have one, or even at the drive-in up in Lebanon. They know all about New York. 
The point is, they just plain don't want to go. My mother's never been there and never will. But I was curious, and I don't scare easy. So there I was, in the middle of the ant hill, plowing my way toward the street. The first thing I saw when I got outside was this little fellow in a red get-up, standing there on the sidewalk and ringing a dinner bell. He had a beard as white as old brother Mog's, and twice as long. But I could see it was just lamb's wool. I knew who he was supposed to be, of course. You can't walk a mile out of Gilly at that time of year without seeing an electrified Santa Claus on some fool's lawn. But I sure wasn't expecting to see a grown man dressed up that way in public. I stood and watched him for a while. It turned out he was collecting for some sort of charity, and I figured I'd best give him something. I had the money with me I'd saved up from working in my father's store. Looking back now, it doesn't seem like much, less than forty dollars. But it was all I had. I reached down in my pocket to dig it out, and that's when I found out it was gone. I can still remember how I felt. It was like somebody'd pole-axed me. It near made me dizzy. I went stumbling back into the bus station, searching every stranger's face, trying to find out which one could have done this to me. As if I'd know just by looking in his eyes. And I'll tell you something. Everyone I passed looked like he could have done it. Maybe it was just the way I was feeling, but I swear there wasn't an honest face amongst them. The room had grown silent but for the purring of the plump gray cat as it pressed itself against the foot of his chair. He realized with a flush of embarrassment that the others had long ago finished their soup and were waiting for him to do the same. Here, he said, pushing the bowl roughly toward his wife. Take it, I've had my fill. As she collected the bowls, he frowned and turned away, reaching down to stroke the gray cat's head. Carol was watching him expectantly. How awful, she said at last, to lose all your money like that, and it always happens to the ones who need it most. I assume you took the first bus back to Flemington, said Frears. There was a shade less sympathy in his voice. Back at the oven, Deborah laughed. Then you don't know Sar. She swung back the oven door and reached inside with the potholder. Something bubbled and hissed, and the smell of roasting meat grew stronger. He's a stubborn one, he is. He's not one to give up without a fight. Sar smiled. I'm stubborn, all right, and also a damned fool. I could have come home, because I still had my return ticket right there in the pocket of my shirt. But that would have been too easy. I was out for justice. Maybe God had meant it for a sign, but I thought he was giving me a test. So what I did was, I went back out to the sidewalk and just stood there goggle-eyed a while, staring at the crowd. I had this crazy notion that maybe I'd see some other fool's pocket getting picked. I didn't, of course. No thief's that stupid. But I did get some advice. I felt a kind of tugging at my coat sleeve, and when I looked down, there was old Santa Claus peering up at me. His face was covered by the beard, but I could see his eyes, and they were sad. I saw them take your money, he said. His voice was real soft, like an old flute. It was two black boys with coats like yours. They ran up there. He was pointing north, past a row of bars and pawn shops and movie house marquees. Way off in the distance, I could see a line of trees, as if that was where the city came to an end. I thanked him, and he wished me luck, and I headed up the street. Sar paused as his wife returned to the table with a platter topped by a sizzling brown leg of lamb. It was followed by potatoes, his Aunt Lisa's homemade mint jelly, and Deborah's own garden-grown beans. He saw Carol eye the meat dubiously, and assumed she must be worrying about how much it had cost them. Well, it hadn't been cheap, especially for a man already in debt, but there were certain obligations to a guest that couldn't be evaded. Sure wish I'd had a meal like this when I started on my walk, he said, sliding the platter toward him. 
He took the carving knife Deborah handed him and sliced off a thick slab of meat. Unfortunately, I'd nothing but a few cents change tied up in a handkerchief, just enough to buy myself a bar of chocolate. He speared the meat and turned to Carol. Here, pass me your plate. She shook her head. Thanks, but no, I don't eat meat. He felt a spark of irritation. So that's why she's so skinny. Deborah looked upset. Why didn't you say anything, Carol? I could have made something else tonight. It's really okay, said Carol. She seemed embarrassed. There was no need to go to any trouble. I've been a vegetarian since college, and I'll manage perfectly well on what you've got right here. But, Jeremy, why didn't you say anything? Freer shrugged. I didn't know. We've only had spaghetti together. Carol, you never even told me. I'm sorry, she said. I guess I never got the chance. Honestly, it's no big deal. I'm happy with the beans and potatoes. Well, Deborah fretted. As long as that's enough. It will be, said Carol. Perth could see that she wished the subject had never come up. Now poor Sar here. All he had to eat was a bit of chocolate. Well, that wasn't till later, he said, grateful she'd remembered. At the time, all I wanted was to find my money. Carefully he served the others, then himself. I suppose it was foolish of me to try. Naive, at any rate, said Frears. How do you think you'd recognize the thief? There are a lot of sheepskin coats in New York. I expected the Lord would give me a sign. He's never failed me, you know. Frears looked skeptical. Really? Another sign? Sar nodded. He doesn't fail, believers. And with that knowledge in my heart, I kept on walking north. It was a sour, cold day, I remember, with gray skies and a wind up, but there was no snow on the ground. It must have been a good deal hotter down below, because clouds of steam kept arising from holes in the pavement, and everyone in town seemed to be out of doors, rushing from one shop to the next, studying the goods behind the windows. Most of the goods looked awfully shoddy, with nothing special to them but their prices. I can't for the life of me see how anybody could afford them. Even if I'd had my money, it wouldn't have gotten me much and yet every one I saw seemed to have a package or two under his arm. Not a person was smiling. There wasn't a happy soul amongst them. But they sure must have wanted the things in those windows, like pigs fighting over a pile of garbage. I guess that's how they celebrate Christmas over there. It's a wonder they don't hate it. A lot of them do, said Frears. The rate of crime and suicide goes up that time of year but it sounds like you're saying it's just what the people deserve. Sar saw Carol's look of annoyance, but Frears went blithely on. You think they're all wicked, don't you? No, I don't, said Sar. I think a lot of them are wicked, but a lot of others are nothing more than victims, and it's up to us to punish the first and save the second. Sometimes I'll grant it can be hard to tell the difference, but still I don't condemn them all. Not even the women who tried to stop me on the street, the ones who called out to me as I passed. I didn't understand then what it was they wanted, but I had a sense of it. I saw as how they weren't dressed for the cold, so I made no answer and walked on. He had added that for Deborah's sake. He couldn't let her get the wrong impression. I know about them now, of course. They said they wanted love, but they really wanted money. "'Twas all right there in the Bible, though I never thought I'd see it for myself. "'Some of them were wicked, all right, an abomination unto the Lord. "'But some, I'm sure, were just the victims of the city.' "'Deborah eyed him with amusement. "'Come on, honey,' she said. "'Tell them what you did.' "'I am,' said Sar. "'What I'm saying is—' There were all kinds of temptations in that city. Places I could have entered, 
things I might have done, but I passed them by. Frears grinned. You were broke. No, sir, Sar said gruffly. I was strong. The Lord was with me. I passed the tempters by and kept on walking. I walked until I came to the line of trees I'd seen from down the street. They began just past a low stone wall. It was a bit of greenery at last, the edge of Central Park. I'd heard about it. A dangerous place, that's what I'd been told. But when I looked over the wall, I could see there were people all through it that day, out for a stroll, eating roasted chestnuts or just sitting on the benches with their hands stuffed in their pockets. The street ran right alongside it. But I followed my instincts and walked on up the path toward where the woods looked deepest. I suppose I thought God was going to lead me to the thieves who stole my money. But he had other plans for me. A breeze lifted the flowered muslin curtains in the window by the sink. Night was coming on. The sporadic clatter of their knives and forks now rose above the faint rhythm of crickets. At first the park was real ugly, he went on. Everywhere you walked you could hear the sound of traffic, automobile horns, people yelling at each other, and everywhere you stood you could see buildings in the background, just behind the trees. Maybe this time of year it would have been different, with leaves to cover up the view, but when I saw it the branches were bare. Besides, the place just didn't seem real, not to me anyway. It was supposed to look like you were in a forest. I could see how they were hoping to fool you with the rocks and the brooks and that winding little path going up and down over the hills, yet wherever you looked there was garbage on the ground, and the trees were black with soot. But as I kept on heading north, the place began to draw me in somehow. It was so huge for a city park. It just went on and on. It's supposed to be twice the size of Monaco, in fact. Oh, Jeremy, hush! And I began to lose the sense of being in a city. I could still see buildings far away, behind me and on either side, but the place seemed quieter now. I could actually hear the wind in the branches, and there weren't many people any more just a few strange, lonely-looking old men out for a winter's walk. All of a sudden the trees thinned out. I hadn't been expecting that, and I came to the edge of a great, flat meadow. Most of the grass there was dead, with bare patches showing through everywhere. Underneath that dark gray sky it all looked very sad. There were two or three figures in the distance kicking a ball around, but I wasn't interested in them so I moved off to one side, still keeping to the trees. After a while, they began getting thicker again, and the ground got hilly. One minute I was walking over a little stone bridge, the next I was moving through a tunnel. On the other side I couldn't see the meadow any more. I couldn't even see the buildings. I was inside a tight little ring of trees, a perfect circle the limbs actually touching one another, like children playing ring around the rosy. And I was in the middle all alone, with not a sound or a sight to distract me. Why, I could have been in the center of a forest, the deepest forest on the face of this planet, with no one there to see me but the Lord. I knew at once it was a holy place, God's own preserve in the very heart of wickedness. And I don't mind telling you. He gripped the edge of the table and leaned forward, talking especially to this new woman who had come among them, who seemed to have some of the Holy Spirit in her. I don't mind telling you that in that lonely place, myself a stranger of just seventeen years, I got down on my knees and said a prayer. I said, Father, make me a vessel of thy cleansing light and deliver me from evil, and if thou pointest the way I shall follow. That's what I said, and I started to get to my feet. And just then, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I caught a flash of movement somewhere outside the circle. By the time I turned I'd missed it, but then there it was again, only far off to the side now, like a pair of dark shapes flitting past the trees. It was only a glimpse, mind you, and then they'd moved away out of sight. But I was sure somehow that God had led me to the black boys I was after, the ones with coats like mine. 
I was wrong, though. I must have been, because when I ran across the circle and into the woods there was no one around. And the woods were so thick thereabouts, what with creepers and pucker brush and all, that I didn't see how two people could have run through that way anyhow, one right beside the other, and I thought that what I must have seen was one man running with his shadow, or the shadow of a bird. Frears looked as if he were about to ask a question, but Deborah spoke up first. Honey, you're going to have them thinking you were drunk? She lowered her eyes. Of course, I know you'd never touch a drop. He grinned briefly. I'll not claim that, but I'll grant I was feeling pretty light-headed by that time. Remember, I'd had naught to eat since morning, and had a long ways still to walk. You mean back to the bus? said Carol. No. I kept on heading north, at least until I got out of the park. When that was behind me, I took to the cross streets and started working my way up in a kind of zigzag fashion, wandering from one side of the island to the other. I actually believed I could cover every block. The streets up there were even dirtier, and there didn't seem to be as many people as before. There were the same holes in the ground, though, and the same steam coming out, as if the whole town had been built on top of a volcano. My own breath was steaming, too, like a dragon's, and when I walked through a steam cloud I couldn't tell which part came from underground and which came from me. I was hungry and tired by then, and little by little I could feel the day get colder as the sun began going down, even though there were still a few hours left of afternoon. Most of the faces around me were black or foreign-looking now, and by the time evening came I felt like I'd wandered into a completely different country. But I put myself in the hands of the Lord and kept right on walking. The farther I walked, the more black faces I saw. Everybody'd watch me as I passed, at times just with curiosity, at times with something more. I saw a few people smile, like they knew some joke against me, and a lot of others glared at me with hatred in their eyes. At one point a group of kids tried to stop me from going up their road. They formed a line across the sidewalk and told me that if I wanted to get past, I'd have to give them all my money, just like the kings of Jerusalem asking pilgrims for a toll. But like I said, I'm not a one to get scared off. There were a lot of them, but I was bigger, and I knew the Lord was with me. I turned out the pockets of my pants to show them I had nothing and just kept on walking, no one tried to stop me, and I never looked back. My pockets stayed turned out for the rest of the night. For the rest of the... Frears stared with disbelief. What did you do, spend the night in Harlem? Sar shrugged. Can't say. I just kept moving, that's all. And I wasn't much aware of the passage of time. I even forgot to worry about what my mother'd think. I just knew that the night was coming early. I didn't have my money, and everything around me was godless and ugly and mean. The houses, well, they were a horror. They looked as if they'd been deserted for years, like the ruins down the road from here. Only there were lights coming on in some of the windows, and the shops were foul and dingy, though their prices were just as high as all the rest. Even the churches made me wonder. They looked so much like shops, with doorways along the sidewalk and billboards in front. There was one place. The Church of the Dog. He shuddered. And the people I saw. If only I could forget. The ones in the alleys, or sitting on the curb, or lying in the street asleep with bottles by their heads. It was almost night now, freezing cold, and they should have been indoors. So should I, though I didn't pay much heed to it till the sky turned really dark. I managed to find a few faint stars up there, but not a great many. Nothing like out here. And then the street lights all came on up and down the blocks without a sound. They made everything seem even darker, and the stars were blotted out. That's the time I felt the loneliest, I think. I found myself looking into every window I passed and wishing I could join the folks inside, black as they were. 
It seemed so warm and light in there, especially from out on the street with the homeless ones and half-starved dogs and frozen-looking cats. Idly he glanced down at Wada, who was curled beside his chair, preoccupied with licking one fat gray forepaw, toes spread and gleaming nails extended. In the sudden silence she paused a moment and looked up, then turned her attention back to the paw. You'd think she was just a sweet-tempered old lady, said Deborah, but it's all play-acting. I saw the way she tore open Yoram's hand. "'Twas nothing," Sar said quickly, noticing Carol's look of uneasiness. "'She meant no harm, nor Brother Yoram either. "'A misunderstanding, that's all it was. "'A clash of spirits.' "'Still, the city was momentarily forgotten, "'and the deep-rooted old affection he'd been feeling. "'Almost a reflex now. "'Whenever he thought of the cat, "'was pierced by the memory of that bellow of pain,' the small gray shadow fleeing toward the woods, his own stammered apologies and the other man's furious, accusing glare as he yanked back his hand and watched the upturned palm fill quietly with blood. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How right Jeremiah had been! How eternally mysterious the world was, and all the beings in it, he realized with a start that Carol was asking him something about the city, and that his head had begun to throb uncomfortably. The drink was wearing off. There's not much more to tell, he said. Not that much I actually remember. I recall a fight outside a bar room, with one man spitting teeth, and some children throwing dice against a playground wall but what sticks out more is the line of police cars I saw parked along one lonely street, with the lights out and the motors running, and the men in their uniforms sitting together inside, talking and laughing as if they were waiting for something. After I was past them, I stopped to look back, and I saw one of them come out of a building and another going in. And farther up the block, a boy about my own age sitting on his stoop made an angry face at me. I guess he supposed I was one of the police, and asked me if I'd gone and had myself a piece. That's just the way he put it. He pointed to the building I'd passed and said there was a fourteen-year-old girl in there living in the basement. Her mother'd run off to Puerto Rico. And this afternoon they'd put her father in jail. And now the girl was all alone and the police were taking turns with her. He fell silent for a moment surprised by the vividness of his own memory, and wondering what impression it had made on Carol. Somewhere inside him, where his thoughts were darkest, he felt the first unwelcome stirrings of a reawakened lust, but fought them down. Carol had stopped eating and was frowning in his direction. "'I can't believe a thing like that could happen around Christmas time. It's just too sick. Where were all the decent people hiding?' They must have been inside, he said. I only saw the ones left out in the cold, and everyone was crazy and no one seemed to care. Everyone was talking to himself, or singing like a drunk, or making odd gestures in the air, or shouting his lungs out at things I couldn't see. I remember a huge black man, big as a bear, who stumbled past me carrying on a conversation with himself in two different voices— and then behind him came this skinny old white man, the only one I saw up there, tagging after him like someone in a clown's parade, laughing and pointing and making the madman sign, as if to tell the world, See, this man is crazy. Sar twirled his finger beside his head. I think the second man was as far gone as the first. And everything was ugly, and everything was crazy and corrupt. I kept telling myself that the whole city wasn't like this, couldn't be like this. But it's still the only part I really remember. I hadn't eaten all day, nothing but a little bitty candy bar. And I was high, dizzy almost, by the time I reached the river at the top of the island. There was another stretch of woods up there and a field for sports. It was as far north as I could go. So I turned around and started walking back, 
I could never do a thing like that today. All those miles on an empty belly, without a thought of sleep. But I was younger then, and inclined to extremes. He looked past the others, past the sink and the curtains and the window screens, into the remembered darkness. The night I'd picked was very long, the longest of the year, and I began to wonder if I'd ever see another morning. Whenever I came to a cloud of steam, I'd walk right through the center, hoping it would warm me up a little, but by this time my teeth were chattering so hard I thought they'd break like china, and the wind seemed to go right through my coat and gloves. I felt like I'd been walking forever past those eyes looking out at me from windows and doorways and alleys, those sad, dark faces saying things to no one in particular. Finally, though, the sky began to brighten some. And when I was two or three miles to the south, I realized that the streetlights had gone off. Things somehow looked a little better then, and for the first time I wondered if maybe I'd been too hard on everyone, too quick to judge. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Deborah give an almost imperceptible nod. I told myself that if the people I'd been among seemed godless, t'was only because they'd never been taught the truth, and that just because a few of them acted crazy. It didn't mean they all were. And just then, as if to prove it, the steam parted and I saw a really distinguished-looking coffee-colored man walking toward me up the block. He was getting kind of old, I could see, but he stood erect and tall, and he had on a long gray winter dress coat, with a scarf tucked in at the neck, and a fancy creased hat, and he was swinging a long black umbrella with a shiny wooden handle. The sun was just beginning to come up, and I finally remembered the day. T'was Sunday morning. And I said to myself, See, here's a good sort of man, probably on his way to church. There are still a few decent people left in this city. And then, as he got closer, I saw that he wasn't looking at me. His eyes were glassy and fixed on something just in front of him, and he was snarling to himself, words I wouldn't repeat even in anger. I knew right then exactly where I was, and where I'd been all night. I knew that the Almighty had vouchsafed me a vision. Those frozen streets, the sky without stars, the ground steaming under my feet. There are spots in the world where the hell fire peeps through and i just had a tour of one. It was meant as a warning, of course. I put aside all thoughts of my money, made sure to keep the river on my right, and kept on moving south. Well, even the longest nights got to end eventually. That's one thing I've learned. And by the time the sun was up above the buildings and the day had gotten warmer, I was halfway back to the bus station. I figured I was in the normal world again, I thought I'd put all that wickedness behind me, and so when I passed an open area with statues and iron gates and big Greek-looking buildings, Jeremy's old university, it turns out, I decided it was finally time to sit down a while and maybe put my feet up. I'd seen the river gleaming at the end of the cross streets, with a thin green park beside it sloping down toward the water, and there seemed to be plenty of benches I could rest on before heading back. By that time my wandering was beginning to catch up with me. The rest was what I craved. There were a surprising lot of old folks in the park that Sunday morning, walking dogs or just watching the river, and they all looked nice and peaceable and happy with the world. I knew I was among my own kind now. God's my witness, it was really a relief. A few of the benches were already pretty well filled, but way up ahead, past the others, I saw one that was empty except for a little old man sitting by himself, all bundled up in an overcoat and muffler, with just his little pink head peeking out like a baby's, and fuzzy white hair on the top. He had a brown paper bag on his lap, and I figured he was fixing to have lunch. But when I sat myself down at the opposite end, he pulled up the bag and stood, as if he hadn't wanted company. Well, that was all right with me. I was suddenly so tired I could hardly keep my eyes open. I remember, though, how he stopped to look down at me as he walked past, and how his whole face lit up when he smiled. Reminded me of my grandfather.
or maybe even my father in one of his better moods, like just after worship. I think I may have dropped off then, at least for a second or two, because when I opened my eyes he was still standing there, looking sort of concerned. But when he saw I was okay he just nodded and gave a sort of wink. Then he stuffed the bag into a trash can and strolled away, humming some peculiar little song. I hate this part, Deborah said abruptly. She got up and went to the stove for the last of the vegetables. He ignored her. I can still see that wink, and the careless, almost contemptuous way he stuffed that bag in among the garbage. Afterward I must have gone right back to sleep, because I don't remember anything else. I recall I had a dream about a man with snow-white wings. I thought it was my father come back as an angel. I don't know exactly how long I slept, but it must have been for some time, because when I woke up I was shivering. My hands were clenched like fists inside my pockets, and the day had gotten darker. I thought it was a child's cry that woke me, but there weren't any children in the park, and not many adults left either. It was late afternoon. I shook myself awake and hurried from the bench. Lord, how my body ached! Just after I passed the trash can, I heard a tiny little cry. So faint it sounded miles away. But something made me stop. I looked around, and sure enough, it was coming from the bag. Well, Deborah knows the rest. Inside there were the remains of a sandwich, wax paper with some icy crusts of bread, a bit of meat, and six or seven newborn kittens, dead, frozen, I believe, though a couple looked broken-like. Honey, please. He nodded, the vision fading. I'm sorry, Deb, you're right. I'm acting like a fool. Enough to say it was a sight not fit for Christian eyes. But then I noticed a bit of movement, and I reached down and found that one of the bodies, a little gray thing underneath the others, still had a tiny breath of life left in it. I picked it up. It was so small I could hold it in one hand, and very softly it began crying. Crying. The sound of it came back to him, and the chill from off the river. He could feel once more the stiffness of his limbs, the pain of the wind against his numbing fingers, the exhaustion of that journey. Suddenly he felt very tired. The shops there were still open, he said at last. That's just about the only thing we have in common. The people of the city and the brethren. We are none of us too proud to work on the Lord's Day. But the shopkeepers in that hellish place had hearts like flint, and nary a one would give me a penny's worth of milk. Not that I could have paid for even that. So I asked God for forgiveness and took the milk anyhow, a carton from a supermarket shelf. I saw to it that the creature got nourishment, warm from my own mouth. No one was looking, or if anybody was, no one seemed to care, except for me. I cared. And I cried. God help me, that's the only time in my life I've ever stolen anything. That Sunday in that city of yours. Ten years it's been, and then some, and I've yet to set foot there again. They say the Lord works in mysterious ways. I'd hoped to bring a jewel home, and now somehow I'd found one the last innocent thing left amidst all that corruption. I kept her inside my shirt, pressed up against me, all the way back to the bus station and all the way to Flemington. She was almost dead by the time I got her home, but I knew my mother would nurse her back to health. Carol lay down her fork. And did she? Sar's mother can do anything, said Deborah, returning to the table with the salad. She has the healing gift. I won't deny it, said Sar. She can make things live and grow when she's a mind to. So the story has a happy ending after all. There was relief in Carol's voice. And the kitten? Haven't you guessed? Sar bent forward and lifted Wada onto his lap. Squatting there uncertainly with her ears bent back, 
claws digging into his trouser leg. The animal looked fat and sullen and dangerous. But as soon as Sar began to scratch the silver fur between her ears, she blinked contentedly and relaxed, settling herself on his lap with an almost inaudible purring. The others looked on, grinning. Even Deborah seemed pleased. Deborah, who had heard the tale before and who bore little love for Boada, the one cat of the seven that was Sar's alone. But Sar himself shared none of their content. Now lapsed into reverie, he was years away and thrice as many miles, remembering in Boada's purr the susurrus of wind as it raced beneath the frozen gray sky through that desolate circle of trees. And as the cat's sound swelled and deepened, taking on what almost seemed a note of warning, he heard once more the old man's peculiar little song. I'm among loonies, Frears was thinking. These people are all insane. Every time somebody farts, they think God is giving them a sign. All through the story he'd been watching Carol's face. She'd been listening with rapt attention, and at certain points, whenever Porath had prayed or called on God, she'd gotten positively starry-eyed. But maybe it wasn't God that made her starry-eyed. Maybe it was Porath. Well, what else did I expect, he told himself. He's a hell of a lot bigger than I am, and in a hell of a lot better shape, and that soft, low voice of his would probably make any woman think she's a little girl again being tucked into bed by her daddy. He wondered if Porath talked so much whenever a new woman was around. Or perhaps it was the influence of the wine. That home-brewed stuff had been surprisingly potent. His own head was still swimming with it. And, of course, there was that brooding quality he had, something Frears knew from experience that women seemed to like. It was so easy to mistake for real depth. Maybe this was all a bad idea, he told himself. Maybe I should never have asked her out here in the first place. Clearly Sar is the master here. This is his world. No, I'll not deny it, he was saying to Carol. I still feel the attraction of the lights. But I'm a wiser man today. I know it sounds prideful, but it's true. And I know the path we've got to follow. We've got to give up the ways of man and the ways of the city, the corruption, the idleness, the love of worldly gain. And you should, too. You should come back to the only constant things, the land and God. That bastard, thought Frears. He's using God to make time with my girl. Now, I'm not saying we have it easy here, Deborah and me. And I'm not saying we have a lot of anything but work. But we're living the way the Lord wants us to. Living just like people in the Bible. Porath's hands took in the kitchen, the farmhouse, the fields and woods beyond. Our only aim, really, is to abide by what the prophet said. Stand ye in the ways, and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Carol nodded as if she understood. Yes, she said. That's Jeremiah. I kept hearing passages from him on the radio today. He must be big in these parts. Deborah seemed to find this irresistibly funny. Her husband did not. He's the prophet of our sect, he explained. Freer spoke up. And a good thing, too. I sometimes think that's the only reason they let an unbeliever like me stay here, because they like my name. Carol barely seemed to hear. Her eyes were still on Sar. The one thing I don't understand, she said, is where you're hiding your church. I drove all over Gilead and didn't see a single one. Oh, we don't go to church, said Deborah, getting to her feet. We hold our meetings in the Brethren's homes. Later this month we'll be holding one here, and you're welcome to come out and see for yourself. We take our call from the Gospels, added Sar, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Carol nodded. I see. That's Matthew, isn't it? Hey, said Frears, surprised. 
you're pretty good. She looked slightly embarrassed. Didn't I tell you? I went to parochial school for twelve years. Freer's eyes widened. No kidding. I knew you were a Catholic and all, but, well, I guess I'd always pictured you as just a nice corn-fed country girl from some little red schoolhouse in the sticks. He tried to remember if she'd said anything about parochial school over dinner the previous week. Probably he'd done so much of the talking that she'd never had a chance. There's a lot you don't know about me, Jeremy, she said. She turned to Sar. You see, I may go about things a bit differently, but I've tried to live in the Lord's way, too. Frears regarded them sourly. They sound like they're on speaking terms with God, he thought, but I'm not so sure I'd want to meet the poorest version on a dark night. Leaning back in his chair, he peered out the window above the sink. It was certainly dark enough out there tonight. The moon seemed to be hidden behind a cloud with only a pale streak above the trees to mark its presence. A line from a poem came back to him. On the farm, the darkness wins. Though no doubt the brethren would argue that the darkness here was the darkness of God. Beside him, Deborah was clearing away the salad plates. The Poroths ate their salad European style, just before dessert. Hey, she said, nudging him gently on the shoulder. Come back and join us. I went to a lot of trouble over what's coming. It proved to be a steaming Indian pudding, which had lain nearly three hours in the stove, made of cornmeal and molasses. It was served with thick, fresh cream from the Verdox dairy in town. Now, Carol, she said, I sure hope you'll have no objection to this. Not the slightest, said Carol. Her eyes widened as Deborah ladled out a generous serving for each of them. God, it's a wonder the two of you can even stand. Frears nodded ruefully. I'm still trying to figure out how they stay so thin. I have to watch that man like a hawk, said Deborah, laughing. He'd eat everything in the bowl if I let him. Pensively, Poroth licked the spoon clean and looked up. They warned me about that when I married you, he said. They told me, Sar, that woman from Sidon's going to starve you. He eyed her with affection. But the truth is, we work hard, Deborah and me. We're at it all day, seven days a week. Keeps a body from getting fat. We don't believe in sitting on our duffs. There was a moment of silence. Frears decided that Poroth had been speaking to him. He forced a smile. Keep it light. Oh, physical labor's all right, I guess, if that's what turns you on. But as the philosopher said to the farmer, while you're feeding your hogs, sir, you're starving your mind. He glanced sidelong at Carol for approval and caught a smile. Maybe the night was still salvageable. By the way, have I told you about the exercises I'm doing? While Deborah set aside the jug and brought out Rosie's wine, he launched into a description of his daily routine, the sit-ups, the push-ups, the stretching motions for the back. I've also done a little jogging, he heard himself say. It's more interesting here than in the city, and a lot more private. Maybe I'll explore the other end of this road, or hike in the direction of those hills. He listened to himself talk on aimlessly, inconsequentially, perfect New York small talk. Yet perhaps he'd overplayed his hand, for Carol, he saw, had turned back to Sar, who all the while sat silent and unsmiling. They're sharing something I can't touch, he decided. Deborah was smiling at him sympathetically. Sounds okay to me, she said. A lot more fun than washing dishes. She got up from the table and began collecting their bowls. Carol seemed to shake herself awake. Oh, can I give you a hand with that? Won't say no. Deborah tossed her a towel. You can do the drying up. Neither Poroth nor Frears made any move to help. Frears had offered a few nights ago and had been politely rebuffed by Deborah. Such work, she'd said, was women's work. It had shocked him at the time to hear her say such a thing, but he'd been content to let her have her way. 
If she was so big on tradition, he sure as hell wasn't going to dissuade her. He seized the opportunity of being alone with Sar. Digging into his wallet, he extracted a ten-dollar bill. For tonight's dinner, he said in a low voice, Thanks a lot. It was great. Porath smiled wanly and shook his head, not even looking at the money. Go ahead, said Frears. Take it. I want to reimburse you. It's for Carol. I mean, let's face it, she's not your guest, she's mine. Porath did not appear to take the hint. In fact, Frears thought, he looked hurt. Maybe he'd been more sincere all evening than Frears had realized. Put away your money, Jeremy, he said quietly. It's well meant, I know, but I can't accept it. Our hospitality's for everyone. Your guest is also ours. Truth is, I sore regret every cent we've had from you already. I like to think of you as a guest here, and I only wish we could treat you as a guest deserves. God damn it, thought Frears. Isn't that just like a Christian? Just when you've decided that you hate his guts, he goes and makes you feel guilty about it. Drying her hands with the dish towel, Carol yawned and realized how tired she was. She would probably fall asleep as soon as her head touched the pillow. And with the thought of bed, she remembered the present Rosie had given her for Jeremy, and the book she'd brought out for him. It was meant to be read only at bedtime, the old man had emphasized, and surely bedtime would not be long in coming. She turned to Deborah at the sink beside her. "'I'm just going upstairs for a moment.' she said, lowering her voice, though at the table the men were still talking. A friend of mine gave me a little gift for Jeremy. She saw him look up as she left the kitchen. He looked concerned, probably afraid she wasn't coming down. I'll be right back, she said. The living room was small and low-ceilinged, with simple oak furniture grouped around a braided rug. Several not very clean-looking farm implements lay scattered on the floor beside a wooden bench, patches of metal gleaming from their rust, as if polishing these tools was the usual evening's pastime. In the corner near the stairway stood a tall grandfather clock, whose ticking, when all else was silent, could be heard throughout the house. A narrow wooden writing desk stood in the opposite corner, its dusty bottom shelf stacked with books, many of them college texts. Carol noticed a Fundamentals of Social Change and a volume of inspirational verse. It was apparent from their position that they were never removed, yet clearly Poroth had been unable to bring himself to throw them away or store them in attic or cellar. Perhaps they were a source of pride, perhaps one of temptation. By the other wall a corn-husk broom and iron tongs leaned against the stones of the fireplace, there was a smell of wood and lemon oil in the room, and, behind it, one of charcoal. Though the fireplace must have stood empty for some time now, it had obviously seen much use during the winter months. Venturing closer, Carol stopped to read the crude wooden plaque that hung by the chimney, with a motto from someone named Cowley burned into the wood. A plow on a field arable is the most honorable of ancient arms. On the mantelpiece below it lay a garland of dried flowers, a group of china cats, several chipped or broken, and a little wooden weather house with the man out in front. He looked a lot like Sar. Taking a lamp that stood burning on a table in the corner, she hurried upstairs. In the flickering light, the man in the moon gazed down at her benignly from the wall as she rummaged through her tote bag for the parcel and the book. Outside the window the real moon lay hidden by a cloud. Pressing her face to the glass, she tried to pick out the long, low guest house and the barn. They were hard to find. She'd forgotten how dark it got in the country once the sun went down. Jeremy would be out there alone tonight. Well, it simply couldn't be helped. There was no way she'd dare offend the Poroths by sneaking off with Jeremy, on whatever pretext. Besides, she was far too tired to contemplate sleeping with him now, tired from the drive out, the wine, the tensions of their silly conversation. She had felt Sar's eyes boring into her all evening, and had felt herself, for a moment at least, the more desirable woman in the room. Jeremy had suddenly seemed too abrasive, too eager. 
But in fact, her mind had been made up all afternoon, ever since she'd seen that awful gray brick building he was living in. The thing was ugly even for a chicken coop. It reminded her of something abandoned by the army. Jeremy had tried, of course, to brighten it up a bit. The blankets had been folded, the furniture polished, the books all put away, but somehow that had only made it more depressing. A vase of roses he'd placed by the bed had failed to disguise the pervasive smell of mildew, her nose wrinkled in recollection, and a hint of insect spray. And just outside, their shadows falling across his pillow, a group of trees had stood peering in at them like spectators waiting for a sacrifice. Just as well she'd be spending the night here in the farmhouse. Downstairs the two men were still slouched at the table over the wine, Sar fiddling with a worn-looking pipe while Deborah mopped the counter by the sink. Both Porths looked tired, though Jeremy sounded awake and animated as always. Well, not as always. She'd noticed earlier tonight that his leg no longer swung nervously beneath the table as it had back in New York. At least the country was having some effect. Or that line of butlers, he was saying. God, he never stopped about how I'd rather buy milk than own a cow. And let's face it, there's some truth to that. For instance, speaking for myself, I'd rather rent a room than own a house. On the other hand, Deborah called back, giggling, I'll bet you'd rather have a wife than... They looked up as Carol came in. Jeremy, she said, I just wanted you to know that I didn't come here empty-handed today. Smiling, she stood beside his chair. In fact, I have two things I'm supposed to give you. This book you wanted. With mock gravity, she laid it on the table before him. Which, according to my instructions, you are to open at bedtime. And this gift from Rosie. She placed it beside the book. Which you are to open now. Deborah came to the table. Oh, Jeremy, she said. Lucky you. She ran her fingers over the book's embossed yellow covers. They sure made them nice in those days. What book is it? asked Sar. He made no move to touch it. Oh, I remember now, said Frears, unwrapping the small package. It's a story collection, that's all. I need a couple of things in it for my project. I borrowed it from Voorhees, Carol added. I'm supposed to take it back with me tomorrow. Deborah picked it up and examined the spine. Oh, I see, she said. It's a library book. The House of Souls. She smiled at Frears. This looks like it'll send you off to dreamland all right. Frears had undone the white paper and was examining the slim cardboard packet inside. Deanad, he read, puzzling out the ornate gold letters on the front. He opened the flap at the end. Hmm, it's a set of cards of some kind. Rosie says they're like the tarot deck, explained Carol, peering over his shoulder. She'd never actually seen the cards before. Dina's Welsh for images, he says. They're supposed to correspond to the twenty-two, whatever you call them, picture cards. The greater arcana, said Sar. They all looked at him. You know what these are, honey? asked Deborah. I know the tarot, yes, but not these. He eyed them dubiously. The card on top bore a round yellow face and the words, The Sun. Or at least, I'm not sure. I'd have to look them up. Sar has read more weird old books than any twelve people, said Deborah, seating herself beside him. He knows almost as much as his mother. He shook his head. I'll bet you do, honey, she said. It's just that she gets it all without reading. I've never heard of this sort of thing, said Frears, who had been studying the box. It doesn't say Welsh on the label. It just says Made in USA, Crystal Novelty Company, Cranston, Rhode Island, and Instructions Included but there don't seem to be any instructions. He showed them the empty box. God, how annoying, said Carol. 
Isn't there anything printed on the back? He turned it over. Nope. Nothing except for entertainment purposes only. Looking to the deck, he slid the top card off. The one below it showed a crescent moon. I guess they mean it's not supposed to be used for gambling. Well, of course not, said Carol. It's for fortune-telling, isn't that right, Sar? He shrugged. Maybe. What did your friend say? You mean Rosie? He didn't say. But isn't that what a tarot deck's for? She sat down and reached for the moon card. The pale crescent shape was faceless against the purple sky. Between the two horns gleamed a star. A tarot has seventy-eight cards, though, Sar said guardedly. This only has... did you say twenty-two? Let's see, said Frears. One by one he began going through the deck, counting each card as he came to it, while Carol, beside him, read the title at the bottom. The Sun. The face, she decided, was mysterious and cruel, anything but sunny. The Moon. Look, said Deborah. Look where that star is. Isn't that impossible? There's something like that in the ancient mariner, said Frears, with a whispered two to himself. At one point he looks up, and that's what he sees. But it isn't natural. It's not supposed to be natural. The book. Gee, it looks just like this one said Deborah, pointing to the House of Souls. The book in the picture was fat and mustard-colored. It bore no visible title. The Bird A graceful white shape with a splash of red at its breast. The Watchers It's just a group of pussycats, said Deborah. Carol studied it a moment. Hmm, you're right. I wonder why they gave it that title. Frears revealed the next card. The Moth. It looked more like two green leaves stuck together, Carol decided. She was still disappointed by the oddness of Rosie's present, which, in a way, had become her present. The illustrations weren't very pretty, just rather lurid lithographs. And what was the point, anyway, seeing as they'd forgotten to include the instructions? The Wand. Black as ebony and shiny-looking. Odd, said Frears. It seems to have holes along the side. The... Dole. The what? Deborah craned forward to see. Sara squinted at it suspiciously. The thing on the card was dirty black and had four legs. Beyond that it looked ragged and half-formed. A papier-mâché mouse. It must be a misprint, said Carol. For mole, maybe. Or vole. Honey, maybe you can look it up later. The serpent. A pale, snake-like thing. Funny, thought Carol. She'd have expected a typical red Welsh dragon. The mound. The lovers. A man and woman, smiling. The eye. A single staring eye amid the branches of a tree. The rose? It was hard to say why the picture was so disturbing, thought Carol. Perhaps it was the inner row of spiky petals that looked so much like teeth. The marriage? Odd. The thing standing beside the woman looked like the mole-like creature from the earlier card. The pool? Greenery all around. The tree? It's the same picture we saw before, said Deborah. It's the eye. You're right, said Carol, more disappointed than ever. It must be another misprint. The deck was unusual all right, but obviously rather cheap. Freer slid up another card. Hmm, said Carol. This one doesn't even have a title. The card bore a simple design of three concentric rings, slashed by a vertical red line. Maybe it's like the Joker, said Frears. He turned another card. Spring. 
The card showed a landscape, but done entirely in white. This is weird, said Carol. White's supposed to be for winter. Summer. A landscape all in green. Fall. All in red. Ah, here it is. Winter. The land was black, like the aftermath of a fire. Here's the last one, said Frears. Twenty-two. The egg. Carol made a face. Is this supposed to be some kind of joke? The picture was of a globe of the earth, the familiar continents clearly visible. Well, said Frears, as if trying to inject a note of heartiness. Your friend Rosie comes up with some pretty unusual presents. I'll have to write him a nice thank you. He tapped the edges of the cards against the table, lining them up evenly once more. From the one on top, the sun's face glared toward the ceiling. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, said Frears. Does anyone want their fortune told? I have no idea what these damn things mean, but maybe I can improvise something. No thanks for me, said Carol. I'm really exhausted after all that driving. You know how it is when you get away from the city. Pushing back her chair, she stood up. God, she really was exhausted. And I think I had a little too much wine. I guess I'd better just go on up to bed. She saw Jeremy's smile fade. We're pretty tired, too, said Sar. We'll be up in a few minutes. Carol stood looking down at Jeremy, feeling awkward. She handed him the yellow book. And don't forget this, she said, trying to cheer him up. I've got to take it back with me tomorrow. He stared at it miserably, as if it were his own death warrant. Oh, yeah, thanks. He didn't look up. Well, then. She made her good nights to them all, and on impulse leaned over and kissed Jeremy on the cheek, wondering as she did so what he'd think of it, and more what Sar would think. Nonsense, she told herself. Surely these people can't disapprove of that. She felt Sar's eyes on her as she turned to go, but couldn't tell what he was feeling. Jeremy, though, was no mystery. Looking through her bedroom window when she got back upstairs, she saw him leave the kitchen and walk dejectedly across the lawn, the book tucked beneath his arm. For a moment he was outlined in the kitchen light. Then the night closed over him like a shroud. If Rochelle hadn't had that second glass of wine and the remainder of a joint, she might have taken more notice of the fact that the lock on the door of her building was broken again for the second time in a week. The door swung open as she leaned against it, and closed behind her with an echoing of metal up and down the tiled hall. The hall itself appeared more dimly lit than she remembered. Two bulbs at the other end had been removed, stolen probably, since she'd come through here earlier today leaving the passage to the elevator obscured by shadow. But it was late. She was in no condition to recognize signs such as these, and in no mood to heed them. Shrugging off the darkness that had settled upon the street, she pushed her way inside and moved wearily down the hall. She felt cheated. Buddy had not shown up tonight. Nor had she been able to reach him by telephone. The party had proved enjoyable enough without him. She had known most of the people there and had given her phone number to one of the host's friends, who'd been eyeing her all evening and had come up to her near the end. But afterward, on the cab ride home, she had grown depressed again, weighed down by a vague sense of betrayal. Carol was away for the weekend, all excited over some guy she hadn't even slept with, and for the first time in months she and Buddy could have had the apartment to themselves without the need to keep their love-making out of Carol's sight or to endure her lonely envy. Instead, she was coming home alone. The night was all but wasted. The street lamp by her doorway had been dead almost a week. The moon had long been lost behind the rooftops. Her mind still fogged by alcohol, she had overtipped the driver and stumbled from the cab, bruising her knee as she stepped down. She paused now in the middle of the hall to rub it, then walked blindly on. Something shrank within her as she remembered what awaited her upstairs, the dark and silent rooms, the emptiness beside her in the bed. 
Turning toward the elevator, she nearly tripped again over a shapeless bundle of rags that, hidden by shadow, had been heaped up against the rear wall. She mouthed a curse. Just as soon as she got the money together, she was going to move out of this rat hole. She'd had enough of garbage in the halls. As she pulled open the elevator's scarred black metal door, the bundle rose and followed her inside. She turned, her stupor lifting, to find a gaunt and wrinkled old woman beside her, filthy-looking and impossibly stooped, the back bent almost double. The face, too, was averted, as if in deference or fear. But by the light of the one bare bulb that dangled from the ceiling, Rochelle made out a mass of stringy hair, deep creases and discolorations in the skin, and, clenched as if praying, a pair of plump little hands. It was the hands that bothered her most. Pressing the button for her floor, she edged away. The metal door slid shut. Do you belong here? she heard herself demand. Her voice was harsh within a little car. The figure made no answer, but as the car jerked upward, something stirred beneath its rags. I asked you a question, snapped Rochelle. If you don't belong here, she gasped. The figure had turned toward her and was beginning to straighten up. Overhead, with an almost audible pop, the bulb in the ceiling winked out. There was time for one brief, desperate scream that echoed through the blackness of the car, and then the plump little hands closed over her throat. The night was filled with the sound of crickets, a vast and mindless machine grinding without end. Lightning bugs gleamed above the grass. Bats darted under the eaves of the barn. In the light from the kitchen, the apple tree's branches were bright against the darkness. Frears looked disconsolately toward the sky, wondering, now that it was too late, if he should have asked Carol to come out for a stroll. But it was not a time for strolling. The night was dark and unpleasant, the moon half concealed behind clouds. And anyway... How obvious it would have been to resort to such a ruse, and how humiliating if she turned him down. No, there'd been nothing he could say or do, not in front of the Poroths. There was no way he could have invited her out. It would have seemed too much like pleading. Brooding over the patronizing little peck on the cheek she'd given him, he slunk back to his room. Somehow I didn't think I'd be writing this tonight. I suppose I had visions of Carol with me, beside me all night long. Instead, she's up there in the farmhouse right now, about to sleep the sleep of the virtuous in that tacky little room, while I'm alone out here, scribbling the night away in this goddamned journal and trying to lose myself in the dubious consolations of prose. It's probably my own fault. She was probably embarrassed to do anything in front of the Poroths, and I didn't encourage her enough. And maybe she really was tired. If only I'd asserted myself more. If only I hadn't behaved like such a goddamned gentleman. She'd be here beside me now. Wish to hell she didn't have to go back to the city tomorrow. And now I've also got a headache, thanks, no doubt, to Rosie's wine. Damn. He took out his anger on the bugs. He spent half an hour going over his room, spray can in hand, looking for them. He found them, too. As many times as he'd gone over the room, the corners by the ceiling, the spaces around the window frames, the cracks beneath the sills, he always found new ones. There was no keeping them out. Whenever he saw an insect, he blasted it with the spray. Spiders doused with it, curled up like men in despair, clutching their knees. He almost could have felt sorry for them, if only their brown legs hadn't been so hairy and their eyes so cruel. He blasted some large beetles that were clinging to the screens, trying to push their way in. They convulsed and dropped away, disappearing. He watched a lot of daddy long legs curl up and die, and fat, bloated caterpillars wriggle. He tended not to kill the moths out there. They seemed so vulnerable, so hopeful, like humans, striving toward the light beyond the screen, bodies pale against the surrounding darkness, unless their banging annoyed him. The ones he really liked, however, were the fireflies. He felt a little sorry when he sprayed a few by mistake as they clung to the wire. 
When he sprayed them, they'd glow, and that cold light wouldn't wink off. It would just keep glowing, glowing much too long till at last it faded away. That's the only clue, he decided. The dead ones don't wink. At that moment the singing began. He could hear it from the farmhouse, coming faintly through the night. The Poroths were going through their hymns. He had heard them do this before, their evening devotions, they called it. But he'd never heard them singing as late as this, and never with such intensity. They must be atoning for the glass or two of wine, he decided. Big sin. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. The rug had been rolled up. Sar and Deborah were on their knees on the bare plank floor, watched by three of the cats. Their hands were clasped before them. Their eyes were shut tight. They seemed to be beseeching something they could see inside their heads. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Their voices rose louder and louder as they worked themselves into the song. Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Briefly, Sar thought of Carol in the next room. Her crimson hair would be pressed against the whiteness of the pillow. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. He threw himself into the song, singing all the louder to regain the feeling that was gone. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Carol had been almost asleep when the singing started. She roused for a moment, but she was so tired. Curious, she couldn't remember the last time she'd been so tired, that moments later she was slipping again into sleep, incorporating the words of the hymn into her dream. There are days so dark that I seek in vain for the face of my friend above. Jeremy's face, Sar's face, his dark probing eyes, a black thing watching from a tree. She started awake, thought briefly of the Dinad, and drifted back to sleep. But though darkness hide, he is there to guide with a touch of his hand and his love. Back to sleep, with Sar's hand, Jeremy's hand, the hand of God on hers. The room smelled faintly of insecticide. He had put away the can and decided to call it a night. Now he sat morosely on his bed, listening to the voices drift across the lawn to the outbuilding. They made him feel even lonelier. The others were all there, together in the farmhouse, and he was alone out here. Exiled till dawn. He wondered if Carol was singing with them. He doubted it, though it was hard to make out individual voices. She was probably already in bed. Wonder if she's thinking of me. I'd give anything to be inside there with her. Suddenly the singing stopped. He could picture the two of them climbing into bed and envied them, their warm, familiar bodies pressed together the mattress sagging softly beneath them. All was silent now, except for the crickets. Unfortunately, he wasn't very tired. In fact, he was still restless and on edge. The sick feeling left by the wine had finally worn off. Maybe a dip into someone else's mind would do the trick. He undressed and got into his bathrobe. Glancing around for a book to read, his eye fell on the faded yellow covers of the one Carol had brought him. Seating himself at his desk, he ran through what he knew of its author. Mackin had been a Welsh minister's son who went to London and lived alone for many years, nearly starving, haunted by fantasies of weird pagan rites and longing for the green hills he'd left behind. Lovecraft, in a survey of the field, had praised him highly. Frears flipped through the yellowed pages, searching for the story the old man had recommended, The White People. It was near the center. The book fell open easily to it. Someone, perhaps old Rosie himself, hadn't he been scribbling something that day? Had written in pencil just above the title, only effective if read by moonlight. Too bad the moon was blocked by clouds tonight. 
it might almost have been worth a try. Just for fun, of course. By way of experiment, he snapped off the desk lamp. Surprisingly, moonlight was now streaming into the room, falling onto the bed, and a strip of the floor with a radiance far brighter than he'd imagined. Though the table he was using as his desk was still in shadow. Peering out the window, he saw that the clouds had begun to part. The moon was shining down now unimpeded. Leaving his chair, he seated himself on the edge of the bed and laid the book on the window sill. He discovered that, by squinting, he could just make out the words. It might be amusing, he decided, to try and absorb the story this way. Maybe it would ease him into a dream. Holding the book open to the moonlight, he began to read. His eyes were moving faster. They felt as if they were darting back and forth as rapidly as insects, yet his vision seemed glazed, as if he were no longer reading the words but was instead being read by them, carried along like the beetle he'd seen kicking in the swiftly flowing stream, borne by the current, toward what rapids. The story's prologue, a framing device, had confused him, with all its high-flown talk about the human soul and the meaning of sin, and he wasn't even sure exactly where the tale was set, somewhere in the countryside. That's all he could be certain of, with a big house near a forest and secret places, hills and pools and glades. But the main portion of the story, the extract from a young girl's notebook, was staggering, overwhelming. It was as if it spoke to him aloud. I looked before me into the secret darkness of the valley and behind me was the great high wall of grass, and all around me were the hanging woods that made the valley such a secret place. He couldn't read it rapidly enough, the air of pagan ecstasy, the rites one doesn't dare describe, the malevolent little faces peering from the shadows and the leaves. It was, he felt certain, the most persuasive story ever written. He found himself whispering the lines as he read them, the words coming faster and faster. I knew there was nobody here at all besides myself, and that no one could see me. So I said the other words, and made the signs. And by the time he'd finished, he was half convinced he heard another voice, one softer and more ancient than his own, whispering an even stranger story in his head, a story in a language he seemed dimly to remember. He had no idea how much time had elapsed. It might have been days. His head was still spinning from the rush of words, or maybe it was only from the effort of reading in so faint a light. A pair of flies, trapped in the darkened room, were crashing into the window screens around him. The crickets droned their song. Frogs piped madly by the brook, but he no longer heard them. Still in the story's spell, he felt himself slip off the robe and walk slowly across the room, opening the door to the lawn outside and stepping into the darkness. But it wasn't dark. It was a different night he stepped into, one almost as bright as a stage. Every rock was visible, every blade of grass, every object cast a shadow. The clouds had rolled back, the sky had opened up, and the full moon now shone forth onto the yard with all its power. Pale light seemed to pour from the sky, revealing things not meant to be seen, the secret night side of the planet. He felt the wet grass beneath his feet, and small wet things that moved, and things both hard and sharp, but he didn't pull away. He felt himself drawn like a dancer across the lawn, past the back of the farmhouse and the line of dark rose bushes standing like sentries along one side, the house itself sleeping in the moonlight, its windows dark. And still he was drawn back, toward where the bubbling stream made sucking noises at him, back toward the massive shape of the barn, the moonlight so strong now he could see his own shadow floating over the grass, floating toward the gnarled old willow that grew against the barn. And his own shadow yearned toward the shadow of the tree, and he watched it, and felt himself follow, past the corner of the barn, moving inexorably toward the dark branches. And at last his shadow touched the other, merged with it, was absorbed in it, and still not knowing what he did, he followed. Deborah caught her breath in wonder. Beside her, two of the cats looked up and regarded her curiously, then settled back to sleep. 
She too had been asleep, but she'd been awakened by the shift in the clouds and the bright moonlight which had suddenly flooded the room. There were no curtains on the windows. Their people didn't hold with them, feeling it correct to get up with the sun. Unable to go back to sleep, she had been sitting up in bed and gazing absently out the window, head still spinning from the wine and the pictures of the Deanad, when suddenly Freer's door had swung open, down there in the yard, and now Freer's himself emerged into the light, his body pale against the lawn. Her eyes widened. He was naked. His expression was strangely preoccupied as he stepped onto the grass. She felt excited, watching him pad farther from the building, like a child watching something she shouldn't. She hadn't seen a naked man, aside from her husband, in... She couldn't remember how long it had been. But here were Jeremy's smooth white buttocks, his thighs, his sex. She caught her breath. Where was he going at this hour? He must be off to have himself a pee, she thought. But why is he heading clear across the lawn? At no time did he glance up toward her window. Not that he could have seen her in the darkness anyway, she told herself, and he without his glasses. And he couldn't have known, as late as this, that anyone was watching. She wasn't sure of the time. The only clock was downstairs, the big grandfather clock Sar had inherited. She could hear its regular ticking, but she thought it must be close to midnight. He was walking slowly, like a sleepwalker. Maybe he was sleepwalking, she thought. Jeremy wouldn't walk barefoot like that. He was far too squeamish about bugs, worms, night crawlers. Yet there he was, across the lawn and disappearing in the shadow of the barn. Perhaps she should stop him. If he was sleepwalking, could there be any danger? She dismissed the thought as soon as it occurred. Why embarrass him? If he wandered off into the long grass or the forest, well, he wouldn't be hurt. The Lord watched over sleepers. And if he found himself on rough ground, why, he'd simply wake up. She thought of calling to him through the open window, but she was already too excited. She could feel herself breathe faster now, and was suddenly aware of her hand beneath her unbuttoned nightgown, cradling and squeezing her breast. With a little sigh, she lay back, deliberately jarring the bed, hoping to awaken Sar, his face pressed to the crumpled pillow. He stirred, clutched the pillow tighter, and slept on. She shifted closer to him, so close that she could feel the warmth of his body. He too wore the traditional nightgown, but as her hand explored beneath the sheet, she could feel that it had worked its way above his waist. Her fingers caressed the familiar contours of his hips and slid into the soft, girlish hair. Gently, yet urgently, they closed over his penis. He groaned softly, still asleep, and turned toward her, eyes closed. She tugged more insistently, and in reflex he twisted his hips to be nearer her, snaking his arm along her body, at last finding her breast. Carefully keeping her breath slow and silent, she rolled herself on top of him. In the smaller room Carol slept on, outlined in the moonlight, her arm thrown over her eyes. Her regular breathing grew faster. Suddenly her hand clutched the edge of the sheet. Her other hand formed a fist, and a tremble shook her body like a fever. Her legs straightened, then pulled back. Her form seemed to grow heavier, pushing into the mattress as if she were retreating in her dream from some unwanted approach. Soundlessly her mouth formed words. Above her in the pale light, the cardboard nursery shape stared indifferently down. He felt the rough bark against the soles of his bare feet, and sensed dimly that he was climbing the gnarled old black willow that grew beside the barn. The branches bent beneath his weight, but did not snap. He felt himself climb upward, unerringly as a squirrel, as if he had done it many times before and knew exactly where to place his hands and feet. Attaining the upper branches, he made his way out onto one of the thicker limbs, let go with both hands, and precariously balanced stepped lightly onto the barn roof just before the limb began to give way, the old wooden shingles curling wet beneath his toes. He continued climbing, bathed in moonlight now, the moon's face just above him, whispering him on. At the apex of the roof he unbent and slowly stood upright, 
one leg on each sloping side, one foot planted east and one foot west, straddling the center line. The moon gazing down at him was close enough to touch. He raised his hands to it. Deborah eased the sleeping Sar onto his back, rose on her knees, and straddled him. Reaching down, she grasped him and put him inside her. He slid in easily. Hands raised as if in supplication, Frears felt himself make overtures to the moon, gestures and faces that no one could see, no one would ever see, no one had ever seen before. Perhaps some ancient force was in control, but there was no thought of explaining what he did, or why. Past and future did not exist. There was nothing real but his own movements. The shingles, he sensed idly, were rough against his feet. The ground seemed far away, but he had no fear of falling. From this height the land below him, the distant farmhouse with its little black windows like eyes, its outbuildings and its garden, seemed almost luminescent in the moonlight, with the trees a dark ocean around it. Sar awakened and looked sleepily up at Deborah, her face pale above him, eyes half shut. He reached out and caressed it, then slipped the nightgown up and off her shoulders so that her breasts hung down heavy and full above him. Briefly he tasted a dark nipple. Slowly, then faster, lifting and lowering her body, she began to pump. Frears tried to touch the full moon's face, and shaped his lips toward it, and heard someone whisper to it, words he'd never heard before and didn't know the meaning of, and instantly forgot. Beneath his feet the fireflies were like shooting stars, and a silver mist was rising off the field. He smelled roses. He could taste them on his tongue. Listening to the chanting in his ear, he waved his arms and made the faces, and did the gestures with his fingers, looking like a madman's shadow as he signaled to the moon and to the dark woods spread below. The moment came. He wriggled his head, arched his neck, threw his chest out in the night air, Sar kissed the breasts before his face and arched his body into Deborah, who leaned forward to widen herself just as Frears threw his arms wide, and Sar pushed himself all the way in so that Deborah gasped and they trembled all three. And Deborah made a moaning sound just as Carol cried out in her sleep, and Frears heard the whispering and chanting louder now inside his head and realized that the sounds he'd heard were coming from himself. Abruptly he stopped singing. The trance left him. The dream fled. He was standing on the barn roof, weary, and gasping and suddenly exhausted, as if he'd just finished a race, dance, and a struggle all in one. He looked down, lost his balance, almost fell. He was astonished at where he was standing, and at his own nakedness. Carol, for the first time that day, had been out of his thoughts, yet there on the rooftop, with the planet at his feet and the taste of roses in his mouth, he looked down at himself and saw he was erect. The dream, those mad, twisted trees, and the eyes. Carol was still shuddering from it, trying to throw it off as she lay breathing heavily in the tiny bed, the damp sheets clutched to her throat. Moonlight seemed to filter into the room like poison, seeping into her brain, making everything she looked upon seem strange and menacing. The shiny little cardboard figures with their evil, knowing smiles, the gaping black fireplace, the pale red witch ball hanging in the window like the child of the moon. The moon, its very brilliance was disturbing. She remembered the story she'd read long ago about the sailor who fell asleep on deck, lying on his back with the full moon shining brightly on his face and how, rising from a dream in which an old woman clawed him by the cheek, he awoke to find that his face had been permanently drawn to one side. She was suddenly aware that something had changed. Something was missing. Without realizing it, she had been breathing in time to the old grandfather clock downstairs, whose loud tick-tocking could be heard throughout the house, through the spaces in the floorboards, the thin walls and doors and suddenly the clock had gone silent. Ah, there it was again, with a pair of faster beats thrown in as if to make up for the missing ones. 
no doubt a broken spring. Well, everything had to run down eventually, after years and years. She drifted back to sleep, her face smoothing, her breathing growing slower, the dream dissipating like smoke from an altar. The spell was broken. The magic didn't work anymore. He almost slipped three times as he crept down the side of the slippery roof, ass in the air, fearfully clutching at the shingles. When he groped for a branch of the willow, it broke off in his hand. Somehow he was able to grasp a limb and hoist himself back to the tree, and at last, with much difficulty and a badly skinned elbow, he climbed down to the ground. He realized he was trembling from exhaustion. Jesus, he thought. What the hell was in that wine? Slipping timidly around the side of the barn, he covered his nakedness, an Adam after the fall, and dashed across the wet grass to his doorway. He winced with every step, feeling dozens of wriggling living things, some imaginary, some less so, beneath his bare feet. He prayed no one was looking. When he was back inside, he stood shivering by his bed. A great way to catch a cold, he told himself. These nights out here were damp and his feet felt clammy. His skin, he noticed, was covered with mosquito bites. He itched all over as he slipped his robe back on. His eye fell on his wristwatch on the stand beside the bed. Just past midnight. He shook his head and sat down on the bed. Of all the schoolboy stunts, he thought, wiping his feet off and scratching at his ankle. Whatever possessed me to... He paused. Something odd had just occurred. While he'd been sitting there trying to reorient himself, he'd been half-consciously aware of the crickets in the yard outside. The regular cadence of their chirping had been soothing, like the sound of a well-oiled machine. It had been making him drowsy, in fact, lulling him to sleep. But for a moment just now the crickets had seemed to miss a beat. They'd been singing steadily ever since he'd left the farmhouse, yet all of a sudden they'd simply stopped a break in the natural flow. And then moments later they'd begun again, only out of rhythm for a beat or two, as if an unseen hand had jarred the record. Well, they were back on the beat now. It was nothing to worry about, probably something to do with a temperature change. He turned back to preparations for bed, locked the door, put the mackin on the table, closed his journal for the night. It was only when he'd opened the top drawer of the bureau to put the journal away that he saw the brightly colored greeting cards he'd shoved to the back and realized with a sudden burst of sadness that it had happened without his remembering it. The moment he'd dreaded had come and gone. It was his birthday. And in her stone cottage on the hill above the stream, seated at her bedroom window, with the moon swimming full above the hedges by the roadside, and the pictures scattered at her feet. Mrs. Porath, hearing the crickets break rhythm, looked down from the moon to the image of the yellow book, and from that to the one that lay beside it, a shapeless black scribble with a hint of stubby legs, and realized at last why the woman had come out today. Book Four the Dream Think ye that the lot of them, the worm, the virgin, and the rest, are but symbols of corruption and purity? Then think ye again. Nicholas Keyes, Beneath the Moss July 3rd Carol opened her eyes shut them tighter against the brightness streaming through the unshaded window, then opened them again and stretched languorously. She had not slept well. Bad dreams, or rather one bad dream, had troubled her throughout the night. Now she was glad to be awake. Yesterday the room had had a musty smell, but this morning it was filled with sunlight and the scent of things in bloom. From outside the window came the raucous cries of birds. Aside from that the world was silent no sound of breakfast dishes or of singing in the kitchen. Dressing in jeans and a clean shirt, and running a hand through her hair, she peered out the window. No one was about. The farm seemed deserted. 
Then she remembered. It was Sunday. The Porrets would be at services at one of the brethren's houses, and would probably be away till past noon. Going downstairs, her footsteps on the wooden treads breaking the morning stillness, she saw by the clock in the living room that it was not yet eight. But perhaps the clock was wrong. She suddenly remembered that late last night she had heard it wind down, or had that too been part of the dream? Her eye fell on a portable radio standing by one of the kitchen shelves. Hoping it might give her the correct time, she switched it on. The sound of singing filled the room, a hymn like the one Sar and Deborah had been singing last night, only here there were dozens of ecstatic voices backed by an organ. She stood listening to it a moment, then snapped it off. They reminded her, those voices, that she herself should be in church this morning. Well, she would make sure to drop in and say a prayer this afternoon, just as soon as she got back to the city. God would understand. The silence in the kitchen was oddly oppressive, but outside the cries of the birds held a note of invitation. She pushed through the screen door and out onto the back porch. The sunlight was intense, and the land in back, stretching down toward the distant stream, looked beautiful, but there was a smell of dampness in the air. Two of the younger cats, an orange one and a tortoise shell, she didn't know their names, lay washing themselves in a small patch of sunlight, but when she started down the back steps, they both rose and trotted after her. The grass was wet around her ankles as she strolled toward Freer's outbuilding. She walked to the front and peered through the screen, a little nervous. Yes, there he was, a pale shape lying twisted in sleep on the bed. The shape stirred, and she saw with embarrassment that he was naked. Hastily she stepped back and began moving away, hoping he hadn't awakened and seen her. She continued down to the stream. Schools of tiny silver fish darted back and forth in the shadows of the rocks. It looked so inviting that she could almost imagine herself going for a swim. She reminded herself that, after all, she hadn't bathed this morning. She would leave her clothing there on the rock and step gingerly into the water. It would be chilly, of course, as it climbed her legs and perhaps while she was naked and so occupied, Jeremy would awaken, and walking silently down behind her, would surprise her, there in the warm sunlight. He would reach for her hand. This was no way to behave on Sunday morning. Besides, she thought, the water's only a foot or two deep, and the bottom must be covered with sharp stones. With a sigh, she sat herself on the rock and gazed at the pine trees across the stream, trying to pretend the place felt holy. Jeremy could get up when he pleased. Woke up later than I'd wanted to, feeling stiff and hung over. Carol and I went for a ride in Rosie's car, me at the wheel. Told her as we drove about its being my birthday. She was properly solicitous. I was gloomy. Telephoned Mom and Dad from a shopping center outside Flemington, they seemed worried about my allergy. You mean they have seven cats? And whether the seclusion's good for me? After lunch in Flemington, Carol insisted on buying me a small birthday cake to take back with us. Spent the afternoon driving through the countryside, past endless miles of farmland, shopping malls, new suburban tracts. This area is changing fast. Had a somewhat unpleasant encounter in town. Gilead wore a soberly festive air as they drove up to the crossroads. A dozen cars, most of them black and all of them at least a decade old, were parked along the main street, and there were dark-clothed figures talking in small groups on the open land that adjoined the general store. Several turned with undisguised curiosity as the car approached, but their faces seemed friendly enough. "'Let's stop,' said Frears, pulling up beside the store. "'I want to buy more bug spray.' The front door was open now, barrels of goods crowding the porch. This place is a cooperative, you know. Frears whispered as they walked inside past boxes of cutlery and rolling pins. All the brethren own it, and all share in the profits. Karl Marx would have been pleased. After so much time on the road, 
It took Carol a few moments for her eyes to adjust to the store's dim light. She looked for the woman she'd talked to yesterday, but there seemed to be no one behind the counter. Three men were standing near the back, by a passage that led to the grain warehouse. All of them had beards that curved from ear to ear. All were gaunt and solemn-looking, with faces that looked as if they'd been carved out of the same unyielding wood. They had been talking about someone with a drinking problem. A scandal to the community, one of them was saying, and I hear tell his boy Orin's are taken after him. But they fell silent when Frears and Carol entered. The man in the middle turned toward them. And what might you be wanting? he said. There was a wariness in his voice, but Frears appeared not to notice. I need a can of insect spray, he said. Something good and powerful. The other stared at him a moment, as if he'd recognized Frears and was trying to recall where. Suddenly he nodded. Ah, yes. Well, you would be having some trouble with the bugs now, wouldn't you? I mean, tis that time of year. Carol saw him dart a quick glance to the others. Now let me see what I can rustle up for you. He led Frears over to an aisle along the wall, and the two of them disappeared behind a pegboard. Carol heard them talking, and the clink of cans. She was left facing the other two and feeling awkward. Awkward for them, too, apparently. They stared silently at the floor, not even acknowledging her presence. Suddenly she heard feet tramping up the wooden porch behind her. In the doorway a heavy-set figure stood silhouetted against the light. Stiegler! If you tell me you've no more sandpaper, he called out, I swear I shall... He caught himself. Ah, Adam, Werner! He came forward, a dark bear of a man, nodding to the other two. He turned to Carol, and his eyes narrowed with interest. And who might this be? I'm just visiting, she said timidly. With him. She made a vague gesture toward the other aisle. Be right with you, Brother Rupert, came the voice of the storekeeper. He rejoined the group, followed by Frears, who was carrying a hefty-looking metal canister. The larger man ignored him. Ah, yes, he said, as soon as he saw Frears. He looked from him to Carol and back again. You'd be the one from the city, yes? the one who's staying with Sar Porath. That's right, said Frears, his voice level. I'm the one, and you are... Rupert Lint. He stuck out a beefy hand, which swallowed Frears up whole. But if his grip was painful, Frears made no sign. And this here's Adam Burdock and Werner Geisel. Frears shook both their hands as well. I've been drinking your milk all week, he said to Verdock. He turned to the third. And judging from your name, you must be related to our neighbor. I guess you're right, said the other. He was the oldest in the room, his head nearly bald, his beard shot with gray. You know my brother Matthew, do you? Sure, said Frears. He lives just down the road from us. In fact, you might say... And then again you might not, said Lint. Fact is, those poorists are off on a road by themselves, like they are in a few other ways as well. Matt Geisel is on the other branch, the one that doesn't run so far from town. Tis a good, oh, what would you say, Werner, a mile or two closer? The other nodded uneasily. Lord knows why they bought it, Lint continued. Old man Baber hooked himself a proper one when he sold that place to Porath. Tis a ways too far from the rest of us, if you ask me. And a ways too close to the neck, added the storekeeper, ringing up the purchase on the cash register. Frears looked startled. What neck? McKinney's neck, said Geisel. You don't want to go poking your nose around there. The ground's treacherous this time of year, and you're liable to get yourself drowned. Lint seemed to find this funny. Heck, 
Nobody's going to drown in a little bitty patch of mud. Leastways, nobody whose mama taught him to walk right. He cast a cold eye on Frears, then a warmer one on Carol. She felt her heart beat faster. You going for walks in the woods with this fellow? He demanded, nodding toward Frears. Or you come out here to give that Deborah woman a bit of competition? Now come on, Rupert. It was Adam Verdock who spoke. He was the tallest and thinnest of the men, the one with the gravest expression. He'd been the one speaking when the two of them had entered the store. Brother Rupert's only jesting with you, he explained. I was talking to Sar and his woman only this morning, just after worship. He's my nephew, as you young folks may know. I married his pa's sister, and he says everything's going just fine. You're the best guests a man could want. Says he'd like to put up a whole string of guest houses, if he could. Lintz snorted derisively. Sure, and maybe get himself out of debt. Frears took the spray can. Carol was afraid for a moment that he was going to aim it at the larger man's face, and slipped his hand protectively in hers. Come on, he said. Let's go. She held back a moment. She had a sudden vision of herself and Jeremy up to their necks in quicksand. Tell me, she said nervously, turning to Geisel. Just in case we do decide to take a walk in the woods, should we avoid that McKinney section you mentioned? Well, like I say, the old man answered, it's a little treacherous out there in the neck, especially for a stranger. And there are some... He cast a sidelong glance at Stiegler. Who say the place is haunted? The storekeeper stepped from behind the counter. Now, now, Werner, he said testily. I don't claim that, but you know perfectly well the place has a mighty peculiar history. What's this about haunted? asked Frears. Carol could almost see his ears perk up. This was probably just the sort of thing he'd come out here for. It was Lind who answered, looking somewhat amused. I believe they found a girl hanged out there, back before the war. He nodded to Carol. A nice young girl she was, pretty much like yourself. Ain't that right, Werner? The older man nodded. Twas in the thirties, I recollect. Suicide? asked Frears. Not likely. There was talk of other things that had been done. Begging your pardon, all of you, said Verdock, looking pained. But I don't think this is a fit subject for a Sunday. You're right, said Frears hastily, to a chorus of nods and amens. Anyway, we've got to go. Sar and Deborah have a nice dinner ready for us, debt and all. He glanced quickly at Lint. Mr. Verdock? Mr. Geisel, a real pleasure. As he took Carol's hand and began walking out, he called over his shoulder, And Rupert, next time you're in New York, be sure to look me up. She was glad when they were back outside on the street. They didn't go right back to the farm, though. Frears was now excited. He dragged her across the street toward the line of massive oaks, and beyond them, the schoolhouse. Come along, he said. I've got a sudden yin for local history. Let's look up that murder. But where are we going? asked Carol, as she followed him across the dusty brown playing field. He nodded toward the red brick walls of the school. The town library. It's supposed to be here in this building. Carol laughed. This is turning into a busman's holiday. Oh, don't expect this place to be like Vori's. Sar says it's hardly more than a school library, and Bible school at that. He warned me about the place, in fact. He told me, you'll not find the shelves filled with pornography the way they are in New York. Freer shook his head. Good old Sar. He really thinks we're next door to Gomorrah. The library proved to be on the first floor of the building, 
and, true to the brethren's work ethic, was open even on a Sunday. Porath, they soon discovered, had not been exaggerating about its contents. As the two of them surveyed the narrow room with its meagerly stocked shelves, they saw nothing that would have corrupted the most innocent schoolchild. There were cookbooks, books on farming, and books of household hints, but the bulk of the works were religious, and most of them appeared to have been written in the days when people still drove Model T's to church. An entire shelf was devoted to refutations of Darwin, another bulged with temperance literature, most of it written before the start of Prohibition. "'Sar was right,' said Carol. "'There's certainly nothing here to make the blood race.' "'Yeah,' said Frears. "'Too bad.' Carol looked in vain for a librarian. There appeared to be no one around, nor even a desk or a counter where one would have worked. Voris seemed very far away. The only other person in the room was a short, portly woman who was fanning herself vigorously as she peered through a section of inspirational novels. "'I've read every one of them once or twice before,' she confided, after they'd walked over to introduce themselves. "'But I like him even better when I know how the story comes out.' She explained that, in fact, there was no librarian on duty. "'Leastways not summers, when the schools closed down.' Folks just come in, take what they please, and bring the books back when they can. No kidding, said Frears. What's to stop somebody from just walking in and stealing all the books? The woman seemed surprised. The sort of folks who come in here ain't the sort who steal, she said, regarding him with suspicion. And the sort who steal ain't the sort who come in here. Frears, having sized up the woman as a regular, explained what he was looking for. She led him and Carol to an alcove near the back, where floor-to-ceiling shelves sagged beneath the weight of thin brown books the size of atlases, piled flat. They were bound volumes of the Hunterdon County Home News. Perfect, said Frears. Back before the war, Rupert Lint had told them. The two scanned the shelves for the volumes from the thirties, and found them in a pile near the floor. From the way the books stuck together from the heat when Frears pulled out the one marked 1937, Carol guessed they were rarely consulted. He flipped through the volume. The newspapers were yellow with age and smelled like a damp cellar. Over the years, many of the bindings had loosened. Most were missing corners. Here and there, whole sheets were torn in half. The Home News had, in those days, been a weekly, with few issues more than eight pages long, but it was obviously the only source of local news. Gilead had never had a paper of its own. Carol watched as Frears turned the pages. What struck her immediately about the stories she saw was their violence. Rather than the sedate era she'd imagined, the newspapers conjured up an age of lawlessness, freak accidents, and sudden death. A local dentist, speeding from Flemington to Sergeantsville, had injured his best friend in an auto crash and had promptly committed suicide. Arrested as drunken driver, said the headline. He goes to office and inhales laughing gas. A man in Pennsylvania had been shot down by a fellow hunter in an argument over a deer. A Baptist town man had been stung to death by bees. Other news was more frivolous and bespoke a happier time. A convention of dance teachers in Atlantic City had proclaimed the end of Jitterbug. People are tired of the jumping dances, such as the shag, Big Apple, and other athletic steps, explained one. And railroads still ran everywhere. A special train had been initiated, running from Flemington to the New York World's Fair, whose admission price had just been raised to fifty cents. A New Haven Railroad ad suggested, Sleep on the train, wake up refreshed in Maine. Clearly some conveniences had vanished since then. It took them nearly half an hour to work through the 1937 volume and the subsequent one before they came upon the article Frears sought, in the issue of August 3, 1939. It had been an otherwise happy summer week, the populace keeping busy with a round of local fairs, auctions, and church socials. The weekend's weather had been hot, 
Temperatures had run to 96 degrees during the day, 81 at night. The moon had been full. Amid the welter of other news, the report of the murder near Gilead. Slain girl's body found in woods would have gone virtually unnoticed if the two of them hadn't been looking for it. The article was a brief one. No doubt many of the details had been suppressed. The girl, one Annalisa Heidler, twenty, had been reported missing on the evening of July 31 by her father, a prominent Flemington attorney. Two days later a party of deer hunters had discovered her corpse suspended from a tree in the woods outside Gilead. It had been partially burned and bore markings of an obscene nature, made with black grease. Although police refused to speculate, the article added, Elderly residents of the town have opined that the perpetrator or perpetrators may have been imitating a similar crime committed on July 31, 1890, in the same location. Freer's eyes widened. Jesus, he said, turning to Carol. It seems the murder had a precedent. Somehow that makes it even more horrible. He nodded, not really listening. Let's see what the paper said. Replacing the volume, he searched for the one marked 1890. There it is, said Carol. She pointed to an upper shelf. Frears had to reach for the book on tiptoe and tug to pull it out. It was well that, this time, they knew the exact date of the article they sought, because finding it in this early volume would have been difficult. The home news had changed greatly in the intervening half-century, and the version they were looking at now contained far fewer photographs. The typeface was smaller, the front page more cluttered, and the headlines, true to the practice of the day, maintained an almost enigmatic reserve. A fatal argument, the closing of a brewery, Unfortunate accident in Highbridge. Frears leafed quickly through the book, watching the county's history pass in review. Mills had been erected. People had made fortunes in the railroad. A Baptist town farmer had set a state record with a squash that weighed 118 pounds. He came across the article he wanted in the first issue of August. The county then had been suffering an unusually hot summer. The week's average temperature, the paper said, was 98 degrees in the shade. Ads recommended Hood's sarsaparilla as an excellent remedy for summer weakness during the oppressive, muggy weather of the dog days. A West Portal boy had gone blind from picking strawberries in the hot sun. Eleven celebrants at the Hunterdon County Harvest Festival, the biggest gala in the history of the county, had had to be treated for heat prostration. The article in question was a relatively brief one, crowded out by optimistic pieces on the fair. Tragedy revealed, it said. Gilead, August 2. Authorities here report the death of Lucina Reed, 16, daughter of Jared Reed of this town. She had been missing since the evening of July 31. Her body was discovered by searchers in the section of outlying woods popularly known as McKinney's Neck, the full moon aiding them in their task. Positive identification of the body was difficult, abominations having been practiced upon it, though further reports indicate that death was due to strangulation. Authorities are searching. She heard Frears catch his breath. For some reason, she didn't know why, she felt her own heart pound a little harder as she read the passage again. Authorities are searching for Absalom Trout, Twenty-two of the same town, believed to be the last to see Miss Reed alive. For Frears it was like seeing a familiar face in the middle of a nightmare. It made the nightmare worse. So here the trail ends, he thought. The evil led back to Absalom Trout, the boy with the devil in him. Frears recalled the blank space on the tombstone, and even in the heat of the library felt a shudder. This is the guy who set fire to the farmhouse that used to be on the Porth's land, he said to Carol, knowing there was too much to explain. He was some kind of distant ancestor of Sars, and when he was a little kid he killed his whole family, burned them in their sleep, and now it seems he must have gone right on murdering. 
God, said Carol, shaking her head. I thought things like that only happened today. There was nothing about the crime in the following week's paper, but two weeks later a brief notice appeared to the effect that Absalom Trout, wanted in connection with the killing of a Gilead girl, was still missing. Authorities have been unable to locate him, the notice said. It is believed he has taken his own life. There was no further mention of the crime. Well, Frears said, there's just one more item to search for. Shoving the book back onto the shelf, he withdrew one still earlier, marked 1877. It was a curious sensation looking through these volumes in reverse. Time was running backward, and Hunter and County grew younger. New Jersey, he saw, had been a rather wild place in 77. He read of cattle rustling, stable fires, and hunting accidents. A Milford boy had died in February from the attack of a mad bull, another from the bite of a snake. In Flemington in March, one Deto Turo, described as an Italian boot-black, had stabbed three men in a bar. In June, a Moses Raymire, four years old, had fallen down a cistern and drowned, and a man had been sentenced to twelve years' imprisonment for horse-stealing. One of the lead stories in July, died from drinking too much milk, told of a cook, employed on General Schwenk's large dairy farm, who drunk herself to death after having become, in the words of the article, very fond of fresh milk. He wondered what the temperance crowd had made of that. There were dozens of reports of fires. Civilization in those days seemed to have been one colossal tinderbox, but it wasn't until he saw the notice, Tragic Fire in Gilead, near the end of the volume, that he knew he'd found what he'd been searching for. Here it is, he said. The report was a brief one, buried near the bottom of the page. Gilead, November 1 The farm of Isaiah Trout, 38, was the scene of a terrible tragedy last night when sparks from a wood stove apparently ignited combustible material in the kitchen. Eight of the family are believed to have perished in the conflagration that destroyed their home. Among the dead were Trout, his wife Hannah, and six children, all of whom were apparently asleep when the fire broke out. The volunteer fire brigade arrived too late to save the unfortunate family. Authorities from Annandale and Lebanon picked through the charred remains this morning and attributed the fire to an act of God. The only survivor, nine-year-old Absalom Trout, had been outside at the time of the blaze, attending to a sick calf in the barn. Authorities say the boy will live with relatives. Can't we go now, Jeremy? whispered Carol. This tiny print's beginning to give me a headache. Or maybe it's just thinking about all those poor people. Sure, said Frears. Sorry for taking so long. He slipped the book back on the shelf and wiped the dust of the old paper from his hands. He thought about Absalom Trout all the way back to the farm, and he kept wiping his hands. Sar and Deborah were in the house when we got back. They were all fired up and full of the Holy Spirit. Even when I was out here in this room, I could hear them clattering through the kitchen, humming little snatches of hymns. I suppose that when you don't have any Broadway shows around, or movies, or TV, you take whatever entertainment you can get. They both told me over and over how exalted they felt— but as far as I'm concerned, they might just as well have said exhausted, since they'd apparently spent the last four hours praying on their knees, rising to sing, kneeling, standing again. Good preparation for planting seeds, maybe, but not the sort of religion I'd choose. They were both very nice about my birthday, though. Why hadn't I told them? Deborah would have baked me something special, etc., etc. She actually kissed me on the side of the mouth could feel her breast brush against my arm. I don't think she wears anything beneath that dress. Sar put down the wicked-looking scythe blade he was honing and contented himself with an earnest shake of my hand. Wish I knew how Carol felt about him. Of course, nothing could have gone on between them last night, notwithstanding a few fantasies I had when I came out here. But I still sense a certain interest there, 
at least on Carol's part. As for Sar, I'm now convinced he has his mind on God and eyes for no one but his wife. But who can say? Who can say what's in another person's head? I twisted Carol's arm a bit, and she agreed to stay for dinner. Despite lots of moaning and groaning about the drive back to New York, it was a nice meal, one that Carol this time could eat. Cheese omelet, garden salad, and that cake of Carol's for dessert. She and I finished off the Geisel's wine from last night. Both porths declined. I guess one night of transgression is enough for the weekend. Deborah, as usual, spent the meal laughing and carrying on, and generally having a good time. She obviously craves company. But Sar tended to withdraw a bit as the evening wore on. He sat there like one of his own cats, getting all silent and brooding and inscrutable. Maybe it's because I made the mistake of asking him about those murders. God's my witness, Jeremy, he said. You know more about those things than I do. I'm just plain not interested. I wasn't around in 1939, and I certainly wasn't around in 1890. I've heard my mother had some sort of premonition about the one in 39, but I'm not really sure. She was a young girl then. I told you about the gift they say she has. Frears nodded. Obviously, in this case, the gift didn't help. I guess not, said Poroth. He sounded somewhat downcast. My mother seldom speaks of it. I expect it's troubling to her. What intrigues me most, said Frears, are the legends these things give rise to. I gather people claim they've seen ghosts in the woods where the murders occurred. Poroth shrugged. Some claim that. Personally, I don't hold with such tales. I believe they're probably in error. Still, there could be something to it. It's not for us to say. Freeze decided that he liked the idea of having a haunted place so nearby. It was just the sort of thing he could take back to his classes, evidence of modern superstition. Carol was gazing at Porath sympathetically. You don't believe in ghosts yourself, then? On the contrary, he said. I know full well that they exist, as sure as there are eggs and fireflies and angels. I just don't think they stay out there in the woods. Frears decided that he hoped they did. Carol wanted to leave before eight, to give herself plenty of daylight to navigate the dirt road and the way back to Gilead, but the Porth's clock has gone off, and I'd left my watch inside here, so she probably didn't start till close to nine, when it had already begun to get dark. Hope she makes it okay. She was really nervous about the goddamn driving. Was sorry to see her go. Never really got as close to her as I'd wanted to, and don't know when she'll have another chance to come out here. There's a kind of genuineness in her I don't find in most New York girls. She makes me feel like a teenager again, which isn't really as bad as it sounds, especially for an old man of thirty. Oh, come off it, says another voice. You just want to get laid. Could be. Sigh. Maybe I'll try to see her in the city next time, in my own environment, rather than out here on someone else's turf. Came out here after she left and tried to do some work. Started on Melmoth the Wanderer by the Reverend Charles Robert Maturin. Powerful stuff. But after the Lewis book, I'm getting a little sick of all the Catholic baiting. No doubt it's great fun for the connoisseur of atrocity scenes, Still more mothers clutching the wormy corpses of their infants, a gothic staple, I suspect, starving prisoners forced to eat their girlfriends. That's a new one on me. But the Inquisition's over now, the villain's dead and gone, and all a book like this can do is put you in a rage. Fine for getting me through tomorrow morning's push-ups, no doubt. A drop of adrenaline works wonders. But otherwise, quite useless. Hmm... Never thought I'd find myself sticking up for the papists. Must be Carol's influence. Afterward, wished I'd taken some notes on that story, The White People, which Carol took back with her. Already seemed to have forgotten most of it, and what I do remember seems oddly confusing and repetitive. I did locate in one anthology another Mackin piece, about a London clerk named Darnell, 
who has mystical visions of an ancient town and woods and hills. Our stupid ancestors taught us that we could become wise by studying books on science, by meddling with test tubes, geological specimens, microscopic preparations, and the like. But they who have cast off these follies know that the soul is made wise by the contemplation of mystic ceremonies and elaborate and curious rites. In such things Darnell found a wonderful mystery language, which spoke at once more secretly and more directly than the formal creeds, and he saw that, in a sense, the whole world is but a great ceremony. The writing was beautiful, with a real magic to it, yet somehow my mind began wandering. When I was halfway through, I looked down and saw something squatting stick-like on my pillow, just beneath my nose, something like a cross between a cricket and a spider and a frog. And as I watched, the thing began to chatter. It pranced and chirped and shrieked at me and shook its tiny fist. And then I woke up. The story was still where I'd left it, and a huge white moth, horned like the devil, was tapping at my window. Must be midnight now, and the coldest night so far. Strange, really. It was hot all day. But with evening comes a chill. The dampness of this place must magnify the temperature. Carol complained that it gave her bad dreams last night. But she wouldn't talk about them. Yes, past midnight, I just checked. Thirty years behind me now. Another birthday gone. Where do the damn things go?'